Chik, 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 chik.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We begin with the second day's program. We have a short welcome video waiting for the people to come in. And then we'll have an update about the patients which were done yesterday. Harshal? Dr. Harshal Gadikar will update us about the patients which were done yesterday. Hi, good morning everyone. Welcome to day two of our ninth uh, Congress on endoluminal surgery. I am sure you had a great time yesterday with the didactic lectures and the hands-on procedures. The uh, patients uh, have done well. Especially, I think there was a lot of uh, question about the Zenkers. Yes, everyone's doing well. And uh, we do have a good number of cases lined up today as well. We start off with the lectures and uh, we are, uh, we are, I mean, and the feedback we have is also that everyone's happy with the uh, interaction that has been going on across the uh, uh, presenters, uh, performers, and the people who have been giving the lectures. So, <clears throat> in short, we uh, have had a good uh, response to this conference. We have had 243 registrations, people who are attending, and uh, we have a live YouTube channel where there were about 420 hits yesterday. We expect a little more today. So, uh, thank you everyone for being here, for being a part of this uh, academic uh, feast. And uh, we hope you will enjoy the uh, uh, program today as much as we have, uh, we are enjoying it, getting it to you. So, like everything else, sit back and enjoy the academic feast. So, over to Sanjay for the rest of the day. Thank you, Harshil. So, we begin with a session on poem. May I please call the moderators, uh, Dr. Anil Arora from Gangaram. I uh, Dr. Satish Kulkarni, Vashi, Dr. Prashant Bhandarkar from Nagpur and Dr. Jayanta Samanta from PGI Chandigarh. The first speaker will be Dr. Vikas Singla from Max Delhi who will speak to us on pre-procedure workup and checklist for poem. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, at the outset, I'm thankful to Dr. Amol for the kind invitation. So, as you know, uh, Ecclesia cardia is a esophageal motility disorder, and it affects two sites. One is the LES. There is failure of relaxation of LES, and it also affects the esophageal peristalsis. So, there are two defects, and we are targeting only one defect, that is LES. And we have only the palliative treatment. There is no curative treatment for Ecclesia cardia. And POEM is an uh, effective treatment with efficacy more than 90%. So uh, before we do the POEM, we have to take care of the, uh, all these things. We have to do a good clinical evaluation. Then patient should undergo endoscopy, manometry, and the barium. 
and then the consent, uh, we have to think of comorbid condition, then uh, issue of anticoagulant, we, we will discuss each one by one. So first is the clinical evaluation. Uh, the most common symptom in patient with ecclesia is the dysphagia to both liquid and solid and mostly they have a long duration of symptom and many times they have chest pain also. And one symptom is very specific for the ecclesia cardiac. If the patient has nocturnal regurgitation of food, it's a very specific symptom for the ecclesia because in ecclesia cardia the esophagus gets dilated and there will be a nocturnal regurgitation of the food and this symptom is very specific for ecclesia cardia and then the patient can also have a weight loss or the recurrent pneumonia due to aspiration. But these symptoms can occur with other disorders also. So in a patient who has a short duration of symptom, age more than 60 years and if there is rapid weight loss, it can be a pseudo ecclesia or secondary ecclesia, secondary to malignancy. In this patient, we should do a good clinical evaluation to look for any node in the left supraclavicular region or any peripheral sign of malignancy. So, and in all these patients, we should calculate the ECART score, which is based on the four parameters, dysphagia, regurgitation, chest pain, and the weight loss. So, first is the endoscopy. In patient with the ecclesia cardia, there will be resistance at the G junction. If there is a very tight resistance at the G junction, it can be malignancy. There will be only subtle resistance at the G junction. Then we can appreciate tertiary contractions and there will be a fluid accumulation in the esophagus. And we should also same time rule out the malignancy, mucosal malignancy. We should do a good uh, examination of the mucosa with the NBI. We should also look for the any submucosal compression which can be due to gist or leomyoma. And sometimes peptic suture or the eosinophilic esophagitis, they can also mimic the ecclesia cardia. Then before starting poem, we should do a good mucosal assessment. And in a patient with ecclesia cardia, there can be mucosal injury. Type 1, this is type A, it's absolutely normal, we can see the vessel. In type B, there is some obscuring of the vessel. In type C, we cannot see any vessel. In type D, there is a linear furrows in the esophagus. D, type E, there is ulceration and type F, there is a scarring. So in patient with the C, D, E and F, there is significant submucosal fibrosis and this is the uh, degree of fibrosis, SMF0, no fibrosis, SMF1, there can be sub submucosal fibrosis. In SMF2, there are bundles of fibrosis, but the mucosa is liftable. Uh, SMF3, mucosa it not uh, is not liftable. And in patient with the type D uh, esophageal mucosa, there is likely to be significant risk of some mucosal fibrosis and higher risk of failure of tunneling and the POEM procedure. And the second test is the manometry. Manometry is the gold standard for diagnosis of ecclesia cardia. During manometry, we have to identify the G junction, then we have to check the IRP and then we have to look for the peristalsis. So first, uh, sometime in patient with ecclesia cardia, because of tight G junction, it's difficult to pass the manometry probe across the G junction. So we have to look for a pressure inversion point. So what is the pressure inversion point? So this is the high pressure area. We can see on this bar, green is higher pressure as compared to the blue pressure. So the green is the LES. And we can see at any time the pressure inside the esophagus is lower as compared to the stomach. The stomach pressure will be high as compared to the esophagus. And during inspiration, the pressure in the esophagus will fall. We can see this is the inspiration, this is the contraction of diaphragm. And the pressure in the esophagus is falling and the pressure in the stomach is increasing. Here it's blue, now turning the green. So if you're getting a pressure inversion point, at point at which above the point the pressure is reducing with inspiration and pressure is increasing below the point during inspiration, it indicates it's a pressure inversion point and our probe, is, probe has gone across the G junction. If you're not getting the pressure inversion point, we can do the wire guided manometry. Then we look for the integrated relaxation pressure. This green line again shows the, this is the G junction. So this is a swallow. We can see uh, with the fluid intake, there is a relaxation of the upper sphincter. So after swallow, during next 10 seconds, we check for the esophageal EJJ pressure. In patient with ecclesia cardia, the IRP will be high. IRP is the minimum pressure during next 10 seconds. So the, the software will take the pressure during the next 10 seconds of the EJJ and will, it will take the average of the lowest pressure, that is integrated relaxation pressure. And second is the peristalsis. The normal peristalsis wave is the oblique wave. So in patient with the ecclesia cardia, there will be, IRP will be higher and there will be total normal, total absence of normal peristalsis. Normally we give 10 swallows. 
in all the ten swallows there will be no normal peristalsis and there will be high IRP. And based on these findings, it can be classified into type three types of occlesia cardia. In all these, IRP will be high. We can see line is green after the swallow. It means pressure is high. Type one, there is no contraction in the esophagus, no increased pressure. It's a type one ecclesia cardia. In type two, there will be green uh, pan esophageal pressurization. And in type three, the distal latency will be low. Distal latency is the time between the swallow and the CDP. If it's less than 4.5, it's a type three ecclesia cardia. It's essential to differentiate between type 1, 2 and 3 because the mitomy will be tailored according to the type of ecclesia cardia. Type 3 will require the longer mitomy. In few patients there can be distal spasm. Here the IRP, uh, in patient with the distal spasm, IRP will be normal but the DL will be low. This patient again can be treated with the uh, POEM procedure but we don't have to do the mitomy at the LES. In distal spasm, just the DL will be low with the normal IRP. And in patient with the hypercontractile esophagus, there will be vigorous contraction in the esophageal body. The red color shows high pressure. So there is high pressure contraction inside the esophageal body and we can see IRP is normal. Again, this patient will require long myotomy without any cutting of muscle at the lower esophageal sphincter. Then there is a condition called EGJ. In EGJ, pressure will be high, but the peristalsis will be normal. The differential diagnosis of EGJ are, it can be either a functional, it can be mechanical EGJ due to malignancy. In the elderly patient with the EGJ, it can be a malignant obstruction. The next investigation is the barium swallow. In barium, uh, there can be various findings. This can be a bird beak appearance or there can be a small stricture or there can be a tram line, a tram track appearance. We can see a blue line surrounded by two white lines. So, and there can be a shouldering also. So, the type, the five findings we see in the EGJ, uh, EGJ obstruction. So, if the patient has a long stricture, it favors the secondary ecclesia. If there is a shouldering, it favors the uh, secondary ecclesia. If it's a tram track appearance, it favors the primary ecclesia. So, based on the barium findings, we can have a various differential diagnosis. In patient with a short history of symptom, we should always do CT scan and endoscopic ultrasound to rule out the malignancy. We can see here uh, on CT scan, there is a circumferential malignancy at the G junction and similarly at the US, we can see the obstruction. Uh, so last two slides. Uh, and this is the checklist which is meant for the all the patient and in patient with ecclesia cardia, we have to take care of consent form, relevant comorbidities and uh, anticoagulation and the functioning equipment. So, in the consent form, a patient always has expectation and the fear. They should be addressed in the consent form. We should always tell them it's a palliative procedure, not a curative procedure. Alternate treatment modality should be explained to the patient. Efficacy and the risk of reflux should be explained to the patient. Nowadays, we are doing poem in patient who are suffering from other comorbid condition like cirrhosis, CKD, COPD. These patients are at high risk of worsening of underlying disease. This should be explained to the patient. In patients who are on anticoagulants and antiplatelets, we can continue cosparin without any risk of extra bleed. Patients who are on anticoagulants and uh, clopidogrel, it should be stopped, but still there would be high risk of bleed around 5% in these patients, which should be again explained to the patient. And we should always have a checklist of equipment. We should have all the equipments ready. We should have high definition endoscope with the auxiliary channel. We should have electrosurgical unit with the endocut and the soft coagulation mode which is mandatory. Soft coagulation is mandatory to achieve the hemostasis. We should have a low flow CO2 tubing, water pump. So these are all the necessary equipments. And during POEM, air should be switched off. Otherwise, there is a risk of air embolism and there can be mortality. And these are the commonly used knife. We can use either TT knife or the hybrid knife. And coagrasper is there for the hemostasis. So to summarize, High resolution manometry is an essential test for diagnose ecclesia cardia and to classify the ecclesia cardia. Malignancy should be ruled out in a patient with a short history and the elderly patient. We can assess the submucosal fibrosis by the mucosal appearance and in the consent form efficacy and the risk of GRD should be explained. We should always explain the alternate procedure and the dose of antiplatelet and anticoagulant should be adjusted. Ecospin can be continued and we should have a checklist for the equipment and everything should be available. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Singla. Okay. We move on. Uh, we'll take the questions at the end in the discussion. So we may I invite Dr. Rajesh Puri from Medanta. He'll speak on mucosal incision, planning and execution. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank Amol and the team DMH for giving this opportunity. And after completing the checklist for the patient as well as for the equipment, when you start the procedure, it is important that the mucosal incision is the most crucial step for the successful poem procedures. And before embarking on the incision, it is important we should plan. And the planning is what should be the site of incision, what should be the shape, length, depth, and the spatial situation. So it will depend, the site of mucosal incision will depend upon the type of achalasia, as Vikas has said, type 1, type 2. Generally, you do around 4 to 6 centimeter proximal to EG junction. In type 3 and type DSE, you generally do around 8 to 10, 12 or 12 to 14, depending upon the manometry finding. So as Vikas has highlighted, the manometry findings are very important. So this is the one of the case, if you see an extreme left image, the poem procedure was done five years before and after two years, the patient again comes with the symptoms. So depending on the manometry finding on the barium, you see there's a spastic segment at the upper end of the esophagus. And the redo poem was done, and the incision was done at the cervical esophagus, and the patient was asymptomatic now. So manometry findings are very important, especially when you are talking about the DSC or type 3 achalasia. Type of myotomy is also depend. If you are doing an anterior myotomy, it should be around 11 or 12 o'clock position. If you are doing at posterior myotomy, then the site of incision is around 5 or 7 o'clock position. The incision will also depend if the patient has a previous Heller's myotomy. The posterior, you do an approach at 5 to 7. If patient has a previous poem, you do the incision on the contralateral side. A special situation, if patient has a long-standing achalasia, there is a lot of submucosal fibrosis, then you do at different site, maybe on the same direction or the opposite direction. Regarding the shape, you can do longitudinal transverse of the inverted T. The advantage of longitudinal is it's easy to close, but difficult to enter, and you may have an insufflation related side effect. Transverse, again, the entry is easy, but it is difficult to close, and inverted T, the easy entry, less insufflation related side effect, fewer clips are required, but the presumed difficulty in the closer. So what we require a randomized control trial to prioritize that which is the best in season, but nowadays the clinical practice, we do a longitudinal in season. The length of the incision roughly around 1.5 to 2 centimeter, but in inverted T you can do the 0.8 centimeter transverse and 1 centimeter longitudinal incision. So once you have decided that you are planning to do the anterior, posterior, what should be the length of, from the EG junction, so you always do and check endoscopy. You should look at a relatively healthy mucosa, relatively less vascular area, either on the white light image endoscopy or NBI or on the RDI, a less spastic segment should be chosen and there should not be a no infection or candidiasis. So once you have opted for the incision, you have do a check endoscopy and you have planned that this patient is fit, the next point is come about the submucosal injection. And how to inject? You pick deeply and invert very gently by gradually withdrawing the needle once you get the submucosal blab. So in anterior, you do at around 2 o'clock position, avoid the spine, that is important. Put a water, the dependent area is posterior. Ask your assistant to flush the knife and while flushing, you inject deeply and try to withdraw the needle. So this is an important step. Prick, give a jab and withdraw your needle and your assistant keep on infusing the saline which is diluted with the methylene blue and you get a good blab. This can be different with the speedboat which has an inbuilt needle and assistant has to rotate the speedboat. It in the inverted position, the needle will come out and once your needle is in, which is 26 gauge, <clears throat> you raise the blab and after raising the blab, again the whole of the uh, catheter is changed and you do in oblique position. So different catheter has a different mechanism, so it should be in an oblique position. In the hybrid knife, you can give a small neck and from the same knife, you can do the submucosal incision. Routinely, we do a 23 gauge needle, but it can be done either with the hybrid knife, you don't require any needle or it can be done with the speedboat without using the needle. Now, if patient has a lot of submucosal fibrosis, then you have to choose which is the best area. You may fail sometime, like in this case, while injecting, because of the submucosal fibrosis, you are not able to raise the blab. And uh, in this condition, either you go a little bit below or use the contralateral side to get the good blab. Now, what is an ideal incision that is important? Once you have a good blab, by using the 
TT or hybrid knife give a clean 2 centimeter incision. Most importantly, it should be a clean cut 2 centimeter incision. Once you have given the good incision, second point come about the trimming. And what you do, you do the trimming of the sides as well as the apex. I personally feel the trimming of the apex is very important. And if your incision is good, it is easy to enter into the submucosal plane. And once you enter into the submucosal plane, your procedure is very good. So a good incision, which is clean cut, two centimeter trimming of the edges as well as trimming of the apex is mandatory. Sometime, if the incision is too deep, then there is a possibility that you are in the muscle, you are not getting the good blab. In the patient, long standing achalasia, there is a lot of mucosal fibrosis. In these conditions, you keep on incising on the superficial layer. So you should identify which is the thickened mucosa and what is the submucosa. Look at here, if you incise in this, you keep on rotating in the superficial layer, you have to go deep and give the incision. Like in this video, superficial incision lead to entry into the mucosa and the submucosa. This kind of incision should not be there, like this is the case, the, when the beginner was doing and you see the zigzag mucosal incision and you find there is a no straight line, the edges are not, in these cases it is difficult to close the defect also. So the mucosal incision should be clean, clean your edges, clean the apex and go into the submucosal plane rather than doing the zigzag. And what is best for this? You put your knife, make the big knob away and try to rot bring your scope down or the big wheel away from you. That is going to do. What the beginner generally do, they take out the needle and they try to pull the needle. In those situations, you will not get the good incision. Choose the relatively avascular area, as I said, either on the white light endoscopy or NBI on the RDI, because if the mucosal incision, you will find a lot of bleed. You keep on coagulating and your procedure is difficult. So always choose a uh, relatively a less vascular area. Sometimes, if the mucosal incision is not good, you keep on doing the uh, incising and you get a very long incision. This should always be avoided. Regarding the cautery setting, I think this is different. Uh, individual has a different priorities, but commonly used either you do a endocut Q or endocut I with the effect of two, cut duration three and cut interval three. Generally, in my practice, I do the endocut I or endocut Q. So ladies and gentlemen, to summarize, the mucosal incision is the most crucial step for the successful poem, and not only for the successful poem, also for the closer. If your incision is long, if it is rough, and the margins are not good, it is difficult to close, and you, you apply a lot of clips, and the post-procedure complication may happen. The proper planning is required before jumping into the procedures. You should always choose on the basis of manometry finding, on the basis of mucosal conditions. You place, you plan that are you doing the anterior, posterior, what is the mucosal healthy or unhealthy, and the RCT are needed to bring the modified mucosal incision because till now we are doing the uh, longitudinal incision, but if you want a T type of incision, then we require a more RCT to see that, which is the best technique for the easy entry and for the better closure. Thank you for the patience hearing. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Thanks for finishing in time. Uh, we are going to be joined by Dr. Mohan Ramchandani from Dinanath. Hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So, uh, let's start uh, talking about the subject as uh, it's in continuity. I think uh, once Rajesh told us about the mucosal incision, uh, we should also uh, go into the submucosal tunnel and we should be thankful to this guy, uh, Christopher Gustout, who in 2004 started this process. This is known as submucosal inside out proje project. So, there are two types of uh, endoscopist working in this era. Once uh, 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 the in Western side, uh, they saw Japanese doing good ESD and uh, West it was EMR which was more prevalent. So people were wanting that how they can improve their EMR. Uh, and then second group was notes uh, group where people wanted to go into the peritoneal space with, with a tunneling technique. So this gave rise to this tunneling technique and uh, uh, initially uh, the tunnel was made by injecting CO2 by needles or do a balloon dilatations. So the ultimate goal was to separate mucosa from the muscle so that the EMR guys could separate the mucosa and do ESD because they can have a mucosa separated from muscle and those who are interested in nodes can get rid of muscle, keep the mucosa intact. 
So that's why the nodes gradually vanished from the scene and it gave rise to the submucosal tunneling. And the submucosal tunneling initially uh, was very difficult because we used to make uh, an incision but it was very difficult for us to go into the tunnel and people started using balloon. You can see that's a, a balloon, CRE balloon which can be inserted into the, into the mucosal incision and dilate it. And once you dilate, you get a, a place where your scope can go into the tunnel. So th this is how uh, initially we used to do because there was uh, very difficult for us to know how to get into the tunnel. And gradually we learned that if you do a mucosal incision, don't start putting your scope into the tunnel. In fact, do a layer by layer dissection right at the mucosal incision because you have to do in a V fashion, you have to dissect on, onto the apex so that a trimming is done. And once trimming is done, it's very easy to insert the scope. So this uh, took us long to understand why this scope is not going into the tunnel. And again, for anterior poem, you can see you have to do not only the mucosal incision, but trimming. You can see this step looks very simple where you have to dissect at the apex, make some space for your scope to go in. You can see here I'm using that the conical cap which also makes it easy to insert into the, into the uh, tunnel. But if you don't do this and try to negotiate the scope forcibly like this, I'm not able to go, I'm pushing, pushing, pushing and then what I will do is I will cause a mechanical enlargement of this mucosal incision. And sometimes in my uh, experience, uh, I created mucosal incision which went up till to the G junction and I have to abandon the procedure. So uh, a proper trimming at the mucosal incision is key to enter into the submucosal tunnel. Now uh, once you are doing this, it's a cakewalk. But certain situations like submucosal fibrosis is a problem. Good, you can see here the mucosa is firmly attached to the muscle layer and it is not separable. So in such situation, good thing about POEM is that if there is a fibrous scar, you can go onto the bang opposite direction. You can see here we are trying to go into the anterior, posterior and then now below, slightly below. And once you do that, you have a lot of uh, spaces available. You can do posterior, anterior, uh, slightly below, slightly above so that you can get a proper uh, tunneling uh, place. Uh, another problem comes once there is a sigma. I, I know uh, Nila is talking about that but I'll share our experience how we negotiated tunnel in, in sigmoid, especially S2 variety of sigmoid. And you can see in our initial days, this is 2013 video, I'm trying to go into the, at the G junction, I'm making a tunnel, but I'm getting lost because uh, the, the, this tunnel is so wide that I'm, uh, I'm just getting lost. I'm do, I don't know where I'm going. But good thing about that was we are doing in the ERCP table and we saw when the scope, it goes laterally. So we want to go straight. So if you pass a guide wire into the lumen and straighten the scope, you can see in the tunnel, you sometimes can go into wrong direction. So I'm thinking I'm going towards the G junction, but this is wrong direction. But if you put a guide wire and straighten the scope, uh, the, the, the video which, which is here, you can see, uh, you can now straighten, you can see this is the place. That is not the place. So this is the place, but if you are in the tunnel and you don't have third eye, you may go into wrong direction. So you can correct your direction into the tunnel. And once you do that, you have a very good response in the form of barium emptying. The another problem in tunneling is once you're dealing with type three ecclesia cardia. And in such situations, sometimes the spasms are so severe that your scope will never go into the stomach. You can see here, people have used amyl nitrate once you are giving, uh, once your uh, anesthesiologist can give amyl nitrate. But what we uh, devised was pre-cut. We don't create tunnel, but we keep on cutting the muscle. So one step cut muscle, create a tunnel. Cut muscle, create a tunnel. So that's a stepwise method by which you can keep on going into the stomach. So don't lose, uh, don't, uh, try to negotiate forcibly your scope 
through the spastic G junction, cut the muscle, release the muscle and go into the tunnel. If you do that, you will achieve a fantastic response and you can see the time barium at one, one minute it was full and now it is completely empty. So this is the pre-cutting without doing the tunneling and you can go into the uh, tunnel. So once we have traveled through that, it's important to know whether you have reached to the G junction or not. So the G junction has got a peculiar uh, uh, vessel pattern. You can see these spindle vessels which are gastric cardiac vessels. So once they arrive, you know that it is G junction. And once you see aberrant longitudinal fibers, this is again a, 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 a matrix of G junction or large tortuous vessels. Again, you can see a big G junction. So this is how we, we know whether we are in G junction or not. And it's also important to understand the anatomy. If you are, a, if you are doing a poem, you should know what is posterior. This is posterior. And towards your right is the lesser curve. Towards your left is greater curve. This is anterior. There will be vagus. There will be right lung here, left lung here, aorta here. You can see once you are doing a tunneling, you, you will have a aorta on the left and then so it's important to understand the anatomy. If you're doing posterior poem, you are right on the thoracic duct and azygous vein. And also, if you want to go to the lesser curve, you have to go to the right. You can see here by this anatomy, if you want to go to the lesser curve, this is the lesser curve. So you have to go to the right. You don't have to go to the greater curve. If you go to greater curve, you will go to the angle of his. So if you go to angle of his here, you will cut the reflux, anti-reflux mechanism. So that's why it is important to know whether you have arrived to the GE junction and you have to keep right. In our Indian traffic, keep left. But on poem, keep right. Because if you keep right, you will come to the lesser curve and will not uh, injure the sling fiber. Why sling fibers? Because sling fibers are not driven by nitric oxide. Because in Ecclesia, there is a mismatch. There is no nitric oxide. So the major spasm is caused by class fiber. And there is loss of relaxation because of class fiber. Sling fibers only contribute to the maintenance of angle of his, not to the contraction. So no point in damaging sling fibers. So nitric fiber, oxide fibers are absent, which leads to increased tone at LES. It is only by class fibers. So class fibers are only on to the right, only on to the right. So keep right. So this is the uh, method by which we do keep right. I'm using this uh, new blade, which I'll be also showing this in morning. Once you reach to the G junction, keep right. I'll uh, quickly go to this. I'm not going into the left side. I'm exposing this. Uh, penetrating vessels. I am not cutting onto the left, but right of these penetrating vessels. And once you do that, you will have a good uh, cutting of class fibers onto the right, and you will have a no reflux, almost a nil reflux. Once you are doing a short myotomy, not going too deep into the stomach, keeping right of these penetrating vessels. You can see these are the two penetrating vessels. This is the G junction, you are out. So this is how we do that and also measure the gastric muscle length tunnel. You can see this is the scope diameter and this is the bluish discoloration of the tunnel into the stomach. So if your scope diameter is one centimeter, you can measure the depth of insertion into the stomach. Never go more than four centimeter. If you go more than four centimeter, you invariably cut the sling fibers. You can use the double channel technique, but always, always uh, go two centimeter in the stomach. Second penetrating vessel should be the stop point, And this is how, so in my talk, I, I not made a summary slide, but I told you about how the submucosal tunneling was evolved. What are the challenges, submucosal fibrosis, sigmoid, uh, the spastic nature of muscles in, in uh, uh, spastic disorders, then uh, how to identify the G junction, how to minimize the reflux by going right onto the laser curve, how to identify the structures. And with this, I'll end my talk and subsequently we may have more discussion. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Mohan. We'll now call Dr. Nilay Mehta. 
He'll speak to us on poem in sigmoid esophagus and epiphrenic diverticula. Dr. Nila is from Zydus Hospital, Ahmedabad. Uh, thank you, sir. So, basically, uh, we know epiprenic diverticulum is one of the three diverticuli we see in esophagus. One is uh, Zenka, the other one is mediesophageal, that is Rokitansi, and the third one is epiphrenic diverticulum. Most of these diverticuli are associated with esophageal motility disorders. In fact, in Achalasia, 3 to 7 percent of them, they will have having epiphrenic diverticulum. Most of them would be asymptomatic, but they may present with some symptoms like dysphagia, regurgitation, weight loss, pain, heartburn, and there would be overlap of these diverticular symptoms as well as achalasia symptoms. And m many of them are, in fact, due to achalasia rather than the diverticulum itself. Uh, traditional treatment is either a myotomy with, uh, with or without diverticulotomy, and that is by surgery. But now we know that POEM is also effective. So basically, this is an echelasia cardia. And you will see our epiprenic diverticulum over here, which would be in lower esophagus. And that can be easily and uh, very effectively treated by POEM. Uh, you can do either normal POEM or, as I can, I'm showing over here, a septotomy. So what is, this is the esophageal lumen, and this is the diverticulum, and this is the septum. And this is what is important, that if you want to do a septotomy, you have to go into the path of a septum. So what I am doing right now is, uh, so septum is somewhere over here, and I'm doing a lateral dissection, lateral to the septum. You can also continue with your esophageal tunnel and complete the esophageal tunnel going across the GE junction and into the stomach and then come back and then do dilatation. But normally I do it well when I reach the diverticulum. That is what is done. I'm sorry about it. So after that dissection is done, uh, we proceed towards the and. Uh, completing the tunnel, and you can see a diverticulum over here. This is prolapsing mucosa, and you have to be extremely cautious, otherwise you can do perforation. And then we start doing myotomy. Again, the same principle, you go uh, do normal myotomy, and then you do a septotomy. So there is a diverticulum, this is a septum. Uh, so again, few people, so you keep on cutting septum, and then join the myotomy, what you've done over here and then continue with your, once the septum, so this is the last part of the septotomy, and once it is done, you can see the prolapsing mucosa is out of the field, and now you can continue with your normal uh, myotomy and going into the stomach. You can also complete the normal myotomy and then do septotomy, and this is what you see at the end of the procedure. This is a diverticulum, which is almost gone, uh, uh, and there is no septum in between. And this is what is seen on endoscopy. There is no diverticulum over here. So if there is a large diverticulum, there will be diverticulum, but because there is no septum, now patient will not have symptoms because of that. It is pretty effective, and this is what it shows. Uh, it is effective up to 900% in most of the series, except one series. So uh, uh, I think POEM is the way to go. There are proponents that, as you can see over here, that they did only myotomy and no septotomy, and that is also effective. The other uh, part of the talk is sigmoid diverticulum, and we know that sigmoid diverticulum is S1 and S2. Mainly, it's a CT uh, classification. If you see two, two lumens in one CT uh, scan uh, plane, then it's S2. Uh, uh, poem in sigmoid diverticulum is effective. Uh, so what are the options for sigmoid diverticulum? Either surgery or POEM. Traditionally, it is lap heller with anti-reflux measure, and sometimes it is very long-standing echelasia, and it's a very advanced echelasia, then probably you need esophagectomy. But POEM is also effective, in fact, very effective in treating this condition. But there are caveats. First, it's a difficult entry, and Rajesh showed us how difficult the entry can be. And sometimes because the mucosa, and why would you have this difficulty is because it's a long-standing echelasia. There is a lot of inflammation going into the esophagus. The, the mucosa and muscle are stuck together and there is uh, a negligible submucosa. There is a lot of fibrosis. There is a lot of neovascularization. So difficult entry, no cushioning of submucosa or loose areolar tissue. So it hinders the internaling. A lot of inflammation, neovascularization, bleeding. And sometimes, 
you think you are into the uh, submucosa but in fact you are doing your dissection between the circular muscle and longitudinal muscle so in fact when you do myotomy circular muscle is still there and it is attached to the mucosa also there are many angulations and you have to be aware of it while doing submucosal tunneling because those angulations will give you false idea that you cross G junction in fact you are still in the esophagus and then you think that you cross G junction and then that you will have failed poem also you've done everything but the mucosa is so thick it's so inflamed that closure sometimes it's very difficult and because of the angulation there are the gas get stepped into two angulation and you have gas related complication so this is one of the case you can see uh, this is after clearing of the esophagus why dial uh, esophagus and then there are angulations and actually the g junction dips down as you can see over here so basic and it's extremely difficult to even to go across the g junction because of the angulation you think the g junction is somewhere over here no it is here because it's th that's the norm in sigmoid diverticulum so what would you do if you find this? First, clean esophagus. See what are the angulations. Three, see with, whether you have candida or ero e erosive esophagitis. So if there is candida, you have to treat candida. And the most important thing, don't do poem right now. Put a rice tube, put a NG tube, give feeding, and that you have to do it anything between one to four weeks, depending on what you have it in uh, 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 esophagus. And this is how we do sigmoid, as you can see over here. So I actually injected over here. Nothing went over here. Everything went back. So either I can do incision over here or incision over here. But I know there was, because mucosal changes were saying that there was a lot of fibrosis, I thought I'll just continue with the same. And this is what happens when you continue at the same place. So I, I do a mucosal entry. And what you see is fibrosis, no muscle, no loose area tissue of submucosa, you see fibrosis. So what are the options? As my previous speakers told you, you can change the incision site, but I persisted with the same incision site and you can do it. How do you do it? You have to cut the, that fibrosis like this over the muscle. No, inject, um, no injection related insufflation, but then also you can cut this fibrosis fiber for fiber as you can see over here, very cautious. And then you see muscle, and what you see is this is mucosa, that is superficial mucosa, and this is deep submucosa. Uh, this is superficial mucosa, deep mucosa. And it, because the deep mucosa was attached, it was stuck with the muscle layer, this is what you see. So what I'm trying to do is now I'm cleaning up the, that deep submucosal mucosa from the muscle. Again, no uh, adequate uh, uh, submucosal uh, uh, cushioning but then also you, you can do it very cautiously muscle mucosa you have to be very cautious everything is fibrous and you keep on doing it and then after some time you will get submucosal plane over here and so now I'm getting sub submucosal plane as you can see over here muscle mucosa and now I have a proper submucosal plane other thing what you get is angulation so you have to always follow your circular muscles because circular muscles are going to give you guide otherwise you'll get lost you'll get lost into the esophagus the other problem you get it is at the g junction as you can see over here and there the the the, the sigmoid can dip like this and you have to be extremely cautious otherwise you can have mucosal perforation and the last part is closure because that is also not easy Thick mucosa and normal clips would not do. You need big wide mucosa or sometimes you have to just hold the mucosa with the muscle. But if we were fortunate to uh, complete the mucosal incision over here. And it is effective. It is effective to the tune of 90%. So both achalasia with epiprenic diverticulum and sigmoid achalasia are difficult situations. Poem with or without septotomy is the treatment of choice for epiprenic diverticulum. For sigmoid esophagus, poem may be challenging. There are technical difficulties, but it is doable and it has excellent uh, uh, efficacy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nile. Join on the stage. We call Dr. Gaurav Patil from Reliance Mumbai. He's going to speak to us on securing the tunnel, tips on effective mucosal closure. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. At uh, the outset, I want to, to thank Dr. Bapai for this invitation and congratulate the entire team at uh, Pune for this wonderful conference. Uh, so my talk is very limited to uh, effective mucosal closure, one of the key steps of um, uh, completing your poem. 
So the safety of any submucosal tunneling endoscopy lies in the health of the mucosal flap valve and closure of the mucosal incision that you're performing. What it does, it ensures that you're, you have closed the defect and you also are preventing any contamination of the deeper structures, preventing uh, mediastinitis or peritonitis in case of GPOM. Today, almost all 95 to almost all incisions can be closed with the help of endoscopic hemoclips and sometimes some rescue techniques may be required. And these could be using clips with the help of line technique, clips with the loops uh, suturing, or with the 3-0 polypropylene sutures that we have the overstitch device today and the helix extract uh, uh, system. So there are some standard steps of uh, closure. Uh, so as a beginner, you would want to use clips which are easily rotatable. They can rotate in a 360 degree axis, which can open and close easily. And they have a one-to-one -one movement with the, with, with the assistant opening and closing. Today, there are clips which are uh, uh, of different sizes, right from 11 mm to 20 mm, as we saw yesterday. So the most important thing is you align the clip at the apex of the inc incision. You open the clip and the jaws have to be open such that the jaws are perpendicular to the desired line of closure. And this is very important as you can see in this video. So once you align the jaws of the clip perpendicular to the mucosal incision, you apply a gentle suction. And once you are sure that the mucosa is caught between the jaw, you ask your assistant to fire the clip. Many a times while doing this procedure, the mucosal edges can be inverted. One edge may fall below the other. At this time, you want the assistant to open the clip, realign the, uh, the, the clip, use the big wheel and the small wheel of your scope, align your scope along the exact perpendicular to the mucosal incision, and then achieve a closure. Uh, th this is again two videos showing uh, the, the similar steps of uh, uh, closure, where uh, you, you're seeing the clip is open at the uh, perpendicular to the mucosal incision and after you are opening you are uh, sucking out the mucosa making sure the entire mucosa is within the clip you would, you want to make a uh, sort of a, uh, you know a fake pass just hold the mucosa and then uh, see if you've captured both the mucosal edges and then achieve a closure at the end you want a linear mucosal incision closed in, in such a fashion However, there are pitfalls in, in this closure, primarily because most of our endoscope, all endoscopic techniques, there is no counter traction to the mucosa. As a result, you can have sometimes inversion of the mucosa, as Dr. Nilay showed, that uh, sigmoid esophagus are very difficult to uh, uh, close, and sometimes one of the edges can just start overlapping and prevent an effective closure. Sometimes because of uh, coagulation current or because of uh, unhealthy some, uh, mucosa, uh, the, the edges can be ragged, the, the, the lamina propria and the muscularis mucosa start to get separated from each other, and in this uh, photos I can see, and many a time there is narrow space in spastic esophagus of agus or in Z poems. So here is a case where this is a hypercontractile esophagus, the type 3. You can see the muscularis mucosa is separated from the uh, superficial mucosa. We're trying to close. We already uh, failed two passes to uh, apply the second clip over here. We think we have closed the mucosa, but I, uh, I wasn't very sure because we, uh, I was missing the left edge. I asked the assistant to open and I, I was seeing I was actually holding the muscle and the right edge of the clip. So what do we do? We go back, we pull our scope back, we go to a space which is relatively more wider, more roomy, and then realign the clip, go more distally, and then you, you uh, catch the mucosa on, on both the edges. And as you can see, this is a very spastic esophagus, absolutely no room. Here again, now I ask my assistant, I move my big wheels down, small wheel to my left, and then I suck. I do not fire immediately, I give some CO2, and now I fire the clip. And, and this is how uh, sometimes uh, achieving closure can be easy with shorter clips. It's not like you just have a wide clip, it's important, but you also important to have smaller clips in, in your armamentarium, like in this case, uh, where some edges were left. So we change the type of the clip. Here we are using the easy clips, and uh, again, we are lining the jaws of the clips perpendicular to mucosal incision, and then we are firing the clip over the mucosal incision. So you need to know which types of clips to use, when to use, what type of clips, and all depend upon the case-to-case, -case, uh, depending on the type of incision and the uh, space that you have. 
Another important and very simple technique is the clip and line technique, and uh, uh, we've never be used this technique in our uh, practice, but of course, uh, uh, there are a lot of publications on it. So in this, uh, you apply a li line on the clip outside the scope, you take the clip into the esophagus, apply one clip on the distal end, one clip on the proximal end, and you just apply gentle traction to this clip. What it ha helps is approximate the mucosal edges close to each other, and then you can apply effective uh, closure, right? from distal to proximal. A similar technique can be done with the loop. You apply the loop on the, uh, on the distal most end, you can see a very uh, unhealthy uh, mucosal incision here, and then start applying loop, uh, apply the clips on the apex, and then uh, start uh, applying clips on either side to achieve a good mucosal closure. In cases of Z-POEM, and uh, as you can see, there's a very narrow space, so you want to use clips which have a very short handle. You want to start with distally and then start uh, closure up to the proximal end in such cases. Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, the, uh, the era of um, um, Z-POEM has been evolving, and we've started doing something called as uh, mucosotomy after a Z-POEM. So after you do a septotomy, uh, you close the mucosal incision proximal and distally, and with the help of a knife or a uh, cutting uh, 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 grasper, you end up cutting the mucosal septum. So here we are using the sumitomo forceps, and we are cutting the mucosa septum. So you're doing a mucosotomy over over this, uh, uh, after closing the uh, incision, and after you do a mucosotomy, then you have a closure. So this is something which was done in the last uh, two years at our center, and over the last one year, in the last six months rather, we've done cases that we call as open ZPO, and as yesterday Professor Kashab showed you, that we, after performing a septotomy, we opened the entire mucosal incision right up to two to three centimeter below the septum, and we just uh, wait and watch for this patient. These patients, so far, whatever cases we've done, none of these patients have developed any leaks or mediastinitis, and on day two, we do a contrast study to see if there is any leak and start the patients of diet. Obviously, something that has to be uh, studied in the near future. What about uh, suturing? We have uh, techniques with uh, both the overstitch device and the X-Tax. x, -tax. x -tax is something new, and this is a uh, video from Dr. Kashab. These are tacks with, uh, made up of stainless steel. They are 5 mm in size. They have a driver uh, within it, and with the help of a drilling mechanism, you can help and secure the mucosa into the, these tacks. After you secure the mucosa, you want to pull back the stack to make sure that there is enough engagement, and you want to start uh, applying these sutures in, in a running suture fashion. And after you apply these sutures, similar to the overstitch device, there is a cinching mechanism. You apply pressure, gentle pressure on the suture line, and then you cinch these tags to achieve a good closure. Nowadays, there are enough uh, uh, evidence coming up with the closure of mucosal incision with hemoclips or closure with uh, overstitch suturing or tag system. Both have been found to be effective in closure of the mucosal incision. The time for such overstitch suturing is slightly high, and the costs are um, definitely higher. So to conclude, effective mucosal closure is a key step after you achieve a good myotomy and hemostasis. A good adept knowledge of how to use your through the scopes clips is very important. How to maneuver your scopes is important. Knowing which clip to use in which situation. Rescue techniques with loops and lines are extremely useful. And suturing is promising in expert hands. And my mentor, Dr. Maidev, always mentions a good mountaineer is one who knows his way back home very safely. So it's not how fast you reach the summit, but how easily and smoothly you can come out is, uh, is a key to such procedures. Thank you. Yeah. Toro, join us on the stage. We have 10 minutes for discussion. Short questions. Yeah. Uh, any question from the house right now? OK, I want to ask Dr. Moon one question. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So once there is inversion of the mucosa, once you're applying the clip, uh, you showed in your lecture, how to go forward with it once there's an inversion? A very short answer. Uh, it's a good question. So you want to make sure that which clip was the mucosa inverted? Has it started right at the beginning or is it at towards the very end? So if it's at the beginning, you have two options. You either remove the clip or you can just take the second clip, you use a small wheel of the, the, the scope, and you try to push the, the mucosa which is everted. You try to push the mucosa uh, towards the, the side where it, where, where it is up, and thereby creating a suction and uh, lifting the right mucosa. So this is a technique which uh, involves movement of the scope with your small wheels, 
and the movement of your clips by side. Sometimes, as I showed in the video, you would want to start closure distally if the mucosa is starting to get inverted. So apply one clip right at the distal most part, I'm um, sorry, the proximal most part, and then you start closure uh, in such cases. What would be the site of mucosal injection in presence of sigmoid esophagus? It should be all about the bend, acute bend. Yeah. So uh, most of the times you avoid the acute bend. Uh, you have to have most of the time incision is in the dilated segment, but don't keep it over the band. Don't keep it too long also, otherwise you get lost. And most of them are like advanced achalasia. You don't need a big myotomy in esophagus. What you need to cut open is that the last angulation or last one or two angulation and the G junction and you are done. So even four or five centimeter myotomy in esophagus is good enough. Uh, and of course one or two in the stomach. We can avoid the acute angulation, go proximal to the G junction. That will be suffice. Acute angulation, uh, so you want me to do my incision just above the G junction, that's what you're, no, I, I, I would at least keep four or five centimeter away, uh, above the G junction and try to find the best place. Nila, okay. I have to make one point in this. Uh, uh, if you are uh, having a sigmoid esophagus, one should understand that clinical response is not as good as technical response. That happens because if you are not able to straighten the esophagus, yesterday we saw how uh, myotomy can help us in straightening the stomach, uh, which was uh, secretized because of some uh, uh, post sleeve. Uh, similar thing can happen in esophagus also. If you do a short myotomy, there will be a good response, but you are not able to straighten the esophagus. But if you above, start above the level of angulation, I know that's going to be difficult, but if you can do myotomy of that angle, that straighten the esophagus a lot and we have published about that and uh, to have a proper uh, knowledge about the pathway, you can use ancillary test uh, like uh, fluoroscopy, guide wire technique. So tunneling is difficult proximally, but ultimate response may be better. But I agree with Nila, in most of the cases it is okay if you do a short 4 to 5 centimeter myotomy. But the clinical response is not equal Mo to technical Mo response in that. But isn't it the angulations are ma most of the times in lower esophagus and you have to take care of that lower esophageal angulation. That's what I told him that you just can't G junction, cut G junction. You have exactly. to take the lower one or two angulations into account. You can't just let them go. Yes. Actually, so the most important is your incision should not be at the angulation. If you can't avoid angulation, you do proximal to that. If you can avoid and you have a good length of the esophagus, then you can do below this. But it, the incision size should not be on the angulation, otherwise entry into the submucosa is difficult and your procedure will not be completed. My another question to Dr. Vikas, in presence of candidial esophagitis, how long we have to wait and whether it's a matter of the Corsi classification? So normally I wait at least for one to two weeks. The case I showed, I had to wait for three weeks. So it depends on how bad is the esophagus. You have to take care of candida, you have to take care of inflammation. And uh, Rajesh, when I finished my talk, he asked me, will it reduce fibrosis? No, it will not, but it will definitely reduce inflammation and your subsequent procedure would be much smoother than what you would have had it uh, without uh, subsi subsiding the inflammation. Even presence of Corsi grade one, we can, uh, should wait for two weeks or we can wait for around four or five days and can go ahead with point. Yeah, so that's what I say. It's not, it's grade one. You can, uh, then you can even straight away go ahead, but normally you have to wait for a week. So what we take the question from the back. Yeah, if you have a coronary artery disease patient on dual antiplatelets, as Dr. Vikas told, uh, we'll, uh, we can do the procedure on aspirin. So what is your personal experience on patients on dual antiplatelets and uh, uh, if you do a poem, when do you start the second antiplatelet and what are the chances you anticipate the complications of a tunnel hematoma happening in these patients, if any? Uh, so we have to understand poem and ESD, they are two different things. So whenever patient is on dual antiplatelet, we stop one and patient can continue on the ecosprin. And uh, in the end, we close the tunnel. There is no exposure of the vessels to the food or the, uh, the acid. So there is likely to be late uh, vascular erosion or the bleed in these patients because you are protecting the vessel with the mucosal closure incision. So whenever you're doing poem in these patients, please uh, coagulate all the visible vessel in the tunnel. That way the risk of bleeding can be reduced and the second agent can be started after 48 hours. Dr. Lalit. 
And yes, one sir. more important thing is, it will, you have to prioritize. If a patient has a recent PTCA, you can't stop it. So you have to prioritize. If you feel that patient is on elderly person, diabetic, and taking the Ecosprin without any reasons, then definitely you should stop. Better is to stop antiplatelet agent, but if you can't, then you continue Ecosprin. And the second will depend again on the type of the cardiac problem. Even if the patient is at the mechanical valve, you may have to start after six to eight hours also. Uh, uh, Dr. Nilay, so, I wanted to ask one more question is that uh, you talked about uh, mucosal edema being and the unhealthy mucosa being a, being a problem when you are trying to do mucosal incisions or whatever. It's not just a mucosal edema, it's <coughs> just overall inflammation. Yes, yes. So in those situations, as you said, that let's say we have to keep the patient, I mean defer the surgery for let's say one to four weeks, place a, 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 a RT and do that. In those situations, sometimes what we do is uh, instead of an RT, keeping for a longer time, we inject Botox at the bay, uh, at the G junction, allow it to open up for a while so that the stasis goes away and then uh, we uh, plan the surgery. Do yeah, you but think about uh, that? first of all, it's an additional uh, cost. Second one is it may make more fibrosis. Botox injection is known to cause fibrosis. Otherwise, also in sigma, it's difficult uh, at G junction because the esophagus suddenly dips it, and then you have more fibrosis. So I, I wouldn't do that. No, uh, I want to ask you one question. In, in wanting to keep to the right, do you always try to identify the two penetrating vessels? That's question number one. And you cut the, uh, you coagulate the vessels and keep right or you preserve the vessels and keep right? So, uh, gradually uh, we have uh, noticed that if you are at, uh, as soon as you come to the G junction and you try to go at uh, 3 o'clock position, you need not to expose the vessel and always trying to expose vessel doing a wide uh, you know submucosal tunneling in the stomach may be associated with more complication in the form of uh, uh, bleeding uh, better is to not try to do that but once you are beginning for two three cases you may do that but if you are at three o'clock position invariably you are away from sling fibers and two, if your depth is less than four centimeter, you never severe the sling fibers. So if you follow this dictum, you, you need not to expose the penetrating vessels. And vessels are very important for mucosal integrity, so I never coagulate them. If there is inadvertent partial injury, I will definitely coagulate them because it may cause delayed bleeding. But if they are not injured and they are healthy, I never coagulate them. Uh, just so just to take this uh, uh, thing about unhealthy mucosa, so we had a couple of patients in which we put in a Riles tube, gave wash, uh, didn't really come back to normal, put in a nasogegenal tube, three weeks feeding, NBM, still not uh, getting a really good healthy mucosa. So in two patients, we've uh, gone ahead and done a PEG and keep the PEG in C2 for two months, give entirely feedings through the PEG. And in both patients, the mucosa turned out to be very healthy at the end of two months, and we could do good, good poem. So I agree. Uh, these are the different methods. Somebody put the lukewarm water to drink the patient. Somebody yeah. will put the Riles tube. As my colleague said, Botox or the PEG. The most important thing is you have to divert. Once you divert, there is a time for the mucosa to heal, and then you can proceed with the procedure. It's a good idea that you can uh, do in case you get unhealthy mucosas despite uh, waiting for uh, We have also done in one of the patients. Yeah. Uh, the good the results. Patient. Yeah. Yeah. If there is a, a great difficulty in closing the mucosal incision, sometimes we can clip the underlying muscle with the mucosa so as to close the opening of the submucosal tunnel. What is your opinion about that? Uh, so, uh, gener generally, we try to avoid clipping the muscle and the mucosa together. We try to get both the mucosal edges together. But it, if it's still difficult, I think using a, a line or a loop technique is much easier and uh, much safer than clipping the muscle. The issue with the muscle is you can tear away the muscle. These clips have sharp edges and these clips can tear the mu muscle instead of actually closing it. You can start, start creating more and more uh, deeper cuts into the muscle. And in the video you saw what was happening is we were trying to close. We were thinking we are getting the left edge of the mucosa, but we were actually creating holes into the muscle. But yes, if you are quite sure that that's uh, helping you out, yeah, you can try. We thank the speakers as well as the moderators for this lively discussion. Thanks to the floor too. And now we are going to live to Dinanath. There will be a change of moderators and may I please call the
moderators for the live demonstration, Dr. Chalapati Rao from Vishakapatnam, Dr. Zubin Sharma, Medanta, Dr. Bhushan Pandit from Thane, Dr. Advai Aher from Nashik. The chairpersons will be Dr. Praveen Suryavanshi, Aurangabad, Dr. Kapil Jamwal, Gurgaon, Dr. Hussain Bohari, Nashik, and Dr. Saransh Jain from Bhopal. Dr. Prasad Ayer, you could please join me on the... Yeah. How are you, sir? Great, sir. The talk, sir. Uh, can we start presenting the case, sir? Yeah, you can, I think. Good morning, all. Uh, so, we'll be starting with the first case today. This is a 15-year-old girl who uh, has a history of constipation since childhood. She is anema and laxative dependent. An anorectal manometry performed in the past showed absent of rectoanal inhibitory reflex. Uh, the rectal EMR biopsies, uh, which were taken at different uh, locations, showed uh, absent ganglion cells from 10 centimeter, 7 centimeter, 5 centimeter, and 3 centimeter biopsies and the immunohistochemistry showed calretinin negative. So a diagnosis of Hirschsprung's disease was made. This is a representative barium enema image which was done in this patient uh, which we can see on the right. So uh, we would like to show you a, a demonstration of how the EMR biopsies were performed because uh, this is often required for the confirmation of the diagnosis of Hirschsprung's disease. So, as we can see, uh, this is the case. Uh, learning objective for this case would be demonstration of per rectal endoscopic myotomy or the PREM procedure. Over to you, sir. Good morning, everybody. Sanjay Prasad, yeah, can you see audible. us? Yeah. You are audible. Yeah. Okay, so welcome once again from Good the morning. Dinanath uh, uh, Shivanand Desai Center at Dinanath Mangeshkar. And, uh, our entire team is over here and we will start uh, the proceedings, the live uh, cases today. So we are starting with this case, Rohan has shown you the history. So this girl has had constipations since her neonatal period and uh, however the constipation was probably mistreated or whatever uh, using uh, laxatives and enemas. But she was never worked up till about 15 years old and now we have found that she, is, she has her strokes. So as Rohan showed you the, you know, the video of the EMR biopsies, the CAP EMR biopsies are very important not only to confirm the diagnosis of her strokes but also to map the aganglionic segment. And that is the reason we need to take uh, multiple biopsies serially starting from the dilated segment and going distally up to almost the anal verge. <coughs> the distal three centimeters of the anal canal is usually there is a physiological aganglionosis. So that we should always keep in mind when we are making a diagnosis of Hirschsprung's. But otherwise this is how it is and <coughs> here I put the scope in, you are getting the endoscopy image. So these are the biopsy scars that you can see and I have with me over here Pankaj. So Pankaj is going to help me with this case and uh, we are going to be doing this together because uh, I will probably start off but then I will ask Pankaj to take over at some point in time because I will also have to go to the other rooms to make sure that uh, you know just for coordination. So that is how it is. So <clears throat> one of the important things is we plan to do the pr procedure the myotomy has to be posterior because the posterior rectal uh, space is relatively avascular and there are no, uh, you know, uh, any major structures posteriorly, so it's relatively safe area. And with, we usually, we would use a gastroscope, so the up wheel of the gastroscope is quite, uh, you know, that angle is much more than the down wheel. So because of that, we put this patient in a jackknife prone position and you can see the patient's position over here. She is in a prone jackknife position and we are going to be doing the procedure in this. The advantage of this, this position is that the buttocks can be spread apart 
and you can you get a good view of the entire and manipulation of the, the scope in this uh, position so one of the tricks is you have to make sure that you are going in the di correct direction because otherwise uh, you can uh, go in another direction so what i'm doing over here is i'm turning the scope around like this so that i am getting a uh, exact up direction over here and this is the dentate line that you can see now i'm using the x1 scope the 1500 scope from olympus and you can see that the vision of the scope is fantastic and this is of course as as we go along you will also uh, yesterday some uh, you know we demonstrated the rdi technology in this and today also we will demonstrate the other technologies like the txi technology and everything so can we have the uh, can you hold the scope please i will have someone to hold the scope because i want the scope to be in a exactly up direction over here like this because that will give me a good direction of the this thing so the injection has to be just submucosal and just inside the dentate line Yes. I have uh, read and heard of a lot of uh, issues about perforations being caused when taking biopsies. So can you Needle? suggest some tricks or some uh, points to avoid that perforation? Yeah, inject. Yeah, so... One, I think uh, you also had one recently. Yeah. So you can get a perforation, particularly in Young very, small very ki uh, small kids. Because one has to be very careful about the amount of suction that we use during when we are performing the CAP EMR. Because you have to be in the deep submucosa. But at any point in time, if you doubt that you have gone, you are in the, there is a little bit of muscle that is being shaved, then one should always put clips over there and make sure that that area is secured. Otherwise, you can land up in a delayed perforation and these perforations are you know quite bad to treat basically because what happens is Amol if yeah. uh, Pankaj is wearing a mic it, we couldn't hear him he was yeah. speaking to you can you hear me now no no it's still faint okay they are doing yeah. something better better okay okay and yeah. up so, uh, at any point in time, if we are during biopsies, if we are doubt, if we are concerned about the integrity, then one should use clips to close the defect, and that is absolutely valid. Inject. Yeah. So that so is the point. Yeah. Despite you know our best intentions, the scope turned around a little bit, and my first injection was a little bit more lateral. So I am correcting the direction again. And I'm making an injection over here, back, needle back. Uh, Dr. Amul, with your permission, can we present the case for the other room? Yes, yes. Okay, you can go Thank ahead. You. you will Thank be you. showing, uh, we are starting. We'll be going this thing. Yes, sir. We'll keep watching you. We are now starting the case in room four. Good morning, everyone. For the second case of the day, we have a 58-year-old gentleman presenting with a history of dysphagia and regurgitation for the past four years. Gastroscopy was suggestive of, suggestive of achalasia cardia and we could see a large epiphrenic diverticulum as shown in the image here. Manometry showed generalized failure of peristalsis on all wet swallows, suggestive of type 1 achalasia cardia. Uh, so we are going to demonstrate deep OM in this case using speedboat technology. Over to you, sir. Uh, Dr. Mohan? Yes, good, we are good morning. On. Uh, so, at the outset, I thank Amol for uh, giving me this opportunity to work uh, in this prestigious institute along with a uh, great team. Dr. Rajendra is here, Vilas. Uh, so, this case, as you saw, is a case of uh, epiphrenic diverticulum. So, one should uh, differentiate between a diverticulum which is caused by the uh, pulsion versus traction. So here there is a problem at LES. You can see it's not allowing my scope to go with a sudden, some push. It may go. 
but I don't want to injure the mucosa also. You can see it's a very tight LES and you may go, okay, that's into the stomach. So there is no tumor over there. But this is so spastic that it has led to formation of this uh, diverticulum. Uh, Nilay was talking about a technique where you can do a LES myotomy and this uh, diverticulum may be, uh, become non-functional. But still we find some patients who come to us with uh, uh, accumulation of food residues. Yeah. And then uh, even if there is a good passage here, you may have a regurgitation. So presently we follow that. We have not only to do this myotomy, go into the stomach, but also uh, do a Z poem type technique to cut this septum, which is a bridge between the diverticulum on the right and the esophageal lumen on the left. So uh, this is the plan. We will do uh, a poem, but we'll include this septum in our pathway so that we can expose the diverticulum lumen on one side and the esophageal lumen on the other side. Uh, so we'll start from here. Uh, type 2 achalasia does not require very long myotomy. So the plan is to start uh, 3 to 4 centimeter ahead of the diverticular septum. Keep going like this. Uh, tunnel so, along the right, uh, margin of the diverticulum, go into the stomach. Meanwhile, expose this septum. So the direction of your tunneling will be towards the diverticulum? Towards the diverticulum. It should not enter into the yeah. diverticulum. At the edge of the diverticulum. Edge of the diverticulum. And the other thing which we are going to do is use a new technology. This is known as a speed boat uh, technique where the bipolar device. So now we are having, can you, can you show this on camera please? You can see here, this is the uh, bipolar device. And the good thing about it is uh, the lectures on electrosurgery will be gone because we will not be talking about spray coagulation, endocut, True cut, true, uh, we have only one generator with Creo Medical, which has only got one setting. There are no other settings. So we have to go to the RS2. We have to go RS2, yes, and then uh, we can select this. And then we are selecting this instrument, and that's it. So we are ready to go uh, because we don't have to do endocut 2, 1, 3 or nothing like that, one sitting. And then this is a bipolar device. There is no requirement of no uh, pad attached no to pad the patient. Because this instrument works from very close circuit. There are two margins. Can you ex show this? I will show on the, on the endoscope also. So the current will flow from upper margin to lower margin. It will not travel through the body. So the amount of current required is very less. Say for example in monopolar device 2000 volt and here only 20 volt. So uh, there is no collateral damage. So we, are, we were looking for bipolar device in flexible endoscopy. They were available with all the uh, uh, laparoscopy or rigid devices but not with flexible endoscopy. So with flexible endoscopy we are now using this device. So this device, one is bipolar and two, it has integrated everything like a needle. Can you show us the needle with us? You see that that's a needle there and then there is a, uh, a coagulation by, uh, uh, the cutting is by radio frequency ablation and uh, we will start this procedure by injection now, out, needle out. Mohan? Yes. Does the direction of your diverticulum decide uh, where you go to make your uh, incision? incision? Of course, yes, yes. We so, saw that. So, so, uh, so how do you change it? Suppose uh, it's on the left, the diverticular opening is on the left. What do you do? Where do you choose an anterior approach? Yeah. What's so the, uh, most of the uh, diverticulum which we have done till now mostly comes on the right. So posterior approach is perfectly fine. But suppose it is on the other side we may change the position of the patient like we do in ESD and align it so that it comes to the therapeutic channel. Like this, uh, if I want to do, uh, stop, so needle in. So if I want to do here, it will be so difficult for me to do tunneling. So I change the position and do this and bring it to the therapeutic channel. Therapeutic channel is 7 o'clock 
and my working place is 5 o'clock. That is the best. So I align by changing the position of the patient. So now we have gone a good uh, uh, in elevation. elevation and now we will cut. So the cutting cannot be done by supine position. So this is supine. So Vilas will have, I uh, will tell him vertical, so he will just move like this. So this Make rotates 360 degrees. Yeah. So we have to do vertical. So I will put uh, some tension there and uh, create a hole. And now I will increase this uh, incision towards the, uh, uh, to the anal side. So create a good hole and insinuate your, this one. And I can see a vessel, so I'll not, I'll put the coagulation a minute and then I will keep on cutting like this. Mohan, this device can actually be put through just a diagnostic scope, yes? No, that's a very important point, yeah. uh, Dr. Prasad Ayer, that this device is under evaluation like the human race. It started with 3.2, uh, 3.7 channel. Now we have 3.2 channel. So it is coming up, 2.8 channel is coming up. So gradually it is getting miniaturized. You can see nice clean cut. Yes. So don't jump again. I will say that we will do the trimming now. See that? So I will trim. So you are using a therapeutic scope then? Therapeutic scope, yes. Okay. Very Thank important you. point. So I will just right. see that. I will trim, 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 trim. Don't jump. So suck out. Not a big incision. Again on the this side, trim. So make a ledge. Yeah, ledge. Like this. Don't injure the muscle. Ledge. Yes. Ledge. See that? Spend some good one minute to make some space for you. Don't jump. See that? Now we are again. Now I'll make a ledge here. This is also muscularis mucosi. So now once I have got this and I will see. Now I'm using therapeutic channel. So I may enlarge the mucosal incision by a millimeter to go nicely. Can you make it vertical again? So once you are tunnel, you have to rest this uh, on the muscle. But once you want to do the mucosal incision or muscle incision, I'll ask Vilas to do vertical. Give a vertical incision a millimeter like this and that's it. So now we'll try to dip in. See that? It's so easy. Yeah, you entered. Gone. So, so this is a one of the best uh, uh, position. Like once I started doing colonoscopy, I used to see transverse colon. That means very good because I have done almost the hard work to negotiate the sigmoid loops and all. And poem, if you see this, you are almost satisfying. half done. You are satisfied. So this is one of the satisfying picture. So now once you are in the tunnel, now it's like you have to do onto the right dissection and on to the left dissection. So it looks like Mohan, the, the speed boat, the knife is really just on the edges. Yes. yes. And yes. the undersurface of the, of the knife is really not conducting any electricity. So you so have I think a little that bit is a of safety. Layer, right? So in fact, this yeah. knife was made for ESD, yeah. where we are not supposed to injure deeper, the muscle layer. Dish. Yes. Yeah. So you can see right. now you can uh, rest yeah. onto the hull yeah. Uh, hull on the muscle and keep the distance between the accessory and uh, how, uh, is constant and then I uh, will ask, he will, will ask to do right up, right up, so right up and then I will be able to cut right up more. Right, Dr. Mohan, we will keep watching you, we will get back to you on the audio, mm -hmm. sir. Okay. Uh, Dr. Amol, we are back with you. Okay. So. I am sure you all, you all must have seen, we started the mucosal incision and I don't know whether you noticed, I took a horizontal incision and as compared to what Mohan did uh, in poem, we take a vertical incision, nice. Uh, but here we take a horizontal incision because we want to, you know, perform the myotomy right up to the anal verge and we have to include the internal anal sphincter. And if you perform a vertical incision, you lose about two centimeters of the mucosal incision where you can't perform the myotomy. So part of the internal anal sphincter might be left behind and then that can cause problem. Back. So after that, I've made this tunnel and as uh, we saw in the EMR biopsies, 10 centimeters was the 
the proximal most point where there were there were ganglia so we have to go up to 10 centimeters and uh, because uh, otherwise we will not be able to you know cover the area so the idea is to perform a myotomy going up to the ganglionic segment and starting from the ganglionic segment right what do you think pankaj i think uh, yeah i think you will have to take a uh, couple of centimeters more yeah and now uh, the issue is when you have to make such a long tunnel and you have to reach the sigmoid uh, yeah. do the same principle do you follow follow the circular fibers here also yeah follow the circular fibers sometimes it can get trickier and in which case we can go out and we can uh, look at the blue stain and then accordingly direct our tunnel in that direction yeah, so also it is not as straightforward as in esophagus yeah, it is because not as straightforward it can be as in some time yeah because the sigmoid pain can be quite acute in these patients so one has to be careful about that i'm all just a quick question and i'm sorry yeah, if you address this um the 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 incision you said you make a horizontal incision that makes yeah. a, that makes a lot of sense yeah how do you position that incision are you starting at the dentate line are just you just inside above? the dentate line just inside the dentate line okay okay yeah nice hello Hello, Amal, Praveen yeah, here. Praveen yeah, here. yeah, Dr. Yeah. Praveen. Yes. I think the benefits of this posterior myotomy is that uh, that it is a long segment of posterior rectomy is extra peritoneal. Yes, that also is there. Although uh, so we yeah. have done a couple of myotomies where we have done 15 centimeter myotomies where they do go into the uh, intraperitoneal segment. But the advantage of this is that you are doing a submucosal tunneling. So you are not really worried. Because uh -huh. as long as your mucosa is not breached uh -huh. at the proximal end of the tunnel, uh -huh. you are secure. Because uh, this is just a mucosal incision at the dentate line. In Chakkaratra. No, no. When you do myotomy, that time, yeah, uh, the chances of uh, you know going into peritoneum will be less. Yes, yes, you, yes. If you are. But actually, Dr. Mm -hmm. Praveen, yeah, the extra peritoneal or the you know the sub serosal plane is mm -hmm. is a quite well established plane and you can see that very well when you you know go outside the muscle layer we see that even you know in the stomach when we do a full thickness myotomy in the esophagus and here also we see that okay. so it's, the only thing is bleeds sometimes there can be you know branches of the superior rectal artery which are coming down okay. and that can cause a torrential bleed which becomes a little bit tricky to handle because uh, uh, typically the bleed will happen outside the muscle and the vessel will retract behind the muscle layer and that can become a little bit tricky to control. So that is usually more of a worry. Mm -hmm. uh, patients may develop a little bit of capnoperitoneum but that will get absorbed. One, is, one should not worry if uh, follow-up x-ray shows uh, some capnoperitoneum. That should not be a worry. Act, inject. I think and in this case where the patient is uh, prone, uh, it is difficult to assess uh, for yes. capnoperitoneum. Yes, clinically. Here we will not be able to yeah, assess the, because… So uh, the anesthetists have to play a major role here yes. where they have to keep a strict watch on the ETCO2 ETCO2 and uh, ETCO2. the ventilation if it is requiring more uh, effort. Yes. And then they will warn a wall and then we'll probably have to stop and hyper, hyperventilate the patient. Yeah. So these are a certain different things uh, when you are doing things in a prone position. I think right. that increasing peak pressure is one of the most sensitive you know, parameters than just ETCO2. Yeah. Because in prone position, whenever the gas leaks, there will not be enough much space in the abdomen to you know, get distended so the diaphragm gets pushed up. Absolutely. And the peak pressure rises immediately. Right. So um, we always, you know, keep yeah, uh, yeah. notice of the initial peak pressure Mike, at yeah. the starting yeah. of the procedure. So we have Dr. Kalani over here, anesthetist, and yeah. They'll give Hello. you a mic. As Sir said, we initially start with a peep of five, and accordingly we increment, we adjust the peep so that we, the, the hypercapnia will not be there, and the airway pressures will be acceptable. So we start with peep of five. And according to the ventilation, according to the requirement, we adjust the peak to maintain the capnoperitoneum. 
Right. Thank you. And you will also have some tachycardia, uh, yeah, shooting up of blood pressure, I think. As we all know, uh, the CO2 itself will cause sympathetic stimulation. So, we keep on juggling by giving any okay. additional doses of opioids, beta blockers, dexmed according to the hemodynamics, so that there will be a stable uh, heart rate and blood pressure. Right. In, in Prem, the heart rate is not too much of a concern from the operating point of view, but in Poem, sometimes, particularly when you are doing an anterior Poem, yeah. uh, if you are, the patient has tachycardia, it makes your dissection very difficult because, because of the tachycardia and the anterior, uh, you know, uh, uh, contractions and the, this thing. So yeah, it is. Cardiac pulsations. Amol Pankaj, uh, yeah. while dissecting, uh, what is going to be the end point? I mean, how are you going to decide your point of dissection to be stopped at? So, as I said, we will go, so 10 centimeters is the distance. Now, my scope is around 10 centimeters, so I will probably go another centimeter or two before uh, we, uh, this thing, we stop the dissection. And I will also go outside and see uh, whether it has gone beyond the my, the proximal EMR mark because I have to go pro beyond the proximal EMR mark. So, both ways, th that is how we uh, judge the extent of yeah, the myotomy. Strictly looking okay. at the marking on the scope and seeing the scope is in a straight position, not looped. Yes. Because sometimes that can mislead you. Yes. And you have to remember that we are following the posterior wall of the rectum and the posterior uh, you know, angulation and curvature of the rectum. So, the distance that we measure, you know, intraluminally as compared to what happens in, uh, you know, when you are going along the wall is different. So, you have to uh, budget for that also because usually the distance is a little bit longer when you go along the wall. That is also what happens. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So here you can see that uh, there is some angulation which is yeah, coming. Yeah, now ga gradually an angulation is coming over here. So I am still following the path very easily, so I am not going out of the tunnel. But at some point I may have to mm, go out and check whether we are going in the correct direction or not. And you can see that there is quite a bit of submucosal fibrosis, although it is not too bad. But you can see these white fibrous strands over here, which are actually this thing, little bit of leading. So it was that big vessel yeah, which is just coagulated. coagulated. Give me the knife. So most often, your knife tip is adequate to control these kind of leads. And a coagrasper is most often not required for such small leads. Right. And Amal sir, yeah? we, can I just shift to Dr. Mohan for a moment? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Dr. Mohan, you are on. Okay, so, so let's see where are we. So we started from here. This is our mucosal incision. And then we are uh, tunneling down. So we are at the crossroads here. You can see this is our tunnel going towards the lower esophagus. And you can see there is a, a septum there. That's the septum. And that's the diverticular side. Th that's the diverticular side there. And this is our pathway towards the esophagus. So, so Dr. Mohan, what precautions do you take while you are around this area, uh, you know, where you have a diverticulum and… Yeah, so, so, so the, uh, when I started, I was going into this so fold. This fold. So I thought there is a submucosal fibrosis. Uh, so you, you may, may, once you are going, dipping into the diverticulum, you may have a fibrosis. As we see in Zenker also, towards diverticulum, it's difficult to dissect. Towards esophagus, is easy to dissect. So same here, because of uh, stretching and all, this becomes fibrosed. So no need to go into that. In fact, you are to, supposed to expose this septum, which yes. we have to cut. So I am thinking that through this translucency of loose areolar tissue, the diverticulum, I am not dissecting this. Ultimately, I have to cut uh, this septum. septum. And then the real problem, real problem is the G junction. So we will keep on dissecting towards the G junction. As we are doing now, you see, 
it's a so the idea is to keep the uh, accessory at a constant distance and there is no point no uh, fear of any collateral injury because muscle is well protected by the hull and mucosa is way above here i'm not even going there so so this device inject please villas so this device will make this procedure very very uh, uh, safe you can see now this is the g junction will go down there this is our septum, septum. and uh, this is our this is the muscle layer of the esophagus and this is out and then we'll check this that we have gone into the diverticulum on this side this is almost swollen because of the submucosal injection and then this is the diverticulum you can see the tunnel and then no injury to the mucosa and then here we'll keep on going down up till to the g junction so mohan at yes. some point you may want to show us how your assistant is helping you yes. in terms of moving the knife because that, i think this is something that is unique to this yeah so that's this, very very important knife. point and vilas in fact the creo medical which makes this device always called uh, two person for training the doctor and Get the it. person who will take care of this instrument so he uh, you can see here he has made a taping onto the shaft of this device so that he has to do only one thing uh, rotation on his wrist so that uh, he can do right up or left up so that i can expose the blade on the side which i want to cut so the right up and left up uh, is my instruction to him rest and and and, and, and at the moment when you are uh traversing the g junction uh, in this case when there is the large diverticulum do you feel that uh, you would want to go um, much more than you uh, towards the gastric side as compared to what you would do in a normal poem to really make sure that the tone goes down uh, i think that's an interesting point but i think that uh, we have to treat poem as poem it won't uh, be affected by the diverticulum as far as you are able to reduce the les pressure uh it the, it will serve its purpose but whether presence of diverticulum changes our approach to the poem it's not known but uh, uh, theoretically speaking i think i don't see that to happen uh, what i just like theoretically meant was that if you still have some persistent les tone in a when there is a large diverticulum you may have a higher chances of a blow out uh, later on so do you feel that you should slightly modify your technique versus a normal i mean uh, that's a good thought process but uh, it requires a lot of studies whether leaving the making more myotomy because in fact uh, that the can you inject with us so if even if you do a good myotomy you need not to tackle the uh, septum that is what is known at present by the retrospective studies but for your points i don't have the data but it's a interesting point Yeah, Mohan Anil Arora here. Yes, sir. Since it is a multi-pronged instrument, uh, yeah. is it reusable? Because you have uh, the needle, the cutter, the coagulator, and the bending instrument. Yeah. So you think repeated use will make it defunct in one of the functions? They. Uh, so in uh, such conference, we cannot speak uh, f uh, for the uh, reusable because company has devices as as the. Uh, as the single use device uh, so always it is single use uh, of the record we can speak about the reusability so i'll wait for you to finish yeah so, so you can see now we are reaching to the g junction uh, the really g junction because everything is getting narrowed there yeah and uh, the, there is comes again the role of this device uh, you can see uh, once we are doing the uh, dissection at g junction we are very very cautious because mucosa comes very close to us and during monopolar device i switch off the spray coagulation because i use lot of spray coagulation and spray coagulation is like apc where it it cause blast and it burns the back of the mucosa but here you can see that there is no spark uh, there is no not much of uh, jarring, jarring. and i can dissect onto the muscle without damaging it uh, the gas related complications are much less with this we are we are part of a, a world uh, randomized control trial uh, which we have shown that 
this is not associated with charring and also uh, gas related complications and other things are less so you can see gradually we are moving towards the stomach so i'm removing these these fibers but mucosa is so close to me it's here next door and the, the, the tunnel is very, very narrow. Can you inject, please, once more? Right. Dr. So, Mohan, we'll just get back to you. Sure. Thank you. Dr. Amal, you're on. OK. So we've completed the tunnel. And uh, I pulled the scope out into the rectum. And this is the mucosal incision. Prasad, you can see that, that I'm just inside the dentate line. This is yeah, the dentate yeah. line, and I'm just yeah, inside that. And uh, we, you can see the blue stain anteriorly over here. I'm pushing the scope ahead. This is the last mark, uh, the most proximal mark of the EMR, which we did earlier, a few weeks earlier. And you can see on the opposite wall, we, our stain has gone much, much more proximal to that. So we yeah. have definitely crossed the proxim most proximal yeah, EMR yeah, mark. Yeah. And uh, now I will just go inside the tunnel and show you. So Amul, your guidance for doing the CAP EMR biopsy should be that it should be only on the anterior wall. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. It should only be on the anterior wall or sometimes maybe lateral, but we try and be as anterior as possible because then that will give you a clean mucosa on the posterior wall to perform your myotomy. Otherwise, your tunnel is going to be very, is going to be a nightmare to create a tunnel because you're going through the deep submucosa and there is going to be significant fibrosis and there can be a risk of mucosal injury at that point. So here we have completed the tunnel over here now and uh, now we will start the myotomy. Pankaj, I would, uh, can you take over to do the myotomy and then probably we will discuss about the distal most yeah, part sure. of the myotomy over here. I have a small question. Because, uh, yeah. This uh, biopsy, EMR biopsy should be done how far from the dentate line? How far inside? Is there any specific tire so the centimeters? Distal, the distal most biopsy should be approximately 3 centimeters uh, inside the dentate line. The distal most biopsy. The proximal yeah. most biopsy will be decided by the barium enema and you have to start in the dilated segment. So barium enema as well as colonoscopy both or sigmoidoscopy. And you definitely go into the dilated segment and take your first biopsy way into the dilated segment and then come down every three to four centimeters you take biopsies on the anterior wall. The challenge is that in the sigmoid it is very difficult to assess which is the anterior wall. Absolutely. So follow the anterior rectal wall and follow a line along the curve of the sigmoid and keep and on, take, keep and on, keep on taking in, biopsies yeah. over there and keep on injecting and then taking biopsies. And so maybe one, you can yeah. put some saline and see uh, where it is pulling and take biopsies from the opposite wall yes. whenever you are in doubt. Yeah, so that is important. So, Amal, yeah. just a quick question. Um, did you have to train your pathologist to actually look at these biopsies, you know, for people who might be interested in starting such a program, what would you suggest? Well, the, you definitely need a GI pathologist who has experience with, uh, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, these kind of uh, conditions. So we have a GI pathologist with us uh, in our hospital, Dr. Sheetal Biradar, who has a you know, she was done a, she was a specialized as a, uh, you know, GI pathologist. And uh, what is important to note is the ganglion cells will, def will only be seen on IHC, immunohistochemistry. So it is important to perform in immunohistochemistry on these biopsies. Only on a standard uh, histology, they will not be able to comment on the ganglion cells and the nerve bundles. Because they also, it is not just absence of the ganglion cells, but also hypertrophic nerve bundles in the areas where there are mm, uh, absence of ganglion cells. That confirms the diagnosis of Hirschsprung's. And uh, that is what is important, because otherwise ganglion cells, you know, hypogangliosis sometimes can be even more difficult to diagnose, because you may find a few ganglia, but then there are certain guidelines that they uh, follow to ensure whether there is uh, aganglionosis versus hypoganglionosis versus a norm, normal, uh, uh, you know, normal colonic, this thing. 
So that is how it is. So typically, how many biopsies would you take uh, for? Usually, we would take about four to four five. Four to five, yeah, yeah. Four to five biopsies, and mark them serially, and uh, according to the distance from the anal verge, and then send them separately in separate containers so that they can also the pathologist can also report accordingly. That is very important. Yeah, absolutely. So. That is that you know. That is what we are going to be talking about also in the afternoon when I'm giving my talk on the, you know the technical checklist of preem. So these are the some of the things which are very important because yes. otherwise, you know, you will not make a diagnosis itself, and then you don't find a patient with Hirschsprung. That is where the problem lies. Most mm -hmm. you know most of the queries which I have had in the last uh, year, so many years that we've been doing this procedure is, of course, Hirschsprung is relatively rare. And many of these patients go to pediatric surgeons and pediatricians and they don't come to us directly. But some of them, at least the adult or the you know, semi-adult or in this age group, you will find that if you have a high index of suspicion, you will find that occasional patient where you will find a ganglionosis or hypoganglionosis where, who, who will benefit by this procedure. And we are coming out with a quality of life survey paper this year on our the patients of PREM and uh, we are, you know, we are uh, very happy to uh, report that, more, you know, all these patients have an excellent quality of life and none of them have any, you know, uh, any issues regarding their bowel movements now. Of course, many of them are on some laxatives because if the colon is dilated, uh, proximally, really badly dilated, then of course they do need some laxative. But the doses is much, much lower than that. Yeah. yeah. And both in our yeah. practice, even in adults, you get a lot of pediatric patients with uh, severe constipation. Standard tests are barium anema and anorectal manometry. And more often than not, they are inconclusive. You send them to a pediatrician who says it is a habitual constipation. So right. how, how, when do you recommend that when RAI is normal and uh, barium anema is doubtful that you go in for... Uh, invasive procedure like biopsy for confirmation because majority of the patient ultimately settle down on say psychotherapy or uh, laxatives. So no, is Hirschsprung uncommon or we are missing it? No, of course there is a large segment of pediatric constipation which is just functional and uh, you know bad uh, habits. So that is definitely there and we should not disregard them and we should not treat them over, uh, over seriously with this kind of an invasive procedure. But at the same time, <coughs> as I mentioned, a high index of suspicion and also the characteristic barium enema. Actually speaking, the first suspicion of Hirschsprung's is only on a barium enema and the conical uh, narrowing, narrowed segment, the conical narrowing is what actually raises the suspicion of Hirschsprung's because there is a conical transition zone. And that will raise the suspicion that you will, this patient could be having Hirschsprung's. So then you perform an inner rectal manometry to look for the rectoanal inhibitory reflex. The other point about the RAIR is that patients with an ultra short segment Hirschsprung's can have a false positive RAIR. So that is where again the challenge lies. RAIR is an absent RAIR or it definitely confirms Hirschsprung's, but a positive RAIR does not rule out Hirschsprung's completely. So that is how it is. And then the first uh, final thing is your sigmoidoscopy and serial biopsy. So this is how in the, that order one should in, evaluate these patients, work them up and then probably take, take up the further decision. Right. Dr. Amal, we are also ready in the next room. Okay. So we are just about to start. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sir, somebody wanted me from the hall. Okay. You can yes, just see, you, yeah, sir. Yeah. So you can see that punctage is performed uh, near, nearly a full thickness. So here we are always going to be going full thickness, and uh, that is how it is. And we might, you know, change over to an insulated tip knife because that sometimes helps to protect against the deeper structures over there. Yeah. So uh, we'll see. We are just slowly. Can you see the muscle uh, which is exposed? This is a longitudinal again. The same. We are sparing the serosa and just taking this as a guide and sometimes it is difficult so keeping a big wheel very up so we have to just be very small and small small steps I think uh, we have yes. to uh, do it. 
Yeah. Don't try to rush things here. Okay. Anand, you can go to the thank next room. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Keep watching us. Thank you. Three big, one and two small. Right. Presenting the case. Uh, 40 year old gentleman is a known case of Gardner syndrome. Patient, patient underwent subtotal colectomy with iliorectal anastomosis in 2021 August and he underwent rectal ESD EMR in October 2022. He is under surveillance colonoscopy the, which was done in June 2023. It showed multiple sessile and uh, semi pedunculate polyps in the rectum at anastomotic site of iliorectal anastomosis and at anal verge which were measuring 7 to 25 millimeters with genet type 2A morphology. Uh, the largest polyps are in the rectum. And the plan is to do ESD for rectal polyps. You could see the large polyps uh, that are there in the rectum and, uh, and the uh, anastomotic site. Learning objective is demonstration of rectal ESD using hybrid knife, O2, 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 5. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear yes. you. Yes, okay, okay. Uh, uh, the case is uh, the patient with Gardner syndrome. So the patient underwent a uh, subtotal colectomy and ileorectal anastomosis. Here is an anastomosis. Here you can see a poly, but uh, it probably, uh, sorry, it is just uh, the hyperplastic, uh, inflammatory, inflammatory poly on the anastomosis, I think. And, uh, uh, he's a rectal, the patient's a residual rectal and, uh, you know, the Gardner syndrome is, uh, has a, a multiple adenoma, like this here, it's small one. And here, here, and here. So, uh, the patient has multiple polyp in the rectum, residual rectum, and here's the largest one. It's very close to the anal, you know, about the size is almost 20 mm around less than 20, less than 20 mm -hmm. maybe. And uh, though, since the Gardner syndrome has uh, many adenomas, uh, we don't need to, uh, I think we don't need to care about the curability of the, each polyp. I mean, uh, even if, we, I, I, if even I remove this polyp out zero, mm -hmm. but <laughs> eventually the patient will have another polyp in the future. Mm -hmm. So I think the uh, feasible um, to sustainable treatment for him is uh, required, I think. Kind of reduction surgery. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Reduction endoscopy. Mm -hmm. And actually now we are uh, doing uh, intensive downstaging polypectomy for FAP patient in, our, uh, in, in Japan. So uh, we are trying to uh, avoid uh, total colectomy uh, for the FAP patients. Mm. Do polypectomy um, every year or six months, every six months. Intensive. In intensively, intensively, yes. And I heard that it is all, uh, accepted in a social insurance system. Yes, yes. This national last, social insurance system. Last year, now. last year. So Su such kind of intensive uh, polypectomy no, 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 for familial polyposis coli patient. Yeah, in Japan. And we so already usually how many polyps do you remove <laughs> in one session? Depends on the patient, but uh, sometimes maximally uh, we do uh, four four hundred uh, <laughs> polypectomy in, in day one day. So I think the uh, underwater EMO is the best choice for this patient. Mm. What do you think? I think so, practically. <laughs> practically. Yes. So uh, what is an uh, indication of ESD versus EMO uh, so in your mind or in your idea? Yes. Basically, the size ESD, uh, just regarding the size, the region, Larger than 20 mm is a, a kind of indication for ESD, but not all the region, such region, is an indication for ESD. And probably uh, morphology is also yes. a, you know, kind of indication, like a laterally splendid tumor to like a very flat, non-granular type, two yes, centimeter yes, yes. is a good indication of ESD, but uh, yes. such polypoid, peduncreated, semi-peduncreated region, 
Maybe EMR is good enough. Yes, it depends on the suspicious for the invasive cancer. If the region is more uh, suspicious for invasive cancer, like uh, as you said, uh, LSD energy, uh, should depress type or uh, uh, unusual shape or larger than more three centimeter, then I will do ESD. But this is this region is not so large, and the surface pattern seems genetic type. Uh, no, no, nice, nice type two. You can uh, see. How the about uh, a grade of yeah, suspicion of malignancy? Like uh, sometimes European guidelines suggest that uh, T1B or T1 cancer is yep. better to be removed and blocked. So sometimes ESD is recommended. But uh, for example, like a uh, semperunculated polypoid region, suspicious for some invasive, shallow invasive cancer, we, what is the indication? Ah, <laughs> it's a bit difficult to say. Mm. Uh, but of course, the, it depends on the confidence level of the uh, endoscopist. If I, I have a high confidence for SME invasion, mm -hmm. the region is definitely invasive cancer, then we should prefer, uh, refer the patient to surgery. Mm. And uh, it depends on if the percentage is smaller than 50 or 60 percent, then I will try uh, mm. endoscopic resection. And uh, if possible, the unblocked resection is uh, desired and is, should, should be performed in such region. Yoji, hi. Uh, mm. This is Prasad. Yes. And just a quick question, maybe both for you as well as Noria here. Mm -hmm. When you look at the morphology of this polyp, mm -hmm. Um, it seems to be somewhat pedunculated. You have yes. it right there. Yes, yes, yes. Is this something, how, how would you factor that in into making uh, a decision on how best to do a polypectomy here? Would you, oh. would you think a, a snare or a simple EMR might be enough versus an ESD with getting the base? Could you comment on that? Yeah, so I think the uh, benefit of ESD is a uh, achievement of unblocked section of the region. So such kind of narrow uh, semi created base, I think ES EMR is enough to achieve unblocked resection of this case. So I don't think method ESD versus EMR doesn't matter to achieve unblocked resection in such case. So in our practice, maybe I prefer to perform underwater EMR. Now uh, you can see that the uh, polyp is really floating up into the lumen, so a uh, base or a stalk is very easily seen in this image. So I think, yeah. You're really demonstrating the, yeah. the water filling really well and we can all appreciate yes, the yes, morphology. Yes, yes, yes. Are you just using the, the irrigation channel of the scope to fill yes. the rectum with, um, okay. Yes. 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 Yeah. Right. Um, Maybe we can uh, perform. Can you take yes. Professor Yuji yes. and uh, Professor Noria? We'll just get back to you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Just moving to Dr. Mohan, who's been waiting. Dr. Mohan, you're on. Yeah. So uh, we completed the tunnel, and I'll just uh, go inside the tunnel and show what we have done. And we were waiting for the myotomy to start. So this is the under. Uh, so you can see now no charring, clean tunnel. And then we expose the uh, diverticulum on the right side. This is the septum uh, between the diverticulum and the uh, esophagus. Then we kept on going towards the LES. And you can see very tight LES there. This is absolutely tight. And uh, I will not go into to show, but I will give a bird's eye view by underwater. Again, underwater. You can see now through the water, you can see the stomach. Uh, and it has gone around 2.5 centimeter. So that, that is the problem of the patient. That's the LES. You can see the vessels, the cardiac vessels into the stomach. And this is the problem. This is a bottleneck, which yeah. is causing the, the diverticulum to form and dysphagia of the patient. So <laughs> we have to cut this. And uh, we have to cut the septum, this septum. Mohan, so, sir? Yes. 
this is Saranj here. Uh, any particular tips to cross the G junction when you are doing with a therapeutic scope since it's a very tight G junction and we are already having a bigger scope? Yes. So that's a very important point to go atraumatic. If you stretch too much, you will cause a lot yes, of sir. trauma. So best is to use, uh, as I shown in my lecture also, if the scope is not going by maximum dissection, you cut some muscle. You cut some muscle, make it more relaxed and then you can enter it. But uh, 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 we were not on the air when uh, uh, live and uh, I was crossing it, it was really difficult. But uh, I don't think therapeutic channel is a problem. Uh, but the spastic nature of this LES is a problem. Uh, if the uh, spasm is not too severe, even a therapeutic channel can, a scope can go very easily. So now let's start the myotomy. Here you can see this is the entry site and I am just beneath the mucosal incision. So I will not cut the muscle right up till here. So I will start cutting from here which is a centimeter below and I will use the same knife. Vilas will do slightly vertical orientation of this. This is more supine position. So he will, he is rotating his wrist and uh, maybe on different, on that side, yes, yes. So now we are on, we have exposed the tip and then I will keep on cutting like this, cut, 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 cut and see. So I stretch the muscle by, unless you give a good stretch, if the tissue is too much uh, soft and redundant, the cut is not adequate. So the cut is also that, that's a principle of electrocautery. That if you stretch the um, tissue which you are cutting by the cap, by pushing a pressure, giving a pressure, it will cut very nicely like this. Yeah. But if, if, the, if the stretch is not there like here, it will not cut much well. So always stretch. So now, once we have made a cut, we will come back and see. See that this is all circular, circular fibers. Yeah. So that means we have not reached to the proper depth. So we will more depth, deepen our cut. Right. Dr. Mohan, so what, uh, oh, Mohan, what is the length of this active blood? So, this is, uh, I think, the, the, if you can see this white ceramic, yeah. so th there are two things. One is this white ceramic, now I will keep inside. So, this is the length when oh, the ceramic oh. is inside my cap and this is not cutting. So, only the distal 2 to 3 millimeter is the cutting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. We'll get yeah, back to you, yeah. sir. Uh, Dr. Pankaj and Dr. Mohan. Yeah, Mohan. Uh, Amol. Yeah. Uh, see, in, uh, traditionally for the diagnosis of Hirschsprung disease, yes. we used to take full thickness biopsy yes. for the diagnosis. Yes. So endoscopically, when you are taking these submucosal, you know, uh, with ESDA, so what are the sens uh, you know, sensitivity of these biopsies coming, having adequate tissue for okay. the... Okay, so th there is data to show that ganglion cells are present, present in the inter intermyantric plexus between the yeah. longitudinal and the circular muscle as well as in the deep submucosa. Yeah, right. So if you take a deep submucosal biopsy, then you have a good sensitivity of picking up Hirschsprung's. But a routine superficial submucosal biopsy will not give you that diagnosis. Right. So that is the reason we do the cap EMR because that helps us to capture the deep submucosa rather than, you know, just the superficial submucosa in, uh, uh, yeah. in this. So always you take with cap uh, EMR? Yeah, so always, always cap EMR. Cap EMR. Always cap EMR. Okay. Inject lift. Now this is uh, the myotomy full thickness we have done the circular and the longitudinal and this is at almost 13 centimeters here, the depth. And you can see the siroza which is there and, yeah. and completely uh, we have opened up and till the incision and on the incision, even this fibers we have removed and this is our incision here. So, so we have taken the important. internal yes. sphincter here. That is very important because otherwise your frame will fail. Because, you know, this is like the LES. The internal anal sphincter is like the LES. So, in fact, in 
many of the you know literature uh, hirschsprung's has been described as a disease of the internal anal sphincter extending proximally for a variable distance that is how it has been described so the internal anal sphincter is the most important structure to be divided and uh, so unless that is completely divided the patients will not get relief of symptoms so that is very crucial then what are the chances of yeah. uh, and, uh, this uh, uh, fecal incontinence incontinence fecal okay. incontinence so an uh, internal anal sphincter division will not cause fecal incontinence it is only if the external sphincter is divided now here you see that might be you know if if you see the muscle twitching that means it is the external anal sphincter you should not divide it so when you apply your knife be very vigilant if the muscle twitches then do not cut that yeah that the that's the important skeletal muscle yeah pankaj amol sir we we'll yes. just get back to you sir yeah yeah sir. Okay. Uh, thank you so professor yogi and uh, professor noria you're on yes ah thank you uh, welcome back sorry uh, we kept you waiting no, <laughs> no it's okay and uh, uh, this time maybe i just uh, want to introduce new olympus system so this is x1 system so uh, this processor uh, can is good i think the most good thing is a uh, good thing is a uh, compatible to uh, both 100 series and 200 series scope and uh, this equipment uh, equip new video process processing system so even all scope uh, image improved can you show so this is a 190 series scope yep. but uh, you can see very clear and the precise image like this and uh, so I, it means that if you have a one this system uh, if you can buy 200 293 uh, it's which is commonly used in Japan, uh, which equip magnifying, zoom magnifying endoscopy to this system. And uh, this system also equipped with a new uh, image enhanced mode, this is, which is TXI. So it really enhanced the color as well as surface texture like this. And a good thing is uh, usually NBI really change the color, uh, but uh, oh, sorry. it's still uh, yeah, like color, but uh, TXI preserved the original color of the region. And then uh, we can appreciate a uh, red, reddish area is more reddish and the whitish epithelium is uh, whiter than the uh, normal image. But uh, still uh, clinical relevance or clinical benefit is under investigation. Okay, maybe you can start under okay. water resection. Okay. Uh, I have two questions to Professor Wedo. Yes. Uh, my first question is, are you comfortable in defining the pit pattern based on NBI only without using uh, crystal violet? Uh -huh. Num number two, uh, in patients with Zenit 2B mm -hmm. lesions, mm -hmm. how will you decide which patients can go for an endoscopy resection versus surgery? Uh, so that is a yeah, big important question. So, uh, but at least probably uh, Chromo endoscopy magnification is better accuracy than yeah. NBI magnification. But uh, for example, uh, to preparing a crystal violet uh, or something is very sometimes taking time, time consuming, troublesome. And in some country, it is not really available. And uh, it's, I don't know whether it is significant, but uh, recently, some kind of carcinogenetic effect is uh, suspected. So in such case, probably NBI, uh, just illuminate optical method is more, uh, you know, friendly and that easy to uh, integrate in a clinical practice. And the uh, second question, uh, how to manage lesion with Janet 2B? That is also, uh, it's 2B, that Janet 2B has a many uh, diversity, some, until some mucosal it's cancer close, to intermucosal close. lesion. So maybe in that case, we appreciate more morphological factor, like yeah. a very strong depression okay. or irregularity or something like that. <laughs> oh, you, you cut when I talk, <laughs> he cut already. <laughs> so it was imp very important to make sure the tip of the uh, snare should be located at the distal side of the polyp, then you can uh, you can have an unblocked resection. Mm. 
So and now no... he moved the region to a five o'clock, six o'clock position. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, yes. seven o'clock like position. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, I'm using a uh, Apache GI therapeutic scope, so the, the device is coming from the seven o'clock. So oh, okay. I placed the region at channel the side. channel side, this position. And here is a scar, probably the previous EMR scar. So uh, if we do ESD for this region, it will be a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. And so underwater EMR can achieve uh, unblock reduction a very short time and very safely. So for this patient, underwater EMR is the best choice, I think. Yes. OK. Oh. Mm. Thank you. Shall we remove another polyps? I don't know. Shall we remove another, another one? Uh, Professor Yogi, we'll just get back to you, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We continue thank you. the procedure. Thank okay. you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mohan? Yeah. We are with you. So now we have reached to the myotomy site where we are on the one side is the diverticulum, another side is the uh, esophageal, lumen. esophageal lumen. So you can see now we are preserving the longitudinal which directs us towards the towards the es esophagus side. So in my practice, uh, I do the myotomy onto the esophagus first like this. You can see here. We are cutting, 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 cutting. It cuts like a butter, butter, butter cutting. See that? Now we keep cutting, cutting. That's the spastic segment, which is very important to cut. So this is going towards the esophagus. And now this septum. So I cut this septum to meet. Can you do the vertical like this? Yes. So this septum is now being cut. to meet that place, so there's some bleeding. So, so this is the microwave coagulation. You can see here that causes bubbles and it will never cause deep injury. But you have to stay 10 seconds. So it takes a little bit more time than yeah. normal cautery. So now again, stretch with the cap and cut it. Again, that septum is being cut now. You can see that difference between. Yeah, you are joining two women's together. Together, now. yeah. There is a beater there. I will find out. Fine. We'll just get back to you, Dr. Mohan. Yes. Yep. Because Dr. Pankaj has finished. Dr. Amul, Dr. Pankaj? Yeah, yeah we are here. So, uh, Pankaj has closed that uh, mucosal incision, and here the beauty is. Because the tunnel is retrograde, you don't need to uh, close the tunnel very Absolutely. tightly. Yeah, yeah. Because it's just at the anal verge. So you just need to put a few clips to bring the mucosa together and that is adequate because the proximal end of the tunnel is uh, completely blind. So it's, uh, it's not going to have any issues regarding that. The other thing that we do before we uh, you know, take the patient out of anesthesia is that we do a proper digital anal dilatation in these patients because any residual internal anal sphincter fibers should be stretched apart and they should be split. That is very important because otherwise these patients, you know, these are the fibers which can hold back and they can compromise the result of the, the, the procedure. So that is how it is. Pankaj? Yeah, I think so. It yeah. is done. And thank you, Amol, for this. And congrats on a wonderful meeting. Thank you so much. Excellent Thank you. meeting. So we'll just do an uh, anal dilatation in this patient and uh, bring the patient out of anesthesia. Yeah. Okay. You can move Thank to you, another sir. room. Yes, uh, sir. We are back with uh, Professor Yoji and uh, Professor Nuria. Okay. Hello. Mm. Ah, we <laughs> continue uh, removing the polyps. Probably I've already uh, removed the maybe six polyp open. Just open and close and cut. So in this situation, you suck or retrieve the specimen each time. No, not each time. Not each time. Uh, open. 
So maybe this is a different maybe strategy to spread it. Ah, yes, regions. yes, yes, yes. Probably each polyp looks benign, and mm -hmm. just this removal is just a just for the prevention of developing colorectal cancer, rectal, rectal cancer. Mm -hmm. so the pathology is not so, uh, uh, we, we don't need to be so serious mm -hmm. to check the pathology. But uh, if the region looks somewhat, um, it means a displaced, um, you know, invasive of or a shallow invasion or cancerous, maybe we uh, send a specimen to individually. And actually, uh, we send the polyp larger than one cent one cm. Ah, okay, okay. Otherwise, we pick up the polyp one of ten polyp and send pathology. Mm. So otherwise, you just remove it and discard. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Water. Oh, thank you. So, is there any tips and tricks? to prevent the bleeding because uh, bleeding uh -huh. cause, you know, interfere the subsequent procedure in an underwater procedure, so. Tips for prevention of, of the bleeding. bleeding. <laughs> mm. Do you use endocut or coagulation? Uh -huh. Usually more doesn't matter, I don't mm. know. Probably the depth is the most, uh, depend on the risk factor of the bleeding, I think. So if we remove the deeper uh, layer, then mm -hmm. we will have a thicker vessel, so the risk of bleeding. Depth be means uh, a depth. Depth, depth of resection. Resection, yes, yes, Depth yes, of yes. tumor, not, not depth not, not, of tumor. Mm. Depth of resection. resection. So yeah, probably yesterday okay. we discussed that the underwater EMR usually captures the shallow superficial okay. some mucosa rather than uh, injection EMR because injection EMR inject the solution into the deep submucosa so whole layer of submucosa lifted up and then when we remove sometimes we cut the submucosa vessel as well but usually okay. underwater EMR uh, captures shallow submucosa above the vessel often close so I think the chance of oh. interprocedure huh? bleeding is less <laughs> This is called snaring, so <laughs> it's called bleeding. So, ah, so, so during the polypectomy for the FAP patient, uh, I never do cold polypectomy because we have some losing after cold polypectomy and it makes it difficult to <coughs> pick up the another region. So it means that even small lesion, small polyp, you perform, uh, you use hot. Yoji sir? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Resection. Yoji sir? We are yes. going to add your next OT and come Okay, okay. Sir. Okay. Morgan, sir, your mic on, sir. Yeah, so we are encountering some bleed on the muscle side. So the, I'm using this microwave coagulation. You can see it's, uh, it's the bleeding was sputter. And still we could manage to stop it almost. So I'll put this knife onto this. And if you use uh, soft coagulation or spray coagulation, by this time, whole muscle would have been charred. Sir, any more, more at times, do you have to go on to conventional quack grasper if it is a spurter splattering blood on your face? Well, those who are well versed with this will not require this, but for beginner, I used to do that, yeah. More Naresh I mean, what you're using is a fantastic device, but I don't know, the, I get the feeling that one little weakness is managing the bleed which is a little slow. Yeah, 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 you, I agree with you. But, uh, 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 but it has got its own advantage in third space endoscopy that uh, uh, it will not cause the delayed bleeding or delayed post polypectomy syndromes uh, because uh, this doesn't travel too deep and uh, the charring is not there. The planes are still maintained. So, uh, yes, I agree it's slow. But yet, uh, it is not uh, that bad. Yeah, Mohan, a Mo basic, basic question to you. Why does a patient develop this uh, diverticula? Is it because of the very high pressure? Yes. Or, uh, because ultimately, it doesn't help the patient. Is it a bane for the patient or a boon for a celebrity like you? <laughs> oh, I mean, this patient requires, uh, definitely, we have a pathology there. Uh, 
a diverticulum, a ecclesia cardia, a uh, which diverticulum. is causing increased pressure in the esophagus. Patient is trying to eat, but not able to eat, he is pressurizing. So there is a giveaway, of course. So there is definitely a cause relationship there. And uh, 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 as we said, we have to reduce this uh, uh, tone at LES, which we are doing now. But also, we have to take care of the diverticular septum, which we have done, I'll show you. So this was the diverticular septum, which is completely gone. There's some bleeding over there, which is resolved already. I'll just suck out all the, the fluid. The septum was pretty vascular. Yeah, see that, that's the septum. So now there is no, no uh, barrier. It's, it's a small fibrous tissue which I'll remove because there is a big vessel on that. So that fibrous tissue I'll remove and uh, this tunnel and the myotomy is com going to be completed on towards the esophageal side. We have net yet not reached to the, to the uh, uh, LES. This is the LES. This is a uh, very narrow segment which we have to remove. Uh, I'm doing the full thickness. Sir, any uh, particular position of the knife you have to place while you are coagulating that bleeder or uh, like when you are cutting you have to keep it uh, perpendicular to the muscle? Is when uh, uh, unfortunately, your voice is not yeah, that clear. we are not getting your clear voice. So, when we are cutting the muscle, we are keeping the knife perpendicular to the muscle. Yes. But when we are coagulating, do we need a particular position of the knife like parallel or perpendicular? Yeah, that's a very important point. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Jain is there. Uh, so. Uh, so, uh, you, what you said was absolutely right. The cut is by the edges, so you have to not go too deep like this. Uh, keep the edge exposed to the area which you want to cut. But if you want to coagulate, you have to put the tip onto the vessel and coagulate like this. So, it's a tip that causes coagulation. And Mohan, when you are coagulating, are you using a different kind of current? Y yes. So the current is, uh, again I said there are no uh, settings here. So if I have a blue pedal, uh, which will tell me coagulation 9 and cut yellow pedal. So yellow pedal will give this, blue pedal will th give this. Okay, that's, that's good to know. Thank you. So now uh, I can see there is a small bleeder there which I will coagulate by the tip. Saransh has just told you change the orientation, coagulate for 10 seconds. 10 seconds looks slightly large but as you can see there is no damage to the underlying vessel or underlying structure. Even the longitudinal if I want to preserve I can do that. So, so that's the beauty of this. I, I know it's not a, a 100% knife, but it's a good innovation and uh, it has reduced the number of exchanges which we want to do and obviously it will reduce the trauma to the doctor in long run. So you can see below is the peritoneum or mediastinum. This is the muscle which I am cutting. So it has got a lot of carbonization, so I'll clean this. And th this is the bottleneck, yeah. which we'll cut. I'll clean the knife in a minute. And you can see I now, can, uh, this is the muscle which has been cut completely. There is a, some fluid in the diverticulum. I think for this effective cutting uh, you know, uh, mode, this uh, Cut more plus adequate traction on the tissue. Both are equally important. That's very important. I, yeah. I think I, I, I sent the message right yeah. that if you if you cut like this, it will not cut. But if you stretch like this with the cap pressure, the muscle get widened, stretched out, it cuts much better. Dr. Mohan, what are the other applications of this generator? You have shown RS2 mode. That's what very important, very important. So the obvious question is, shall we buy this generator only for this? But no, there are many things, uh, Creo Medical is coming up. The needle, RFA needle, they are developing. Uh, the Caesar knife, which, will, which we saw uh, 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 by the stack beetle knife by Sumi, Sumi Yam, uh, Sumitomo, that made life much easy for endoscopists uh, in cutting the mucosa, the 
edges of the ESDs, so uh, uh, Zenker's diverticulum. So yes, uh, many things are coming up and moreover, this knife is gradually being developed, uh, miniaturized, no more therapeutic scope will be required. So future is there definitely. And as you see, this, uh, this technology once learned, you can have a, a clean cutting, no collateral damage. There is no, no zero collateral damage. Unless you hit the mucosa, you will not burn it. Uh, Dr. Mohan, uh, great demonstration. Jayanta, this side. Uh, do you find uh, difficulty sometimes in uh, doing an anterior poem with this uh, device? Uh, not really. Uh, you have to orient the knife in such a way, uh, though it looks like that, but uh, I don't find uh, uh, any difference. So I'll, I, I'm not uh, properly, I mean, you can clean with the blade if you want. So there is a layer of carbonization onto the knife, so which you need to cut, uh, remove by the, not only above, but only on the sides. Because the sides are, yeah, yes. side. So we have to clean the carbonization from the sides. So Mohan, actually, we've also uh, used this uh, knife for uh, performing the poem F on a few occasions. And actually, when we do the anterior, it's not that uh, difficult. You can do it with the 3.2 quite well. And more importantly, the peritoneal dissection, it is very useful for the peritoneal dissection because uh, it really gives you a very clean dissection over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I think Amol, you are a surgeon, so you, you are not bothered about any bleeding. But for us, uh, uh, for peritoneal dissection, I have not used it. But definitely I will go home and do this. Uh, but you can see now, once you remove the carbonization, it cuts like uh, brilliantly. So don't waste your time uh, trying too hard. Clean so the stretch, knife. Uh, stretch the uh, fibers. Stretch the fibers and cut. Clean the knife and cut. You can see my mucosa is falling right onto me. Yeah. So I, I have to be very careful. I stop here about and down. then about downwards like this. So at the G junction, this type of dissection is very, very important not to injure the mucosa. If you are using spray coagulation, you may hit here and you may cause a big hole. So th that is to be avoided and this knife allows us to do that. Very uh, gradual cut and then once you are cutting from above, you can cut down. So I am taking the help of longitudinal fiber there, I am not going too deep. Uh, I am just cutting right across, this is the most narrow segment. Uh, see, in this, uh, usually in bipolar there are two electrodes, one active and one passive. Yes. Is there anything like that? Is this active? So, uh, two layers of the electrodes, two layers of the electrodes are closely placed to each other. So it works in both the edges of the electrode? Yeah, yeah, both the edges. Both, so yeah. it is a semicircular kind of an electrode which is on the top and the bottom edge of the cutting surface actually. Okay, okay, oh, good. Of so, the lateral surface. Uh, sir, uh, when we have to use a cautery in patients who have a pacemaker or a cochlear implant, we have to change the settings. Is it also, uh, does it also apply for this device? No, no. Yes, no, uh, uh, this, this can bipolar be can well be used. In fact, you have used yes. for one case, yes. I remember, yes, specifically sir. for this. So we did a Zenker, we had a patient with a Zenker and who had a, the, you know, deep brain implant uh, place for Parkinson's and uh, we did a Z, uh, Z poem using this device. We actually, we, we demonstrated that, we, we showed that video at uh, one meeting, Mohan and I, we were together in that. So, we did that. So, it's, it's really useful in these kind of situations where, you know, you know it is impossible to use a conventional diathermy in these kind of situations. And you can use this device very safely. So now we are gradually going towards the stomach side. Now you can see nicely the wide tunnel of the gastric side. And this is the longitudinal fiber which I was preserving. And Amol, do you think this is a vagus now? That could be the vagus. That's yeah, because uh, we, yeah, that's we uh, you are a surgeon, so I sometimes yes. see such type of structure yes. which I... See, posteriorly, if sometimes you are... My tummy goes more towards the 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. Yeah. You can see the vagus uh, posteriorly, even when you are doing a posterior my atomy. Because all of our patient goes into bradycardia after poem. Uh, are you 40, doing a tummy? 40, <laughs> No, no, I, I mean the vagus is so close, <laughs> so close. I mean um, most of the people might have 
uh, I don't know whether they have, uh, but once I go to the recovery, I see their pulse is either 40 or 50. Oh. No, we have not had that experience. Uh -huh. I will sir, mic a little closer, please. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. See, not 40 or 50, meaning, oh. yeah, we, our patient's heart rates are usually in the range of 70 to 90. That's what we would typically have. Is it something to do with Hyderabad or what? <laughs> biryani, something <laughs> to do with biryani. biryani. So we are gradually coming down yeah. to the – so I am keeping my uh, orientation towards lesser curve. Right. You can see that is a right onto the right corner. Uh, Anand, I, I think is uh, room number 3 ready? Yes, sir. We are just about ready. to present the case, sir. Yeah. So we can go to room number yes, 3. Yes, sir. We are just presenting the case. I am going live to Dr. Dr. Kaurav. Uh, so, uh, Vijay, you can go 1 plus 2. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. So, uh, this is a 67-year-old lady who presented with uh, complaints of dysphagia for the last two months. On the endoscopy, there was a polypoid lesion in the mid-esophagus between 25 to 29 centimeter from the incisors with adjacent superficial ulceration and it showed an IPCL pattern type 3, type 4. Uh, CT chest uh, demonstrated a well-defined ovoid, mildly enhancing hypodense intraluminal polypoid lesion, probably a fibrovascular polyp. On the radial endo ultrasound examination, there was a hypoechoic lesion measuring 22 cross 20 millimeters, uh, mainly arising from the M MM and SM layer. The MP layer appeared intact and uh, separate from the lesion. So the plan would be an ESD or an EMR for the esophageal lesion. These are some representative images of the lesion. As we can see, there is a small short stalk. So the learning objective would be demonstration of EMR slash ESD plus minus clip closure for esophageal lesion. Over to you, Gaurav, sir. Dr. Gaurav and uh, Dr. Nilay. Yeah. You're both on. We'll uh, so, hi everyone. Um, uh, so, as you heard the history of this uh, case, it's an elderly female who has got dysphagia and found to have a lesion in the mid-esophagus. So, as we advance the scope ahead, you uh, start seeing a very vascular um, polypoidal lesion. This has a very large head and as I'm moving the scope, the lesion constantly bleeds, even on suction and applying any uh, fluid uh, injection. So uh, here is the aim is first to demonstrate what type of lesion is this. So I'm trying to go across the lesion from either side and here you can see the normal, uh, the squamous mucosa or the esophagus and as I'm uh, advancing throughout in the white light examination, I don't see any, uh, any worrying thing on the right side of the, the lesion. I uh, withdraw the scope and here, wash pit. Here I see a bit the stalk of the lesion. Can you appreciate the stalk at uh, 6 o'clock right now? So this looks to be a very, uh, you know, small but thick vascular stalk. Uh, that the Can you just be there and freeze yes. it? Yeah. Wash little. So, yeah. so yeah. this seems to be the, uh, the stalk yeah. of the lesion and the polyp is prolapsing right into the midisophagus. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I agree with you. And uh, if you see the uh, mucosa on the left, uh, it's a bit inflamed, but otherwise okay. If you see the base, it's only a small part, but otherwise it's fine. So the options uh, would be, come, come, come back, yeah, come back. Yeah. Come back, come so back. The options over here is yeah. where you see a slight change in the IPCLs of the esophagus. But it's still more, more yeah. like inflammation Inflamity, because yeah. of… Uh, yes spaces yeah. and inflammation going around the polyp. But uh, yes, definitely now the other two options for us, uh, we've done a EUS, we've seen this is uh, uh, free from the muscularis, it's not going beyond the muscularis. So we have an option, either we can uh, uh, resect it by means of a snare or uh, but just to be careful and be sure to get an end block, prevent bleeding because this is bound to have a large uh, vessel below it. Uh, we can uh, just dissect around the base and get rid of this polyp. Hi, Gaurav. Uh, this yeah, uh, but uh, so uh, as Gaurav uh, told us that either we do EMR, 
so we inject and then do EMR or we do ESD. Uh, uh, Gaurav, when, can, can it be a pseudo stock because of the weight of the polyps? Yes, yes. yes. Many a time these polyps tends to uh, prolapse yeah. and they cause traction on the mus uh, muscularis mucosa and create a pseudo stock. Yeah, so pseudo even if you see such a small stock, when you really start doing ESD, you see a lot of fibrosis. Number one. Number two, uh, uh, prolapsing uh, the lesions like this, uh, of course here the stock doesn't look too big but even if it is one or two centimeter and you start cutting and the lesion rotates, it yes, twists yes, and yes. then it becomes more difficult for you to do procedure. So the third thing is when you are cutting, uh, it because of the weight it will keep on uh, peeling out the mucosa and uh, you go you keep on going away uh, with the mucosa. So, Hi Gaurav, uh, Zubin yeah. here. Uh, do you feel that uh, you can do a hybrid kind of thing at injecting it proximally to the lesion, lifting it up because there is an area just proximal to the prolapsing polyp which you showed on NBI looked suspicious and uh, doing so a hybrid proximally kind of is thing. oral side or anal side? Uh, oral side, oral okay, side. Yeah. You mean uh, you create a flap and get the polyp yes, from like this? A, yes, yeah. like a flap and then going inside, creating a small tunnel and then seeing what… what yeah, so happens. I think they've biopsied the proximal area, there was uh, no, you know, adenomatous… This looks inflammation yes. on yeah. NBI, yeah. this is not malignancy. So what was the biopsy? No, fibro. Yeah. So, I, yes, yeah. the, the point is well taken, but in this case, because we On, have a… Yeah, so we go proximal only if we can't elevate it yes, properly. Yes, yes. And normally we go distal, but in this case, this I case, don't think yes. it will be possible. But so, at least we can go by the side so, so. and cut it a bit uh, when we start cutting. Yes, yes, on both the sides. Yeah. I just okay. have one question. Uh, can we use an endo loop? Will it, uh, will this be too uh, large to use an endo loop? Endo loop, there is not enough stock for endo loop over here. It will not stay there. So it has it lifted well, well yes. yeah. So it has lifted well. Inject more. Yes. Inject. Yes. So the challenge, yeah. Okay. Give the other Yeah. Yes. Can we put uh, some can, more? Can we give a mic to Dr. Amul, please? No, no, no. Injection, injection. First injection, do bhaiya. Usually these lesions have a single large vessel in the center and rather than multiple vessels. So, and these vessels can sometimes retract. So, that is the idea of doing a kind of a flap and an ESD because then you can secure the vessel much more. Knife out, needle out. Okay, okay. Inject. Uh, Delay and Amol. Yeah. yeah. Is the size yes. of the lesion and you know the space around it, is it going to be a problem for an ESD like procedure? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, as I told you, uh, uh, it looks easy, but sometimes it's not easy because Good. the the moment you start cutting it, uh, it will just start, start bleed, peeling yeah. off the mucosa and it will, it will start going uh, away from you. So then what you do is take an IT knife and cut that uh, mucosa. The opposite side. Yeah, and yeah. we will not start from the proximal end. Cutting will start by the knife side yes. first, yeah. Knife out. So we're using a 1.5 mm knife uh, by Olympus. So uh, this is a dual J knife. J stands for the injection port. And uh, dual J are of two types. One is gastric type, the other one is colonic. Colonic is 1.5 millimeter tip, gastric is 2 millimeter tip. So in esophagus you use colonic one. Excellent uh, mucosal incision, Gaurav. Uh, you can see it's so you vascular see. and this vascularity is because of the inflammation and that is because of the weight of the, the polyp itself can cause this inflammation and also some stasis above the polyp. Rather than going deep yeah. now, we'll start cutting yeah. a bit uh, yeah, by yeah. the side, yeah. So he's doing exceedingly well. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's such a small, so now so let's start by the side, yeah. Wash little, wash. Yeah. So can we put some more water there and then 
you are perfect yeah. and we don't need this is not a cancer we don't, don't need, need a, a big margin, margin yeah so the difficulty is that the lesion itself is not allowing gaurav to gaurav to, can we inject yes. more inject yeah and then we'll have some more cut on the, on the side by the side some more cut on this side yeah. and then uh, i think uh, we'll take care of the lesion by that cut yeah that side yeah perfect yeah now we can see you can see the stock yes Yes, excellent. Can we do no, it now? This left side. Now we'll do on this side. So, yeah. Can we inject more? Inject in submucosa. So what is happening is with as I'm dissecting the submucosal fibers because yeah. of the weight of the polyp. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it, acting as that's what I wanted to yeah. make it clear. Yeah. You think that? See now, see, see. what was I saying? Watch see the word. the lesion. See now the mucosa is peeled off because of the lesion itself. Come, come back and show them. Yeah. You have not made this big. Uh, yes. uh, uh, so it's the yeah. weight of the polyp yeah. which is helping the ESD, uh, the dissection to go smooth. In this case, it's not helping. It's yeah. <laughs> in fact causing problems. But yes, most of the times it helps. I'll just continue some emotions here. Yeah. yeah. First, let's coagulate that yeah. vessel so it doesn't come in between. Take the knife in yeah. and then go there and force, force coag. Yeah. Inject little. No, no, no. Just, just put four square. Just Dr. Gaurav and uh, yeah. Dr. Nilam, we'll just get back to you, okay, sir. Okay. I'll just go to Dr. Mohan and come back. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Dr. Mohan, yeah, so we're back uh, with you. Just to show the completion. So, th so th this is the incision which we closed. And that's the diverticulum. There was a small, while dissecting the muscle, uh, but you can see the septum. There is a V-shaped uh, incision there which has made this diverticular lumen and the esophageal lumen common. There is no big ridge over there now and the LES has opened completely. You can see now we can easily go inside. Previously I was not even going. So that was a fantastic demonstration. Excellent uh, demonstration. needs a board. big round of applause. And he has done both poem as well as septotomy. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Yes. One only, Viji. We are back with you, Dr. Gaurav. And, uh, so, Gaurav is almost done. He is watch. changing the knife. He can get IT fine. Otherwise, just we will continue with the same. IT, Olympus guy, IT knife, please. Fast. So, you can see we uh, dissected the polyp from the base. And uh, Dr. Nele was saying the polyp just peels off from the mucosa. You can very well see this is arising from the layer 2, the muscularis mucosa. So, Basically, this is IT knife 2. It's a smaller tip. You have IT knife, IT knife 2 and IT knife nano. For esophagus, either you have 2 or nano. You can't use the normal IT knife. It has, uh, a, a, IT stands for insulated tip. So, if, suppose, this is a very small stock. So, you can cut it with dual J2. But if it is a thicker stock, I would prefer IT knife because I don't know what lies beyond. beyond. And then, that insulated tip helps me. So that's the advantage of the ceramic tip. It prevents uh, damage to the deeper structures. And like in this case, I don't want any uh, damage to the mucosa on the other hand of the polyp. I could do this with a dual knife, but uh, just for demonstration, we're just showing how to use. So the importance with uh, ceramic tip or coated knife is that you want to go from distal to proximal. You want to hook this knife on the distal part, like over here, and then hook it and and then, then just I cut. It cuts from the underneath. Yes. So it's done. So, so this is how you get excellent. Very excellent. 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 And now we'll uh, just coagulate this uh, bleeding. And uh, first, let That's us take out the uh, specimen. This. And Gaurav, then we'll do you think you need to close this defect? No. Is this there is any reason to? 
uh, this seems to be straightforward. Yeah, uh, yeah it's too superficial. Yes. In fact, you still see submucosal fibers yes. there. Yeah. So we don't need to. So watch, no watch. muscle injury. Still, a lot of submucosa remaining. Uh, a, yeah. Hemostasis yeah. And no, first we take out the specimen and then yeah. do hemat okay. hemostasis. Gaurav okay. Bhushan here. You must be feeling Light. like Yashashvi Jaiswal, you know. Sachin Tendulkar standing Watch. behind you, Saurav Ganguly and you know, three <laughs> stalwarts. Amol, I think, great choice of a case. For the wash, wash. Thanks, Bhushan. Open. And Gaurav is a Tendulkar here. None. <laughs> Open. Right. Open. Okay. You can just apply the closed knife over yeah, that red thing. Yeah, be, no? Closed, closed, I, closed. Yeah, yes. No, no, there, there. Yeah. Also there at the mucosal side. Ha, huh, it's there. Dr. Garu, we'll just present the case on the other side, Dr. Nilay. Okay. And then we'll get back to you on the audio. Uh, a 39 year old female uh, presented with complaints of dysphagia to liquids and solids and regurgitation on and off since four years. Endoscopy showed dilated esophagus with liquid food residue and tight lower esophageal sphincter. Barium's follow done, it showed uh, dilated esophagus with smooth tapering. Manometry showed IRP of 30 and there is generalized failure of peristalsis in all wet swallows. Plan is to do poem and uh, learning objective is demonstration of poem in sigma edacalasia. Over to Rajesh Puri, sir. Dr. Puri and uh, Dr. Mohan. Yes. So first of all, thanks to, can you put the water? First of all, thanks to Amol. Uh, for giving this opportunity and uh, I have a fantastic master Mohan, can you put the water? Can you put the water? So I have a master Mohan with me and I remember my first poem was with Dr. Amol in Medicity around six years before and I've got a fantastic technician, uh, Mr. Man Singh and the anesthesia doctor Dr. Rashmi, Dr. Kalyani. So this is a sigmoid uh, achalasia and I think we have discussed in the morning my G junction is around 38, 39, yeah. 38, 39. So we have discussed in the morning few important points, the mucosa should be healthy and the curvature which come, you try to avoid. Mon has a point that either you include those curvature but if you look at here, they are quite proximal to it. So we will do around, is this okay? 39 was G junction and this is a little unhealthy mucosa, we will do it from here. Is that okay, Mohan? Yeah. So slightly above maybe. Yeah, this is 32 VR. Yeah. Okay. Can you give the water? Put the water. So this is the spine here on the left side at 3 o'clock position. This is roughly around posterior poem I'm going to plan at 5 o'clock position. So what, what knife you prefer? So I will use the hybrid knife. Okay. I type or T type? So T type. T type. Okay. Okay. Try to use the avascular area. Yeah. That can be, uh, can you take the needle out? Can you take the needle out? A uh, little bit inject slowly. Yeah, inject slowly, yes, inject, inject, keep on injecting, keep on injecting, yeah. So roughly around 10 cc I am going to inject. It's complete? Okay. So I have injected 10 cc diluted methylene blue. So this is a very important step. Uh, it looks simple, but once you get, you saw how the dynamic injection was done. Once he started getting a blep, 
he out tip up the scope and then whole of the solution was uh, deposited in a right plane so uh, from a posterior point of view uh, most people do uh, distal to proximal cut which rajesh is also doing so distal to proximal is uh, making okay this is the depth. out yeah that is okay okay now the second important point is trimming can you make it out make the knife out not completely is it okay so he is injecting so the, the advantage of this hybrid knife is any time you can inject with a uh, good jet of water so whenever in doubt inject so that is the keep it out him. please uh, out not to cut without seeing but whenever in doubt you have to inject inject so he is injecting and little bit expanding That's the all. submucosa is sufficient this is a very important technique to learn uh, as i shown in uh, demonstration also in all less all out over. little less out you can see now little less out so the Keep knife, the knife yeah. is slightly big so uh, you can adjust the length also so that you don't injure the underlying muscle yes can make the knife in yes so we are in now inject little bit yeah so that's, so that's the advantage even if you are uh, perpendicular to the muscle you can inject little bit, elevate some little of bit the submucosa knife is little keep dissection under karo thoda knife just the ko, muscle thoda plane. under karo yes not much out so what he is doing is adjusting the length of the knife so that he can see the tip the, the t the, part of the knife yeah the most important is you should able to see the knife <clears throat> okay don't keep on uh, keep it this level only when i will say keep it out then only do the out okay so i am doing on the endocut q effect of the two yeah inject little bit inject 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 more yeah is okay Sir, sir, I'm sure you're keep using. Keep the knife little bit in. Keep yes. the knife little bit in. Under karo knife. Yes, sir. Uh, please Put say loudly. Karo. Yes, you are using uh, some uh, for tunneling. You are using endocut Q. Yeah, he is using. So yeah, actually, I do my all procedure in the endocut Q with the effect of two and uh, with the cut interval and cut duration of three. Only in the large bleeding, I use the soft coagulation. otherwise i do my all procedure with the endocut q okay can you inject more inject more inject inject okay wait inject 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 okay wait so that's a very good question he is making uh, one small question yesterday we saw that uh, with the hybrid knife uh, somebody used a precise cut yeah you that is a precise is a intelligent cut and uh, but in my practice generally we have a bio we don't have a bio 3 so most of the time i am using this but if yes you can use the precise mode which is a intelligent cut and uh, at the time of need it can coagulate and at the inject so 
So what the are the only advantage of precise sect is even if you find some vessels there, you can keep on dissecting because yeah. you will call it. But for endo cut, so, I think you have to exchange okay. the accessory. So, so a small vessel, you just change the pedal, Mohan. You even don't require to change the setting also. You just need to change the pedal from blue to the yellow. If there is a big vessel, then definitely you require to change the setting yeah. to the soft coagulation. Is that right? Yeah. So, what are the various pros and cons of endo cut versus precise cut? And so, uh, yeah. So, the good question, as I said, it is a smart cut. So, when required, it apply the coagulation. When it required, it use as a cut. So, the only thing is, this is the principle of third space endoscopy. You always do inject. You always do your all procedure under vision. Inadvertently, if you uh, small vessel is came in between and there is a possibility of bleeding with the endocut Q, inject. Right, Dr. Puri and Dr. Bond, we'll get back to you. Thank you. Yeah, we are just near the G junction. Wait. Yes, I will keep watching you, sir. Right, we are presenting the next case for room 4. For the next case, we have a 47 year old gentleman who was diagnosed with achalasia cardia. The patient underwent poem uh, in the month of June elsewhere. Patient developed chest pain on post-operative day 3. Uh, endoscopy showed a mucosal defect just proximal to the G-junction and CT showed a collection in the left mediastinum. An ICD was placed to drain the collection and the patient was referred to us for further management. We labeled the patient as post poem perforation with mediastinitis. We placed a PEC tube and subjected the patient to three sessions of endovac therapy. Uh, so Dr. Bapai will now demonstrate endoscopic vacuum therapy for the esophageal perforation in this case. Hello there. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I have put the scope in. Are you getting the endoscopy <coughs> image? Yeah. So I am in the stomach. I have Harishal with me. And uh, this patient, you know, as I am pulling back, you can see that there is a big rent over here on the left side. And you know, this was a part of the tunnel. But this is where probably this was a delayed mucosal injury. This is what we anticipate. Because the proximal part here, the mucosal incision has healed. This is the mucosal incision, which has healed completely. Yeah. yeah. So this is about two weeks post-procedure. So uh, yesterday you all saw from uh, Brazil, the endovac therapy being placed and uh, performed and they demonstrated the intraluminal therapy. Here we will demonstrate the intracavitatory endovac. You can still see that there is a little bit, you know, quite a bit of pus here because uh, we just removed his earlier nasogastric tube with the this thing and what we are going to do is we go, we've gone into the cavity. We've also have a fluoro image over here, but we will show that in a mo moment. Let me first clean up, clean this up. So Amol, obviously the ICD is not working. Yeah, the intercostal drain is probably not working. That's but right. uh, what is important is that the nasogastric tube with the EVT, that will give us a lot of benefit. And uh, you will see in a minute, once this fluid is, you know, sucked out, that the granulation is pretty clean and, you know, it's quite nice. So that is what the thing is. I do anticipate that with this kind of a large defect, this patient is going to need several more subsequent sessions of EVT before, you know, we can expect that the defect is going to close down. But uh, gradually this will improve. It is very important to maintain nutrition in these patients. And that is the reason having the peg inside is very important. So it's a little bit of thick material which is which we are suctioning out. Amol, there are other options like uh, SAMS placement or OTSC. So the esophagus is dilated. In fact, you know, part of the history, we just give you a short history. This patient had an o OTSC being placed earlier, which we had to remove because it was only hanging from one side. See, we have to remember one thing that uh, when these patients, uh, you know, in any kind of a defect which occurs, you know, has come. there is tissue loss over there. And with the edematous edges of the defect, you know, the, any kind of a closure device is 
is doomed to fail basically because no, the yeah. hs will cut through also and if you have a collection of this size yeah. there is no yes. point closing the collection closing the, the defect, defect before you take care of the collection of the so collection. i so this is very important if you have pass outside no clip will work yes no no, no sutures will work yes. you have to take care of the infection first yes. and then only you can close maybe in the stent will not the work in this. Stent stent will not work in this yeah. even if stent. you take care of the infection outside stent will not work uh, in this situation if you see it is uh, the lot of gran uh, granulation tissue but it's not a healthy granulation tissue outside lot of fibrosis so this nothing will work uh, probably ovesco if you take care of the infection but before yeah. uh, taking care of infection you even you can't put ovesco no there is no way and you can see that the granulation is cleaning up now yeah. it's pretty nice in fact this inside it's a better granulation tissue yes, if you see inside is yeah. good granulation so, only a little bit of debris yeah. over here so healthy granulation tissue is red in color and it bleeds on touch that's healthy granulation tissue yeah now can we have the fluoro so uh, to show you the sc uh, scope vision uh, you know the position of the scope up so basically you are going back amul yeah. yeah it is upwards upwards it is upwards yeah <laughs> it is upwards you can see that and that is the reason the end of, and this is the upward direction and this is the lateral direction towards the yeah, it's a big, uh, it's a big, 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 big this color. is the entire plural cavity we are in yeah. the plural cavity over here just yeah. now the idea is that in this kind of a situation, you also apply negative suction on the intercostal drain so that the pleura, you know, the lung expands and then the mediastinum and the pleura separate. Once that separation occurs, then the defect starts closing much more so better. Pulmonologists, they have ready-made uh, negative suction yeah. uh, available uh, yeah. with them. Uh. Even Amol, plastic surgeons use the yes, lot of. Yeah. Yeah. Amol, I think yeah. this pocket is you know in the posterior mediastinal extra pleural. It's not in the pleural cavity. No, this patient definitely had a pleural this thing, uh -huh. and although it was initially extra pleural, it became intra pleural when the mediastinal collection drained into the pleura on the left side. So. Uh -huh. What what we would usually would do is there is a little bit of debris, so we will use hydrogen peroxide and betadine to clean up the area, and then uh, wash it with saline, and then place a guide wire, and then. Oh, sorry. See again, uh, what in our experience, what we have seen, that most of the major pockets they remain in the either posterior mediastinum extra pleurally, and we, when you put the ICD. It drains a small amount of fluid which has leaked into the pleural cavity. Yeah, Not that really happens. That definitely happens. Really whole that is uh, pockets which is there in the posterior mediastinum. Yeah, that definitely happens. Uh -huh. I do agree. Yeah. And second question is if there would have not been such a large opening, what yeah. other than endoscopic options you have? As I said, closure of the defect is not likely to work. What is going to happen is we have to allow this area to granulate and heal and f fibrose and close off that is more important no no what i am saying in this no, you case you can use the a, opening the is quite pediatric big. scope you could actually. pass the scope inside okay, okay. the cavity yeah, yeah okay. we can use a pediatric, pediatric scope. scope we can okay. use a pediatric scope okay okay to go inside if the okay. defect is not this big because uh, then I'm all, so yeah. what you are basically saying is that this will all heal by secondary intention yes, well. yes 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 it will, it will. and um, this would be over a matter of weeks, months? Yeah, matter of weeks, hopefully not months. <laughs> but the pa you have to counsel these patients for patience because that is what, you know, is most important because they are going to be, you know, obviously impatient. The patient came for a poem procedure and now there is a lot of, Amol, you know, this, this looks to me so I have mediastinal a space because I yes. don't see ICD. So, couple uh, questions for you. No, You're irrigating no, just... But you don't see ICD in the... No, we, yeah. it's on this side. The ICD is on this side. Yeah, earlier we have seen it in okay, one of the okay, earlier okay. These things we have seen it. Sir? Uh, and you are irrigating just with plain water, nothing Plain else. water and I used hydrogen peroxide and betadine earlier. But now I think this is pretty clean enough so I will not put any more hydrogen peroxide. I will place a guide wire here because then that helps me to guide my you know, nasogastric tube into the thing. So, so any preference for guide wire Amul or any guide wire is fine? I am fine. using the Visiglide over here. So steeper stiff, would stiff not one. be better? Sir, uh, I am worried about the tip of the wire. 
penetrating into the no, you no, know no, lung or just thing. just uh, 0.035 steep zebra or steep wire see the vizi has a better stiffness that is what i i feel than a zebra or a, you know the other wire that is what we feel where do we plan to leave in the cavity the endovac the distal most portion the mid part the opening ah, bus. so i am placing it on the upper side you know towards the proximal the upward side now can uh, we place two we can yes. only thing is you'll have two tubes coming out of the nostril that would be and it is yeah that will be uh, difficult for the patient the other thing is I I also place a marker, a external marker, just at the entry, in, you know, the entry point into the cavity on the esophageal wall, because that just helps me to guide the uh, nasogastric tube, because otherwise that can become difficult. Sometimes it's difficult to, you know, n uh, adjust that. So this is the entry point. Var 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 var. Amul, yeah. just tackling this issue is going to be sufficient or the external drainage which is not found right now should be functional. I feel both should be. Yeah, I mean the external drain can also be adequate but we are going to be applying a, we are applying a high uh, uh, intensity suction around 100 to 120 millimeters. So this cavity actually empties out completely on the, uh, you know, as soon as uh, you apply the suction. So that is what is important. Now we will just bring the uh, guide wire out of the nose by placing a uh, nasal catheter and bring it out. If you want to go to Rajesh's room, you can go there. And uh, right yesterday side. we demonstrated, you know, Dr. Eduardo demonstrated in the video how the EVT has been placed, yeah, can be made, the indigenous EVT can be made. We can probably just show you on the, can you come here? On the external camera. Amal, will so, you get the CT scan done uh, after the procedure? Uh, not we immediately, just, huh? meaning presently we don't want to have the CT scan. So we've already prepared the one EVT for uh, to save time. But this is all that you need for the EVT. Uh, nasogastric tube, 18 or 20, uh, 20 uh, size. And you need some sutures and you can either use the sponge if there is a lot of uh, debris inside the cavity, you can use the sponge and you can tailor it and apply it on tip of the on the tip of the nasogastric tube to cover the fenestrations, and you can trim it. You don't need a very bulky sponge. The idea is just to close the fenestrations, or we can use the uh, EVT, the gauze, and the Ioban, uh, you know, uh, drape. Uh, design which uh, Dr. Eduardo demonstrated yesterday. So this is what we have prepared now in this for this patient. We, and then of course we will be checking it when we go there. And you need sutures, you also need tie sutures over here and if we are using the uh, sponge, then we also use the 2O or 3O ethylon to suture the sponge onto the uh, nasogastric tube. And uh, that way we can, we can do a good this thing. So uh, that is all that you need and uh, the sponge becomes a little bit more expensive because this is, the, the sponge is around 10,000, that is what the price is or whatever. But uh, the Iopan with the gauze becomes really very inexpensive, less than 1,000 rupees because the entire Iopan costs around uh, 3,000 rupees or so and uh, you can get plenty of pieces out of it because you only need a small piece. So that becomes very easy and anyways these patients require subsequent procedures so you can use the Ioban repeatedly, the same Ioban uh, repeatedly. So the nasogastric tube, we've made up a, um, a hole at the tip for uh, it to be, uh, you know, passed over a guide wire and we will now over there uh, to the patient, we will just check on suction that the EVT is working and then we will place it inside. section here. Some nothing is awkward like that. Yeah. Mike, lovely. Love. Hmm. 
काहीतरी एक धर काहीतरी एक धर असं म्हणतो मी हां म्हणजे मी ओके सो नाव आय एम अप्लाईंग सक्षम एंड यू कॅन सी दॅट द सक्षम इज वर्किंग व्हेरी वेल सो दॅट मीन्स दॅट द इव्हीटी इज वर्किंग so any special settings for the suction that you need to take care of yeah settings for suction settings we we maintain it around 100 to 120 that is the plan okay and now we are passing the uh, evt over the guide wire swapnil is doing this and swapnil and sambhaji are helping me straight hello you need to keep the nasogastric tube quite straight otherwise uh, it is sometimes difficult to pass the wire pull 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 sir pull yeah pull 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 okay pull pull yeah okay nahi wire na nahi this yeah this is a suture 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 i don't talk to you okay so i am guiding this inside var var dakh wire pull kare thoda aa la aa la stretch the wire okay kali now the trick is to make sure that it enters the cavity because that is where the challenge can be and sometimes we have to pass the scope alongside to make sure wire wire bahut hai bahut bahut kaafi andar hai wire hai varthi okay help i think i'll pass the scope alongside because that will help sometimes you can also use a pitatic scope to pass it alongside because otherwise it can come back but the advantage is you know with a evt always remember that when you are pulling out the scope before that you apply the suction because that will help to maintain your nasogastric tube in place because uh, otherwise there is a chance that you know you might be able to the tube, comes, might, out. The tube comes out it's entering now that turn yeah that angle is a little bit acute na mm. so would you like to use the forceps some all or you think just uh, push just with the with, scope should be okay just with the scope most often it goes yeah if it doesn't then we may we can use the forceps not that it is contraindicated it's just has to be guided inside Is little the little pack little. open or closed? Like closed, closed. Okay, because I can't seem to be getting a distension. So that's the reason. So see, I'm asking. No, get, get, get. Okay, we've gone inside. Yeah. Okay. We've gone inside. So now, Swapnil, you push. As you push, I also push the scope inside. yeah so with the kind of suction we are going to apply even 3/4 of the way are enough or you want it full inside we want it full inside yeah. because the thing is that uh, you will have uh, otherwise intraluminal secretions coming back mm. yeah so that's the important point i think he is trying to make the secretions from the lower esophagus will start coming into the suction amol sir how do you ensure yeah. amol sir venkat here yeah uh, sir is it not uh, uh, if if we put this uh, endovac on the most dependent part of the uh, mediastinum see uh, so or you want to push it uh, right up push, to push, the push, point push, that push, you had gone and seen no see venkat 
the earlier end of act was placed on the it was the lateral side but today when we went inside we found there was more fluid in the proximal part you saw that yes. when we went inside yes so that is the reason i am trying to turn it upwards because if we can do that then we will have you know that area is, you know training which well, is yeah. training well so that is the reason i am trying to put it on that side so because you are applying suction the dependent position and all that doesn't matter much yes it doesn't matter much abol can you share your yeah, protocol yeah i think it's gone well in the yeah. abol yeah naresh here yes sir can you share your protocol or once you put an endovac how what do you follow up when do you change the endovac every 3 to 4 days we would change it and uh, we immediately apply suction except for when the patient is being shifted so the suction is continuously on what is the pressure in suction 100 to 120 hi okay. uh, this is saurabh mukhewar here dr bape ha uh, yeah saurabh. so there are a couple of uh, advised recommended methods of endovac from what i could see one was the intra luminal where they have placed the endovac inside the esophageal lumen and the other is what we are doing here do you have any experience with just intra luminal when you have a yes, difficult time putting it inside the cavity does that work because i have not personally done that yeah we we have uh, some experience with that as well okay okay thodi sha jal pa ah डॉक्टर बताया आई हैव अ क्वेश्चन सुकृत है सो इन आर प्रैक्टिस व्हेन वी हैव अ बोर हाफ सो इट स्टार्ट बिहेविंग लाइक अ बोर हाफ दिस केस सो द चेस्ट सर्जन्स इफ दे नीड टू डू अ वैट्स दे डू अ वैट्स दे प्लेस एन आईसीडी एंड देन दे पुट दैट ऑन अ कंटीन्यूअस सक्शन या सो वुड दैट बी बेटर वी विल हैव हिज नोज और हिज माउथ आल्सो अवेलेबल एंड देन वी कैन जस्ट प्लेस अ स्टेंट लाइक वी डील विद अ बोर हाफ ओके या तो ये तो बराबर की चीज है Yeah. Okay, uh, I, uh, so the, I'm like answering that. You see this opening; it is extremely difficult for the stent to close it. Yes. How many times we have failed putting a stent, and uh, then you take it out after six to eight weeks, and the opening might have gone down in the size, but it's still there. And uh, you ask anyone, like you know, you take uh, opinion poll. Those who have done it would say that we fail a lot of times. हाँ uh, अगर प्रेशर आपको रख सकते हो उस पर तो यू डोंट नीड टू पुट द नीडल इफ यूर प्रेशर नीडल इज टू मेंटेन द प्रेशर एट हंड्रेड सो दैट इट डजेंट गो बियॉन्ड ओके एट द कनेक्टिंग पॉइंट कनेक्टिंग पॉइंट बिकॉज इफ यूर वॉल प्रेशर इज हायर देन यू हैव टू पुट द नीडल सो दैट यू मेंटेन द प्रेशर एट दैट डिस्ट्रिक्ट नाउ संभाजी इज अप्लाइंग सक्शन एज आई एम पुलिंग द स्को पैक स्लोली and you can see that the nasogastric tube is not moving that is very important because otherwise all your effort is lost so that's that's the end of the procedure now we will apply suction in this patient and this patient will probably come back after 3 uh, uh, days probably on uh, wednesday we will plan the will this patient be in hospital uh, yes he is admitted in hospital so all the time till the therapy is over Yes. Two weeks, three yes, weeks. Yes, because applying the suction at home is not going not to be possible. possible. Uh, Amol sir. Yeah. Amol, so Hi. How much? How, how much is the suction? Uh, how much is the suction, and how much aspirate uh, pus comes out per day? And See, do we it depends. Monitor? Yeah. Initially, earlier, you know, when there is a lot of uh, collection in the cavity, more um, fluid is going to come out. As the cavity collapses, the fluid may not be there at all. You may not get adequate any fluid at all, or very minimal. 20 30 ml but it is a suction continuous suction which is going to stick the surfaces and allow and initiate the granulation process that is very important reduction what happens to the opening like you know the cavity collapses and then yeah. there is a small, small opening then there is a small opening which you will see at the end of the and just let the, it go just let it go if it heals with fibrosis sometimes you may need to put a couple of clips or you can even put a biodegradable plug over there to seal off that opening if there is a small track which is remaining but so even if things. there is an opening with a blind cavity it, part, it, it becomes it part becomes of the part of the you don't have to do anything you don't have to do that yeah. Yeah. so if there is no pre leak you don't have to do anything yeah, there has to be a pre leak yes that is uh, our amol so, yeah you said this patient came early within 2 weeks but if there is a patient who has come late 
to your, you know, after doing multiple attempts of other therapies, where the cavity is completely fibrosed. So still you will go with the same uh, approach or? Uh, See, if there is a delayed leak, presentation of a delayed leak, there is no hope of a primary closure in that kind of a situation. No, actually fibrosis will not occur yeah. because cavity, cavity, cavity is will open, but pus itself will not allow fibrosis. fibrosis. Even if you have, there will be filmsy adhesions, yes. which scope you can take it out. If the, the purpose of doing this, this is to is cause fibrosis. fibrosis. So I don't think when no, there no, is no. infection, fibrosis can happen. So, uh, Dr. Amol, you See, said no, that no, what I'm saying that if there is a large cavity, pleural cavity, yeah. which is fibrosed, if you just internally drain, the, cavity, the ball will remain, fibrous ball will remain as it is. It will not allow lung to expand. Okay, so in, in that, that situation, that sometimes you may require an endoscopic, uh, thoracoscopic uh, de decortication may be required. Yeah. If there is a lung collapse with fibrosis and a pleural thickening, that could be required. Yeah, yeah. Additional that, therapy, that additional would, be therapy required, would be required the for the, doesn't for the pleura. Yeah, 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 that doesn't, that, that cannot be uh, avoided. Managed. So my right. question is okay. that you said that it has to be done every two to three days, the uh, changes. So yeah. how do we know the, now we have to stop and no more? So, no, so you will see the, the cavity closing gradually and once the cavity starts closing, it really happens very rapidly. So then at that point in time, you will see that the area is cleaning up and the granulation is sticking together and suddenly you see that the cavity is closing quite well and that can happen. And, and the drain, and the the drain, drain reduces. reduces yeah. no, drain also reduces. Drain reduces. Yeah. Right. Thank you, sir. We Thank just move on to Dr. Puri. Uh, Rajesh Puri, sir. And Mohan, sir. Yes, we are. We have been with you watching. So uh, uh, we have completed the procedure. Uh, we have done the myotomy. Very this, nice. this, is the, this is the G junction and we have done around 2 cm distal to that. Can you wash? Yeah. Wash. Okay. So we will come to the lumen, look for the mucosal injury and uh, this is the yeah, very wide G open. junction. Very nice. Is that okay? Very good. And the last yeah. part is to close with the clip. Yeah. It's a fantastic demonstration. Very good. Rajesh, um, great uh, demonstration. And we just saw on in the other room, uh, it is nice to, for us to get a perspective of what could happen. Most of the poems go very well. So is there a way of predicting um, in which cases mucosal injury can happen? And is there something you could do right after the procedure? You're obviously inspecting. And I saw that on the previous procedure with the speedboat, there was maybe a, an aspect of mucosal injury as well. Yes. So, Dr. Prashad, I think is a very, very good question. Two, three things which we can take care. Number one, if there is a fibrosis, the dissection should be very gentle, layer by layer, number one. Number second, while coagulating the blood vessels towards the mucosa side, you should take care, you should use the co-grasper, hold the blood vessel, pull towards you, and then you apply the energy. And number third, fourth aspect is, try avoiding the blunt dissection, because when you do a blunt dissection, or more towards the mucosa, your plane of dissection should be between the submucosa and the muscle layer. Generally what happened is, if you are doing between the mucosa and the submucosa, uh, then the chances of the mucosal injury are very high. So you should ensure these three points and then the chances of mucosal injury are less. And after, ex after doing the procedure, always look for the mucosal injury. Grade one, you can leave it, otherwise it is better to clip on the uh, time of finishing the procedure. And also the uh, quality of mucosa pre prior to taking them. The if the mucosa is edematous, uh, I will tell uh, nodular, then the closure is not that perfect. And two, uh, what type of current you are using. If Open. you are using more cutting current like what Rajesh used, we can have intra-procedural bleeding more, mm -hmm. but less of uh, post-procedure post, uh, yeah, uh, post -procedure leaks. While if you use coagulation like spray coagulation more, there will be less of intra-procedural bleed, but if you are not careful, your mucosa may get burn and present later on as a leak. So one has to be very careful while using spray coagulation or high, uh, uh, high powerful current which work in non-touch te non technique where 
even if you are not touching you may burn the back of the mucosa could you share what your protocol is after you do the poem how do you watch the patients do you do anything before you discharge them um, yeah so uh, no on the left side please make it on the left side Nice so Rajesh, you have some protocol? We yes. Uh, what we do is we keep the patient nil, nil by mouth for 24 hours. Earlier we just wait. We were doing the uh, gastrographin study. Uh, left flange on the down. Yeah. Yes. So we do a uh, gastrographin study on the day two, and if there is no leakage, we send the patient for five days on the liquid diet with a PPI. Give an antibiotic a shot before and give the oral antibiotic for three to five days. We call, after five days, we allow the patient to uh, take the soft diet and the normal diet. And uh, after three months, a repeat endoscopy and the manometry study we do. Yeah, it also depends you. on your happiness, your own satisfaction. But now the mucosal start, incision yeah. was closed. If you are not very happy, I don't know how when one can score that and more objectively. And if the closure is not that great, and background mucosa is not good. I think we can prolong the fasting by 48 to 72 hours. That heals up everything. But if you are very confident about closure and uh, the mucosa is good, patient has no comorbidities, no uh, antiplatelets, I think uh, we can discharge them next day without doing any uh, contrast studies. So now so you, yeah, close, close. Now you have seen, yeah. over there so uh, with your permission can we yes yes uh, the last point yeah last yeah. point while applying the clip very important you should not take the side mucosa because in the sigmoid while doing the dissection lot of the mucosa comes along so you have seen with the flange of my clip i have removed the side mucosa so there should not be a overlapping of the uh, overlapping yes. of the clip on the overlying mucosa because the delayed leaks are there and the patient may come with the mediastinitis. Open. We so, Tevi sir, they'll keep watching you on the sidelines. Yeah. We are, st uh, are we ready, Dr. Amal, yeah, for the, the... Yeah, I think we'll close the session yeah, and uh, yeah, the, the live session, the yeah, morning we... session, uh, uh, live session, and we'll go ahead with the lectures. Sanjay mm -hmm. and Sachin, you can sure, sure. take the proceedings over there. Yeah, we thank the moderators and the chairpersons. The procedures will continue in the background and we'll go ahead with the lectures. We are now going to speak about endoluminal surgery, um, bailing out of complex situations. The first... Okay. Yeah. Sorry. This session is on perforation management and Dr. Pankaj Desai is going to speak on perforations during colonic EMR and ESD. So Dr. Dr. Pankaj, we can see you. Dr. Pankaj, you are on. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hey, mic off. Can I call the Parla. moderators? Can you hear me, please? Yeah, one. Hello. Am I audible in the auditorium? Yes, Dr. Pankaj. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Moderator for this session are uh, Shravan Kumar uh, Sridhar Sundaram, uh, Dr. N. Suraj Kumar and uh, Dr. Alok Mishra. Can you come on the dais, please? Can Dr. Pankaj start? Okay. Uh, good afternoon and again I thank uh, Amol and his entire team at DMH uh, here uh, for this kind of invitation and very quickly uh, we would uh, see uh, the dreaded complication of perforation which is a nightmare for any uh, endoscopist during EMR and ESD. Uh, the EMR perforations are usually uh, classified uh, according to the Sydney classification and it is uh, from type 0 which is not a perforation to type 5. Uh, type 0 would be a no normal defect, type 1 would be a visible ampullary. so in these two I don't think we need to do anything. Type 2 would be a focal loss of submucosa and you will not be able to appreciate the difference between uh, the muscle and the submucosa. Type 3 is an M proper uh, muscle injury but not full thickness and type 4 and type 5 would be a full thickness muscle injury, uh, type 5 would be with contamination. <clears throat> These are the examples that we see. 
type 0 this is a normal uh, ESD or EMR scar that we see uh, with a submucosal layer which is there on the muscle and without any perforation so this is a good one the type 1 would be you are seeing the muscle fibers like this in a circular fashion and this is called a veil sign uh, therefore this is also not a perforation but the muscle is visible type 2 is there is a lack of differentiation uh, between the muscle and the submucosa and therefore uh, there is a chance that a muscularis propria may be uh, damaged during this procedure this is an example this is a large polyp here you are seeing this after the EMR you see this white scar and this indistinct area where it is not blue so there is a probability of a muscle injury in this area and this needs to be closed type 3 is a proper muscle injury which is not full thickness but you see a target sign that is a defect in the muscle layer here and that is known as the target sign and when you see the specimen you see the reverse of it that is the reverse target sign or the specimen sign so this is a type 3 injury this is an example of you what you are seeing this is a defect here that is a target sign and this is a reverse target sign and even this needs to be closed type 4 is a full thickness perforation where there is you can see the retroperitoneal structures and once this is contaminated with stool this is a type 5 injury so uh, how to manage this the most important thing is recognition once you recognize this injury the immediate thing you have to do is try to close this injury and every EMR or ESD I think we have to keep clips ready with us this is an example which we are seeing a laterally spreading tumor here which is being removed with EMR the problem here is when we take a large bulk then there is a chance that you get the muscle along with it so what we do is any defect which is larger than two centimeters if we are doing an EMR it should be a piecemeal EMR here you can see this is a good defect but as you go near you will see that you have a target sign here so this needs to be closed and how do we close it we take a clip take the distal muscle margin and try not to close only the muscle but if it is possible to take the mucosal edge along with it therefore you will have a secure closure so this is one technique which we usually use and you apply multiple clips till you have a full closure of the defect like this this is very important in this uh, videos are courtesy Dr. Rajvinder Singh and uh, Dr. Nila and Amol also have helped me in making this videos and to uh, help uh, teaching this session so uh, this is another example where you have a big defect here a big LST again we are injecting trying to do an EMR once this is done you take the bulk of the lesion a little more area has been taken off and therefore you see that there is a full thickness muscle defect here in these defects you have to close the muscle defect and also approximate the mucosa along with it so that you don't have leakage of CO2 or stool or contamination of the peritoneal cavity. Closure is our utmost importance and you have to use sturdy clips. The most important thing whenever this perforation occur is if you are doing an EMR usually we do it at 6 o'clock position try to turn the patient so that it becomes a non-dependent position and then try and close the incision to avoid if there is any fecal contamination possibility is there. Again a lesion here which we are doing and you see a small perforation which has to be closed this is a very large perforation here you can see a full thickness perforation and there is, was a lot of capnoperitoneum so what do we do in such cases you do a peritoneal tapping the anesthetist would tell you the abdomen is very tense the patient is having problem in respiration therefore you use a 16 gauge in tracket put in in the right upper quadrant and along with it put fill saline so that you can see the carbon dioxide escaping as bubbles here and this is very important one other important step I will show you a little later how you can just keep it if you are doing an ESD so uh, for deep mucosal deep mural injury in EMR uh, we have to be uh, very careful we have to be very suspicious and always look for them lesions more than 25 if they are removed are particularly associated with higher risk therefore try to avoid uh, taking large bulk of lesions in one single bite in EMR type 1 type 2 as I told you don't need anything type 3 onwards you have to close the defect 
and if there is contamination you have to be very uh, give antibiotics keep a surgeon ready if any peritoneal lavage is needed or if you can't close these lesions so how would you minimize good preparation is mandatory for any emr for small lesions use cold snare rather than hot snare give adequate submucosal injection <clears throat> Avoid EMR uh, and block EMR for lesions more than 20 millimeters. The process, grasp the polyp, close the loop, jiggle a little so that if the muscle is entrapped, it goes up beyond. Look at the opposite wall and if unsure, let go and recapture. Then once it is captured, the polyp should be cut using an endocut current 1, 2, 3 and if it doesn't cut in 3, if it goes beyond 3, there is either a muscle inside or it is you have taken a very large chunk so therefore be careful loosen it again uh, recapture it always examine both the specimen and the floor of the emr in esd <clears throat> why do perforations occur is usually because of the electric discharge from the cautery in which cases are more vulnerable is when there is fibrosis yeah so uh, this is the fibrosis which we see and when we are dealing with such fibrosis we have to be very careful we have to prevent bleeding in these cases and charring because this will cause perforation and it could be delayed perforation very thin muscle if you have a coagulation defect as you see here <clears throat> is likely to perforate at a later stage so reduce the co2 as i told keep clips ready immediate closure is important and close in such a way that you do not hamper further dissection so initially when there is a perforation just dissect around the perforation go a little deeper and then you can apply the clips i'll just very quickly show you because i'm running out of time this is a small perforation you can see esd is being done here and you can see a perforation which has been created here so once this you see this perforation you close the perforation immediately with the clips from the naive area go and do the dissection again and remove the lesion and again check the perforation at the end and apply additional clips if required so this is another example which we are just going to skip for the lack of time this is an important trick which we in amol's last conference we all had seen that when you are tapping this abdomen peritoneum and you have to just someone have to hold the syringe what you do is take a copy cup make a hole in it and you can just make it as a support this will allow you to complete your procedure without the abdomen getting tense so uh, conclusions for per esd perforation you can be managed conservatively and by clipping or required if suturing delayed management can reason in bacteremia and shock and decision regarding surgery should not be delayed prevention is the best and I am not going to talk about this full thickness perforations because there is another talk on it. So post-operatively you have to have a team approach, let your intensivist look after them, keep the patients and nilvorally, give antibiotics, closely monitor the parameters and at any stage if you find that the patient is deteriorating, the surgeon should be called in. This is an example, this uh, a small perforation, this is normal after ESD. This is a post polypectomy syndrome where the serosa is only touched, perforation with no leak, here there is air leak. So in these cases, there is type 4 and type 5, you have to have surgery along with clip closure. So uh, thank you for the uh, patient hearing and we will have questions at the end of the session. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you Dr. Pankaj. We'll move on to the next lecture. Uh, Dr. Pankaj, you can join on the stage. Uh, Dr. Asma Alkhandari will speak on clip closure of EMR and ESD defects, what you need to know. We'll be very crisp with the timings because we are a bit late. Uh, good, good afternoon. Um, this is Asma from Kuwait. I would talk about clip closure of EMR and ESD defect. Like uh, need for clip closure, post EMR, we always uh, clip, uh, clip the defect because of the risk of delay bleeding and in case of ESD we always worried of deep deep thermal injury and delay perforation. The technique that we're using for clip closure. This is a landmark study which was published uh, by Heiko Paul and uh, Moyen was part of it. For any polyp more than 20 millimeter, especially in the proximal location, these kind of uh, polyp that showed that uh, 
clipping reduce the delay bleed by almost two thirds uh, of the of the cases. And this is a meta-analysis which was published around like they taken nine trials. With all the trials showed that the clipping after EMR is really decreased the risk of delay bleed. This is a, a video which showed that the technical um, that we use for clip closure here, a polyp at the C cup side, and as, you, as you can see, is like uh, it looks benign. That's why we decided to do an EMR for such lesion. But because the patient is like he's old and frail, then we decide to to clip the lesion after the resection. We took piece and uh, bit and pieces, we remove it by multi pieces AMR, and then we decided and we used the soft tip coagulation to decrease the risk of recurrence. And then we decided to use the conventional technique of clip closure. As you can see here, I use the microtic um, clips, it's wide, this is 16, and they do have 20 millimeter. Uh, and then I took the normal mucosa from one side to the other, to the other normal mucosa from other side with the sucking of air and trying to approximate the two edges. I started from the middle and then clipped the rest of the defect. By, you can start like in the middle, or I will show you that in the other techniques where you can use zipper technique, like we were using it in POEM. We start from the, like, uh, the distal two edges, and then approximate the whole edges. This is another technique we start using it. Sometimes the defect is like so big we can't, like we can approximate the two edges. And here in this such legion we have done ESD and then after that we start, we just decided because it's like we encountered a lot of bleeding and we were worried about the deep terminal injury. Then we decided to to close the defect, but we use a clipper line where we, as we can use it, you, you know how we use it for the uh, traction, we just uh, tie the, the suture or the dental floss at the clip, put it, and then we pull the line, and we put another clip to approximate the two edges, and then we clip the entire defect. As you can see, uh, we started in the middle to just because as the defect is the, the bigger defect in the middle, and then we st start at the both sides. This is the end result of the closure. This is another technique, we're using it for big defect, like a twist technique, where you can just, uh, to just make the legion smaller, you, you, have, you catch the two edges, twist, and then uh, close and apply the clip. Like as you can see, we apply the, the clip, twist, and apply another clip to make the defect smaller and to approximate the two edges. This is the zipper technique that I'm talking about uh, during poems. At the end, as we, you have seen it a lot, like we approximate the two edges, make it like you suture it. And all of us, I think we have done a lot of these things. This is a clipping with the help of water immersion. Then you can just, if you have really good bowel prep, that does like, uh, it's really, it's, it's really important to have a good bowel prep before you start any procedure. Like with the water immersion, it, the, like the, the mucosa become very floppy, where you can easily catch it and approximate the two edges. And you can see here that after I approximate the two edges, we can just clip the, the, the normal mucosa, hold it with the clip, and take it to the other edge and apply it. 
this is the technique that when you can't, because the mucosa is very fl floppy and it catch with a clip, as you can see, we catch it, and then we go to the normal mucosa and deploy the clip. That's why then Boston, they came with, a, with this mantis clip, which has this, the same idea, has really very good for catching forceps, where you can catch, go to the normal mucosa and apply the, the clips to the normal mucosa, which is really good for the large defect, big perforation, and it really helps. This is a lesion where we have like a, a perforation during ESD. This is the lesion, we did an ESD. With the rubber band, we dissect. The rubber band is really helpful for like, you can see the go plane dissect properly. And you can see here with the rubber band, you see the plane very, very nicely. But unfortunately, we get like a small perforation at the end of the procedure. Then I clip the perforation and was, I tried to clip the entire defect. It's always better to clip the perforation side than you clip the entire defect during perforation. As here, we, then we start using this, the conventional technique and for clipping. This is the best case scenario that when you have like a, a, a lesion and you decide to do a perforation, uh, to do not a perforation, to do a resection, and you get a perforation at the end of the, uh, that you're lucky you get the perforation at the end of your resection after you resect the whole things, then you just apply a clip and close it. You close, the de you close the perforation side, and then you try to close the whole defect if you can. Thank you. I think Dr. Pankaj is coming in from... Uh, Dr. Asma, you could join on the stage, please. Dr. Asma, please join on the stage. Dr. Sidip Dhar Chaudhary couldn't be with us and Dr. Pankaj is stepping in for him. Dr. Pankaj, we can see you. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, again, uh, good afternoon and this is a small talk. I think uh, Sudip Toh has taken ill and he has sent this talk. So, I am just uh, uh, delivering it in behalf of him <clears throat> and then uh, probably we can discuss and try to finish it off fast. Uh, endo loop clips, when, where and how, that is uh, topic of his talk. And as we have seen in the previous two talks that uh, anything, any defect is need, needs to be closed when there is high risk of uh, perforation, when there is a perforation or there is high risk of bleeding after the perforation. So, uh, any after any mucosal resection, uh, the chances of uh, adverse events are uh, almost uh, 0.7 to say 12 percent depending on the location of the lesion. Uh, esophagus, you have a high chance of perforation around 1.5 to 5, 3 to 4 in stomach Duodenum is very high, 15 to 25, colon, right colon is on the world, around 4 percent and if the lesion is less than 20, then the chances go down. So, uh, to avoid this or to manage this uh, adverse events, closure is required. As you can see here, during the procedure, you can see a full thickness perforation here and you can see the peritoneal structures outside, you can see the momentum here. So, in such cases, you need to close these perforations. We have different techniques. Dr. Asma has showed you some. I have showed you some in my previous talk so that you can use uh, multi maybe clips and see, uh, uh, follow up these patients with a scan later on and see if you have a complete closure. <coughs> Chances of bleeding also, <coughs> sorry, uh, would depend on uh, uh, the uh, patients uh, taking any anticoagulants or antiplatelets and depending on that, there is a prediction score for the model. So, in these cases where the patient is having this sort of medications, 
and if you have uh, to do a emergency surgery the chances of bleed in the post operative period would be high and therefore in such cases you would need to close plus uh, the segments of the GIT have different thickness and different maneuverability of the sco scope and therefore there are certain difficult locations. So depending on this we have we can identify the areas where we need to close the defect prophylactically even if there is no perforation especially in esophagus which is very thin uh, as cervical esophagus the stomach is a good area where you can leave uh, defects open duodenum and the right colon around the area of the IC wall definitely needs to be closed even if there is not a perforation. So stomach and rectum you can just leave it open. This is uh, area, this is uh, the overall adverse events and delayed bleeding in a stomach closure versus non-closure in a study is shown that it's 5.4 versus 12.4. So therefore it is statistically significant and therefore lesions in the stomach also needs to be closed if they are full thickness. So mucosa and muscle thick so clip closure is probably inadequate because the drastic mucosa is very thick. Loop closure is indicated in these cases higher on the lesser curve we have seen in uh, live demonstrations in the cardia and around the fundus. In duodenum, the delayed adverse events, uh, complete closure versus non-complete closure is drastically different and therefore you have to close all the duodenal defects regardless of the location because the mucosa and muscles are very thin. Small defects can be closed with clips but larger defects more than 3 centimeters need a loop and clip closure. So this is we are talking about mucosal closures. In colorectum again there is a statistically different uh, between the non-closure and closure delayed bleeding and therefore you have to close especially uh, in the right colon. The challenge is in the colon wall. The muscularis layers from the hostra of the colon and the rectum is thick and the muscular layers are also very thick and therefore it's not very easy to have a clip closure. So loop and clip closure is indicated in right colon especially for lesions more than uh, 30 mm. Uh, we are the, I have already showed you this classification. So now going on to the technique, there are two types of loop available. One is the poly loop from Olympus, uh, that is uh, attached loop, and this requires a double channel scope for delivery. And there is another loop available uh, from another uh, company called Endomed, and these loops are a detachable loop. So these are the two different types of loops which we use, and the technique using the Olympus loop is use a double channel, take the loop out from one spread the loop around the defect with the other attach this loop uh, with the clips and then close the loop this is the technique and these are couple of videos which will show you the technique as you see here loop is being attached to the margins with clips very carefully you have to attach the clips take a thick bite of the mucosa with the underlying submucosa and once that is done you have to just like you see here pull the loop very slowly and very firmly so that the entire bunch of clips would come collapse and close the defect. This is a very effective mucosal closure mechanism and in this case we have started using this not only for mucosal closure but for full thickness closure and this is one example where we see we are removing a large submucosal tumor from the stomach they in this is in the fundus and therefore it is very difficult to close with OTSC so what we have done is we have put a detachable loop now we are applying clips to the margin of the defect and slowly after we have applied you can see all the clips have been applied to the margin this is the defect in the center then we take go in again grasp the loop by and then slowly we are closing this will give you a robust closure I have a comparison uh, but this is not closing the muscle but you approximate the mucosa along with the muscle which comes nearby gastric muscle would heal very well so this is very useful in the gastric uh, fundus so I think uh, with this I will stop this lecture here and uh, Sudipto has asked me to invite all of you for uh, this pancreatic meeting which is happening in September. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Pankaj. We move to the next lecture, Full Thickness Clips, When and When Not. Dr. Saurabh Bokewar from Midas, Nagpur.
Okay, very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Bape and the free endoscopy team for having me here. So I'll be talking about perforation management, full thickness clips, when and when not. So essentially, two clips are available in the market, the Ovesco OTSC clip and the padlock clip by Steris. And when you're evaluating the options between these clips, when you're looking at OTSC clips, you have to make a decision with the type of clip. So if you see, uh, the type A is meant primarily for hemostasis, type T, is meant for hemostasis or tissue closure, and type GC is for gastric wall closure. The endoscope diameter which you're going to use and the depth of cap can be variable between three and six millimeters, and for the padlock clip, it can be either an upper uh, scope clip or the lower scope clip or the colon scope clip. Uh, Ovesco also has come up with the FTRD device as well as the Stentfix. Stentfix applicable in this context when using fully covered SEMS, and you want the stent uh, to be fixed, and you can use the stent fix device. So if you see, when should you be using the OTSC clips? So let's uh, show you some cases here. It's a video lecture. On the left is the case uh, my fellow is performing. Uh, he got the scope in uh, a duodenal scope. And uh, you see now the beautiful and the scary peritoneal fat as the scope is advanced. On the right is a case in which I was doing an EUS, uh, diagnostic EUS, in a patient with prior chemotherapy and radiation. So uh, as soon as the, uh, the defect was identified, on the left we are uh, using uh, uh, the padlock clip and it's advanced into the duodenum and then we will eventually uh, find the defect and it was closed successfully. Acute perforations tend to do very well. Here on the right I tried with hemoclips but was not very successful. So I had to remove these clips and ultimately uh, we could manage uh, the OTSC clip, and this was uh, deployed successfully to close the defect. Another interesting uh, story here, this is a patient uh, with esophageal stricture with dilation was referred to us with perforation and uh, had uh, empyema, underwent thoracoscopy. Now this perforation was a very small perforation, but because of prior stricture, we decided to place a fully covered SEMS. Now, SEMS was placed, but despite placement of the SEMS, the patient was not doing well. There was persistent empyema. Uh, so we decided to pull out the stent and then identify the site of uh, defect, which is right here, and then ultimately managed to do APC and then placed an OTSC clip successfully. And now the SEMS was replaced back in place, and you see now there was no persistent leak, and this worked well. So if you see overall for perforation and leaks, which are acute perforations, we are looking at an 80 to 100 percent success rate in these instances. Closure of fistulas also not a bad idea. On the left is a patient with hemicolectomy with an enterocutaneous fistula, and on the right is a patient post-COVID with a gastrocolonic fistula and had chronic diarrhea. On the left, we could not get the, the, the defect on FOSS, so we had to use a guide wire, which we then eventually pulled through the scope and then to orient our scope in the right direction, and then we could manage to place the clip successfully to close the centrocutaneous fistula. And on the right, we went across the colon and then managed to place the clip uh, uh, across this, this defect. And as uh, you see here, this is being placed. And then we put contrast from both the ends to confirm that it, uh, it's closed. Fortunately, these patients did not have recurrence, and they remained uh, successful uh, technically and clinical success cases. Sometimes if the, if the defect is large, this is a patient with a complicated lap coli with duodenal perforation, and uh, the referring surgeon uh, ended up uh, leaving the gauze in place, unfortunately, and then there was a large defect there. So we had to remove the gauze, uh, and then in this case, you can see the pus coming out. And the defect was fairly large. There were uh, sutures which were cut with uh, endoscopic scissors, and ultimately we used the OTSC clip here and managed to get it deployed successfully. And uh, as you can see with fluoroscopy, this was confirmed closure. For large perforations, when you cannot use the standard OTSC clips, what you can use is the OTSC clip for fixation of the fully covered SEMS. This is a SEMS deployed for a large perforation. And uh, the clip is being deployed. This is a specialized, specially designed clip which will hold the uh, fully covered SEMS in place and prevent migration. Now, how about situations when you should not be using the OTSC clips? And here we are going to talk about 10 situations when you should not be using the OTSC clips. One, size of defect is more than three centimeters. Now, this is a patient, a very unfortunate case, 16-year-old patient with post-poem tunnel dehiscence, 
underwent surgical intervention, and as you can see, there's a surgical drain in place. The defect was large, the tissue was fibrotic, and there was no base for it to hold, so we ended up choosing a loop closure technique in this particular case. Another patient here, 45-year-old female with sleeve gastrectomy leak. Here we are looking at the uh, fistula site, and you can see the surgical drain in place, there are sutures in place, and as the scope is being pulled out, you'll see the tissue is fairly edematous, inflamed, ulcerated, so these are not amenable for uh, OTSC clip placement, and a fully covered SEMS was placed. This is another patient with a Boerhaave syndrome, and uh, like a similar to the EVAC case we saw today, here there's a lot of pus in the esophagus, and as the scope is advanced into the distal esophagus, you will soon see the, li the large defect. You see there's a lot of necrotic debris, and uh, OTSC clip placement is one, not feasible, and two, should not be done when you have all this debris uh, without it being successfully debrided and uh, pus removed. So this patient had underwent EVAC therapy. Perforation with fibrotic tissue is another condition where you cannot actually suction the, uh, the tissue in place. This is a patient getting corrosive stricture dilation and had a perforation, as you can see. But because of corrosive uh, stricture, you cannot put the OTC clip and uh, a, a fully covered SEMS was placed in this particular instance. Now, old fistulas and comorbidities, I would not say you cannot do it, but you have to have a word of caution here, and you also have to have the right counseling with the patient because success rate can be variable. This is a patient with cervical cancer with chemo radiation, had a rectovaginal fistula, and I can see it's a very nicely formed fistula. We, we did put uh, to APC, and then we ultimately placed an OTSC clip, and you can see it worked quite well. There was no leakage, but immediately, 48 hours later, the, the thing uh, gave way, and there was persistent leakage. So prior radiation, persistent inflammation, malnutrition are cases when you should be, uh, be careful in terms of uh, counseling the patients about the success rate. Now, if you see large series, 437 patients with GI fistulas, Technical success rate of 80%, but clinical success rate goes down to 48%, suggesting that these are not easy fistulas to close. And if you look at the, uh, another series here, where they compared 54 with 44 uh, successful and failed closures, uh, uh, successful cases with OTSC, longer duration of fistula, low hemoglobin, high CRP, low albumin levels, were definitely found on univariate analysis to be associated with success or closure. And uh, on multivariate analysis, they could see long duration of fistula to be the only factor. Not, do not close with OTSC when you have an old perforation for more than 24 hours because there's peritoneal contamination. You should not be doing, obviously, when you cannot reach the site of leakage, which is, say, jejunum in this particular case. Sensitive areas like uh, periampillary perforation, just a minute, yeah. This is a patient who's uh, undergoing needle knife for a pancreatic duct leak. And you can see at the ampulla post-needle knife, there's a small perforation. So this you should not be doing OTSC clip in because you, you may potentially get the pancreatic duct if you put the OTSC. So we used a, a standard hemoclip and it worked quite well. Other areas with sensitive structures like upper and mid esophagus, you have to be very careful. In tight spaces, uh, this is a patient with GI bleeding, not a full thickness defect. But an OTSC clip was placed for a refractory GI bleeding in a gastrojejunostomy patient. Unfortunately, the clip closed the jejunum, and uh, the patient developed gastric outlet obstruction. So we ended up having to do EUSGJ in this patient. So uh, last, last slide here. Perforation in children. Remember that OTSC, even the mini clip, has a diameter of 4.65. So the youngest patient done till what I could see was a five-year-old child with a weight of 18 kilograms. So you want to be careful because the device is bulky, as you all who have used it seen. And this is the anthrop anthropometry data where more than 50 kilogram childs have uh, esophageal diameter more than 13.5 and you can actually safely do it. So I'll end my talk there. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mukhevar. You can join on the stage. We will invite Dr. Moin Kashab, who's going to speak to us on endoscopic suturing and extac. Thank you for having me, pleasure to be here. So uh, two types of uh, suturing devices, the, uh, both from Apollo, uh, that's now owned by Boston Scientific. So the overstitch uh, device, which you guys have seen, and uh, these are the different components. The suture is a 2.0 suture 
The other suturing device is the through the scope x tac which is a 3.0 suture. So it's a flimsier and a smaller kind of suture. The over stitch device uh, provides full thickness uh, closure. In terms of why, when we use it, mostly in the US it's for bariatric uh, use, but also we close uh, GI defects, poem closure, and defect closure after ESD and EMR. This is a quick example of a closure after a G poem. Uh, initially, when we started doing G poem, um, before we perfected clip closure, we used to suture, we found it easier. But, but these days, we just use uh, clips uh, for these mucosa closures. But in, in case you have edematous mucosa or unhealthy mucosa, whether it's in the stomach or the esophagus, in some cases of advanced achalasia, uh, closure with uh, suturing uh, gives you uh, a tight and uh, reliable uh, closure method. Another uh, reason to use the suture, uh, this uh, full thickness sutures is ulcers. This is an example of a marginal ulcer in a patient with root and Y gastric bypass and recurrent uh, bleeding. Uh, we've used it also for acute bleeds, but in this case, you can close it. Once you approximate the edges, you help it heal. Basically, you're sealing uh, the base so you don't have uh, food or acid contaminating the base, you're approximating the uh, mucosa or the edges, and that helps the ulcer heal. So this is a nice indication for uh, closure of this uh, defect. I'll uh, pass on this, and uh, for the sake of time, move to the x -tac. I don't think uh, this is available here in, in India yet, but this is basically suturing made easy. So this is a through the scope suture. You can use it through a regular gastroscope and you can use it uh, through a, a colonoscope. And this is how it looks. So it is kind of helical at the end with some barbs. The barbs help it hook better to the wall. And with a rotational movement and forward pushing, you dig it into the wall and you can dig it by 3.5 millimeters. So it's not full thickness, but it gets you to the muscle layer. And this is an example of how we do it. This is a simple EMR defect of a patient on uh, Coumadin. This is a standard colonoscope, and this is going through the scope. And for linear defects, we choose a Z pattern or a zipper kind of suturing for oval or circular defects. Uh, we typically use a figure of eight. There is no risk of crossing the sutures here, so patterns really don't matter a lot as opposed to the overstitch where you wanna make sure that you're not crossing the sutures. So here we're taking four bites and then we basically pull on the suture, approximate the edges, and then cinch it. This cinch is the same cinch we use with the over uh, stitch device. We just published a paper on this technique and gastrointestinal endoscopy for post-EMR defects, and it works uh, well. Similarly, in the duodenum, we use it for large defects uh, and in patients who are at uh, particularly a higher risk for bleeding, and mainly those who are elderly, we're worried that they go home and they bleed, or on anticoagulation. So similarly here, because this is more linear, we can use a Z pattern and do a, a similar thing. Uh, this is much easier to use in a duodenum as opposed to the overstitch, which is harder to get to these tight areas. Uh, we can also use the same system to close a uh, poem. Uh, I think these days we just use clips, which is uh, much easier, but this gives you another method in case uh, you have difficulties with clips or in case the incision is uh, sheared and now it's large, you don't wanna use 10 or 12 clips. Uh, this is an alternative uh, system to use. In terms of uh, the learning curve, it's really not that difficult. 
There is some troubleshooting that uh, you have to learn uh, when you do this, but uh, it's not that difficult uh, to learn. We can either, even use this type of system for uh, closure of full thickness defect. I'm gonna just uh, go forward here. So this is a gastric gist. And uh, we left a full thickness defect in the fundus. Uh, when the lesion is in the cardio or fundus, using the overstitch device can be difficult because you have to retroflex the scope. We use a double channel scope and the overstitch device also stiffens the tip of the scope. So hard to use in retroflexion. With this system, you're able to uh, use it in retroflexion. Here you saw we did first an initial layer. We brought the edges together and then we did a second layer of suturing to provide more uh, secure uh, closure. And uh, that basically went very well. You see here we're partially retroflexed. So this tells you that this system is compatible with a retroflexed position. So that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, during the discussion section. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Moind. Dr. Pankaj is also on the screen. Any questions from the moderators? Dr. Arora. Yeah, uh, Dr. Moin and Dr. Pankaj. Is there any limit to the size of the perforation with availability of myriad of uh, techniques for closure? What is the largest size which can be clipped or looped or, or closed by endoscopic means? Moin, would you answer that? Want me to? So, sorry, yeah, can you repeat was, the question? Yeah, the question what? was with swathe and myriad of endoscopic techniques available for closure. Is there any limit to the size of the defect which can be either clipped or looped or closed? Or uh, say five centimeter or? Yeah, depending, it's not just the size, right? So it's a linear incision. Let's say it's 15 centimeter linear. We yeah. see these large defects after pneumatic dilation. It could be 10 centimeter, but it's linear. As long as the mucosa is healthy, you can just use standard clips. Uh, when we use Ovesco, uh, although it was mentioned, the smaller defects, you can use multiple Ovescos uh, uh, side by side, and we've done that. There are, there are some case reports of, a, of some, like a 10 centimeter defect, and they used five Ovescos. So it depends how uh, the shape of the defect, your access to it, and also how healthy the mucosa is. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Asma mentioned about this circular defect closure with the MINT device. Is that available? Uh, Mantis device is just approved now and CA marked and available now in US and Middle East, but I'm not sure about India. Okay. I and don't think so, is it still there? No, and yeah. a question to Pankaj, when the edges are avert averted, it's very difficult to close, and even if you cl end up closing it, it ends up in leak. So how do you evert the edges before closing, say, in a you mucosal can, defect? Well, what I have done, like, you can take a normal mucosa in the middle, and then you use a standard clip at the other edges. Like yeah. you do this zipper technique. I have done this. Yeah, so the, mm -hmm. uh, I think the primary, the marginal, the margin of the clip, you have to be very careful. And then once you apply, you have to try to, when you are doing yeah, the yeah, lip enclosure, you can just yeah. uh, take the margin yeah. along with it. Uh, yeah, and you apply can take the, the clip a little away yeah, so yeah, that yeah. it gets upturned inside. Yeah, sometimes yeah. you can take the margin of the healthy mucosa to healthy mucosa and then at the center you can up apply the two edges together and the mucosa to mucosa. Dr. Bhatt. Uh, Moen, question for you. Uh, in two years' time, where do you see um, defect closure to be? There are so many techniques and this extract that you showed us seemed very easy, maybe in your hands, I'm not sure. But where do you see, uh, in two years' time, what would most people be using? Yeah, um, I think I'm giving another lecture about the different, uh, for, for different techniques for uh, defects. I think as endoscopist, you gotta learn all the techniques you, you, you've seen today, because there's gonna be instances where you're gonna need to suture, you know, very, uh, large defects. Um, you know, I, the other day I was talking about a case, I did EMR of Barrett's cancer, and then it was a small defect, we put Ovesco, 
it, uh, two hours later, the be patient became septic. We went in, the OVESCO was on one edge, and now it is a 50% defect. We know stents don't work most of the time because you're gonna leak around the stent. So in this instance, you got a suture. So you have to learn suturing. The, what you saw, the x uh the issue with x it's flimsy. It's still a 3.0 suture. So it breaks very easily, and it's not a full thickness. So it is easy for uh, like e post-EMR where your setting is controlled, your access is good. But for difficult cases, you have a perforation, I would not rely on that. I would rely more on OVESCO or, or suturing. But for therapeutic endoscopist, you, gotta be, you have to be able to do all the, te the techniques that we saw today. And what about stents? You think the days of stents uh, is almost getting over? Um, you know, stents are being used less and less. I like the, I, I saw an example where you used an OVESCO and then a stent, like a dual a method, I like that. Uh, it gives you a more secure, and what stent does, it allows the patients to eat earlier, you know? So I, I like that. It's more of a diversion, but uh, primary closure, when you can, is the way to go. So, uh, and a stent, depending on what type of stent, uh, when, if we're closing a perforation uh, or, or a chronic fistula, what we do is we use a partially covered stent where you allow tissue ingrowth to seal the proximal end. Uh, if you don't do that, yeah. you're gonna have leakage around. And actually, that's very, very frequent. I thought you wanna, you wanna add? Yeah, I think uh, you made a good point. I think a couple of instances like an esophageal perforation and a caustic injury patient, which we see a lot in India. So those are instances you can't suture or put clips in. So that's definitely. Another patient which I showed you was a sleeve gastrectomy leak. That's severely inflamed edematous ischemic tissue. So those are not going to work with your standard closure techniques. So I think these are instances when you definitely used to need to use stems. Uh, I think made a good point, you can use partially covered stems, the anchor, or you can use the fully covered and then use the uh, OTSC stent fix. stent fix. Works quite well, so yeah. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Just we we may have to, uh, excuse me. Excuse me, uh, one question. We may have to close the session soon because we have a live transmission in the next. So you just have half a minute. It has to be brief. One Otherwise, basic question here. Yeah. Yeah. One question, sir. One yeah. basic question here. Uh, yeah. uh, one question to Pankaj, sir, is how to use a single channel endoscope for a closure of with endo loop and clip if you don't have therapeutic endoscope? Very brief response, sir. No, no, have to use uh, the detachable loop in these cases. It is available from Leomet and that make, we always use a single channel endoscope. We don't use a double channel endoscope. We use a detachable loop. That makes your life very easy. Thank you. Just, just I think we'll have to close the session. We'll have to close the session. We thank the thank cha you. chairpersons, moderators and the speakers. Thank you. We'll have to move to the lunch session now. Uh, uh, we would like to inform the delegates that the lunch is being served at the back in the same room so you can serve yourself but continue to remain in the room. Uh, the chairpersons for this session are Dr. Vinay Thorat from Pune, Dr. Anil Arora, Gangaram Hospital and Dr. Naresh Bhatt. So. Dr. Yoji will be coming. Oh, sorry. Dr. Yoji, we're just waiting for the moderators to take their place. Dr. Wadhwa, you could join us. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Yoji, you're on. Okay, perfect. Dr. Yoji, you're on. Okay, can I start? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Again, I appreciate, deeply appreciate the committee member of this symposium and AMO to give me this opportunity to talk about end aid and uh, end brain clinical applications. Here you can see my COI. Um, uh, first of all, I have to apologize to you, honestly, uh, to be said, 
I have a little experience uh, with AI in my clinical practice and no experience in uh, clinical study of AI. I have just uh, read some uh, articles on AI. So I e emailed my friend, uh, Professor Yuichi Mori, a top leader of, in this field and working uh, in Norway. Um, I asked him to give me the, his presentation. So on behalf of Yuichi, I'd like to talk to you about the current t topics of AI. So when I saw the title of my presentation, I wondered what, what the difference between the end brain and the end, uh, end aid is. I heard that and aid is totally developed by Olympus company and they're fully equipped with the X1 system. Uh, currently, uh, it is available in Europe and uh, part of Asian countries. Uh, since end aid is fitted in the X1 system, it can be controlled with the endoscope or X1 system directly and seamlessly. Um, the, the information is displayed on the endoscope monitor directly. On the other hand, uh, and the brain has been developed by the other company and an um, external model from the uh, from an um, endoscopy system based on the small PC requires a separate monitor from an uh, uh, endoscope monitor. Uh, we need another monitor to show the information from AI and and and, and the brain eye uh, can uh, detect correct uh, polyps but and the brain can also work to differentiate the chronic uh, lesions with or without endocytoscopy and assess act, uh, activity of uh, in ulcerative colitis. Here you can see the movie of the end brain eye. When the polyp is at, uh, detected, the AI alerts uh, it with a green square and uh, they prefer to alert it with a yellow signal around the endoscopic image and warning deep. CAD-X and CAD-E can be used uh, seamlessly in the Olympus system. After localization of the polyp, the polyp is differentiated with NBI and uh, endocytoscopy. So uh, from the polyp detection to polyp differentiation, uh, modest AI works effectively. AI's major role in colonoscopy is detecting the lesion and the differentiating the detected lesions. In this presentation, let me allow to focus on the topic about uh, detection, that is computer-aided detection, CAD-E. Uh, before talking about AI, we have to consider why we need, to, we need AI. As you know, ADL is a pro uh, proportion of screening colonoscopic examinations performed by a physician uh, that detects one or more adenomas. And it is a well-known quality indicator of colonoscopy. ADL is reported uh, the association with uh, cancer prevention. Uh, this report showed that each 1% increase in adenoma detection rate was associated with 3% or, uh, uh, decrease in cancer risk. So, uh, everyone knows accurate detection of correct adenoma can improve the prognosis of patients with adenoma. However, again, everyone knows uh, adenoma can be missed during colonoscopy, and missed adenoma has been considered the most uh, clinic critical cause of intraval colorectal cancer, so-called post polypectomy colorectal cancer. This systematic review and meta-analysis on the adenoma miss rate of more than 15,000 indexes diagnostic colonoscopy by same day a tandem colonoscopy showed miss rate of 26% for adenomas, 9% for advanced adenomas, and 27% for selected polyps. They were missed uh, more frequently than previously we believed. Especially proximal uh, adenoma and uh, this diminutive adenoma and flat adenoma were overlooked. Here I'd like to show you our previous investigations on autophoresis imaging, AFI. AFI can present emphasized images of the differences of mucosa height or histological structure between a lesion and the surrounding mucosa. As you can see in the middle slide, 
uh, flat region is presented as a purple area in the surrounding green mucosa using AFI. So AFI is uh, ex expected to reduce missing flat adenoma. In addition, a mounting a transparent hood to the tip of the colonoscope can help to detect regions behind the colonic folds by turning over the colonic folds. Since AFI colonoscope is thick and uh, transparent hood can help to make colonoscopy insertion easier, we thought AFI and transparent hood would be a good combination for colonoscopy screening. Then we conducted a single center two by two randomized control trial uh, to investigate the efficacy of com combining AFI with a transparent hood or detec uh, detecting for, for detecting collector polyps at Osaka International Cancer Institute. In this trial city, the number of detected neoplasmas per patient in the AFI with transparent hood was significantly higher than the, in the white light without transparent hood, with a, uh, a, which is a standard colonoscopy. Hello. In the subgroup analysis, if macroscopy type is considered in the detected neoplasm, the relative detection rate, that is RDL, using a transparent hood was 1.69 for polypoid neoplasm. That means mounting a transparent hood increased detection of polypoid neoplasm by 1.69 times, significantly. And the RDL using FI was 1.83 for flat neoplasms. FI increased the detection rate, de detection of flat neoplasms by 1.83 times signaling country. These results suggest that we have two uh, causes of, for or overlooking adenoma. First, we can miss the flat lesion, which is similar in color to the background mucosa. AFI could emphasize such subtle changes and help to detect these regions. Second, we can miss the region hiding behind the folds Transparent hood effectively detected such hided regions by turning over the colonic fold. In other words, uh, we can miss the region by recognition and exposure errors. A recognition error means that the region is supposed to be right in front of you, but you are unaware of its presence. Since the polypoid region is easily detected, Typically, flat and similar colored region can be the cause of recognition error. On the contrary, exposure error means that the region is not fully exposed on the screen and does not enter the field of view. Exposure error has been reported as a serious problem during colonoscopy. This study using customized CT chronography software calculated the amount of visualized chronic mucosa. It showed 8% of mucosa is not exposed by endoscopes, even if we used the 170 degree field of view colonoscopy. This study for the uh, development of AI system I showed that the sensitivity of endoscopists for visualized colorectal polyp is 87%, and 13% of polyps are overlooked uh, even when visualized. So when we consider an optimal solution to decrease overlooking adenoma, we need to consider both exposure and recognition errors. Then we need to use a mucosa exposure device and polyp detection modality at the same time. Although a transparent hood is a good tool as a mucosa exposure device, as I mentioned in our RCT, an endocuff is uh, promising for mucosa exposure device. In this meta-analysis, endocuff increased ADR with 1.12 risk ratio. And it's my great honor to introduce you this paper uh, showing end aid system could increase ADL and the number of adenomas per colonoscopy in a multi-center randomized control trial, suggesting it may aid in detecting colorectal neoplastic lesions, especially because it detects 
diminutive and flat adenomas. Also, again, I am very happy uh, to uh, introduce another large-scale prospective study using end-brain eye, including more than 2,000 patients and showed increased adenoma detection rate significantly from 20% to 26%. Also, I'm directing again to, in, oh, sorry, ah, so, so, uh, to, this is uh, the uh, meta-analysis uh, for polyp detection using a AI. So the, this report is, oh, just a moment, report is showing uh, 1.47 risk ratio increased ADR in this meta-analysis. So a combination of AI and endocalf may be the best match to cover exposure error and recognition errors simultaneously. Further, uh, recently, AI has been considered to have uh, uh, the potential to cover exposure errors. The AI can cover both these errors at the same time. Of course, AI cannot turn over uh, chronic folds or move the tip of the colonoscope, but AI can give feedback on how much we could expose the mucosa on endoscopic images. The video shows the real-time reconstruction highlighting a blind spot. The blind spot of the left column wall, left column wall missed at the colonoscopy is seen as a gap in this reconstruction. This is another solution, End Angel. The end angel can show the withdrawal speed on the screen and the chronoscopist can adjust the withdrawal speed based on the speed meter. Uh, the green range indicates appropriate speed and the red range suggests too fast. Not only the speed, and the angel can distinguish blurred images. If blurred images are shown on the screen, it will indicate view is lost. Please return. Once you can return uh, to the previous screen view, it says the previous view is reached, so it can suggest a good te technique for observation. So it seems certain that the AI will uh, improve ADL, but one wonders uh, whether the uh, improvement in ADL will truly be beneficial. In this study, Yuichi uh, conducted a Markov model uh, micro simulation using colonoscopy with and without AI for colorectal cancer screening for individuals at average risk. They investigated a screening colonoscopy with birth without AI every 10 years starting at age 50 and finishing at age 80 with follow-up until age 100, assuming 60% screening uh, population uptake. The results showed that the uh, relative detection of colorectal cancer incidence with screening colonoscopy without AI tools was 44 to 44%, and uh, with screening colonoscopy with AI tools was 49%. That means about 5% incremental reduction with AI. And uh, AI detection tools decreased the discounted cost by 57 US dollars per uh, screened individual. So AI will uh, reduce the incidence and the mortality of colorectal cancer and the cost of screening. And UH is serious about showing AI's actual impact in a randomized control trial. They allocated 222,000 screening patients to colonoscopy with or without AI, and they followed up with the patient for about 10 years. The, uh, uh, the European Union uh, funds the project, and I look forward to seeing the, this, these results. So I think nobody doubts the ability of AI, and actually many AI-equipped devices are already becoming in, a, indispensable in our daily lives, like AI driving, Siri, Google, and Lumba. Likely, humankind will not be able to imagine life without AI. So the era of evaluating AI abilities is over and we are already in a new era of considering 
how to make the best use of AI. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Yoji. Uh, may we have our second lecture by Dr. Zahir Nabi on resection knives, endoscopist's weapon, wield judiciously. Good afternoon, all. Uh, so, next few minutes, I'll be uh, briefly discussing about the various electrosurgical knives which are available for endoscopic submucosal dissection, as well as other third space endoscopy procedures. So, first, before you start the ride, you need to know a few points uh, which are related to uh, electrocautery, as well as which are related to the GI tract. If you see the wall thickness of GI tract is different across uh, uh, esophagus, stomach, duodenum, which is probably the thinnest, colon and rectum. So this is very important when you choose a knife, that what type of knife you want to choose. You want to choose a uh, insulated type knife or a tip type knife or you want to, uh, what is the length of shaft that you uh, plan to choose. And the second which I want you to know that is uh, the concept of electrocautery and current density. If you see the first image, uh, which is probably we all of us use when we do a pre-cut. So for a sharp and big cut, you need a very sharp tip type knife, which has a very high current density. So you get a very clean cut here. Now look at the second picture where you, are, uh, you have uh, a a bulbous tip. So this tip will diffuse the current density, reduce the current density, so you will get some cut and dissection as well. But it won't be as sharp as in the first image. A very good example is that when you use a snare, then you have various types of snares. You have monofilament snare for a clean cut, and then you have a braided snare, which uh, reduces the current density and provide it, provides you with a slow cut and coagulation both. In, in contrast to a monofilament snare. And it also depends what knife you are using. Not all knives are uh, capable of handling very high voltages. For example, if you see spray coag, there are very few knives which are meant to be used with this coagulation mode, which is a spray coagulation mode, a mode which works at very high voltages, which works at, uh, say, around 4,000 volts. So these are some issues that you should know before you select your knife and choose that what is the procedure that you are going to do and then finally what is the mode of uh, coagulation or dissection that you are going to decide. So let's see the knives which are available for EST. So there are basically uh, three types of knife. One are needle or tip cutting knives. Now what do I mean by needle or tip cutting knives? Means they don't have an insulated tip and the, the entire knife is designed for cutting purpose. So there are various different types of knife. We'll come to each knife later on. And then you have the second type of knife is insulated tip knives. We have uh, different types of insulated tip knives available. And then you have scissor type knives. So these are basically the three types of knives which are available in the commercially available in the market. Now remember all these knives are monopolar knives. Means you need a grounding pad to complete the circuit. None of these knives are bipolar knives. The important difference between insulated tip knives and the tip needle type cutting knives is that insulated tip knives you use in such a fashion that you come from far to near. So this is the way that you use insulated tip knife and that is the basic difference on how to use your knife depending on the type of knives. And if you see the dissection is from out to in, out to in. This is how that uh, insulated tip knife is used. So, so what type of your technique of dissection also differs. The only bipolar device as of now which is commercially available to us is speedboat. I'm not going to discuss too much about this device because I believe there's a separate talk on that. So let's start with the most commonly used device uh, as of now for endoscopic submucosal dissection is dual knife J. And J stands for jet because now majority of the knives, they have integrated jet. There are two types of uh, dual J knives available. One is 
2 millimeter in length and the other is 1.5 millimeter in length. The other important thing that you should remember is that the marks, the white uh, band, the gray band and blue band, they have a definite length which helps you determine how deep you are inside. So the 2 millimeter knife is meant for gastric ESDs and the 1.5 millimeter knife is designed for colonic esophageal and duodenal ESDs. Why? Because the gastric mucosa is quite thick, so you need a knife which is at least 2 millimeter in length. So how to mark in hemostasis? If you see, even if the knife is closed, the dual knife is closed, there is a small bulbous tip which is projecting. So whenever you have to mark or you have to use it for hemostasis, the knife should be completely retracted. So this is how you use a dual knife to mark and to achieve hemostasis. On the other hand, for dissection, obviously the knife is out. The, the good feature of this knife is that the bulbous tip acts as an anchor which can be used to uh, cut the tissue and without slipping. The other important thing is this white ceramic tip can be uh, rested on the mucosa and you know that only 1.5 or 2 millimeter of the knife is in and you are not going to create any perforation. The electrosurgical unit settings are different for different knives and different for different electrosurgical generators. So this is just an example and this does not fit uh, for all electrosurgical, so this is not a universal setting for all knives and this is not a universal setting for all generators. This another knife which is a tip type knife and which is, which is also a good knife is hybrid knife. Now there are three types of hybrid knives available, commercially available in the market and you have seen uh, Asma doing a case with the tip type hybrid knife. So the advantage of this knife is that you have a very good jet facility available with this knife. Now the, the, the drawbacks of the knife are that you need to have separate pump cartridges, you need to have a separate jet pump and the cost of the device may be a little higher as compared to the other commercially available knives. These are some of the settings for mucosal elevation with hybrid knife and ESD with hybrid knife. Now coming to insulated tip knife. Now if you ask me what are the two most common knives that you should have at your center, one is dual J knife and second is insulated tip knife. These are the most essential knives when you start an ESD program at your center. Now there are two different, three different types of insulated tip knife. The initial, the initial available knife was insulated tip knife. You see there is no electrical plate below the ceramic tip. On the other hand, you have IT Knife 2 and IT Knife Nano. The main difference being they have a cutting plate at the bottom. So they can cut from the shaft as well as they can cut from the bottom of the ceramic plate. Now you see, when you use an IT knife, it was sometimes difficult because you had to orient the shaft. It will cut only from the shaft and the tip will protect any inadvertent damage. On the other hand, if you are using IT Knife 2 or IT Nano, both have an additional electrode at the bottom of ceramic tip, which means that you can cut even in a relatively perpendicular direction. So this is, these are the examples of uh, IT Knife Nano and do IT Knife 2. And you can see IT Knife uh, uh, Nano has a circular uh, ceramic tip, whereas IT Knife 2 has a triangular uh, blade. Uh, as at the bottom of ceramic tip. So these are very good knives. You can, you can use these knives. IT Knife Nano, in fact, is, is my personal favorite for esophageal ESDs as well as colonic ESDs because it e easily slips uh, inside and without the damage of in injuring the deeper uh, muscle layer, you can easily, uh, speedily complete your dissection. So this is just to show you IT Nano because this is one of my favorite knives. You can see the insulated tip, there is a circular electrode and the, the shaft of the knife. So the entire knife is very, very useful and very compact device for your ESD procedures. This is just a comparison between IT Knife 2 and IT Knife Nano and how do they work. For Cologne and Esophagus, I think IT Knife Nano is a very good and convenient knife to use. Coming to triangular tip knife, which is one of the most commonly used knives for POEM procedures, it has a jet function 
and uh, uh, these are the differences between the initially available triangular tip knife and now the available triangular tip knife J. Uh, TTJ is very compact as compared to the initial uh, available TT knife and that is the reason this is the most popular knife for poem procedures as of now. The other characteristic feature is this is one of the few knives which supports very high voltage spray coag mode. So you can see the length of the blade is 4.5 millimeter, which means this is a good knife for long tunnel procedures, but not a good knife for ESD because the length of the blade is very large. So if your assistant is not well trained and if he projects the knife too uh, out, then there is a chance of muscular injury. So I prefer this knife only for poem and not for endoscopic submucosal dissection procedures. Coming to hook knife, uh, which is again uh, a very good or popular knife and which is also available with a jet function, uh, the characteristic features is that this knife has a hook, so when you want to precise your dissection, then this knife can play a very good part, especially in areas of submucosal fibrosis where you have to dissect fiber by fiber. Again, the length is 4.5 millimeters, so you need to be really careful and your assistant should be really in tune with you when he is rotating this knife uh, for a good dissection. So as, as you can see in the image that your assistant should be uh, really careful and should rotate it from time to time so that you can uh, complete your dissection in a safe way. This is a very good knife for dealing with submucosal fibrosis and many uh, ESD specialists use this knife for submucosal fibrosis. So this is the last knife that I'm going to discuss which is the uh, scissor type knife and this knife is especially useful for uh, cutting the septum because it can hold the septum in between and cut it very precisely. There are different lengths available and this knife is mainly used for uh, Zenker septotomy. As you can see there, very convenient to use this knife when you are cutting a septum, especially in cases with Zinker's diverticulum. The problem with this knife is that there is no injection facility available, so you need to exchange this device again and again uh, during ESD uh, procedure for some mucosal injection. So how to choose your knife? There are different knives available. You can see that this is the initial hook knife. The problem is uh, it's a, it's a, you have to depend a lot on your assistant and we have to use this knife in cases with Zenker's diverticulum and in cases where you have submucosal fibrosis. Second is the triangular tip knife J. It has a long shaft, so I don't uh, recommend it for ESD procedures. So where to use this knife? You can use this knife during poem, excellent knife. You can use it during stir. You can use it during preem. The third is insulated tip knife. The problem is there is no injection facility as of now with this knife, so you cannot do a good incision with this knife. Where to use, I think, colonic and esophageal ESDs, this is a very a good device to use in majority of the procedures. The third is, which is my personal favorite, and which is dual knife J. Uh, the, the problem is initial injection, you still need a needle. Uh, but this is the knife which I use for majority of my ESD procedures along with the insulated tip knife. So the choice of knife depends on the operator, the location of the lesion, whether uh, how is the maneuverability of your scope. If I find that I'm at a difficult location, I choose insulated tip knife so that uh, my margin of safety increases. The presence and absence of submucosal fibrosis also determines which knife you use. I prefer insulated tip knife if there is submucosal fibrosis but because I have an added margin of safety. That's all from my side. Thank you. Zahir, you can <clears throat> join on the stage. You can join the moderators. Uh, we are just in time for going to UK where Zach is waiting and uh, he'll be speaking on novel energy platforms for ELS. Time to change the paradigm. Over to Zach Tiamolos. Hello there, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hello, I'm, I'm just so very honored to be invited to this prestigious course. I just want to thank massively uh, Dr. Amor Papaya and the rest of the organizing committee uh, for the kind invitation. and. Um, I was really very privileged to present um, after Zahir Nabi, one of my uh, colleagues who collaborate uh, from AIG. So uh, I'll try to be very short. I'll try to do my, do my best. 
Uh, I don't know if you can see my screen. I can start uh, by trying to elaborate data about a new energy platform, which I think we, we, it's, it's a paradigm shift to the patient's pathways. Um, and uh, when we change, um, this is my disclosures, when we uh, change the, uh, and move the advanced energy platform, uh, this technology can have an impact on, on the technique per se, on the time, on the team, and also um, on, the, on, on the whole clinical practice. So Zahir very nicely alluded every monopolar knife in the market. Uh, but this is quite, uh, it's a new kit on the block, uh, which incorporates novel electrocautery modalities. And this is the first time it's been described uh, in the human gut. So this is a, this is a microwave energy is utilized uh, to have a, a very focused and, and a very controlled coagulation of the vessels. Uh, this high, super high frequency of 5.8 gigahertz can actually build up the energy and the power in a very, in a very safe manner. And the high energy uh, indicates that there is a decreased penetration to the tissue. Uh, alongside that, we have the bipolar precision. The bipolar is the first uh, bipolar in the, in, in the West. Uh, uh, device, which actually gives us the ability to tackle um, the, um, the fibrosis to uh, actually cope with every step, step of the cybernetic dissection. Uh, and this is, uh, this is our, all these two novel electrocotary modalities that, that are embedded to this a new uh, device, which is called the speedball device. Uh, this kind of energy um, uh, device, advanced energy device, has got different energy points. And it, um, this is a um, very uh, honored to present uh, the new version of the speedboard the inject device of eight friends, uh, which is a similar size in length with the IT Nano, uh, but it has a different kind of novel, uh, uh, novelty in design, uh, which has two parallel electrodes, and energy is actually uh, delivered back to the uh, to the generator, so there's no need of a return plate, and uh, and the active margins are actually uh, around the device, uh, which gives also an insulation on the bottom, which is very very important when we operate on the deep submucosa uh, layer. Uh, the advanced bipolar energy actually is very adaptive, and that can uh, can detect about 1,000 times per second all the tissue evidence. So there's no need to change any settings as we do with the other monopolar energy units. And this continuous energy monitor, monitoring uh, allows for the operator to focus only on the dissection and not bother about any settings. Um, what's very interesting on this kind of platform is we can use the same platform during the training and the same settings as also in humans, which actually the, the translation and the transformation of the of the of the preclinical uh, training can be easier uh, with this platform. And the microwave, as mentioned before, because of the high frequency, has a shorter pathway and allow us to be very very focused with a high power density to the vessel. So the microwave actually degrades the collagen fibers and seals very very effectively and efficiently the vessels. So. Given this new platform, uh, definitely there is a positive impact on the, on the technique. That's why we managed to rename that as a speedboard assisted endoscopic cybernetic dissection, because it advocates tunneling and the bridge formation. So within this kind of platform, we have a quite, it's a multimodality uh, device which are actually incorporates the cutting, the coagulation injection with the injection needle. The the one to one rotation as well as the isolation, uh, but most profoundly, I think the whole design it brings the uh, surgical element within the endoscopic dissection. Because uh, from our Japanese expert colleagues, we learned that uh, uh, ESD is simply a microsurgery and nothing else. And uh, and for someone to uh, I'm sure to every all, all, all the uh, delegates that do have the same question. Do I perform an EMR? Do I perform a piecemeal dissection? Or do I prefer to go for an unblocked dissection? So this dilemma now seems to have now the answer. Uh, we do have all these monopolar energy uh, devices and knives. 
but having the bipolar energy with the precise and control cut, you can clearly see how, um, how clear and field of view with no charring while cutting, which enables the operator to really uh, see where it's cutting, especially when you do have a fibrosis. You can see here how the micro propagates within the vessel and makes this uh, blanching and bubbling effect, which gives again the confidence to the operator to, to perform. A very, a very, you know, a seven centimeter lesion in the rectum uh, with no, uh, with no injury to the muscle bed uh, had definitely a huge effect on the recovery of the patient and, and no, and no actually complications. So I'm really honored to present this data that will be soon published in the next couple of months. It is a, it is a prospective observational conference study, uh, but we started to collate all the data for the last three years. Uh, within East Kent Hospital, and we did try to have consecutive patients, you know, with the use of SESD, and we recorded all the unblocked dissection, the conversions, the short and long-term outcomes, as well as any benign and malignant resections. So this is just, just roughly a flow chart about the to the first 200 patients. The 21 were abandoned because of a retraction sign, uh, muscle retraction sign, which actually uh, deemed to be 60% of cancer. And then 179 resections with zero perforations, um, and we had only a conversion to a piecemeal EMR in 7.8 of the cases because these data actually from the old uh, Speedbo device, the 10 friends, and I'm very, very happy now to have the 8 friends device with a minimal complication rate of the limit of 1.7% and 0.5% of recurrence on one case where the lesion was 16 to uh, by 16 centimeter in size. And just I want to tell you eyeballs to the number of cancers that we, we just have removed. We have 11% of malignant semicosal invasion resected with a positive EMI uh, lipovascular uh, invasion, a negative lipovascular invasion. And surprisingly, those that even they went for a surgery, uh, there was no residual tumor uh, found only, I think, in a, in, in a few cases, we found some lymph nodes. Uh, which was very reassuring that we do perform a very distant uh, uh, dissections. Um, but from this data, we managed to do also a regression analysis, and we're trying to look how the, um, how the time is being affected by the polyp surface. Uh, and we did find that despite the increased um, uh, surface uh, of the colorectal lesions, uh, the speed uh, actually is really um, improving and, and increasing. Uh, while we remove more polyps, so in 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 in, in a whole, we don't have any any uh, delays on on the dissections. And similarly, um, uh, the bipolar radio frequency, the advanced bipolar radio frequency, uh, was not actually massively impeded by the fibrosis, and we managed to tackle very successfully all the fibrotic lesions, including the F2 fibrosis. Uh, and these are some examples. Uh, we managed to perform consecutive patients uh, from the lower rectum. Uh, having no stricturing at all um, uh, after uh, after the dissection. That's another feature that it will has to be proved that um, the bipolar energy and the protection of the mass layer definitely has a better uh, outcome in terms of the of the stricturing and narrowing. Uh, then we move to the mid rectal lesions uh, in in a very short period of time with less recovery need for recovery and hospital stay. Uh, and then we moved, we expanded that our, our, our dissection range to huge lesions like this on this lady. That was the only lesion that we had a bit of fibrosis. And this is dissection after that was four or five hours. And I can see the, the massive, um, the massive uh, uh, specimen, the pinout specimen. Uh, and then we moved to proximally to the sigmoid lesions, uh, almost circumferential, uh, with a, quite a, a fibrotic element, a very successful dissected. Then we move to the splenic flexor, and as we move proximally to the colon, we found really the protection of the mass layer was was definitely um, uh, was imperative, and I think that gave us the confidence and uh, and the ability to perform further dissection, even when we have been on the hepatic flexor around the diverticulum ostium, as you can see on the on the right hand side, uh, that didn't actually stop us, and we managed to dissect very very elegantly uh, around the diverticulum ostium. But then uh, I want to present something which has been acknowledged by and presented to the uh, DW ASGE plenary session. It's a new platform that we incorporate with the SESD is, is to control the pressure 
uh, the luminal pressure within the left bowel. So we just simply you know, trying to understand more about this one. And this is the first kind of explanation that we're trying to uh, combine the speed vault uh, inject dissection the SSD with the mucosa pressure. So we use a LCL, a special exchange carbon dioxide platform, which is actually is very useful to improve the field of use uh, during dissection. But also we actually exploring that there are actually there are some kind of uh, uh, of um, influence on the steps of the dissection. Like we use low pressure during the mucosa dissection. We increase the pressures highly to uh, create the same because of tunneling and the bridge formation. And then we end up with a really high pressure that really um, uh, creates an environment of retraction. So we were trying to, uh, and we do believe that uh, retraction is, 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 has an impact, has a, has a role within the uh, uh, endoscopic of dissection. But uh, uh, we strongly believe that the innate, the inherent, uh, based on the carbon dioxide pressures has a better effect. And this is the video, which I'll try to play very quickly. Uh, this is a sigmoid descending junction uh, polyp. Uh, as you can see, we use a, a SD hood, and we were struggling to see the views uh, because it's exactly on the band. By using then applying this carbon dioxide exchange LC, LC system, then you see automatically the views has remarkably improved, and you can see the entire steps of the polyp. And based on that, then we, we can really assess. Uh, we use the dye spray uh, chroma endoscopy. And then, following the, uh, the steps of the uh, SESD, we do the proximal um, mucosal lesion um, by using short burst of uh, advanced dipole energy. As you can see, there is no such a kind of thermal energy to the margins. Uh, but due to the bipolar mode, we need to have to be into contact with the tissue, which makes the dissection safer. Uh, but sometimes you need to apply more skills uh, to be really in contact and not just from distance to apply any monopole energy, which can sometimes uh, dissipate and, and, uh, within the surrounding tissues. Then we repeat the same thing of mucosa dissection in the distal side and try gently to uh, apply to create the, 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 the flopping uh, of the polyp and the tunnel. At this stage, we still keep a low pressure uh, within the lumen. But then as we manage to really enter the, 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 uh, the, the submucosal tunneling, then uh, we, uh, you can see we have really slightly increase of the pressures and trying to apply a lot of pre-coagulation. We have uh, found using this kind of a new platform that over the time, you know, we have almost nearly bloodless dissections because we are becoming very familiar with the uh, microwave energy and the precoagulation is really um, uh, persists, you know, sustains a very um, uh, a, an environment with no uh, with no blood and no messy. Uh, and this microwave, as you can see, has been frequently, uh, repeatedly um, applied using the blunting and um, uh, the, the uh, blanching and the uh, blending effect. So, and then we, after we completed the tunneling, we uh, release and isolate the margins of both sides on the left-hand side and the, and the right-hand side and try to trim again, um, uh, trim again the, uh, the, the margins by getting to the mass layer. And, and, that, and this, is, this, this is the time it's very essential to understand that we can utilize all the modalities of the device by actually having the rotation, which is one-to-one, -one, and try to keep the insulated hull parallel to the mass layer, always protecting the mass layer uh, for any energy delivery. Um, it's, it becomes really the more uh, we, we see with this kind of advanced platform, then we become more aggressive and we can remove lesions that they really are before uh, other, other referred for surgery or they actually um, be referred uh, uh, for, um, you know, for big, for big stoma um, resections. And as you can see here, trying to use the, the speedboard inject uh, uh, the 10 French device, part of the mass layer and, uh, and having this insulation uh, towards uh, the tip. The tip, the tip and the margins are the most active, they are the most active uh, energy points. And when we encounter uh, really fibrotic patches, such in this case where the tattoo has been previously placed, 
that the patient was supposed uh, to go for surgery, then this kind of uh, uh, the, using the tip and the, the, the ergonomically uh, design of, of the spiro will allow the operator to rotate and use the tip, the margins, the convexity, and, and really speed up uh, massively at, the, at this point without even stopping because you can see the pre coagulation uh, use full blown um, um, microwave coagulation effectively to the vessels without causing any, any kind of delays. One of the main reasons that we actually found with using the pressure here, the pressure is really, really on, on the high side. You can see how the retraction, the innate, the physical retraction of the lesion actually moves to the, to the 12 o'clock and we can actually have a very successful um, dissection without forgetting that we have to reapply pre-coagulation uh, Pre-coagulation of 10 seconds, if you compare it with the exchange of any other monopolar coagulation uh, graspers, you know, it's actually no-brainer. And then we finish that uh, uh, in a very decent and safe manner by having it really expose the muscle uh, layer without any charring, without any injury. And we've been very, 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 um, um, I would say, patient with a high-grade dysplasia. After, after a year or so, you can see there's no such an arrangement or even the scar tissue is not so prominent as, as with other monopolar energy devices. And this has also uh, been published in, in American Journal of Syndrology uh, this year, uh, where it, uh, there was another lesion, as you can see from the MRI scan, was actually occupying almost the upper rectum to the distal sigmoid, mid-sigmoid, I would say. And uh, the, the patient had a very, a very easy dissection, about four and a half hours. But I, can, I just want to tell you, uh, your attention to the lower pictures, as you can see with the white light, with the NBI and, and dye spray, how the, 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 there is a kind of very uh, smooth proliferation of the scar and which has a huge um, you know, positive impact to the patient's quality of life and no need for further uh, 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 structuring. Last thing, I don't want to delay you more, is about the time. There are different kind of groups within, um, uh, within uh, is the, the, the Japanese group, which is the, the proof that uh, the, the ESD you know, can be more cost-effective than, than PCMLMR. On the other hand, the Australian group, that they believe that only selective ESD can be more, more, uh, more effective than the universal ESD. I think with this platform, we're trying to uh, have a health economics and we're trying to do a kind of analysis for uh, a, a, a propensity uh, uh, score analysis with real data, because all until so far there was no real data uh, comparison uh, for the NHS and for the hospital. And we looked at all the parameters, including the endoscopy suite time, the, the medical time, nursing time, all the consumables, uh, the hospital stay, and of course pathology and the follow-up. And we pro provisionally, we have found that with the match per analysis, there's a cost uh, um, effect of about 5,000 pounds per patient, but this has to be proved with the propensity score analysis. So, yes, the ESD can have an impact on the reduction of the downstream cost, not, in, not in, the, in the long term, but also in the, not in the short term, but also in, in, the, in the long term. And also, by looking at through the NHS perspective, again, the SESD has a huge reduction on the downstream cost compared to the, to the EMR. So that overall, it seems that the SESD and this technology, this platform can dominate EMR when you get to this proficient level, which is, which is not so um, sharp as with other monopolar devices. And that's why we have introduced the Pioneer program, which is a dedicated, uh, personalized approach with immersive, integrated, in the experiential and didactic learning. And we're trying to, in a way, to uh, uh, iron out the, the, uh, the learning curve for the, uh, for the ESD based on the European guidelines. And last but not least, I just want to uh, really announce to you that we have started and launched the, uh, the European registry, uh, the uh, Speedboat Inject uh, Semicorsa Dissection Registry, which is a multi-center um, in the UK and in Europe. Um, and also we have the East Ken as a data controller, and we are going to invite now every user within the UK and Europe to see uh, what is the effect on, 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 on many operators and on many health uh, and, 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 and health economics trust. Uh, so just to uh, recap, yes, the SESD uh, can definitely advocate tiling. It's a very safe and, and effective approach for some of the dissections. Uh, it can perform in a timely manner compared to any other monopolar uh, devices, uh, despite the increased surface and the decrease of fibrosis. It can um, um, possibly change the health economics 
and people they can see that differently. And of course, all this will be ratified by the data collection, uh, by the introduction and the advent of the registry. Listy, and I just want to invite you all to our course, Ken course, which is on in October. Thank you very much for your time. And um, I'm really ready for questions. Thank you, Zach. We'll be taking questions at the end of the session. So we have one more speaker. Uh, so we welcome Dr. Asma al now, yes. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for accommodating the change in the schedule. She'll be speaking on improving efficiency of ELS. Uh, hi, again. Um, every one of us has this enthusiasm for, like, hold the knife and cut and chop. Uh, everyone has, like, this is, as you know, that's endoscopic uh, luminal surgery now become a fashion and everyone who wants uh, to acquire this skill. But for us, how can we improve this? How can we make it more efficient, fast? Because as you know, this type of procedure takes long time to perform this uh, such procedure. That's why we have, we come up with this injection solution, traction technique, and of course, hybrid knife, which is a revolution, which was come to the era of endoscopic resection and, and the new hyperflexi. We start with the injection. Like injection, is really uh, is really need the, the the one to be very efficient and precise in injecting the polyp. Like you, you can see here, we're injecting from behind, like from the sickle side, to bring the polyp to you, to, not away from you. That's why we inject behind to bring the lesion toward the oral side. And you you make sure that you're injecting uh, like a decent amount, not little, not too much. And when you're injecting, we, we you use this the push-pull technique to, to make sure that you are in the submucosal space. Like, as you can see, we, we try to inject using, the, like, uh, the, the maneuver to inject with a one single needle injection to have a good lift. And now, and after that, many viscous solution come in the market, and this study was comparing normal saline versus viscous solution, and it comes that the, it showed that the, with the viscous solution, you have higher in block resection, low recurrence, and it, it usually is good for polyp more than 20 millimeter. And then in the era of like decreasing, making the resection more fast and efficient, we start using clip and line with the traction, making your like uh, the plane very obvious, decrease the risk of like complication, perforation, bleeding, having like see see very clearly as you can see here, see the plane very clearly in case or also you have fibrosis, you can differentiate all the plane, muscularis propria, submucosa and the mucosa and in case if you have fibrosis, you can see the fibrosis and you can see a rim between the fibrosis and muscularis propria. Then we came with this, uh, this is with the um, Piochi and uh, Germain, they come with this rubber band technique, which is really helpful, helpful and I have used it like doing, during my resection, and sometimes I use more than one rubber band, and you can see sometimes the lesion, you have just put the rubber band on one side, and then you, I use another one to have like, you can see like two, three bands on the same uh, lesion. But as you can see here with this fibrotic lesion, it was like previously resected. I managed to resect it properly without any risk of perforation or delay bleed. And you can see here we're using a dual knife in such lesions. But I'm going to talk about a new knife uh, shortly. And this is the, also I will show you a attraction device at the, uh, for lesion which was at just at the appendiceal orifice, and we, all of us, you know that the appendiceal orifice is like, is there, everybody is worried about like risk of appendicitis and thing, and you know that the risk of appendicitis is even lower than the risk of uh, when you do a full risk thickness resection. This, the Budrigi from uh, the Metronic, is like a snare where we can just, uh, this is not, this is the case snare from the Pentax. This is the good things about this. This is the like you can cut and then you do a car, you can cut, start with a circumferential incision, and then you can do a, like uh, take it by a snare. I just want to show you the, the, the device. This the, from Metronic. It's like this is the Budrig traction device. You can put it with a apply it, fix it with a clip, and take it. It has the same technique of the rubber band. And then you pull the other side and pull other clip, and it stays and give you a good traction and keep the plane very obvious. As you can see here, even with a, 
with the legion at the appendiceal orifice with the law of fibrosis and with this groove and things, you can see the plane very obvious. And then we come this with, after like uh, the poem started with tunneling technique, this old pocket and tunneling technique was started. And it's also that we have to admit that, that these techniques make the, the section very more efficient, faster, and the plane very neat and obvious. Um, as you can see, like with a pocket, you create a small pocket and then you go and create other pockets till you get the end. And with tunneling technique, you start with a mucosal incision at your distal part and then an incision at your proximal part until you reach the end. And then you start dissecting at the peripheries. And also we're using water attraction for difficult lesions such as this lesion. Um, we usually don't mark in legion and uh, in colonic legion, but we do mark in IBD legion because just to know the extent of the legion, and you know you would, you don't want to leave any residuals behind. And you can see here because of this submucosal fat and a lot of inflammation, submucosal fibrosis with with the IBD legion, you don't get a good lift. Like, but with the water, we're using the water as a traction and dissect with the water. And here we use normal saline, not water to enhance the cutting technique because of the normal saline, because of this, like the electrode and electricity. Like here, I want to show you like a difficult lesion and the rictus sigmoid, uh, where we decided because the bit pattern wasn't very uh, nice because we were worried that it carried risk of like uh, high grade dysplasia or cancer in it. Then we decided to take it by uh, and block, and then we, uh, as you can see here, there is a bleeding, and I wasn't able to <coughs> localize, but with the RDI, uh, this, uh, the Olympus, uh, the X system, it, it helps me to localize the side of bleeding, and also it, it, it turns the red to yellow. Like you feel, even the nurses, they will ask, they will tell me, is it more comfortable to see that? They don't want to see the red everywhere, and they feel more comfortable with this with this yellow color rather than the red. And also the pure stat, as I told you before, is really very nice hemostatic gel. It's a work with the extracellular, is work as an extracellular matrix. It's form a natural block, which even help you for like, uh, it's very, uh, help you to like, is a transparent uh, gel. Uh, help you to stop the bleeding during intra-procedure bleed and also many studies showed that it decreased the post-procedure bleed as as you can see is easy to apply you wait one to two seconds and it's form like like a natural uh, hemostatic plug and then we come with the ESD9 with hybrid jet 2 you know this the hybrid uh, the hybrid knife technique combine electrosurgery with a hydrosurgery because it's just a very nice knife, like you, a very efficient, it, it decreased the, uh, decrease, like, the time, decreased the risk of like uh, bleeding and perforation uh, because you, you don't have to take the knife out and in, it's just you can inject and dissect on the same time with a good power of jet, of jet. like if you have like some fibrosis and thing, it really gives you a good lift. But the the crones of this knife that I was using it only in poem and tunneling technique and in the rectum. I, I was hesitant to use it in the right side because of the length of the knife. Then this is, I will show you how it's nice even and use it not in only poem because yesterday I demonstrate, demonstrate the, the hybrid knife with the T-type using it during poem. Now here, this is a rectal legion, almost occupy the full circumferential. And when I see, I saw that it might like to take six to eight hours, but with the hybrid knife, it like makes it much faster because I don't have to take the knife in and out. And this, the, the ball at the end of the, um, end of the knife, it's really good for that co coagulation. As you can see, as you, all of us know that the rectum, it carries a risk of bleeding because it's just of these all hemorrhoid plexus and all these uh, blood vessels. And sometimes it might bleed profusely, but with this hybrid knife, you can coagulate. And as I said yesterday, you can combine the precise sect with uh, a hybrid knife, and it gives you really a good uh, coagulation settings. See how it's beautiful? It gives you a good lift when you just inject. 
and it's come like with the like the injection needle it's become like inside the needle uh, you don't have to like it doesn't block like other needles and uh, it gives high energy with the highest parts for cutting and we managed to take this legion in uh, four hours it was around like uh, 18 centimeter this is the type of hybrid knives we have the t-type and the i-type and the one with the ceramic ball and the one with the ceramic ball is like for additional insulation protection. Like if you need, like if you want to do it in the colon with this, you need some like protection. And now like we're fortunate to have the new uh, hybrid knife which just come, like as I told you, I was hesitant to use the hybrid knife on the right side because of the length of the knife. But now they come with a short knife, is 1.5 to 2 millimeter. And, for, and they do have I and T type, thin electrode with wine, thin ceramic, and it like generates sparks very nice during cutting. It gives you like uh, the flexibility of manipulating the knife with a good pressure and water jet with a good lift. Like while you're injecting, you have a good lift, you don't have to take the knife in and out. And the good things, I used to like the, uh, the dual knife. As Zahir said, the dual knife it was using it for the most ESD. And the good things about this knife, it just combines the benefits and the advantages of the hybrid knife plus the dual J knife. Like even it has like this, like the teeth type, it has this ball, we can just coagulate blood vessel and seal the blood vessel with using a precise sect. I think using a precise sect with this, uh, uh, this revolutionary hybrid knife will be like uh, the new era of ESD. And this is course to see of the, the, because the Professor Repici, he's, the, uh, he's uh, the first one who used this knife. It was like th three or four days ago. And I managed to get this video of him. As you can see, he, he used it in the cecum for this legion. And he, he managed to inject without using an injection and you see how the lift is nice, it gives a good lift. You don't have to put a needle and inject and take the needle out. And then you start cutting with, uh, with a mucosal incision. And I asked him, he used a precise sect during dissection. And I told you before that precise sect is a good innovation and smart innovation from Airby and Dithermy machine because it's recognized the, muco the mucosa and the blood vessel uh, depending on the impedance and the R resistance. And it gives you more thermal like more thermal and coagulation at the blood vessels if you, if you like in contact with the blood vessels with a just gentle pressure and all these blood vessels it will seal out and I'm start using a precise sect for all of most of my uh, endoscopic dissection as you can see here like he he never, he told me that he never took the needle out, he just was injecting and you see he, he passed on the blood vessels and he calculated with the tip of the knife using water and as I told you before by like if you see a, a blood vessels like immerse the, the field with the water and use precise set, coagulate gently till the, you, till you see this, the white blood vessels. You don't have to get in and out or use a co-grasper. You, this will make your like dissection more efficient, faster, and decrease the risk of bleeding and the blood, the red blood will just obscure your view. And I think this, the Hyperflex is the, the new innovation and will be adopted by all of us and most of the endoscopists in the uh, practicing uh, ESD and endoluminal surface. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nasser. We can have some questions. Yeah, questions from the audience, uh, yeah. And I just have a very, uh, excuse me, a very basic question. Has it ever happened that you have started doing, using a new, new knife or a new uh, instrument? And then you felt that, no, you had to go back to the earlier instrument because there was a learning curve and maybe something didn't go as well as you thought it would during the demonstrations in the meetings. Has this happened? Uh, you can also answer that. Yeah, uh, actually it's happened. Like I used like some new innovation, then I decided, no, bring my, uh, my, my knife back or bring the, 
my clip back. I don't want to use these things. It happens really because like maybe because I got used to this device, but with the, with the Airbnb knife, I have used it in animal models and it really works well. Like it gives you a good lift with a dissection, nice feed, nice plan. I used to like the dual knife a lot. I don't like to use any other knife other than dual knife. Till I, I, I was using hybrid knife for channeling. Unlike Zahir, he's using TT knife, but I'm using the T, the T type knife of hybrid knife. And because it helped me with the dissection, giving me a good, like, good blade injection, I don't have to take in and out. And also, like this, the ball at the end, it helped me to hook the muscle and cut. And with the this new knife, uh, I don't think, you know, like, because I like the original hybrid knife, and I think I'm going to use this, the new knife. Thank you. Yeah. From the floor, Professor Yozi. Professor he, Yozi. Yeah, he can hear you. Uh, so, coming to AI, uh, you have all this on that the polyps, uh, which are detected by AI, and which are found to be statistically significant are diminutive polyps. So most of the polyps that are picked up by AI as compared to uh, non-AI non are mostly diminutive polyps. So there are two schools of thoughts even in Japan about the management of these diminutive polyps. The first one is uh, because these polyps hardly turn into cancer, so you leave them as it is. Another thought is you leave, uh, you resect this because they are pretty million. So what is your, uh, uh, this one, thought on this and please share your wisdom on this. Yes, actually we uh, Japanese used to do not remove the, all the polyps. If we Japanese found a very diminute polyp, we leave, left the inside you. But uh, <clears throat> after the, we know the results of the National, uh, National Polyp Study, uh, we found, we noticed that the, all the detected polyps should be removed. So these days, uh, we, uh, we, we, we try to remove all the detected polyps. Uh, but uh, for the, if we, we, if we diagnose it, it's adenoma or SSL. So uh, why this polyp, why this diminutive polyps in the rectus semen column uh, should be left inside you? I think so. Uh, do we have a data to suggest if you leave all diminutive polyp alone, do they progress to large polyp, do they progress to malignancy? We have no data about that, uh, but and, uh, traditionally, we, a Japanese patient is uh, well followed up, but they, they, they underwent surveillance colonoscopy repeatedly, so um, most of the patient has, uh, most of the such as diminutive polyp never uh, be, uh, grow, never become larger. So uh, we may have to take the next questions uh, later because we are running short of time. I yeah, okay. Thank, thank, the thank you, everyone. Thank all the, the moderators. And uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah. May I call the next set of moderators for the session on tunneling potpourri? Uh, Dr. Sandeep Pal from Kolkata, uh, Dr. Saurabh Mukhevar from Midas. Uh, Dr. S.P. Bhandari from Thane. And the first speaker would be Mohan Ramchandani on STIR, Tricks to Improve the Success. Uh, we have you. Uh, good afternoon. So let's start the session. Uh, with a lot of stars uh, coming b uh, after me, so I, I have to finish it fast, I think. So let's start talking about STIR and uh, STIR is nothing but a uh, full thickness resection. If you see a tumor which needs to be removed from the gut wall, it can be either removed by exposing the tumor. Exposing means you can create a hole, uh, expose the tumor and remove it. But for that you require full thickness closure device uh, like Ovesco clip or loop and uh, king closure. Or you can do exposure going in a tunneling method, like a create a tunnel from far away and reach to the tumor, expose the tumor. You, you must see the tumor and then remove it. But you require non-full thickness closure device like hemoclips because you created a flap wall over there. Or the third is non-exposed technique of removal of tumor where you don't see the tumor like Dr. Zahir yesterday demonstrated, 
he sucked the tumor or brought the tumor in a barrel, applied a clip, full thickness closure first, followed by cut. So this is non-exposure. So we are talking about an exposure tunnel technique of EFTR. And tunneling, as I said, was brought in the picture by uh, work of uh, Christopher Gustaut, uh, Pankaj Pasricha, Haru Inoi, when they separated the gut wall and then uh, into the mucosa and the muscle layer and the tumor even arising from the muscle layer can be cut under the mucosa and can be removed. But how an endoscopist can remove this? Uh, so let us talk about first indication. Everything cannot be removed. So three things we have to see. One is the size of the tumor, diameter, location of the tumor and risk factor. What are the risk factor? Risk factor are any tumor with ulceration, irregular border, internal heteroecogenicity in the form of necrosis or bleeding or there are regional lymph nodes. If these risk factors are present, then we should not do uh, endoscopic treatment refer for the surgery. So any non-risk patient, so uh, these non-risk, I am taking for granted that we have ruled out all the risk factors. Now see the tumor size. If it is less than one centimeter, don't do anything, follow them up. Now, if the tumor is in esophagus or stomach, that is very important because in esophagus we are dealing with leomyoma and leomyoma can be our benign tumors and can be removed even non end block. So if the tumor size is more than 5 centimeter in esophagus that can be removed, uh, 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 the 5 centimeter is the upper size of the esophageal tumor, especially circumferentially. Or if the tumor is in the stomach, say for example more than 3 centimeter or 3.5 centimeter, then you don't do endoscopic treatment. If the tumor is less than 3.5 in stomach or 1 to 5 centimeter in esophagus, you can plan the STIR uh, uh, pr procedure. So that is why it is important whether you are dealing with esophagus or stomach. Now in stomach also, everywhere STIR cannot be done. Because you can make a tunnel in the upper cardia, on the lesser curve side, but if it is fundus, you can never make a tunnel. And neither you can make a tunnel if in gastric antrum on lesser curve side. If you try to make tunnel here, you will keep on falling. You can never make. So if, if a tumor is lying in the lesser curve side on antrum or in the fundus, you cannot do stir. You have to do endoscopic full thickness resections to remove those tumors. Rest of the site like esophagus, gastric cardia or even the uh, greater curve in the body, you can do that. So this is the plan. So now we know the indications. We know when, what, when not to do. But if you see this animation, the idea is again to create a mucosal bleb proximal to the tumor, separate the mucosa away from the muscle and similar to POEM, you have to keep on dissecting till you reach the, the po uh, tumor site and then separate the tumor from the mucosal site, separate the tumor from the muscle. Even if it is firmly attached to the muscle, you can remove piece of the muscle along with it and keep the mucosa intact. So that is the uh, uh, plan and uh, this is the video which uh, is very important. Uh, Dr. Zahir has also uh, has, uh, edited it very nicely. You should have a very good imaging. You see, if the tumor is there, we should know how far it is going deep, uh, whether the tumor is coming into the lumen or it is going into the extra lumen side, uh, whether the tumor is uh, proximity to the vital structures like aorta. So once you have a clear cut uh, uh, 3D imaging and then you can prepare the the, uh, the plan that uh, we have to go proximally, cre create a tunnel, reach to the tumor and prepare all the accessories which are normally, which we do in POEM, we use triangle tip knife more uh, because it's a tunneling technique and triangle tip knife is the one of the best knife once you are doing tunnel, not ESD but tunneling. So once uh, that, uh, the tumor is located, just make two to three centimeter proximally, make sure the tumor is in line with your incision, 
then uh, similarly do some trimming to get inside the tunnel uh, 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 it's all similar to the to the uh, uh, poem procedure which we do uh, ex expose the tumor now as i said this is an exposed technique of the tumor this is a muscle layer mucosa submucosa so we are entering into the tunnel we are far away from the tumor now we have reached to the tumor so tumor has got two surfaces the mucosal surface and muscular surface you can go either way but if the if the tumor is small and i am able to detach it from the muscle completely i usually convert into esd so most of the tumors which may be easily separated from the muscle layer we can completely remove it but if you are causing a defect in the muscle then it is important to preserve the mucosa and then the procedure becomes slightly large longer you have to keep on doing the dissection on the lateral borders uh, good thing about esophagus is the sometimes the leomyoma which are more than 5 cm in size are still tubular they are not like uh, uh, involving circumference but they are involving longitudinal length and longitudinal length tumors can be removed very easily even if they are more than 5 cm uh, uh, only thing is they should not involve more than 3/4 of circumference then it is so difficult to do uh, uh, in single go you may do piecemeal resections and doing piecemeal resection of leomyoma is also okay so we need to uh, dissect it from the muscle layer and uh, 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 that is the complete exposure of the tumor uh, release from the uh, the mucosal side from the muscle side keep the mus mucosal uh, intact and then put a snare and remove it uh, so this is the method where you can completely remove the tumor from the tunneling method and you can see now there are no bleeding there is no residual tumor the mucosa muscle both are intact uh, so that that gives you a full uh, uh, specimen for histopathological assessment there is no perforation you can close this mucosal incision as you do in poem and this can be sent to the uh, 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 histopathological assessment sometimes what happens is you are not able to go in, in dissect at the distal the anal end of the tumor because you don't have the device which can flex and able to help you to dissect on the distal side for that condition what you can do is uh, uh, this is say for example a tumor at gastric cardia you create a same mucosal incision uh, uh, then once you are reaching to the distal end of the tumor now you have to dissect in almost a u shape uh, uh, one can do a deliberate mucosal incision at the distal end of the tumor uh, this is known as double opening stir where you have to uh, uh, you are creating a hole in the mucosa deliberately creating a window so that you can push the tumor rather than dissecting in a retrograde fashion which is difficult to do because of the close cavity over there uh, you may cause perforation of the mucosa mechanically but it's better to have a deliberate clean mucosal incision so that now you are able to see into the lumen again so you came by a mucosal incision created a tunnel and now you have create a exit point for this tumor to be pushed from oral end to the anal end which is much easy to do in a tunnel as compared to uh, doing a retrograde dissection or leaving some part of the tumor behind especially at the g junction where possibility of uh, 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 just is more as compared to the leomyoma now you can see the tumor is now popping out of that window and now we are doing dissection from anti grade to to the uh, to the uh, anal side and then you keep on pushing it's easy to push because with the weight of the tumor you will get a proper uh, uh, delineation of the uh, of the planes where is the mucosa even if you create a big mucosal muscle incision 
uh, it's okay because majority of the mucosa is still intact. It is a clean mucosal incision at the distal end which can be easily closed uh, uh, and you can keep on pushing this tumor out and then uh, this is known as double door method. So, I mean the, the double opening method and uh, subsequently the opening of the mucosal entry site and the mucosal uh, opening which you have made to, to push the tumor out can be easily closed. So, uh, th this is the animation to show you that the tumor is uh, pushed out of the opening uh, rather than to do a difficult this type of dissection. So, this can be done to uh, solve the problem of stir. So, if you do stir, you will, it's a minimally invasive method, it reduces the length of hospital stay and cost is lower. However, uh, sometimes uh, the complete resection is not possible and don't do that in malignant gist because you will upstage the tumor if you are not very sure about it. Apart from that, it can be done in majority of the tumors and we have also published about it and shown that our complete resection is around 97 percent and the tumor size especially in esophagus the longitudinal length may, may go to 9 to 10 centimeters. Uh, the problem with this is again uh, to have a good knowledge about the third space, a good uh, command on POEM procedures uh, that will solve most of the adverse event uh, but majority of the time will be able to remove the leomyomas, the gist and so on. So, with this I will end my talk because we have limited time and uh, uh, so, so stir is a nice technique of removing the tumors from the gut wall in a more safer method. It will not require full thickness closure device, neither it will require some fashion the, the uh, exotic device like OTSC or over the scope clip, but if you have a good technique of tunneling you can do these procedures with whatever instrument which are available in day-to-day -day clinical practice. Thank you very much for your patient hearing and I will uh, 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 be yeah, happy to answer the question in the discussion section. Thank, thank you. you Mohan. We will move to Dr. Moin Khashab who is going to talk to us on improving technical success of G poem. Dr. Moin is coming from, the, from DMH. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We oh. can't see you. Okay, yeah, we're uh, working on it. For Mohan, that was definitely more than eight minutes. So, uh, yeah, so the <laughs> I think they're giving you a special treatment. All right. So, uh, so this is just first an update uh, on the open Z poem uh, from yesterday. We see the esophagram that shows nice opening a nice emptying there of the diverticulum and on the right side we see the final endoscopic image with the uh, complete septotomy. So I wanted to show you this because we, didn't, we were not uh, live and uh, this is an outcome of this relatively new technique uh, that, uh, that, uh, that I hope uh, will disseminate slowly uh, after we publish some data. So, uh, moving to today's talk, it is on uh, G-POEM. So, the idea behind G-POEM comes from our clinical experience with Botox, despite two controlled trials that showed no difference from sham, uh, but these were very, very small trials, uh, a very small number of patients. From clinical experience, we see some patients who improve with intrapyloric injection of Botox. I'm talking about patients with severe uh, gastroparesis. Based on that, we started using transpyloric stenting in some of our patients who, uh, on uh, some of our gastroparesis patients who get admitted to the hospital with severe symptoms of nausea, vomiting. Uh, we have a huge gastroparesis practice and our wards got, get full with these patients. So we started putting transpyloric stents to help discharge them with some success. Based on that, uh, we published a few papers. You can see here one in GIE in 2015. Based on these results, uh, you know, actually before this last paper was published, uh, we did the first 
uh, gastric peroral endoscopic myotomy along with Haro Inui and Stavros. This is a picture we took at our hospital back in 2013. So uh, step one of G-POEM, few centimeters approximal to the pylorus along the greater curvature. We don't go too far proximal because we don't want to have a very long antral myotomy and worsen gastroparesis. Also, uh, we don't want to tunnel away from the pylorus. So it's good to stay relatively close. You can make a, ver you can make a transverse incision or a longitudinal incision as I did here. I don't think there is uh, a difference. Some tri trimming, same as we do with a regular poem. Same scope, same cap, same knife, same electrosurgical current settings. And same principle where we tunnel close to the muscularis propria and keep the mucosa intact. So now we're going to tunnel towards the pylorus using spray coagulation here that makes the procedure fast. And we use coag grasper for vessels. And we continue tunneling until we get to this structure here, which is the pylorus. It's a ring. And we see the duodenal mucosa going perpendicular to it. So this is, once you see this, means you're there. But you got to see this. Some anatomies are difficult. And you want to convince yourself it's a pylorus. Until you see the duodenum, it's not the pylorus. And then comes the pyloromyotomy itself. I like to use an insulated tip knife, which you've seen uh, during this meeting. This is an IT2. Two advantages. The ceramic tip keeps us away from the duodenal wall. Also, the ceramic tip helps grasp the muscle. And it helps us understand the depth of myotomy. If you are unable to grasp uh, more fibers, it means your myotomy is done. Sometimes it's hard to delineate if you're... Uh, if you've done a full thickness and you've cut a little more, you're going to be in the peritoneum. So this knife helps you avoid that. So uh, skinning an onion layer by layer until we go to the serosa, we uh, extend it towards the antrum by a couple of centimeters, and that's it. So this is at 7 o'clock. My current technique, I do the 7 o'clock, and then I do the 5 o'clock, so double myotomy, and snare the muscle in between. The idea is to do a wide myotomy so that the muscle does not come together, uh, and which we've seen uh, in some patients. Here you see uh, we were able to still grasp some muscle with the uh, ceramic tip, and we continue to, to cut. At the end, we close either with clips or with uh, suturing. And uh, we've talked about x uh, before. This is an example of also using through the scope suturing to close these uh, uh, incisions. Occasionally, you have a lot of stasis and the mucosa is very thick. And how it's hard to close. You're trying to put clips and they keep slipping. So in these cases, suturing uh, can be helpful. Uh, we keep it as a backup technique rather than a primary technique. But uh, just a Z pattern here with suturing through the scope suturing is actually uh, pretty easy. Uh, Amol asked us to keep it light on data. Just this first study on G-POEM uh, on 30 patients with good success and good safety. And these results have been replicated in multiple trials, including this prospective trial we published in GUT. Uh, the results are uh, mediocre, I will say. 68% uh, we see improvement with significant improvement uh, in symptoms. And there was a recent European study versus GPOM versus SHAM. The study actually had to be terminated early because of superiority of uh, G poem. And here, in terms of predictors of outcomes, patients with more severe symptoms at baseline tend to do better. Uh, the definition of delayed gastric emptying is more than 10% retention at four hours. But if you got more than 20% retention, it's better results. And for in my practice, we only take patients with more than 20% uh, retention at four hours. Uh, some alternative techniques, I told you about the double G poem, which means we do two incisions along the greater curvature, five o'clock, seven o'clock. In this patient with very severe symptoms, we did two tunnels, one across the greater curvature and one across the lesser curvature. 
Uh, it doesn't prolong the procedure a lot. These go very, very quickly. And you see we did a, uh, a double myotomy, one on the lesser curvature, one on the greater curvature. I find the greater curvature myotomy uh, much, uh, much easier than the lesser curvature. And at the end, you close both incisions with, uh, with uh, clips. Um, the role of end of lip, uh, you know, this impedance planimetry, can we test the pylorus and figure out which spastic pylorus can be good candidates for, uh, this, uh, for this type of treatment? This is the end of lip balloon. You can inflate across the pylorus and uh, figure out if it's tight or not by looking at distensibility uh, index. What we found is it's actually good to rule out patient from the procedure, but not good enough to select patient. So you can say this patient is not a candidate rather than say patient is a good candidate. If the pylorus is more, uh, if the distensibility is more than 10, we exclude patients. So the way I think about uh, including patients, I try to select patients without a major abdominal pain comp uh, component, no major psychiatric comorbidities. If they have diabetes, it has to be good controlled. Uh, if they are on narcotics, we exclude them. And if they've responded prior to uh, pylorus-directed treatment like Botox or stenting, that's a positive, uh, uh, kind of a positive sign for response to uh, G-POEM. To, to conclude, hopefully keeping it uh, within eight minutes, unlike Mohan, who took much longer. Indications for G-POEM will need to be determined. And impedance planimetry is good, but not uh, as good as, uh, as we thought. I think double pyloromyotomy deserves uh, further studying. We have an RCT showing G-POEM superior to, SAM, to SHAM, but we definitely need uh, more uh, SHAM-controlled trials. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Moin. Thanks for keeping time. And we'll move to Dr. Amol. Technical checklist for PREM. I think Amol is, uh, we are changing speakers in DMH. Yeah. You're connected? Yeah. Great. Yeah. We can see you, hear you. Okay. You got my slides there as well. I can see it. Yeah. So, <clears throat> well, we uh, already saw the PREM procedure and we did discuss few of the technical points regarding the procedure. So. To begin, we reported the first PREM procedure in 2016. We did the case uh, in the late 2015, and then we waited for a few months before we published this case report. That was our first case report. And subsequently, then we uh, also reported this case series of nine patients uh, a couple of years ago in endoscopy. So basically, first thing is, how do we select our patients? So the clinical profile is very important and this is a kid that we can see and this, this, uh, that video shows you visible peristalsis and this is quite common when you see patients of uh, children with Hirschsprungs and uh, these kind of uh, you know, spastic uh, constipation. And as I mentioned during the live case as well, a high index of suspicion is very important because uh, that would actually trigger off a suspicion that this patient could be having Hirschsprungs. The diagnosis is primarily on a barium enema. You don't want to scope these kids uh, you know, immediately and uh, that can also become quite difficult. And the barium enema with a dilated proximal colon and this conical transitional zone is almost pathognomonic of Hirschsprungs and most pediatric surgical textbooks and uh, literature will tell us that, you know, uh, barium enema is the first investigation to go with when you are su you're suspecting Hirschsprungs. After that, an interrectal manometry, an absent rectoanal inhibitory reflex will definitely, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, tell you that this is a Hirschsprung, but uh, as I mentioned, in an ultra short segment, the RAIR can be false positive, and one has to be careful about that. And uh, don't allow, you know, the, you, you know, if your clinical suspicion is strong, you might still want to do biopsies in these patients despite having a positive RAIR. And we have some patients like that. Coming to mapping of the transition zone, and that is very important. Full thickness biopsies have been described surgically, but what is more important is the cap EMR technique that we've described, and I think Zaheer has also described this in video GIE. And uh, this is how the cap EMR technique is done. So we inject copiously because you want a good bleb so that you can suction and you can gra grab the deep submucosa in the, uh, in the snare. Again, the suction has to be optimal because the colonic wall is thin, particularly in the proximal part, the proximal biopsies, if they are in the sigmoid, you can develop a full thickness perforation even with this amount of suction. So be very careful and have clips handy in case you have a perforation. And more importantly than that, these patients do need bowel prep. They need about 50 ml per kilogram body weight of PEG solution and a low residue diet. And that has to be given, you know, repeatedly over two to three days to get a good bowel prep. They may require any mass to clear out solid stools in addition to that. How do we sample the uh, biopsy specimens? So as I said, we take serial biopsy starting from the dilated segment and then going down. The last biopsy, we're taking about two to three centimeters inside the dentate line. And these patients uh, and these biopsies are, you know, have to be stained with immunohistochemistry and to demonstrate the ganglion cells as well as the hypertrophic nerve bundles. So that will confirm your Hirschsprungs and then you can go ahead. The, the procedure, as we mentioned, we prefer the jackknife position, if, uh, you know, but the procedure is under evolution probably. If somebody else comes out with an easier technique when you don't have to turn the patient around, that's pretty much fine. But uh, that's what we've been doing, uh, going that way. Bowel prep is the most important. You don't want the tunnel to get contaminated. So these patients really need to be cleaned up and that's sometimes even more difficult to do than the actual PREM procedure itself. That's important. Then the technique, we already saw the technique, so I'm not going to show you everything, but you can either have a vertical or a longitudinal incision or a transverse incision. Earlier we used to do a longitudinal incision, but nowadays uh, we are more inclined to perform a transverse incision because that makes things much easier and you can extend the myotomy onto the internal anal sphincter much more easily. Because otherwise, you are a little bit concerned about the myotomy being exposed outside. Be clear with your planes and get in. The rectal mucosa in children is quite thin and it can tear quite easily. So one has to be very careful. We've also uh, sometimes had to use a clip and line technique to get inside the tunnel. Once we are inside the tunnel, Keep the direction of the, of the tunnel and myotomy perpendicular to the circular muscle fibers and also go out as may be required. Particularly if you, are, you have to extend the tunnel into the sigmoid, that is very important because the natural curve, curve of the sigmoid needs to be accounted for. We always do a full thickness myotomy and then a closure. The closure is quite simple and straightforward and you need not have a completely tight closure. Submucosal entry, as I mentioned, sometimes it can be quite difficult, in which case you can just apply a clip and line technique at the angle. This was a longitudinal incision that we had performed earlier, but you can apply a clip and line. And the advantage of the prone position is you can just allow the clip to hang down and then it makes things easier to make an entry under the clip or over the clip into the tunnel. Regarding the post-procedure care and follow-up, 
we do maintain these patients on intravenous antibiotics for 48 hours and gradual resumption of diet particularly if we've gone into the sigmoid these patients can develop paralytic ileus for a few hours 8 to 12 hours so make sure that the patient has regained peristalsis before starting to feed them and we need to give them some stool softeners or laxatives to maintain a stool frequency of four to five stools per day you don't want those clips to get dislodged at least for the initial couple of weeks until healing occurs and after which you can reduce the uh, dose to some fiber supplement depending on the patient's requirement and the proximal colonic dilatation we do recommend currently that we are, we are because we are following up these patients to perform a sigmoidoscopy barium enema and anorectal manometry in around three months period therefore to summarize a high degree of suspicion for diagnosis a combination of barium enema, anorectal manometry, and sigmoidoscopy guided serial EMR, cap EMR biopsies to, for an accurate mapping of the aganglion segment is very important. Bowel prep needs to be very optimal. Position, jackknife position, we need to maintain a correct direction of the tunnel and myotomy, and we need to ensure an adequate length of the myotomy and make sure that the distal end of the myotomy includes the internal anal sphincter. With that, thank you very much, and we'll have questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Thanks, Amul. I believe uh, Pankaj is with you at uh, DMH. He's going to speak on Z poem. Actually, it's Professor uh, Noria who's going to do the next oh, talk, sir. OK. Yeah, you're right. I, I read it wrong. EFTR for gastric ACLs. Well. So, yeah, just yeah. getting his laptop connected. Right. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. So uh, this time, I'm talking. Hmm? Just a second, person. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, this time, I'm talking about uh, EFTR for gastric submucosal tumor. Yes. Yes, first. Okay. Uh, so because of the time, I proceed. So uh, why does gastric submucosal tumor need to be treated? Uh, because uh, it uh, just accounts for 70 to 80 percent of gastric submucosal tumor. Uh, for just inherently uh, malignant nature, such as growing tendency or potential risk of metastasis. And uh, it is very difficult to predict the prognosis. Uh, it means uh, clinically dormant or uh, can be malignant. Uh, by endoscopic or histological finding, uh, because uh, especially when they are small. So uh, histologically proven small gist, standard treatment is excision unless major morbidity, morbidity is expected. So for most, but, uh, uh, most of the treatment for small gist are prophylactic uh, measure. Uh, but uh, however, excessive partial gas erection may be needed for region at the area where laparoscopic local excision is difficult, uh, such as uh, cardia or upper corpus posterior. But uh, this is uh, theoretically suitable for local excision because it does not require uh, lymph node dissection or a uh, generous surgical resection margin. So there are many reports of endoscopic protect section for gastric mesenchymal tumor uh, is published from overseas, especially China, like this. So what is the benefit of endoscopic resection for gastric submucosal tumor? For laparoscopic uh, resection, we usually uh, wrap up the tumor and then cut the uh, region. So uh, Muscle defect can be uh, quite large, especially the region is intramucosal, the intraluminal type. Uh, so to solve this problem, Japanese surgeon uh, studied endoscopic and surgeon studied uh, laparoscopic and endoscopic cooperative surgery, Rex. So in this uh, case, in this method, uh, we remove the tumor by uh, transpaural endoscopy, so we can uh, reduce the muscle defect. And, but uh, however, to close the wound uh, with laparoscopic surgery, we have to dissect the extraluminal tissue. Uh, and sometimes it contains some vessels or nerve. Uh, it may cause some uh, dysmotility after the treatment. 
But a parallel resection and a one closure can minimize the gastric wall defect and extra gastric tissue damage, which may contribute organ function preserving minimally invasive treatment. So uh, actually, we tried to start EFTR for gastric some mucosal tumor uh, in 2018. Uh, it, I get approval for, uh, from IRB. But uh, in Japanese medical practice, everything is covered by national social insurance. So we have to apply a uh, minimum ministry of health in Japan, Japan to get a, a special approval for this procedure. But uh, in 2020, uh, we get uh, uh, approval to, for the indication of 11 to 30 millimeter intraluminal growth type, no ulceration, histologically proven or clinically suspicious cyst. So uh, actually, we have, I have been to Chongshan Hospital to learn uh, EFTR technique, and then they are generously uh, taught me the procedures. But uh, when we uh, perform uh, the EFTR procedure, we have some issues uh, for the procedure. One is uh, clear tumor, tumor resection, and uh, another is secure defect closure. Uh, to solve these problems, uh, yeah, because sometimes a uh, cap or a device uh, traumatize the tumor. So to solve this problem is try to standardize the uh, treatment uh, procedure. So uh, initially we cut the oral mucosa and then extend the mucosal incision to the anal side with IT knife. And then uh, try to make a trimming and some mucosal dissection to expose a uh, muscle attachment of the lesion as much as possible. And then put the clip and uh, make a traction toward oral side. And then start muscle incision from the anal side. So I think 80 or 90 percent of procedure can be covered by this procedure. Uh, it is steps. And uh, we routinely use clip and light traction technique for the tumor resection. And uh, to uh, close the uh, full thickness one, uh, initially we use clip and uh, end loop technique, but uh, this is, uh, there is a limitation of the size of closure according to the size of end loop. And so sometimes it needs multiple closure with this method. And recently, Japanese endoscopy developed new uh, closure technique using a clip and nylon line. So first clip, it is uh, tighten the uh, nylon line, this. And then after that, uh, this line, next, uh, next clip was threaded to the hole of clip. And then apply second clip and then appro approximate the clips each other. So uh, I show the uh, one case. So initially, we started uh, oral side mucosal incision. And then retroflex, we extend the mucosal incision line to the anal side. And then dissect trimming and dissect the tissue as much as possible. And then put the clip. And start a uh, muscle incision from the anal side. And if we use the clip traction, uh, even outside the, t uh, outside the lumen, a uh, tumor uh, come into the uh, inside the stomach. And then we dissect the uh, outside, extra uh, peritoneal tissue dissection, and then complete the uh, tumor resection. So this is a full thickness wound. So initially, clip line is tightened to the jaw of the clip. And then next clip thread is, no, line is threaded to the hole of clips. And then before deployment, we put and tighten the each clips like this. The good thing of this method, we can bite the muscle not only mucosa, but the muscle or even peritoneal tissue to uh, get the uh, very secure, secure closure. And then after removal, we retrieve the specimen with a plastic bag. 
And then uh, that is a, a final result. So, uh, so far, I have, we have done uh, about 38 regions, and uh, uh, the section time is 50 time, uh, 52 minutes. And the free sickness resection uh, was required 90% of the cases, but uh, abdominal percentages were required in only 30 uh, patients. One delayed perforation developed, but it was managed by endoscopy treatment. 73% uh, was just. So uh, we have done completed uh, multi-center study, so we will publish this to get a approval for routine social uh, medical insurance. So in conclusion, if they are fugacic, some mucosal tumor is technically feasible, warranting future validation in large-scale prospective cohort study. Thank you for attention. <clears throat> Next is Dr. Pankaj. He'll be speaking to us on Z poem from DMH. Dr. Pankaj is from SIDS Surat. You can start, Pankaj. We can see you. Yeah, I promise. So, please. Approach. No, no, we are losing your audio. Just a second. Okay. okay. No, uh, power, power. Ah. No, sir, just do that. Just leave that. I have nothing to do with that. Yes, sir, please go ahead. Okay. No, so, no, 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 no. Not no. yet. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so, the basic principle of managing a Zenker's diverticulum is uh, to sever or cut the cricopharyngeal muscle and open the diverticulum into the esophagus. This is the basic principle that has to be followed. Uh, and methods that we had is doing a traditional septotomy with different types of knives, uh, which has been discussed throughout the day. Uh, now, uh, using a tunneling technique, that is a Z-poem, which was described by Professor Zhu, uh, has been introduced. And why the need for this poem, uh, this technique to be introduced was, when you do a septotomy, this was what the initial septotomy looked like. This is a septum, and you just cut the septum into two and lay the diverticulum open. It you could do with uh, IT knife, or you can do with a clutch cutter or an SB knife, as you see here which makes things very simple and effective and very uh, the time was very less. The only issue with this was, as you can see here in the uh, data, was that though the success rate was around 90%, the recurrence rate was as high as 36% in some of the series. And therefore, uh, the concept of uh, the tunneling poem or the Z poem came, where initially what we did was, if this is a septum, we started around a couple of centimeters proximal to the septum, injected like this here, and then we went into the tunnel like we do in all other third space procedures, expose the septum in the tunnel, and then cut the septum like this, either with uh, SB knife or you can use uh, IT knife, and then close the mucosal incision. So this is the classical Z poem, as we all know. Uh, <clears throat> recent multi-center uh, uh, study has shown a very good efficacy and a very low recurrence rates. So uh, this is uh, another video which is showing the use of an IT knife. Now this has been modified to another technique because the problems with the long uh, the tunnel which was made was sometimes you get lost into the tunnel and sometimes it was not very easy to close the mucosal defect in the pharynx or the creek of pharynx. So therefore, instead of injecting away from the tunnel or a couple of centimeters proximal, people started injecting uh, on the tunnel and this is known as a modified Z, uh, Z poem in which the septa injection was done on the septum and once the injection is done on the septum, take a vertical incision, a horizontal incision along the septum, expose the septum, cut the septum, and close the mucosa. This, is, <clears throat> this modification would negate the need for proximal tunneling, improve the working space, because you get a good uh, place to uh, apply clips on the mucosa, and close the mucosa. 
and theoretically reduces the risk of leak. Going ahead, what has happened is this, uh, in this technique, what happens is because of severe fibrosis around the septum due to inflammation and due to the stasis, this problem happens that on the diverticular side or on the esophagus side, sometimes it was very difficult to get inside. So well, you have to use a modified technique. You have to inject on the esophageal side, create some cushion, and then you can enter the tunnel. So these are a little problematic uh, uh, cases where it is difficult to enter directly from on the septum. Now, uh, because of uh, the mucosal flap which remains, what happens is the patients were having recurrent dysphagia. This was also there. So the residual mucosal flap was then stabilized with the placement of through the scope clips at either end. So what people started doing was cut the mucosal flap also. And how this was started was that you do a mucosal incision, apply clips at two ends, then cut the mucosa in between. Again, apply clips at two ends, cut the mucosa till the base of the diverticulum and do a complete mucosotomy. This technique was uh, allowed a wider communication between the diverticulum and the esophagus. So this is a diagrammatic uh, representation of what was done and this is how it looks like. So this is the septum which has been cut. Now what is being done, the clip is applied on one edge. As you can see, the other clip would be applied on the other mucosal edge. The mucosal uh, is cut in between. Again, you apply two clips distally and cut the mucosa like that going till the edge of the septum and making the uh, diverticulum and the esophagus into one lumen. So this required a lot of clips and ultimately what has come now or what is being studied now as Professor Kashab showed yesterday and even Dr. Mahidev has done a few cases is the open technique, open Z poem. So this open Z poem is basically what we do that you do a in, in incision on the septum, divide the septum, and instead of closing the mucosa, the mucosa on the esophageal side and on the diverticular side is cut open, and the entire thing is laid open. And this is showing to have some promising results. So we have to wait and see and uh, experience how this technique goes, and this would be uh, something uh, new which has come on the block. So therefore, this is how the open Z poem would look like. We already, Dr. Kashab showed you. The entire mucosa is cut, the muscle is cut, and the diverticulum and the esophagus has become one. So uh, there is a comparison between all the techniques. There are limitations that traditional poem, you know, that the problem is recurrence in Z poem. The problem is closure. A modified Z poem because of fibrosis there is sometimes a problem and, uh, and there is a problem of the mucosal flap which remains and therefore uh, the concept of open poem is now there. So small, very few cases of Zenkers all over the world but still the technique is evolving. So Z poem any optimal approach the, I think the procedure is still in ev evolution. A lot of modifications are still going on and we need definitive prospective studies to standardize this procedure. Thank you so much for your kind attention. We can take questions. Saurabh? Hi. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, we can let the audience start, I guess. Yeah. Sir, the question is for Bapai, sir. In the procedure frame, uh, when you demonstrated it, you said that we need to look for the twitchings and uh, the external anal sphincter should not be incised. Apart from that, are there any other signs by which we can differentiate between IAS and external anal sphincter? And secondly, is it possible that the external anal sphincter might not show twitching and we might get confused and cut it? Okay. So, very good question. First thing is, if you position your incision inside the dentate line, look at the anatomy. Your external anal sphincter begins at the dentate line and goes out, outward. So there is no way you can actually damage the external anal sphincter if your in mucosal incision is inside the dentate line. Despite that, because of the angulation, your knife may just go and touch it somewhere, 
but there you will see the twitchings because that is a striated muscle and the external anal sphincter, so that will obviously twitch. Yeah, and the internal anal sphincter is extension and continuation of the circular muscle of the rectum, which will not twitch. So that is the difference. So you will always see the twitching, uh, even if, uh, and so you can safely cut whatever is not twitching. Uh, okay. My Dr. question Dr. is to Dr. Pankaj regarding uh, Zanker's diverticulum. Pankaj, excellent yeah. presentation as always. Thank My you. question is the time-tested conventional putting in a RILS tube, doing a septoplasty is easiest to the position, easy, easiest to the procedure. Moreover, most, most of these patients are quite elderly with a lot of morbidities. Rather, I think the average age of Zanker is 60, 65 plus. So even if they have a recurrence five years down the lane, you can just do a repeat 10 minutes procedure. Cannot. The yeah. question is, uh, yeah. why not to do conventional cut of yes, the yes, yes. pharyngeal myotome? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, see, the, if the patient, this technique is evolving, as I said, and the septotomy definitely, definitely works, but we also have seen recurrences, then the only, only intention is to avoid any recurrence if possible. So, if the patient is sick, definitely septotomy is a very good option. I agree with you. I don't have any other uh, reservations about doing a septotomy. In, but the patient who is not so sick and has dysphagia, in those cases, you can offer this uh, technique and uh, try to avoid the recurrence in the future. That is the only thing. Yeah. Is, does the size of the lesion or maybe the volume of the diverticula in terms of its length, is it a contraindication on endoscopic procedures? No, is I don't think so. more than 5, 7 centimeter? No, no, no. I don't think so. Uh, we can always, uh, any, any length of the diverticulum, 5, 7, 10. I think we have done around 7 to 10 centimeters also. I think Khashab also, uh, Dr. Mohan also has an experience of doing large diverticulum. That is not the limiting factor. Last question at the so back. Question, a question for uh, Dr. Bape. So, uh, we had a patient recently, a pediatric patient. Uh, we did PREM. I think we encountered a lot of challenge in terms of uh, capnoperitoneum. And I think the flow of carbon dioxide is, of course, designed for adults and uh, small sized, you know, uh, pediatric patients can be quite cumbersome. So I had to do it in two stage, unfortunately. It happened well ultimately, but then are there any solutions when you're doing pediatric cases in third space? Any options with pedi I, I know you've seen the report of you doing it with a pediatric scope. Is that yeah. something you could do in PREM as well? Yeah, so we've done one PREM using a pediatric scope so far in an 11, you know, about an eight or nine month old child. And uh, I agree that, you know, capnoperitoneum can be a problem even in poem when we are doing it in kids because I think it's based on the surface area. And since children have a smaller surface area, they are more prone to gas-related adverse events. So one has to be very careful with the insufflation, gas insufflation. And at the slightest doubt of, you know, uh, rising ETCO2 or some, uh, you know, ventilatory disturbance, probably just hold the procedure for a few minutes, ventilate, hyperventilate the patient, make sure that the CO2 is washed out and then continue the procedure. That's the way uh, one has to do it. But there's no other solution to that. As I said, using a clip and line technique sometimes helps you gain entry into the submucosal space in that kind of a situation because the rectal mucosa is very thin. Thank you. Yeah, underwater. So one one yeah. last question. Doing, last question. Yeah, underwater, as Moeen has uh, suggested, doing an underwater once you are inside the tunnel, that's also an option. So you can switch off the CO2. Amal sir, one last question regarding PREM. Like, how do you ensure total dissection of internal anal sphincter? Like, sometimes it becomes very difficult to completely dissect the internal anal sphincter. That is the reason you have to extend the myotomy onto the mucosal incision, up to the mucosal incision. See, in POEM, you are going to leave that one or two centimeter gap between the mucosal incision and the myotomy. But in PREM, you need not do that because it is at the distal end. So you can extend the myotomy all throughout. It is a very similar to what the surgeons do as a, as a lateral subcutaneous sphincterotomy for a fissure. And they, they do the same thing. And we are doing it endoscopically, so they are doing the same thing. Last few okay. can be dilated also? Yeah. yeah. So, the, yeah. so even if you are not 100% sure, you can dilate. 
Yeah, yeah. Week. Every I think it is done today. Also, we dilated yeah, at the end. You do a to to Lord's to procedure, which is the bread and butter of surgeons. Yes. With that, we can close this session. Thank you. We thank, you. thank the moderators and we move on to live back at the Nanad. So we can call the moderators for the live demonstration. Dr. Anil Arora, sir. Thank you. Dr. Mandar Roifode, Gastro Hub. Dr. Sheetal Mahajani. Dr. Rakesh Kumar Adi from Yashoda, Hyderabad. Dr. Sudhir Maharshi from SMS Jaipur, the chairpersons, Dr. Sunil Jain, Dr. Vaibhav Banai from Nagpur, and Dr. Sujit Jagirdar from Sholapur. We can, can, we present, the, can yes. we present the case? Present the case. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, this is a 20 year old girl. Uh, she's a case of post poem for type 3 achalasia, which uh, she underwent poem procedure elsewhere last year in the month of September. She now presented with complaints of dysphagia to liquids more than solids uh, for the last three months. And on barium swallow, there was a dilated esophagus with holdup of contrast. Uh, manometry resulted in generali uh, showed generalized failure of peristalsis. As we can see the manometry panel on the right side, which is the recent one and uh, the IRP was elevated. The plan is to perform a per-oral endoscopic myotomy with a concomitant endoscopic fundoplication. So the learning objective for this uh, case is demonstration of anterior poem with endoscopic fundoplication. Over to you, Dr. Moen and Bapes. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, hello there. Can you see us? Sanjay? Moderators. I guess they're watching. Hello. Just a minute, sir. Yes, hello. Yeah. yeah. Yes, we can see you. Okay. Yeah. So, Mohir is here and uh, he's uh, starting an anterior poem in this patient and Mohan will be there with him and then we'll come back over here after the anterior Injection. poem to demonstrate the fundoplication as well. So, Mohan, okay, Mohin and Mohan, over Mohin to both of you all. Now, now it's going to be very confusing. Mohan and Mohan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, so the uh, sphincter looks open to me, guys. Yeah. But, uh, Probably the stomach is over distended, kind of, because she still has symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so this is here about 35 centimeter. So we're gonna get three centimeters of two to three centimeters on the stomach side. So we're gonna reach 38. So, uh, six, seven centimeters on the esophageal side. And uh, we'll have two, three centimeters of normal muscle for a flap. So, we're going to start the incision at 25. So, this is the posterior incision they did before. So, the patient is on the back. You see the spine here. And you can always, where's the, can you please put it, what? let's not move it, huh? just leave it where I put it. Okay. And this is the fluid here, pulls posteriorly, so that's just another indication. So for POEM F, we want to go anterior, and actually it's important. So, uh, and sometimes the esophagus is tortuous, so if you kind of go semi-anterior or posterior, you're, you're not going to be able to do it. So for, once you're planning to do, uh, go into the peritoneum, so you, still you go 1 to 2 p.m. or more 12-ish? Um, I, I like to actually go 12-ish. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's very important point One, because it's entry to peritoneum becomes much easy. Sometimes we go wayward towards right and then Needle out. going into the peritoneum will be a problem. Go ahead and inject. Mohan, did he, this patient have some earlier procedure because the patulous G-junction was patulous on retroflexion? Yeah, he has gone, undergone posterior poem. Okay. And, but the symptoms are still persisting. CT knife, ready? And even the manometry shows an incomplete myotomy. So CT. It needs uh, completion. Mm -hmm. Okay, back. Okay. So we're going to make, uh, so important here, 
that Amol is going to use the, the detachable loop. So yeah. if, if we're using the Olympus loop, which I use, because we don't have the detachable loop, we make the incision longer, longer because, because the loop has to go on the outside of the scope and yeah. it's, kind of, it's, it's hard to get into the tunnel. Yeah. Since you're using a detachable loop, we're just going to make a normal incision here. Yeah, that's so, Moin, uh, okay, my loud. question is, uh, your, why the 6 centimeter myotomy or 4 centimeter myotomy has come into picture? Do you think that's okay or we as an endoscopist uh, can uh, change the length of myotomy because now there is enough data that in type 2 even a shorter myotomy is okay? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, you know, we even, uh, you know, we have some good data now in sigmoid esophagus. Yeah. You do even in, uh, just keep the knife out, huh? no need to put it back in. So the, even in sigmoid esophagus, we do a short myotomy and it works. So yeah, this is even yeah. advanced difficult achalasia. Yeah, yeah. So there is no point for, uh, for long myotomy. Yeah. For, poem, for poem F, it's a little different uh, because you want a, a flap. And especially for us, when we do it with a, a regular loop, when you go in, it's really difficult. So I want actually three or four centimeter of normal muscle. Because when you're trying to push in, you can go through the muscle. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, the flip side of long muscle is that your scope takes some angle. While uh, if there is a short, short myotomy, your maneuverability in the fundus of area is much better, which I feel a shorter myotomy helps more in poem myof rather than longer myotomy because you have a straight shaft and then you turn to the left and then you maneuver there. Mohan, just to ask you a question. We, uh, can, can you please raise uh, your voice? We can't hear you well. And are we, can we dim the room a little bit? It's yeah. uh, too bright. No, 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 Yeah, yeah while, please, please go uh, ahead. Mohan is getting in. When you have a patient who's had a previous procedure, how do you say it has failed? Do you base it on manometry, the IRP values? Because that's not very reliable. Uh, do you base it only on your time barium? Or what is the objective evidence that it's a failed procedure? So first of all, the ECARD score, patient is still not happy. He is having high ECARD score, more than three. So patient wants some relief. So we get objective evidence in the form of manometry. The IRP is not improving. Uh, we have another way like time barium swallow, still the stasis is there. Though we saw there is a patchless opening, but it doesn't mean that emptying is still happening. So, uh, there is definitely uh, emptying which is not happening here in the form of high Eckhart score and objective evidence on IRP and barium and moreover endoflip you use in such yeah, a Yeah, so I am glad you mentioned that because… Uh, uh, Moeen, uh, while you are in the tunnel, uh, can we just go over to Prasad's room and Prasad is just starting an ESD over there. Yeah, he will answer so, the endoflip yeah, question and end then we will Yeah, yeah just, just, uh, just a second. So the, uh, because that point is important, uh, Amol, yeah, yeah, yeah. is uh, in patients with residual or recurrent symptoms after any myotomy, surgical or endoscopic, I think uh, impedance plan planometry or, or endoflip plays a major role. The value of manometry becomes less. So you need to get, you need to get used to getting multiple tests, like a time barium esophagram, or endoflip. We use endoflip in our uh, in our uh, system. So uh, I don't know if you have it in India yet or not, but uh, but I think if you want to uh, work in a complex achalasia practice, you're going to need that. Okay. Okay. So Anand, can on we that note, we, yes, sir, we start with the case history. Thank you. For the next case, we have a 55-year-old gentleman who presented to us on one one month back with an episode of hematemesis. On endoscopy, he was found to have two pedunculated polyps side by side just below the G junction along with other multiple small sessile hyperplastic polyps. He tested positive for H. pylori infection and was treated for the same. So Dr. Prasad Iyer will now demonstrate technique of EFD in a G junction hyperplastic polyp. Over to you, sir. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. So this gentleman, you can see I'm sitting right at the G junction here and has these two large 
hyperplastic polyps which are arising from the proximal stomach. This is the anti-grade view and he has several smaller polyps as well and as you can see these polyps are obviously bleeding. There are others in the stomach and on retroflex view, this is a view of the polyp. Again, they are somewhat pedunculated and obviously are related to his symptoms. And what we have done is that we are, we have marked the attachment of the polyps to the stomach with cautery and our goal will be to first try and incise, lift the mucosa distally on the anal side, make our incision and as you can see I have marked with the dual knife and these are our cautery marks and after we make our, our anal incision we will bring this forward into the anti-grade view and extend the incision on an anti-grade manner and then dissect down and hopefully the polyps will fall into the stomach. So can that's sort of our strategy. Right. We have Dr. Matthew Philip along yeah, with Dr. Yeah. Can you Can you just uh, put a narrowband imaging and show the people why, why you say it is a Absolutely. hyperplastic polyp? Yeah. So… And moreover, this is a hyperplastic polyp by look-wise and… and this one, right? Uh, you can, you can actually look at all the uh, different types of uh, image enhancing and endoscopy. Someone from Olympus. Uh, can you maybe change? We want NBI, I think. Yeah. And here the indication is because the patient has bleeding, so Correct. otherwise hyperplastic polyps are generally not benign. symptomatic, benign. But here this is actually a huge one, and bleeding is a real indication for removal of this. And uh, uh, he's he is going to do ESD. Why you are not using other techniques like underwater EMR and why do you prefer to do an ESD for this patient? Yeah, so again I think the, the advantage of ESD in this instance would be to control the margins yeah. and make sure that we are actually getting the entire base as opposed to um, an underwater EMR where you could float this and then uh, it should be easy enough to get a snare to the base. But here we have put our cautery marks in such a way that we are on the normal tissue and hopefully when we incise the chances of in, uh, recurrence will be lower. Right. Uh, no, Prasad, why not put in a uh, endo loop and because it is a bit thick robust stock and then do a polypectomy, wouldn't that be easier? That's also possible, but you can just tell that. Yeah, and yeah, but really again, I think this is uh, Dr. Arora, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think, um, you know, um, an endo loop or a slow coag cut uh, would be just fine in this. Um, the, the only disadvantage of that is no control of the margins. You would really have to come very close to the wall to make sure and I think this way you can control your margins, make sure where your incision is but I completely agree with you that's a and fairly acceptable alternate strategy. And in and a hyperplastic polyp, are the margins that important? Uh, no, one more thing is there Aurora, this is actually a huge one. So we are not sure that we will be able to engage with this a loop unless it is a wider, wider one. And there are two polyps attached together, no? so it's maybe difficult to engage both the polyps into the same endo loop, and it is very uh, closely attached, you know. So that may be one reason. And uh, of course, we agree that there is not margin is not na that necessary in hyperplastic polyps. We can just leave alone a little bit of that. And one more thing, um, uh, Dr. Prasad, the, the, the biggest challenge here would be bleeding. Yes. What is in your mind that you are going to? How you are going to control the bleeding? And is any strategy you are planning like that? Yeah, so I think that's the other theoretical advantage with ESD in the sense that you can dissect, expose the vessels and prophylactically coagulate them as you move along. As opposed to applying an endo loop or applying a clip and then cutting above that. What will um, I think both of those are, are, are reasonable strategies but I feel with ESD we can prophylactically coagulate the vessels as we encounter them and keep moving forward. We are also going to add a little bit of epinephrine to our um, injection mixture to hopefully lead to some vasoconstriction and help us identify the vessels better. What, re what recurrence rate do you expect if you don't uh, cut the margins, you, if, do, if you spare the margins? Yeah, so that's a great question. I, off the top of my head, I don't know the exact recurrence rates, but I remember reading about papers where particularly with larger hyperplastic polyps, 
the rate of recurrence with simple excision is fairly substantial. The other thing also is that in larger polyps, sometimes when you take off the whole polyp, there might be a focus of dysplasia as well. And Dr. Prasad, what do you think is the cause of the bleeding? Is it a massive input from the arterial vessel or a surface ulceration because of the stripping of the supply? I think it looks more like uh, ulceration that the surface which are oozing rather both, than the major Both, both could be responsible. I, I think both are equally responsible, particularly if he's having hematemesis. I suspect there is multi, um, yeah. and multi-factorial. And quite, quite friable also, you can see that. Um, you can see that uh, even just by touching suction, everything starts bleeding it. Uh, NBI actually, because of the presence of blood, we could not make, make any wonderful pictures there, because yeah. no, that may be reason. When, the, when there is blood there, no, we may not be able to see it properly, and there is a lot of uh, uh, intramucosal hemorrhages as well in that. I think we can go ahead and uh, start. And Dr. Phillips, yeah. does an RDI mode, does it give you some information about what is happening at the base of the polyp? Yes, if probably, it is yes. If we have time, we can actually go for that. Yeah. That can give you some clue. Yeah, to yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. Image enhancing will definitely tell us whether it's a hyperplastic or not. And also, you can actually study the margins better where you have to put the incisions. Yeah. But you know, this polyp has another problem because of the large size, it will be hanging all the times, it is pushing towards uh, uh, distally, so there will be a lot of inflammation as well. So that could be a challenge when you actually uh, try to demonstrate uh, through image enhancing endoscopy. NBI, when there is inflammation now, it's not a good modality, but of course that will tell us where to cut. Large polyps, it is known that even in our practice, I have seen that and if you cut yeah, large yeah. polyps, uh, uh, there is a okay. possibility of recurrence Correct. and bleeding. You know, that is a possibility One, there. So it's better two, that you do a wide excision of three, this. That will be good. This is not in the concern of stop. malignancy, but because of recurrence Needle and back. bleed. There is no malignancy risk in this one. The As such. Okay. So, so you have I'm seen, you have seen uh, yeah. ni nicely, nicely injected, nicely there elevated. One, Actually, two, at one place, uh, three, the stalk of one of the four, polyps in the group of polyps five, is very stop, prominent and tempting. Is it worthwhile doing a combination of uh, either endoloop or, uh, okay, you know, I snaring the and then doing the piece. resection for a better visibility of the base? There is also another op option that you uh, remove it endoloop wise and you cut it and then do. Uh, uh, this, uh, I mean, ESD at some point, some later time. No, at the same time, it may be difficult. Prasad, uh, yes. Mohir is just finishing his tunnel and okay. he wants to start the myotomy. Yes. So right, sir. Probably so. once you make an incision over here. We'll just move over to the other side and come back on the audio. Back over here and we'll keep tandem. Yeah. We're continuing to go watch you. A little bit. Thank you. Dr. Mohin and Dr. Mohin. All righty. So, uh, so Mohin, what is the end point of uh, tunneling while you are planning to do POEMF? Same thing, Same about thing. about three centimeters into the stomach. Uh, importantly, you really need to make sure you're staying anterior. And, and how do you see deviate. three centimeter in the stomach? Because there is a lot of ambiguity in that. Yeah. So, so what is the your way of calculating mm -hmm. myotomy in the yeah. stomach? So for me, a few things is uh, once we see, we see some change in vascularity of the stomach, the spindle vessels yeah, yeah. that we see here. Yeah. So that's one. Two. The measurement on the scope, which is rough, 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 but this is just an estimation. Most importantly is while you're tunneling, you're going to see some narrowing in the tunnel and then widening of the tunnel. So for me, that's most important. Sometimes when you're going, when you're actually, uh, so this is uh, actually good here. Let's, uh, let's, let's, no, no. Uh, so here, this is on the... Actually, this is mild bleeding. Uh, yeah, muscle so, so muscle side. I'm just gonna spray it a little bit. Okay. If uh, if it's heavier, then we could have the gun. The and sometimes this is related to a relatively high pressure, and but this patient's pressure is good. So and then importantly, when we're tunneling, we are gonna go through a tight segment. Yeah. Sometimes it's not. You know, you can miss it. So what you wanna do? You come back to the esophagus to the tunnel on the esophageal side and go back in and you're gonna hit the sphincter and then you look at measurement like you know you'll see it at the same at the same level where you measured your initial sphincter. And then anything beyond that is the gastric tunnel. Here the LES wasn't that tight so this measurement is uh, is not accurate. 
but uh, but but I think here we have a little bit uh, a little bit of a short tunnel on the stomach side. I would say two centimeter. And uh, Amol, is two centimeters okay for you, or yeah, huh? Two centimeters is enough. Is enough? Okay. Yeah. It's vital. She's a small girl. Yeah. So, yeah. We don't want to go too much on the gastric side. And sometimes what? Do, so sometimes what we also do is we do only two or one and a half, one point five to two. And then if the angle to enter into the peritoneum is very acute, then I may extend a few millimeters of the myotomy to just straighten the... Exactly. So, the, uh, so this is important. The length of the tunnel, initial tunnel, does not have to, to dictate everything. Because once you cross that sphincter, the tight area, you get into the gastric side, you look at it, oh, that's short. Lengthen the tunnel. Yes. Or, oh, that's too long. Don't do the myotomy until the end of the tunnel. Yes. So keep it dynamic. So let's uh, talk about how to start the myotomy here. So this is, uh, so this is again, what I'm using here a spray coax. So we want to do, uh, let's see if we can do a selective myotomy. So we'll do one, two, three, four, five, and grab. And so here we're already, so down a little bit here, by all, all the spray here. And then we'll take that angle and take that. So the using the spray is strong, as has already been mentioned. So here we try to get, the, we continue this angle. Right. And, Moin and will cut. just uh, go back to Prasad, because I think he's just started until you complete the myotomy. And uh, they're, they're watching you. And so, we'll come back to you, sir. And we'll come back. Thank and you. I think Noria is also ready in room. Nearly, room sir. Fine. Nearly. They've asked us to wait. Yeah. Right. We have with Dr. Prasad and Dr. Matthew. Audio on, right? Yeah. Are we so back we have, on? Yeah, all, go ahead, all, Matthew. Already we have uh, made some incision that you have seen that he has marked there and he is trying to connect uh, through that area of markings and they are injecting. And here for dissection, uh, the, making the incision, he is actually using a IT Nano. You can see that which has I got know. a ceramic tap, a tip which prevents uh, uh, damage in the distal area. You can see he is actually using is not touching the accessory, is actually uh, using the scope torquing and making it up and down. That is how he is trying to make a circumferential incision. Here actually you can see the, uh, you are doing on the caudal side, no? Yes. On the what is the length of this knife? Is it 1.5? 1. 1. So what? this is an IT Nano. Okay. So this is the shorter one. And again, we have some vessels. You again, can, this goes to... We will control some of this as we move along. You can see the large vessels actually leading to the uh, polyp there. It's a big challenge there when we cut. Matthew, still you think it, I think it's loop would have been better because that will circumferentially take care of all the vessels because it is triangulating. Yes, yes, I agree. It all depends upon individual preferences as, as well. But you know, of course, it's a, it's a good technique. And you do an end loop and later you decide if there is any left over, you can go for ESD. That's also okay, but it produces more scarring at that time. But you can definitely remove the polyp with endo loop and cutting. There is no doubt regarding that. Or you can even do a uh, EMR technique like that. But no, this may maybe this, in this one you can actually control the bleeding better rather than directly going for EMR. Uh, of course, I agree that what you told is that putting a endo loop and then resect it. That is actually a good technique. Yeah, the justification for that was that it is a robust, biggish stock and then you circumferentially strangulate it so that yeah. you have a better hemostasis rather than individually looking for the vessel. Even, even underwater EMR is not a bad technique in this area because you, know, you can actually do a good job with, even with underwater EMR. Dr. Matthew, we also have the next room ready. We will okay. just present the case and okay. come back to you on yeah, that. Yeah, we'll keep fine. watching. That's fine. Thank, That's you. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. A 73 year old gentleman presented with complaints of chronic constipation. On examination, he was found to be anemic and his stool occult blood was positive. Colonoscopy showed multiple colonic polyps, out of which two large polyps are seen in the cecum and ascending colon. Other polyps are found to be diminutive. The plan is ESG of the right-sided colonic polyps and the learning objective was demonstration of ESG of right colonic polyps. Over to Professor Noria. Uh, hello. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, here with EOG. And then uh, now you are seeing the, this region. 
。あ、はあ、マイシー。こっちの方があれかな。ESD がいるのかな。なんでもアンダーウォーターでも。So this is a region in a sea cam. So it has some little bit of extension in the region. Yeah, in the on the base. Like、this. So you can appreciate the surface structure. And then there is a white opaque substance here. But basically,、uh, distribution and arrangement is regular. So I think this part is adenoma. And then in one part,、uh, it is enlarged like this. And、uh, we, there is、uh, some mucus on the surface. So We cannot see、uh, the actual、uh, yeah, pit button of this area. So maybe v i r u s type、mm. component、yes. yeah, is suspected. Does it look genet type 2C?、Uh, here, genet type、uh, 2A. And here is also 2A, but、uh, here we yeah. cannot see the. Big, the yeah, the a b s o l u t e l y Maybe two w e e k how can I say? We cannot evaluate the vessel,、mm. so vessel or structure, so we don't make diagnosis here. But、uh, at least this area it looks like a 2A. So、mm, that is a one region. But anyway, it doesn't、uh, see, show、uh, some mucosal invasive appearance. I think this is an indication of endoscopic treatment. And、uh, another region is here. Yeah, this is another region. And、uh, that is also subpedunculated type, like this. So, we discuss with Yoji,、uh, yeah, like this. And then、uh, I also evaluate the surface structure and the pit pattern and the vessel architecture of this region with NBI. So, so this region as well, but compared to previous region, Here, a bit irregular, mainly to Janet 2A, but、uh, somehow a little bit irregular, but、uh, still maybe 2A. A. Intramucosal region. Intramucosal region. The surface pattern is somewhat complicated、mm. compared to the previous one. Professor、But. Wido? Yes.、Uh, say you have mentioned about white opaque substance、yes. in colon adenoma. Yes. We have heard it only in gastric adenomas. Uh, but uh, uh, sometimes、uh, oh. chronic adenoma also h a v e a、uh, white opaque substance.、Oh, chronic、nice. adenoma or、uh, SSL as well. So maybe you can see the whitish you know, line. Can, can you just show us again? For example, this part, you can see whitish line. For example, under,、uh, underwater, you can appreciate whitish material in the epithelium. So, this is also white opaque substance. I think this is already published, this data.、Uh, irregularity of distribution and the、uh, shape of WOS is associated with the、uh, carcinoma task component. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. And this part, and this region. So, we discuss.、Hmm? Hmm? So, this is the s e c a l region. No,、so、no,、uh, this is、uh, ascending region. No, no,、uh, please put back a little bit. <laughs> bit complicated. <laughs> <laughs> you observe the same region, I think. Ah, okay. On the other,、uh, on the other side. On the other side.、And、here as well. Small, small region. region. Here is a、uh, yes. idiosyncal bow. Here.、Ah, this is this. region <laughs> in the ascending, ascending column. column.、Mm. Yes. 
So we discuss with Amo and、uh, Yoji. Probably both regions, in practically, we can remove by EMR. But, uh, but uh, yeah, this region has a bit wide stock, wide yeah. base. Wide base, yes. Yeah. And、uh, uh, Seeker region is very difficult to access. So even though it has、uh, some、uh, extension, To the base, but、uh, we try to remove this with underwater MR. Yes, yes, yes. And then ascending region also be removed by underwater resection EMR, but、uh, it could be a piecemeal and,、um, and to demonstrate some technique,、uh, we remove it. This is using ESD technique. So that is our plan. Right, Professor Noria, we'll get back to you in a minute. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.、Uh, Dr. Prasad and、uh, Dr. Matthew? Yeah, yeah. Yes, so we have made, we have made the、uh, incision on the anal side, and now we are going to extend this to the,、um, on the anti grade or the oral side. So,、uh, injection, please, first. And I'll just show you an example. Just show you the incision. So you can see we have made an incision, we have dissected a little bit. Lot of vessels as we were expecting. We have cauterized some of the vessels, and now we are going to extend the incision on the anti grade side from the oral aspect. Yeah, two thirds,、uh, you have already done, Dr. Ayer. Two thirds of the circumstance has already been covered. Okay.、No? Injection, please. Once we make the、uh, oral side, then we go to the sites and then we can complete it. Now we should move from the oral side. Yeah. No, no, oral. Because the weight of the lesion、uh, will, we'll we'll、like、just、there. drag it. Yeah. Needle out, please. So,、uh, with permission from the chairperson,、okay, I、inject. would like to make one comment and also a、yeah. question for、uh, Dr. Prasad Iyer. Two.、Uh, Stop. So, needle back.、Uh, not all hyperplastic polyps are benign. The published reports that have plastic polyps more than one centimeter, needle out.、Uh, up to two to eight percent can、okay. harbor foci、okay. of dysplasia. These are proven reports.、Uh, Stop. My question to Dr. Prasad Iyer is,、uh, like,、uh, you know, you have other polyps as well, other than the one where you are doing ESD. So, needle out. How confidently you can say、Go、this、there. is only a hyperplastic polyp, or how can you differentiate between、Stop. a hyperplastic polyp and、Take、a、that. Adenoma in the stomach. Dr. Phillips. Sir, ah, see, uh, the the question is that、uh, I understand is that how sure you are, how、uh, definite you are that this is only a hyperplastic polyp and there is no adenomatous component in this one. I think that is the reason why, why we, are we are doing ESD. So this is the largest one, and the、Night、image、out. enhancing features were suggestive of. Uh, hyperplastic polyps, and even the other polyps in the stomach, which we when we looked at that, they are all looking like hyperplastic polyps. But unless we get a histology 100 percent, we cannot say there are any foci of the, the larger ones. So once you submit the ESD specimen, we will be able to know that. We agree. I agree that it is not always large hyperplastic polyps can have foci of hyper,、uh, dysplasia. There is no doubt regarding that. But it is not. Uh, Uh, very common, or it's not that huge numbers, but it is. It is there. It is reported. What do you want to say, sir? Dr. Suraj, no, another important issue、right. is yeah, the size of the matter. Yeah. So, like,、uh, are there any image enhanced endoscopy,、uh, you know, features that reliably distinguishes between a hyperplastic polyp and a gastric adenoma, other than、uh, the resection? Uh, we are not able to hear you well.、Uh, so, so, yeah. so, so, are there any image enhanced endoscopy,、uh, you know, findings that can reliably differentiate between a hyperplastic polyp and、yes. a gastric adenoma? Nine yes,、half. of course. You know, when when we when we look at the narrowband imaging with、uh, a near focus,、uh, probably we can say, depending upon the. Uh, morphology of、uh, what you see on the pattern, we can say whether it is hyperplastic or、uh, adenomatous polyp. But you know, the problem is when、uh, see a polyp like of this size, which is actually bleeding, then the morphology and the characteristics of will become difficult to comment on that. Otherwise, usually you are able to tell whether it is hyperplastic polyp or not. 
and uh, depending upon uh, now we have got endocytoscopy also we can actually look at that and use use it and tell but generally uh, just uh, imaging enhancing endoscopy using a nba is sufficient to make a differentiation between these two mostly but this polyp is, is difficult because of the bleed because of the inflammatory changes seen and that is the reason and it's a, such a huge one you cannot analyze all the areas so uh, to be more precise could you uh, see any white opaque substance in this uh, polyp or other in, polyps in that this you one we could not see that because of this size probably yes one comment anybody want to make, you want to make a comment on this yes no I not think, really i think it's going to be a little tough in this instance this is i think I, in gastric adenoma uh, if you find white opaque substance that is more in favor of gastric adenoma yes and to distinguish between hyperplastic polyp and if you find a demarcation line that again favors gastric adenoma i think then hyperplastic polyp these no, two features demar demarcation line becomes important when you see a flat yes. lesion or when you see a sessile uh, uh, lesion no or a flat lesion here it is actually a hanging one it's a polypodal one you can see the lesion very well and we are actually looking at the margins we are looking at the surrounding areas where which all areas to be included here there is no doubt that there we have got a pedunculated polyp with a white base and since two polyps are together and uh, because of the bleeding and a large size he want to do an est rather than a uh, limited Knife procedure out. like process like endo loop and all prasad you want to make any comment on that no i think we've talked about this before um, at this point the working diagnosis is that of an inflammatory hyperplastic polyp histology will decide whether there are foci of adenomatous change or dysplasia in my mind it's going to be very hard for us to really tell his on endoscopic imaging with this large size and bleeding if there is adenomatous change difficult maybe in the other polyps we can look carefully maybe that we can tell us whether there is any evidence of adenomatous polyp so now now we can see that actually he is cutting all around the upper uh, the proximal margin and trying to go to the side prasad sir dr sudhir here from the hall so this polyp is large when with bleeding surface and lot of uh, ulcerations and uh, you know uh, mucins also so the specificity of uh, image enhancement and endoscopy will decrease or not absolutely yes yes when there is information that's what we are trying to yes. absolutely right dr prasad will keep watching you sir we'll get back to you on the audio person audio we back with you okay uh, now uh, what i explain what i say and uh, what we plan so uh, the region now gravity is toward the uh, cecal side so i think uh, we are discussing that it's better to cut the gravity side first this way this side because uh, if we cut the uh, uh, anal side it means a uh, uh, proximal side to the endoscopy image uh, everything is flap up and then falling down to the uh, cecal side so incision or procedure it this side it become very difficult so i injected the uh, solution into the cecal side and then now starting the mucosal incision to this side and after completion of the trimming mucosal incision and trimming maybe we can start a uh, mucosal incision and some mucosal dissection uh, from the uh, uh, proximal side so i think there is some small base cell so if you see the base cell you can use coagulation otherwise maybe it's better to use endocut Uh, dr nuria which knife are you using ah, a smaller now, one one now i'm using a, a dual knife j okay what is the length of the knife a uh, 1.5 okay 1.5 mm okay. for colon and his uh, his setting is a uh, endocut i 133 and post post coagulation 4.5 in L, uh, bio 3 Mm. but a bit okay ah, 1.5 but a uh, c 
physical side is a bit difficult to approach, so I'm trying to uh, manage this part as much as possible. But currently, you can see the uh, very clean uh, some mucosa. So as I mentioned yesterday, it's better to cut the middle of this part and then to add a, like an apex of the mucosa incision line. So we can extend the cutting line. But uh, at this location, it looks, it becomes like this. Is it not anti-gravity because once you cut the submucosa, the mm -hmm. polyp is going to fall on to the tunnel? Yeah, but uh, uh, it's better to start from gravity side first yeah. because uh, uh, once everything is flap down, falling down to this gravity side, very difficult to manage this gravity side. So I always start from more difficult side and then proceed to other and then start from the easier side. So that is uh, our strategy. So now I try to cut shallow, not to damage the some mucosal vessel. Now you can see the vessel here. So at the vessel, you change the mode to coagulation to avoid the bleeding and then extend the some mu uh, mucosal incision to this part. Given so, the choice, should not a cut be a better option because if there is a bleed you can control, if there is cut you will are more likely to have injury which can perforate later on because of the coagulation. I cannot understand that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, uh, once uh, you cause uh, bleeding during the procedure using uh, only endocard, you know, some mucosal, uh, some mucosal tissue becomes bloody and it uh, worsens the electrical conduction and make many char. So the uh, procedure becomes very yeah, unclean. So I think better to cut as sharp as possible. Non a uh, non vessel area and then if you have a you, if you see the vessel uh, only that part that area uh, you can use coagulation hello amul i think we can have mismatch here from audio and visual side area. Uh, we are getting uh, audio from one room and uh, video from the other room. Can Thank we you. please check on that? No, no, no. What is that, madam? So, one second, Dr. Noria. I guess you are watching both the images. Yes. Ma no, one minute, sir. Madam? Sheetal, madam? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yes. Please watch the screen. There are yeah. two, two yeah, lines yeah. running. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So now I ask the assistant to inject the solution through the device. So not necessary to change the device to inject the solution. Now, now the scope is retrograde, uh, retro viewing. Yeah, almost retroflex Re -retroflex viewing. Retroflex viewing, I see. And then I want to connect this line to previous incision line. A bit complicated. So region is protruding and it is a bit difficult to approach to the inner side, our other side. Mm. Professor Norio? Yes. Probably we'll just leave you for a few minutes. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Thank I you on the audio. We're now moving back to Dr. Prasad and Dr. Matthew. Yeah. <clears throat> we are actually had some problems with bleeding and we are just trying to. Uh, control control the bleeding, yeah. This is actually, we were discussing initially itself, bleeding will be a big challenge in this patient and we are actually fa started facing that. Now it is much better. Now we will continue with our uh, dissection but yeah. there is some Injection, area of bleeding please. there. Inject and dissect. Yeah. 
actually give me when you see a, a reasonable bleeding i think you know, always try to stop it and proceed otherwise the whole procedure will become very messy exactly so it's better that you control bleeding but so what we are doing is right now we are controlling the bleeding as it's happening doing some prophylactic coagulation some as we are dissecting and um, something that we had expected need love Okay, go there. Right. Uh, Dr. Prasad, we'll get nice. back to you. Uh, Dr. Amol and Dr. Moin, you're on. Okay, so Moin completed the myotomy. She's a small girl and so we had a little bit of uh, uh, CO2 retention in her. So we had to be, take a break for about 10 minutes and she developed a little bit of surgical emphysema. So we just uh, ventilated her and with the help of the anesthesia team, it's, uh, you know, now her CO2 is now all fine. And so we, now we've got the scope inside and we also took the opportunity to switch places. So now Moin is with the slim scope and the big screen that you're seeing over here is the slim scope visual view. And you can see the trans elimination of my scope, which is inside the tunnel and you can see the PIP view over there. And uh, my scope is inside the tunnel and you can see that, uh, that light is seen uh, on Moin's scope over here. We can even switch off Moin's light for a moment over here to see it even better. You can see that. So we know that we've crossed the G junction and this is one of the techniques to ensure that you've done a complete myotomy. So, okay, now let's toggle and let's go back to the, give me my view and Moin can be smaller, yeah. And now we'll open up the peritoneum so for this, I usually, I, I would prefer to use a coag rasper and with a force coag, I would gradually go and, or a precise sec, one of the two. Pre this is precise sec. Yes. Uh, Dr. Amol, the primary p problem of patient was a raised Eckhart score and yes. uh, raised IRB in spite of posterior myotomy. So what is the indication of doing FOM? She's a young girl. She's got a myotomy on both sides, so her esophagus is likely to be quite dysmotile in future. So, you know, she's at a relatively high risk, I would say, to develop reflux. Open. Age. Age is. She's 20 years old. Yeah. Open, open, open. Close. Soft. This patient is very thin, so yeah. perfect patient for this I technique because there's not going to be any. Any fat here. So what okay. are you holding on to? What are you cutting? So this is this is the myotomy, edge of the myotomy, and this is the areolar tissue. The sub zeros are areolar tissue, close. So I'm just dissecting in this area. And we will enter the sub serosal plane and then open the serosa. Open. Any hint which side do you want to go? It is on the left side, center, right. Close. close. We open in the center and then go leftwards. That is left. usually the okay. pattern. Towards the fundus. Yeah, towards the fundus. But once we get into the peritoneum, then we go more leftward. Mm -hmm. But even here, we would usually go a little bit in this direction because if you go straight ahead, you get the ligamentum teres and there's a lot of fat in that. So you go a little bit to the left of that. This is the area which will have a lot of vessels at the G junction, especially on the lesser curve. How do you prevent the injury to them? This is a blind, you're just yes. blindly catching hold of the fold. No, no, no. This is, this is a classical surgical dissection technique, actually. We're using coag, we are, and that's the reason I'm using this as a dissector. Okay. The coag rasper as a dissector. So I'm just dissecting the fibers and gradually going. So when, you know, the patient is a little bit obese or heavy, there is a tendency to be, for there to be a lot of fat over here. I have with me Mohin as well as Mohan, both of them who have experience in POMF as well. So, so few. Guys, you have some comments about this? So few points. Uh, I like to use the large coag grasper, the right. 6.5, and I use forced coag. Here you use precise sec, but the point is you don't want to use endocut Q. Yeah. If you see big vessels, you want to coagulate with soft coag yeah. and then dissect with uh, precise sec or uh, forced coag. Uh, also, as you guys mentioned, this fat can harbor large vessels. So what you, what you can do, if you inject a little bit of fluid, yeah. 
it floats the fat, it floats and, and you can see the vessels that, uh, that are hidden there, especially in relatively obese patients. Yeah. So we don't, we don't do this on patients with a BMI above 30, and the study yeah. we're starting, yeah. that's an exclusion, that's an exclusion criteria. criteria. Yeah. So we're starting a study, all three of us here, along with some colleagues in uh, Hong Kong, of POEM versus POEM F, and we're looking at uh, mainly reflux outcomes. And that's the left lobe of the liver. You yeah, can see can in the see. background over there already. Open. Yeah, the reason why I asked about this bleeding uh, apprehension was because if you cut the two ends, one of them may pop out into the peritoneal yeah, cavity. Yeah, yeah. It may be so difficult you have to, to be catch very hold very careful off. about bleeding in this area because they, they, this, this bleeding will be intraperitoneal yeah. or even subserosal. Yeah. Just last week we had a patient where we, you know, there was a little bit of bleeding. Of course, we managed to control it. Open, yeah. But uh, by the time we controlled it, the patient already developed a subserosal hematoma, which stained the, you know, this thing quite a bit. Yeah. Then, so uh, the and some vessels can be re really large, they, they and these are large. very short. Like this is very uh, short. This is short distance short, from the left distance. from the cilia. Yeah, cilia. So the flow is high. But what we've learned is that you can actually use these graspers and use soft coag yes. to treat vessels that are usually so you think you're uncomfortable with. So I'm just switching to soft coag and coagulating this and then. Nozzle, yeah. So that's how we keep going. And that's the peritoneum now. That's the final layer of peritoneum, so close. And now I'm going to get into the peritoneum. Open. Dr. Amul, we'll keep yeah. watching you. We'll get back to you on the audio, sir. Uh, Anand, we're just getting into the peritone. Oh, we'll stay with you, sir. Okay. So, I will, I will just use the IT knife to get in. Now, we've created this hole in the peritoneum. Now, I insufflate a little bit to create, hypo, you know, a gap in the peritoneum. And we keep the abdomen open because we're going to put in a needle at some point, not immediately. This is the anterior wall of the stomach you are saying, moving? Yes. No, th no, this, this is, is the liver. The liver. liver. Left lobe of the liver. There is a little bit of a scald on the left lobe, but that's okay. So the, this entry into the peritoneum has to be big enough. Yes, it has to be big enough and yeah. I'm going to extend that using an IT2 knife open. So that helps me to prevent injury to the left lobe. And I use coax still. Although I am using the IT2, I don't want to use endocart over here because sometimes there can be bleed vessels at these edges. We are creating this wide opening here. Okay. So now you can go there, Anand. Where you, people will keep watching us in the background. And uh, we will come back with questions and discussions. Thank you, sir. Professor Noria, we are back with you. Yes, yes. Ah, uh, welcome back. So now uh, I completed the uh, cecal side mucosal incision and then a bit of trimming like this. So I think this side almost uh, removed. So now I changed to uh, anti-gravity side, which is proximal side to the mucosa. And then if we uh, as you can see, uh, if we cut the uh, anti-gravity side, specimen is spontaneously flapping up. So I continue the mucosal incision in this part. So somewhat little bit hooking the mucosa, and the tip is on surface of the mucosa. And then I ask assistant to inject a little bit. Yes, inject. So we can achieve enough some mucosa cushion. Yes, thank you. And then try to uh, extend <coughs> the mucosa incision. Do you need to part. change the position of the patient? Uh, but fortunately, uh, it, it is not necessary okay. so far. So far. Right. Now, Dr. Noria, I just need to leave you urgently. I'll just get back to you. I'll just go to Dr. Amul for a minute. Dr. Amul, you're on. OK. So we have simulated a wrap. I, I turned left, you saw that, we saw the spleen, we saw the uh, serosal fat, and then we grabbed the fundus, 
on top of the fat and then we brought the fundus. You can see in the PIP that I'm holding on using a grasping forceps. Yeah, over here. And you can see in the PIP in Moin's view, we can, we, we're getting a good wrap over here. So as soon as he insufflates a little bit more, you'll probably see even a nicer wrap over there. We don't keep too much of insufflation because we don't want a gas-related issue again in this patient. But there you can see that the, the wrap is nicely formed over there. You probably haven't pulled all the way though. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You're gonna pull. I'm going to pull it even yeah. further yeah. when we are applying the clip. So okay. that's how it's going to be finally. So it's going to be pretty tight and then that should be okay. Good thing so is that wrap is made around the scope. So we are yes, not worried about the tightness. We are not the worried tightness. about the tightness of the wrap. So that scope yeah. gives us a good okay. you know, measurement of. Yeah. Yeah. So what we are going to do is we are going to mark this site and then pull out my scope. We are going to grab a detachable endo loop and then go, go in again. And you guys can keep watching us. We will go to the next room and then when we are ready to fire the first clip, we will come back to you. Okay, Moin, can you deflate the... Thank you, Dr. Amul. Dr. Prasad, we are back with you. Two big, one yeah. three small. Do you want to go ahead? We are, we are actually continuing uh, with the insertion. We are just making a circle out of that. Uh, but the biggest challenge is bleeding. Still, we are actually, we had to stop in between and control the bleeding. Uh, now, we are actually tackling the side, side uh, insertion. See that. So we are working on the left margin and trying to in extend the incision on this side. Needle out. Take that. Go there. Yeah. Stop. Needle back. Knife, please. And we are being proactive in two ways. A lot of blood vessels are coming across. We've been using um, the coag mode to dissect. We have also been using the um, coag grasper as well. So a number of th approaches we've been using, but it's been challenging. Once we complete the uh, proximal side of incision and uh, partly to the side, uh, on either sides, you know, because of the weight of the polyp, you know, then the dissection will become easier for us. We have already completed the uh, uh, caudal Inferior side of the incision. incision. Yeah. So we are just really hoping for that. Once we complete the incision, then we start dissecting from okay, proximal end. Right, we'll keep watching you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Professor Noria, we're with you. Uh, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> yes. Now, uh, I want to explain how to make a dissection so, or a trimming. So as I uh, explained yesterday, so there is a, uh, this is a white widus, both mucosa, and then we usually dissect the, in the middle. And then maybe you can see this type of triangle shape. And then start from about a half of the base and then go to a, follow the central line and to the apex of the triangle shape. And uh, sometimes a uh, doctor really want to move the device so much, but uh, this is electrical surgical knife, so we can cut the tissue just uh, touch to the tip of the knife. So not necessary to move too much, just cut the tissue around the, around the knife gradually, and then keep the small incision to make it in a continuous line. And there is a best cell, so we use coagulation. And, but uh, if there is no best cell, may I use endocut to make the incision more sharp. Yes, okay. Now it is coagulation. And then, like this. So, now you can see, ah, yeah, insure, uh, injection, ah, yeah, it's okay. So now 
there's a super shallow, shallow uh, some mucosa is fatty, so it's better to cut, dissect underneath this fatty tissue. Right. Professor Nori, I need to leave you for a minute. Okay. Dr. Prasad, we are back with you. Yes. Yeah, we are doing our same uh, stuff, so really no updates just yet. Trying to finish the incision here. And um, let us know if you have any questions. Uh, right, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Amul, we are back with you. One big. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So, we are using, I have pulled out the scope and we are using this detachable endo loop from White Accord. This is called the closure endo loop. And the advantage of this is the loop is the, the tightening loop over here is much bigger. Because of that, you can actually put a hook inside it and then tighten it later as compared to the conventional <coughs> loop from Olympus where the loop is very narrow and so it's very difficult to re-engage the loop, you know, once you detach it. So we do that and the other thing that we do is we use the micro deck clips. You can show the micro deck clip, yeah. So I use pre preferentially the 11 millimeter clips on the fundus and I use the 8 millimeter clips inside the tunnel. But uh, currently we are a little bit short of the 11, 9, 8 millimeter clips so we'll probably continue with the 11 with, on both sides. But uh, that I have found has to, uh, are the best clips because they have the shortest uh, stem. The stem is very short and because of that uh, there is, uh, you know, it makes uh, the things very easy inside the tunnel also because then the clips are less likely to erode into the mucosa. So here I'm all just yes. the difference here there is no catheter. There is no catheter. So when you go inside the tunnel it's much easier. It's much easier. Because if you have the uh, Olympus endo loop yes. then you have a catheter here that stiffens the scope, stiffens the scope and increases the, increase the diameter. It's actually one of the most difficult steps is to get into the yeah, tunnel. That's a rate limiting step but yeah. with this actually it makes it much easier. So. So I'm going to just put some gel here. I'll, I'll go on top of you. Just a little bit. Okay, so here one has to be careful, so I have the water jet with me and I use the clip, the tip of the clip to manipulate and push the mucosa away and, and I also insufflate, put some water there and then under vision I enter the tunnel. Okay, wait a minute, we're still not in. One of the issues with this loop, Moeen, mm. is you can't pull the scope back. If okay. you pull the scope back, the loop is going to flip over Yes. on the opposite side. So yeah, you have yeah. to push. Yeah. You can pull a little bit but not too much because that will mm. cause a problem. Yeah. So and this is why this wide incision is good here, yes. is important. That's the mark. Okay, hold the scope here. And I want to make sure that I'm not grabbing any of the fat because the fat is actually, is, is likely to, the clip is likely to slip on the fat. So I'm pushing my clip forward to make sure that the loop doesn't disengage. And now open the clip. Okay. Okay, close, don't fire. Wait a minute. No, 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 no not no, yet. No. Okay, open. Okay, close. Better. Now better. Okay. So we would like to be all open. flushed into yeah, the wall. Open, 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 open. Let me see if I can deflate. Maybe you uh, can deflate the stomach a little bit because that might make things easier. So I think we have to tap her belly soon here. Yeah. Uh, Amol, what are you trying to okay. catch? The cirrhosa Close. up to muscle? What, what are you muscle, going muscle. Up to muscle. Always the muscle. Okay, now I think we have a good bite. 
Yeah, I think so. And sometimes, you can fire. sometimes I'm, I'm all, sure. even if this is not great. Yeah, we can reinforce can, it with more clips over yeah, there. Yeah, this okay, is just fire here, this, like fire it. this. Yeah. Okay. Now the trick is, important thing is not to lose the loop because that can make things very tricky. Okay. You can have a needle, I think. Rohan, you can put a needle in. Loop is still in the, the channel? Loop. No, loop is outside the channel. Okay. Now the issue is the loop has gone a little bit on the other Th side. Towards, no, towards the spleen. I, I'm unable to get any vision here. I don't know Because why. I think we have to just, there is, no, everything is compressed now. You probably have to hold it and bring it to yeah. this side. Now, the problem is I'll grab hold of the fat okay. most often. Yes. Yes. Oh my God. Okay, good. Either, either, either. Yeah. So good. Chalo, quick. You can show this, huh? Yeah, don't go all the way in, she's thin. Okay, so did you see this? We have tapped the capnoperitoneum peritoneum here. Okay. The ventilation water is That's good there. That's good there. Yeah. yeah. That's the reason I pulled it back and pushed it by in again because that opens up. The okay. Rotate the clip a little bit. Off spin. Off spin. Yeah. Okay. Open. Okay. Close. Okay. Now we got That's a good bite. Good. Yeah. yeah. Fire. And Amol, if you had eight, you would have used an eight, right? Eight. Yeah, eight. I would have used an eight yeah. here. Because then the stems really make things much easier. Meaning, the stem is not different, but it just needs less space to open. Amol, how long does this uh, stapled clip remain? Does it get shut so down? So it remains there permanently, honestly, I'll tell you. Because this is all going to heal with fibrosis and adhesions and it's all going to form a granuloma and the clips will remain inside the granuloma. So you need to have clips which are MRI compatible as well because, open, because otherwise these patients, if they go for an MRI, you know, they're going to have problems. So the microtech clips are probably the only ones which are confirmed MRI compatible. Okay, close. Fire. Okay. So I think three clips are enough for her. I think we'll come back into the tunnel now and see. Amul, what is the chance of infection since uh, it's a per oral entry into the peritoneum and how does one take care of that? Yeah, Sheetal? Yeah, what is the chance of infection since it's a per oral uh, entry into the peritoneum? Well, you know, hypothetically it can happen, but uh, honestly, you know, we've never had this issue because we are closing the mucosa. So, and uh, we, we sometimes need to go inside, the, you know, insufflate a little bit or irrigate fluid into the peritoneal cavity, but it's never caused any infection in these patients. We, the, our standard protocol for these patients is to uh, put them on uh, uh, augmentin or uh, you know, amoxiclav and uh, a single dose of uh, amikacin when we are doing the, the, 
the fund application when we are putting the loop. So let's okay. open. Haru, haru. I don't want to go on the left side. I want to hold only the right side. Okay. It yeah, probably a, is, is easiest to go closed in the middle of the... Right. Just a small thought. Does the stem of this clips can cause any other organ damage in the, uh, since the spleen is near or any other vessels no, are near? No, but see, it's not coming there. Na? It's, it's not remaining there. It's coming back into the tunnel. Remember that. Because of that, it is, those clips are not remaining near the spleen at all. They are com all coming back in the tunnel and at the uh, proximal end of the stomach. So, that is, uh, that is what the beauty of it is. Okay. Just let me pull this. Oh. So, this is one of the harder steps. Close, close, close. Because we want to wanna get this close. loop to the right side of the Miami wait, now. Wait, wait, wait. What has happened is, close cut. Yeah. What has happened is, this loop is a little bit too stretched. I'm going to push it back again. See how, how, how much outside it is? I'm going to push it back in. And it opens up. It opens up. Yeah. And then hopefully we'll be able to... This is a really nice... Uh, uh, can you nice explain, loop. Amul, what was the issue, how you've been trying to handle it? I didn't get you. Can you explain what was the issue and how have we been yeah. trying to handle both, it? Both the edges of the loop, both yeah. the threads yeah. were stuck to each other. Okay. So I was finding it difficult to, you know, make the, you know, separate them. So what I did was I pulled the loop, scope back and I went out and I pushed the loop a little bit inside with which the loop opened up and now we can do the same thing. We have to hold this side, right? Open. And a bit like it. So Where now you want to clip it to the proximal side of the gastric myarmy. Yes. How do you know where the gastric starts? How do you know it's not esophagus? So I start my clipping at the edge of the myotomy and then I come more proximal. It doesn't matter if you clip it even onto the esophageal, your third clip, the final clip comes a little bit on the G junction. It's just that, you know, it will add to the tension on the endo loop. So, okay. Amul, it's always on the right margin or even left margin you can apply? No, no, no. Ulti virus is true. Off spin, turn first. Rotate the cliff first. I think the issue with the left margin is you don't pull enough. That's yeah. the thing. Rotate, you you want to pull rotate. more so you come on this side. Okay. Okay. Open now, open. Slowly. Yeah. Okay. Amul, do you keep a traction on the proximal end of the loop? Otherwise, it will go back. Close. No, just now there is no traction on the loop. Fine. There is no traction on the loop because I want it to be loose. Otherwise, I don't get that space to work. Once we've applied all the clips, then we will apply traction and then we okay. will tighten the loop. Okay. That is then how you'll put another clip proximally after tightening it. No. The loop is self-staying, so it doesn't need to be, you know, secured in place. We are applying three clips on the tunnel side, which are going to secure the endo loop to the tunnel. We'll see it in a minute. Okay. So rotate, rotate, add weaker, add weaker. Okay, rotate first. No, no, no. No, the other way, other way, other way. Ulta, off spin, off spin, off spin. Okay, open. Sir, half rotation check I get there. Okay, yeah, now open. And here but it's important to get the same side of the loop. You don't want to. Yes. No, the problem is the rotation. Look at on here, okay? Huh? Look at on here, okay? Look at on here, okay? Look, huh? Half rotation, okay? Okay, okay. Close. Okay, fire. There's a second clip. We are almost at the diaphragm, you can see this over here. 
So we'll just apply the third clip here. Very close to the second clip. I don't want to come too much into the esophagus. So one of the tricks is to push this clip upwards. Some issue here. Okay. Let's see. Open. Problem. Eh? Okay. That's good. Okay, that's good. Okay, thodi close kar haru Okay. Okay. Yeah, close. Okay, fire. That's good. Okay, so three clips to distribute the tension equally on both sides. And now we are going to use the end loop for the hook to close the end loop. And Moen will show us the wrap as it is formed. Okay, quick, quick, quick. I don't know, it's a show. So I'm all, I've done uh, end of flip, okay. post my army, and then post wrap. Yeah. And yeah, we did that when I was there. Yeah. yeah. So, I, so I uh, Amol visited me, and we did six in two days. Yeah, in two days. And uh, consistently, we had the DI goes into half. Like yeah. if it's six, goes to three right after the wrap. So there is definitely, we're creating a good tightening. And in my experience, and of 30 patients, you've done now maybe a 75? Uh, I what think are you around on? 85 or 85, 86 yeah. at last count. So the oh. one, it's not all wrap. We really tighten the, yeah. the GE junction. So uh, typically it's like hill two or three after a poem. We go zero or one. OK. Dr. So Moeen, using endoflip, is it possible to know the cause of the abnormal Eckhart, whether it is a weak peristalsis okay. or problem at G junction? Close. Yeah, Close. with the endoflip, uh, so you, there are two types of end of, so here we're looking Close. in retroflex and I want you to see yeah. Moen, that, I, that I, hill grade. I, I want you to uh, deflate a little bit as I'm tightening because I don't want the clip yeah. to slip. Yeah, usually I like it like that until you pro yeah. approximate yeah. to see and then I will then fully we'll deflate. Fully, fully, fully yeah. deflate, that's how it is. Okay. So, uh, and I'll, Slowly close. I will answer your end of flip question in a minute here. While looking at that GE junction, okay. when I see some tightening. Okay. Okay, so now to start tightening and now look at that. And you can see how Rahul is tightening the wrap over here, the loop. It's not a quick tightening. It's a gradual tightening and then he's kind of, you know, releasing, then again extra exerting. So he's kind of pumping in and so that, you know, the tissues really cinch together and close together. So that's how you do it. Because otherwise, the, sometimes the end of loop can break mm -hmm. because of the, you know, on the, the friction with the clips. So that can happen. But I think we've got a pretty decent uh, wrap over here. So once you are tightened, uh, okay, Dale? Okay. So now we will open. Uh, Dr. Amol, 15% yeah. of the patient after laparoscopic fundoplication have too tight a wrap with gas bloat syndrome. Is that a problem with you? Yeah, as Mohan mentioned, just now we were discussing that. We are doing the wrap around the scope. The laparoscopic surgeons very often would do an intraoperative endoscopy to ensure that uh, they are not uh, tight, doing too tight a wrap. Here we are doing it anyway, so that's how the beauty is. Now we'll use an endo, a loop cutter to close the, you, to uh, trim the uh, you know loop and cut it off. And uh, that's the, probably the end of the procedure where, where Moin can. Uh, probably inflate once and show us the final outcome and then it's just closure for us. So you can, you, once you, I'll just cut this and then we'll switch to the bigger view for Moin so that 
you can see the wrap and go to this thing. Wait, 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 wait. Otherwise, you're going to cut the mucosa. Yeah. Okay, close, close. Oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. No, if, I, if I pull it, then it slips. No, sometimes it's, if it's yeah. lifting well, it's good. Okay. So I just want to. Yep, okay, that's, that's good. good. That's that's good. good. Okay. Cut. Okay. So you got that. Okay, so let's okay, just switch to uh, just uh, still wide, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's wide, but then that's because you're over insufflated, so that's that's the reason. So open, uh, 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 kill it. Yeah. Great demonstration, Amul. No, that's trans elimination. Of, that's trans elimination. So we'll go. So you can go to the next room and other room, Anand, and no problem. You can just suction out the stomach and we'll close the this thing. Thank you for that, sir. So we go room by room. Let's go to Dr. Prasad first. Yeah. 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 Yes, Dr. Matthew and Prasad. Yeah, we are actually made some big. good progress there. We can see that we are actually uh, the incision is completed. We started dissecting from above, and also on the right lateral side, on the side, and we have uh, uh, on uh, two sides are completed um, dissecting into that uh, incision is 100% uh, done. Uh, biggest challenge is bleeding. Actually, you can see the huge vessels there because it is in the fundus, large, large lesion, hyperplastic polyps, all this fever bleeding. So, uh, uh, Prasad is doing a wonderful job and he is actually just very meticulously looking at all the blood vessels and he is actually coagulating. That is why it is taking little time. But it's a wonderful job what he is doing. Quite grasp at this. You can see a big vessel there and there is some bleeding, you know, we Close. need to coagulate that. Right. Okay. We'll continue watching you, sir. Professor Noria? Yes. We are back uh, with you on audio. Uh, we continued uh, some mucosal dissection, but uh, in the central part, we encounter some fibrosis. So. I'm a bit struggling to manage. But uh, basically, uh, most of the part I have already uh, dissected. And actually, I also changed the position, patient position. And left side. Yeah, to the left side. And now, this is a remaining fibrotic core. But a uh, bit difficult to. Uh, define the dissection plane. So at this moment, yeah, uh, injection. Muscle area can be the kind of metal okay. uh, for dissection, but uh, now the, we have a fibrosis in the submucosa, so it is a bit difficult to recognize the muscle layer, but we can, uh, we can see the muscle layer and the uh, perpendicular running uh, fibrosis. fibrosis. Yeah. So maybe we determine the starting point at cut perpendicular to the some mucosal fiber. Since the center of the uh, region is very fibrotic, the region is floppy, so it is a bit difficult to stabilize the scope, mm. but the nolia is very. <laughs> Uh, Try uh, my best. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe another solution would be the using a clip traction to identify, uh, not clip traction, uh, using a traction device to identify the central core. But uh, I think uh, here, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, almost very close to the Yeah, and then it's important to identify the edge of the tissue and then cut the, take the edge so that the remaining uh, tissue becomes smaller and smaller. So here and maybe here, but the position is a bit difficult to 
We often see such find such fibrosis in the protruding type lesion, uh, even in the intramucosal lesion. Here. Ah, yeah, that is also possible. Maybe only here. Mm -mm. A little bit challenging. <laughs> oh, getting better. Mm. Now we can see the muscle running at the right side. Yes. So, so try to cut above the muscle. But basically position is a bit difficult, but yeah, here. So this is a, a muscularized propria, so cut along and then try to take the edge Parallel of the submucosa, yes. At this moment, it is easy to go to the superficial layer. Mm -hmm. So then finally we can cut we, we will cut the mucosa, mucosa region. But uh, Noria is trying to cut just above the muscle layer. Mm, maybe only small area. Mm, only small area, but very fibrotic. So the region is very floppy, very unstable. Maybe traction, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Try, yeah, better. Very yes, 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 yes. And also good demonstration how to, okay. yes. <laughs> uh, some ex eh, internal traction method. So, do you have Yes. Which so type of clips, clips. band? Mm. Yes. But almost. Mm, almost finished. <laughs> <laughs> but most difficult part. Mm, mm. This part, yes. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Maybe pocket question method maybe mm, was in better. Better. <laughs> but too late. Mm. But we could not uh, predict mm. the presence of fibrosis like this. But anyway. Almost, yes, yes, yes. Technician always guide me. <laughs> So here, fibrosis. Traction device. Ah, okay. Professor Widow? Professor Widow? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so, uh, 
you are very expert in uh, ESG. So for you, uh, you know that this is uh, submucosal fibrosis. So for us beginners, like how can we differentiate uh, this is uh, a tumor infiltration versus uh, fibrosis? Oh, <laughs> kiri, yeah. Can I have oh, a sorry. knife? Uh, I didn't catch. Yes, he says you are the experts, but yep. for a big man, how can you can differentiate between the fibrosis ah, and the uh, Do you have a knife? Like ah, the, ah. Yes, yes, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, it we is, use oh, truck. Yesterday someone said that it is very difficult to distinguish the fibrosis with uh, tumor invasion or uh, such benign ah, no, no, no. Uh, fibrosis. Traction. But actually, the, if the region, yes, uh, to, the cancer to invaded to some mucosal layer yes. and uh, caused the fibrosis, the fibrosis is more and more Attraction. severe. It's uh, all, it we cannot see the, any tissue running. Right? So um, still we can see the fibers in the submucosal layer here. So probably this is not just a fibrosis. It's not an invasion, I think. Uh, actually, uh, the region is almost attached only this small area is, but uh, I want to show how traction device change. Another thing which may have mentioned by Professor Noria yesterday, that if surface has more involvement, then it is more likely to be fibrosis. If the base has more involvement, it is more likely to be malignancy. That is what he said yesterday. <laughs> このも。さあ、ですね。うん。now we are preparing a SO clip. Okay, open. Yes. You could see the spring. Yeah, just it's next to the clip. The clip. Mm. And then, this is how you can put it in the This Spring is attached to the. Pretty, you know. Okay. Mm. Close. Okay, fire. Okay, mm. thank you. Yes. The and clip you can see the band, no, not band, that, that uh, line, line. Mm. Spring, spring is lying, then we can catch the line and the uh, hook to the opposite side of the mucosa. Then region can be flap up. The problem is that uh, this zero clip is somewhat tricky to use. And then next clip we bite the opposite side. Okay, open. Open. Already closed. I, really? <laughs> yes. Okay. This clip application is the, the movement. The movement of this clip is oh. opposite to the Olympus one, so a bit difficult. To, now we can use Olympus clip as well. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Even any clip can be it's used. Okay. Yes, yes. 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 Mm. ちょっとこう手前に止めるんですね。インナーサイド。うん。オポジットインナーサイドイズベスト。アイ Actually, only putting a clip <laughs> can <laughs> create a 
We move here. Mm. <laughs> Traction already. So you mean to say we should place it on the side? Oral side. Uh, uh, no. It means anal side. Inner side. Inner side. Yes. Now scope is going to the oral side, yes. so we need to track to the opposite side. But actually, only putting a clip <laughs> causes a kind of gravity, additional gravity, so we can uh, open the dissection plane like yes. this. Now we can see the muscle, muscle layer <laughs> clearly. <laughs> Or shall we use conventional clip? Mm -hmm. Or a short clip or any... You can Please. see the uh, yes. attachment better. Good demonstration. So that is a benefit of traction device. But uh, in case of difficulty, I think it really helps. Mm. Uh, oh. Maybe, but uh, maybe. yes, yes, yes. But uh, actually, a uh, dual knife also has a small disc, so we can use it similar to a uh, IT knife, like just hooking the tissue with a small disc, uh, needle out, and then hook it. Final cut. No. Oh. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Kore o saki kaishu. So you need to cut the. So you もうクリップごと引っ張っちゃってクリップを外すかですかね。この糸を切る。スレッドが切れたらいいんですけど、切れるかな。うん。あ、はい。いやいやいや。で。Open. Close. Uh, 
た抜けちゃうとまた入れにくくなっちゃうかもしれないうんあ,あ、ノーノーノーノーうん、イエスおう,うんうんうんつかみ直した方がいい<笑><笑>ちょっと引っかかっちゃう。いやオープンオープンですあオープンあオープンですオープンあ、uh, If you want I can do it but takes time もう一個取る Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Professor Murillo. Thank you. Dr. Prasad, we are with you. So, you Thank you. So, you can see that we have basically completed the dissection on the right side. And now we are finishing the dissection on the left side. And again, this is not something totally unanticipated. There is a fair amount of bleeding. There is also a fair bit of fibrosis. And I think this all reflects the chronicity of the process. So, um, we are just making slow and steady progress. Dr. Prasad, does it matter yeah. how much of the length of the stock you leave behind? In terms no, of it shouldn't matter. It should matter. In terms of recurrence, does the length of the remnant stock matter? It shouldn't matter because we really, this should be a mucosal process, right? And a lot of this is just injection as well, so. Yeah. So we just have to. We are, we are using the precise mode now, and uh, so that we are able to control both. Pardon? New and light. Yeah. The other option is to use a scissor knife, I guess. Now, now mostly what you see is the pedicle and all that because a yeah, lot of big so vessels have we have controlled I think through that. we have tried to we could see a lot of big vessels we have actually controlled uh, bleeding with that because of the weight of the polyp it's just hanging down then you see a, po uh, a stock like thing what you see there is actually uh, the polyp is just hanging there we can see that The biggest problem is bleeding is that you, know, you lose the plane, you, know, you may not be able to see it very well. So always try to control the bleeding, wash it better. If you feel you can inject further, I think you, can, you are able to appreciate the uh, polyp. The dissected polyp is on the uh, left side of mine and the gastric wall is on the right side. We are actually moving away from the muscle.
in fact uh, while the, during uh, dissection no if you feel that your uh, accessory which you chose is not adequate you can even suture here actually you can actually uh, go for a dual knife at this stage you can actually try to see that whether the dissection can be more controlled yes almost getting uh, over <coughs> Uh, Prasad is not Prasad is not to? Prasad is not in a hurry is a very gentle dissection very careful man there is no hurry at all yes uh, arora tell yeah, me yeah what do you do to the other equally big polyp there Pardon? are two polyps huh? yeah we have we have gotten both of them sir okay two large polyps we got in the same one okay and there are st uh, some small polyps which we are leaving alone and we can actually okay. cut this separately so in one eight. submucosal dissection you have covered up both stalks uh, uh, both stalks because they are very adjacent So one of the challenges we are also facing is because of the bleeding yeah. the knife itself as you can see there's only Get this much attachment the knife also has to be periodically cleaned mm. and that's what we I'm having our wonderful assistants do they have been very patient with me Dr Phillips is yeah. something like a speed boat knife would be yeah. better in a situation like this No speed boat is wonderful but now you know, you know it's uh, Uh, the size of okay. uh, it is quite big and we need to have a therapeutic uh, scope and the cost will definitely add to it otherwise that will actually do a bit faster job but at all depends upon individual choice but i am sure the new development uh, the new changes which is going to happen in speed speedboat will definitely will make things better advantage is definitely it is a bipolar one and so it can be used in any patient But I think uh, the present version. I think uh, uh, many people do, are not very happy to use, but you no know, people like experts like Amol and uh, Mohan and many other people are using it. I agree that. But I am sure the new version will definitely, uh, new modification will definitely make it a thinner size and is more useful. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, speed boat uh, is uh, uh, told me it's actually the bleeding is much less in that because usually it is actually microwave dissection or you can the type of dissection is uh, uh, different because it's a microwave bubble injury to the vessel so there is no inflammation and yeah, injury yeah. to the surrounding tissues right dr prasad and uh, dr philip we get back to you no 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 Can we are almost finished oh okay sir no we just had to present the next case okay we are with you we can't deal with you sir the one and two this is the final delivery the baby is crowning the crown almost it is down <laughs> Yes, cut it, or you can go from here. Yes, yes. Can you see only a small attachment there? Yeah. Are you able to see that? Yeah, just two percent left. Yes, the last bit. Yes. Okay. Excellent demonstration. Wonderful. Brilliant, Dr. Prasad. Okay. I'm really proud of no, you. Excellent no, no. job. now Thank now you. now the job is we have to actually look at the base of it and try to coagulate all the vessels and look at that and we'll keep watching you sir uh, and uh, you. now you can move thanks thank a lot thank you sir thank, thank you. you we are now presenting the case on screen one good evening so this is a 33 year old lady she presented with history of dyspepsia and constipation since the last 6 months on the endoscopy there was a 1 cm lesion subepithelial lesion in d1 it was umbilicated in appearance on the radial endo ultrasound uh, there is suggestions of possible mp layer involvement uh, the dota scan showed increased somatostatin expression in the duodenum in the duodenal bulb suggestive of a neuroendocrine tumor so the plan is to do a esd or a freehand eftr for a possible duodenal net 
So the learning objective would be demonstration of ESD or a freehand EFTR plus OTSC closure for duodenal neuroendocrine tumor. Over to you, Nilay, sir. So basically, this is an NET and this is a classical appearance of NET. You know that this is the surface with central umbilication. You start NBI and you don't see any adenomatous polyp uh, kind of appearance. Now, when you have duodenal adenoma, uh, duodenal net, it has to be removed. Uh, so huh? basically, what are the uh, investigations? Uh, we need to do one gastrin to see whether it is gastrin dependent or not gastrin dependent. And second, you need to do DOTA scan. In gastric NET, you may not require DOTA scan, but in duodenal, all duodenal NET, you require DOTA scan. How do you take it out? One is banded EMR, you just suck it, apply band and take it out. Uh, two, three things. One, there is a doubt of muscularis propria invasion on EUS, so you can't do banded EMR in this. Second, if the lesion is bigger, then what is caught into the uh, band, then you don't do banded EMR because there will be incomplete removal of NET. So, uh, so right now, there are two options what we can do. One is we can do ESD or full thickness uh, EFTR. So what my plan is, I'm going to do ESD over here. And then I'll try to take it out and block. And if there is uh, any muscle involvement and there is perforation, then I'll use OVESCO. If there is no muscle invasion, it's just a mucosal defect, then I'll close it with a simple clip. Right. So the Nilesha, we just want one second to go to the other room and come back. One yeah. second, please. Yes, Dr. Prasad and Dr. Phillips. Yeah, this is our resection specimen. You can you, can, can you just see, see that? So we just a big, to big show chunk, you the big chunk of meat. Specimen. No, you yeah. can see that it's a huge one. Yeah. Right. Thank, thank, thank you, you sir. No, thank, no, you, no, thank, no, you. thank you, thank you. Nilesha, we are back with you. Very good, sir. You're on. And uh, hand mic to Dr. Asma, please. Increase effect four. Or no? Nilay, can you do a hybrid in him? Yes, sir. We can do hybrid. Uh, so basically, we can cut it all around and then yeah. do EMR. Yes. But the problem is here there is an involvement of muscle. That is what at least US shows. But of course, it is never 100%. Yes. Uh, US can never 100% tell you whether it is the lesion which is compressing the muscular propria or there is real invasion. I need more effect. So I'm doing marking first. Marking is absolutely mandatory in all ESDs, except in rectum or probably in colon. I'm doing, you can do marking with, otherwise you do so, four square egg, yeah. So you can do marking with uh, either the same knife using soft square egg or four square egg, mm -hmm. or you can do marking uh, uh, using APC. So I'm using dual J over here, and I'll do marking with the uh, APC not APC with four square egg. So, and here you don't need big margin because you know it's NET does not require big margin. Yeah, Asma is joining and probably she would answer more than what I would speak. Yeah, and he's marking because it's like submucosal lesion. That's why we don't need a free, a free margin because it all would come with the, like is this, this uh, polypoid lesion, that's why. It's now effective, why it is not working? I need more. Nilay, does the yeah, biopsy, okay. suppose it would have shown a WHO grade 1 tumor, minimum yeah. KI index. Yeah. Would you leave it alone? No. In duodenum, you, I'll take it out. But if patient is old, patient has comorbidities, I'll not take it out. But Dr. if patient is young as this patient is, I would take it out. Dr. Nilay, this is a single uh, duodenal NET? Yeah, yeah. It's a single one. Okay. Even DOTA is not shown in any other lesion, no lymph node. This is, DOTA is very important because sometimes the lesion is small in small boil, but there will be large lymph node outside. So if you see a large lymph node outside, you don't take it out endoscopically, patient has to go for surgery. Suppose there are multiple, like two, three, four. You can take them out do? one by one. One by one. In the same setting or in different settings? No, he's what, do you using force coag? for the coagulation? No, no, he's yeah, saying... Yeah, that's the same settings. Yeah, yeah. what you say, we can, you can take it in the same yeah, settings. Same setting. It all depends how many yeah. times you're taken for taking out the first one. Now I'll do submucosal injection.
Uh, Nile, is it possible to do an EMR and then have a relook at the base and then decide? Yes, you can do banded EMR and if there is perforation. Problem is, suppose I don't take it out and block with banded EMR, then taking out that remaining bit is very cumbersome. Then yeah, it becomes very difficult yeah, to take the remaining. But after EMR, can you look at the base and decide it is it left over or not or is it yeah, You, you will see the lesion, you will see the white lesion. If it is remaining, you can see it in endoscopy. Inject. Inject more. Stop. Needle. Inject. Stop. Problem is the lesion is dependent position. That's why the fluid and yeah. <laughs> everything will going to stay there. Needle. You don't manipulate. Yeah. The then we may make supine inject. Uh, asthma. Is, is it possible to do a water immersion, underwater testing? If it is submucosal, it will float up. If the muscular muscular is is involved, it will remain depressed. Is it possible to do it? It's, uh, with a suction, you will know. Sometimes with the injection, if you s see the, if you inject, inject and you see the lesion, you can see the lesion is fixed and not move at all. That means it's attached to the Stop. muscle. And sometimes, with the, as you said, with the water immersion, you can suction see it like it's very fixed and you have this like uh, this idea that mm. the region is fixed to the muscle. Needle. As you can see here, it, it's not moving and uh, what do you think? Is it no, attached it's, to it's uh, yeah. Is it submucosal? Stop, stop, stop. Uh, can we make patients supine and see? Because there is a lot of fluid there. And you see like you feel that the okay. injection it goes beneath the region here. But if it's attached to the muscle, uh, sometimes I get mixed up with the okay, U.S. Okay, guys. Okay. They send it to me and they said it's attached to the muscle. But I usually test with the like, uh, with the check, with the suction, gentle Inject. suction. See if it's legion comes with the, the whole mucosa, it comes Stop. to you. That means it's attached to the muscle. Uh, but if it's not, parega. maybe it's submucosal. And with the lift, you can see that with the injection, the whole things will come up. But if it's fixed with the injection, that means it's really fixed to the muscle. Nile, are you happy with the injection? No, I am not happy. Uh, injection is fine, but there is a lot of fluid getting accumulated there. Hmm. So I can't see properly and suction was not proper. Hmm. So what I, I took out the no, took out the, the needle and then I did suction. Uh, no, 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 no. Give me injection. So now my uh, vision is better. So I am putting my needle again. So if does, this does not work, then I'll change the position of the patient so that the fluid doesn't keep on coming into my field. Right, Dr. Nila, we'll keep watching you, sir. Yeah. We are now ready with uh, the third case. One, two, three. One, two, small, three, big. Thank you. For the next case, we have a 67-year-old gentleman presenting with long standing dyspepsia and constipation. Endoscopy showed a 10 millimeter prolapsing hyperplastic polyp in the prepolyuric region. Patient was put on double dose PPI therapy. Uh, so here we see a lesion which is quite vascular in the prepolyclic region. The objective here is to learn the characterization of gastric polyp using magnification NBI and discuss the management strategies. Dr. Pankaj, you are on. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, we are just uh, positioning the patient. This is a very uh, tricky lesion. Raude, Raude, Raude. This is <laughs> extra pyloric, Pankaj? Yeah, yeah, it's extra pyloric. It is in the pylorus actually and it has flopped inside the duodenum, you can yeah. see. Posterior wall. Yeah, it is on the posterior wall. So, a little tricky. Uh, they have biopsied it and to be, uh, it was, uh, it is shown to be hyperplastic. On NBI also, you can see the characteristics. Uh, very vascular, uh, it bleeds on touch and now the uh, thing is getting behind the lesion is sometimes going to be very tricky. Mm. So uh, the patient also is quite heavy, so not very easy to change the position of the patient. Uh, I would have liked to uh, inject behind the lesion first, which I am trying, 
to get this lesion out i think the most uh, likely uh, treatment in this would be if i can elevate the lesion well uh, do an emr and get this lesion out rather than trying any uh, fancy thing because it is very vascular very fibrous and probably there is going to be a lot of fibrosis uh, below uh, what do you think dr arora yeah yeah i think is it possible to have some glimpse at the distal end uh, that is i <laughs> i am just trying it just trying it i'm just because the what is happening is the scope is just slipping out how, how about suction the air yeah sometimes so want and to do it under water mm. uh, but very very one, one option yeah yeah maybe uh, suction the uh, air in the stomach so it may the scope may maybe did a bit stable yeah i think uh, what you're saying is you, if you decompress the stomach right i am doing that the looping will be less yes 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 and uh, we can we have a cap so we can uh, have some you know busier feel yes 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 Yes. Will placement Pankaj uh, putting in an endo loop will make it more prominent and then give you a, some idea of the stock also if you can get. There is no it. stock. It is sessile. Mm -hmm. There is no stock. It is just uh, I think a very tiny attachment. You can see I think the entire polyp now you can see properly. Mm. And now it's better, bit bit stab more stable. More stable, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice, I'm nice. just trying to, yeah. Now we are seeing the other side from here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What right? about underwater EMR? In case it <laughs> remains underwater, it looks like <laughs> that is what I am trying. You can see underwater. Well, I think it is too big and it is. It will not hold water. That is the only issue. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll just try to. What do you suggest, Professor? Should I inject here and try, or should we go underwater? But. Uh, I think sometimes injection make very difficult to catch in the you know stock or base. Or well, just simple EMR is also okay. Between simple EMR professor and uh, what underwater, won't underwater be safe because you are I, almost impinging onto the pyloric ring? Yes. I, I prefer underwater but uh, yeah. maybe still possible to perform. Just uh, a simple smear, smear. smearing, it's also. Uh, Dr. Desai, one question. Could you put a, a clip traction here to pull it into the stomach and then just smear it away? I think it's very... Once we put a clip, smear, you know, 10, 15, we, cannot, uh, we cannot place a smear. So, but currently we can see the base. So uh, I think, yeah, see, yeah. I think the best option is getting it under water. We are getting mm, a good mm. lift. So what we are trying is, I'm my hand is away from my air button the lesion is floating i'll put some more uh, water in it pankaj part of it does seem to have a stock even if it is broad i think underwater yes. will make it more prominent and e even um. emr should be sufficient yes yes that is what i am doing yeah, yeah? see mm -hmm. now we are mm -hmm. seeing the ah, yeah. and this yeah, is yeah, this yeah. is the attachment here mm -hmm. yeah. you can this see the, on the left yes. of the screen here yeah, yeah. right mm -hmm. At 7 o'clock. So, yeah, absolutely right. So, what we will do is just try to get mm -hmm. this snare around mm -hmm. slowly underwater without giving any air. Can you open the snare fully, please? This is a 15 mm snare, I think, which we have taken. Olympus. Professor Nuria, when you take a snare, how do you decide to take a bigger one or a smaller one or as per the size? So Which one is better? Uh, according to the of course, to according to region left. size, but the uh, polypoid region, we usually choose the snare size according to exact region size. But a uh, uh, very sessile region or flat region, underwater region becomes smaller and polypoid. So we usually uh, use a bit, bit smaller snare. Mm. 
See, we presume that, you know, bigger the uh, snare, the more, more maneuverability you yeah, have. Yeah, it's a bit difficult. Large, large snare uh, but uh, large snare a bit difficult to maneuver, especially in a very narrow working space in Dodenam. So I prefer to choose, you know, appropriate size. Open? Almost the same or a little bit smaller uh, size. Can someone hold the scope? Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I think I can. So what is happening? The scope is yeah. slipping. Mm -hmm. A suction might help. Yeah, I'm doing a little yeah, suction. Yes. Yeah. But a very difficult yeah. location. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, close now. Yeah. Okay. Slowly, close. Right, side, right, open. right side. Yeah, we are all yeah, I can. Uh, mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I think now we are seeing yes. and we are holding the stock. Yeah. Slowly pulling, going inside. I think, yeah. yeah, it is. Stock is well seen now. Okay. Close it. Slowly. Uh, right side. Right side, I think a little yeah. bit is left open. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay, I think mm. now mm. we have got mm. the whole thing. Maybe a little is uh, left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Open. A little more on the right. Uh, Professor Noria, any particular type of uh, coagulation setting because the, this region is pretty Close. precarious, both in terms of bleeding and perforation, Close. difficult to handle. Mm. So would you use more of coagulation or more of current? Probably a coagulation in this case. More of coagulation. Yes. Hmm. Uh, actually, through? very difficult location. Yeah, very difficult. Yeah. Open, open. I think we have got the entire left side. Mm. But the right side, the right side is not concept because the uh, channel is located in the left side. So. We will get it. It is just a matter of, I could have allowed the patient to be turned on the right, but have a bigger snare. Oh. Yeah, we uh, can use a double channel. So this, it will come. It is just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. I think okay. stomach decompression might help. Ah, okay. I think the snare is smaller. You need a little mm -hmm. bigger mm -hmm. snare. Mm -hmm. You have a 20 mm snare, please? What is the largest size of the snares do we have? Uh, now we have 25. This is a 15 mm, mm snare, but I mm. think it is a little small. If I have a little bigger snare, 20 mm. 30 mm is the largest available. Yeah, 30 mega is largest. Snare. Mega, mega snare. That's a little, yeah. Mm. 25 is there. Just suck it again. Go in. Mm. Yeah. Okay, open. Open fully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yes, nice, nice. Okay. Yeah, nice. Wait. Let me just go in. Yes. I think it's yeah. close okay. now. Close, yes, yes, close, yes. close, 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 close. Nice. Okay. I think now we have got the whole polyp. Yes. It is floating. 
Pankaj, will you ensure that uh, you are away from the muscle? Uh, yeah, I this is, I think, already, absolutely yeah. underwater. I am just moving and uh, the polyp is moving. Yeah. So, ready? And also, this is on the pyrus, so muscle is very thick, yeah. usually. And oh. I think we have cut. Yes. Yeah, and the mm, polyp mm, is out. Mm. We'll see the lesion. Yes. Yeah, I think the, mm, it is out. Mm. Very nice. Right? And we can see the base mm. also, we'll do it. We'll just suck the lesion here, get it in the cap. Yes, yes, yes. We we'll don't retrieve want to it, do yeah, this. Yeah, we retrieve it first and <laughs> yes, then we yes, will yes. see if we want to apply a clip there or we can just leave it. Right? Very nicely done. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think that was the only way you could have done because it was very <laughs> difficult to go inside, inject or do a retroflexion in the duodenum. Right? We'll just have a look. Just, just one question. Uh, supposing a very tiny remnant is left, uh, we tend to use APC to just uh, burn it out. How effective it is? Uh, we would not use APC. Sometimes we use the uh, same snare with a hot tip and a soft mm. coagulation uh, if required. Mm. I don't think it is left. I think we have removed But will, the it, not, will it not cause a deeper coagulation injury? I usually not. not. I, at this location, I think pylorus is otherwise quite yeah, thick. Yeah. We are not in the duodenum. Yes, yes, yes. It yes. should not be a problem. Yeah, yeah. I think it's so. It's impinging almost on the pyloric ring. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is on the pylorus. And mm. we are seeing, see, uh, see, this is the base. Yes. Right? And we can see yes. it is quite clean, no vessel. Mm. Uh, mm. So I think we'll just leave it. Do you need to clip it? Because this is the area which will have the maximum exposure to acid. Uh, we can apply one clip, but I don't think so. What mm, do you think, Professor? You would a clip a little? Maybe in my practice, usually such small one and very well coagulated, we usually leave it. Yeah. Mm. So if you feel we can just apply one clip, it's not going to take time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that give me a small clip. Okay. 11 m. Nice. Yeah. That's a lesion. There is no residual lesion. Yeah. That is fine. So we'll just apply a clip. Yes, Dr. Pankaj. Right. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Dr. Pankaj. Thank, mm. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent job, Pankaj. Back to Dr. Nilay and Dr. Asma. Yeah, hi. Yeah, hi. So uh, what we've done is we are trying to achieve a circumferential uh, incision, as you can see over here. And uh, needle. And you managed nicely to do the circumferential incision with a little bit of submucosal trimming. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, a proper depth is necessary. Yeah, here we're looking for R0 just because of now the horizontal, the vertical. Yeah. Uh, so I to make sure that we have taken the whole lesion. Hmm. Uh, uh, Nile, would yeah. a pocket ESD be Sir, better pocket, if start from uh, one end? No, 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 no. Pocket is not a good option for duodenal and with this such a… It's, it's not easy to… Yeah. yeah it's not size. easy to create a pocket in duodenum, sir. Conventional is better. And how is this knife different from the one used in colon? No, this is same. This is same. colonic knife. So, the dual J are available only in two sizes, 1.5 and 2. Colonic is 1.5 millimeter and uh, stomach is two millimeter. So basically I need some trimming. I've done a circumferential but I'll clean it. So what I'll do is, now I'll start from here because if I put water, to see where the down. water get, goes. So water goes on this side. We change the position of the patient yeah. because of the gravity. So now I'll start doing dissection from this side, but I still need some uh, uh, trimming all over because that will be anti gravity. Band is also good. Yeah. Uh, 
Only problem is for clip and bend, I need more mucosa. Thinking I'm not going to use any traction, so I have not kept too much of margin. So if you want, yeah, okay, okay, let's see. From here to maybe here. Yeah, let's try because you need more mucosa to catch it. Let's try. There is no harm in trying. Knife. Knife, please. Can you just show this? So, I, I, my hand is over the scope only. I am not doing anything. So, my accessory, I am not holding my accessory. I am just changing the direction pulling a scope a bit so that I don't go too deep. That is how I do trimming. You keep the distance constant of the length yeah. of the knife. Yeah. So what is required is that blue marker has to be seen. Not too much and this blue marker should not go beneath the mucosa. Mm -hmm. Then you are too deep. You have to see this blue marker. So this is how I keep. Now there is some blood vessels over there. So I was cutting with dry cut. Now I'll use some coag. So this is sweet coag. So there is no bleeding as you can see. Nile, would you go circumferentially? You will do an anti-gravity procedure, take it out the top Sir, one first. that is so what I am doing. I am trying to go yeah. from top now. So that it falls down. Again, you see a vessel there, so I am using coag. Traction there, hai na? Pata nahi. You think, Nile, in future even the knives will be AI compatible so that, that you don't have to keep on switching the paddles and they'll know what you they are encountering? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's too much of AI everywhere. <laughs> At least it is good for the uh, share, uh, shares. Uh, all IT shares went up because mm. of the talk of AI. I don't see any other uh, thing AI doing right now in our life knife. Nile, what will be the typical surveillance uh, protocol uh, for recurrence uh, after uh, resection of So you NAD? can uh, repeat endoscopy after a year. Uh, actually... Data scan. Yeah. The data knock scan, the scintigraphy scan yearly to see if there is recurrence or okay. any other lesion. So but if one, one, if one lesion has been removed, the recurrence is almost unknown. No, in, no, you know. unknown, yeah. There will be that recurrence at other sites because you are prone to have more new. You can have new lesions, but the same lesion is unlikely to recover. When margins are clear. If the margins, margins are, clear. are clear. To that, how soon would you uh, do your uh, Dota PET or uh, any imaging for that purpose? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear the question. Can you repeat it again? Soon would you repeat your imaging, Dota PET or whatever modality you choose to see for recurrence at any other place other than the, the scientigraphy, the Dota knock scan uh, is a PET scan, is like uh, uh, nuclear medicine PET, it's called Dota knock at the scientigraphy uptake. The Dota talk typically in an Indian scenario costs around 20, 35,000 rupees. So if on routine endoscopy, which is about one-tenth the cost, if there Injector. is no lesion, there is no need of repeating the total Inject. Unless there is a metastasis. Yeah, yeah, it. just to look for the metastasis yeah. or other lesion, other, other than, than that, that you don't need to repeat it. Yeah, other than this, no need, yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's almost ten times costlier than the endoscopy.
see if you can see he just uh, nicely manipulate the scope circumferentially and and keeping the need on the, the keeping the knife at the same distance same length with this circumferential movement inject now hybrid hybrid would be good here okay yeah but so not the new uh, yeah so that is what even uh, sir was saying that Either you can do complete ESD or we can do hybrid. So you think hybrid? Yeah, yeah. Knife. Yeah, hybrid will be much faster actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. any day. Much faster, safer. So what is the opinion of the house? Hybrid. hybrid. We can have an opinion poll. How many want quick tea and a hybrid? So ESD will take another 30 to 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Hybrid will take around two minutes. So high tea now is the mixed and a delicious dinner is ESD. What do you want? Op opinion. <laughs> Tell board. me what do you want. I'll do that. So everybody is tired. They want to have a quick high tea. Okay. Give they me don't snare. have energy to put up their hands also now. Because <laughs> the chef is really appealing to put a snare and take it off. But see, look at, look at the… Uh, but see, this looks big, but if I cut a little bit more, Suddenly there will be a lot of dissection. Suddenly you will see that okay, I have done more than what I, what was I uh, was achieving in the first. Dr. No, 50, 50, 50, is 50. a hybrid FTRD device possible on this? Yeah, yeah. See, oh, FTRD, if it is too near the pylorus, don't do it. Uh, there is too much of jugglery. This is fine. This is good for FTRD. But suppose the lesion is somewhere here, please don't do FDRD. You will end up in a more problem than uh, actually, then only option is ESD. Yeah. I think it is it's coming end on, Needle. so good yeah. position for yeah. FTRD yeah. also. Yeah, yeah. Needle or snare khol de pura. Pura snare khol de. So preparation for good high tea then. So I'm hooking the lesion close, close, slowly, slowly, slowly. Uh, Nile, any tricks of uh, being uh, away from close. the muscle? Because this is the point, okay. crucial point. Like uh, what I know during car is always better not to do, not to suck while you're closing the snare with the regular. Uh, like how we do with the EMR, or what do you think? Yeah, true. Because if you suck, you will yeah. get a muscle in. So you hook at uh, the apex, then as you see, you garland the lesion as I was doing it. Then uh, the, you don't suck then. Uh, now what I'll do is put some air and open a bit. Open the lesion a bit and then catch it again. Of course, there is no guarantee that I'll yeah. not get the le yeah. uh, muscle. I'm more worried about incomplete re removal of the lesion rather than muscle because uh, uh, muscle perforation because I know that I can easily uh, close this uh, thing. So now what uh, endocut Q? I want endocut Q. Yeah. Q, huh? Q. Does the movement of the, yeah, the yeah, close yes, near yes, give yes, an yes. idea whether it is easy to come out? Uh, I don't know. It, you have any answer? Movement of the closed snare. Yeah, now, the, because the, it's already snare which you have been tightened. Yeah. So, the, if it is free movement, possibly it's likely to be away so from So, you are muscle. talking about this free yeah. movement? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so if movement is not free, then you are right. Yeah. Then yeah. Yes. probably… Ban karenge aap. Then probably I've got the muscle. Now, let's see what I've got. Close, close, man. Close, close. Just a minute. I think it's done. Hmm? Baki hai? Close. Don't be so slow. Otherwise, you'll have too much of coagulation. So that's what I was yeah. worried. See? Mm -hmm. So what has happened? The tumor is there. Mm -hmm. This is not muscle. And this happened because now definitely the tumor is stuck to the muscle. Mm -hmm. It is stuck. So I'm not worried about the perforation and that's why I wanted to do ESD. Mm -hmm. Let me take out the lesion first and then do. 
so now the options are continue with full thickness rejection either endoscopically or with EFTR we have FTRD yeah, right, yeah. so any any different opinion from the house please I think since uh, almost the area which we have already dissected is totally covered with the tumor yeah. and FTDR will be a safer option. Yeah, so we'll do that. Mm. Only thing is I need to dilate the pylorus now. See this is tumor, someone was asking how do you know this is yeah. de definitely tumor. And most likely it is going deep into the muscularis proper. Wait, so it, it needs full thickness resection yeah. now. Yeah. Either endoscopically or FTRD. Yeah. Nile, why is EUS not, you said EUS is not reliable. Why Sir, EUS is not reliable. Sometimes we think the muscle is involved. Uh, actually it is compressing the muscle, the muscle becomes thin and it becomes extremely difficult to differentiate whether really there is uh, uh, muscle involvement or it's the muscle compression. Uh, so many a times it is not very uh, helpful. Or maybe the echogenicity of the tumor merges with the echogenicity yes. of the muscle. Yes, I don't know. I think we can do one more because now doing ESD is difficult. I think FTRD. Now I'll do banded EMR. This will come, so I don't need to see. So just put a band and cut. Okay, chal. Snare. Ovesko chahiye, ha? Ovesko yaya. I don't but think if it cuts the half, muscle. then we are in a bigger suit. From the beginning, ah, when we suck, it comes with you. If it you. cuts half, then we are in a bigger problem. Open, pura open kar do aap, snare ko. I think TRD device is the best. FTRD device. Uh, Dr. Nere, we'll get back to you. Okay, no problem. Thank you. For the next case, we have a 30 year old female presented to us with history of dysphagia and reflux symptoms for three months. On examination, she had kyphoscoliosis. Gastroscopy was suggestive of achalasia cardia. On esophageal manometry, uh, generalized failure of peristalsis in all wet swallows were seen, which was suggestive of achalasia cardia type 1. So the plan is to demonstrate poem in a patient of kyphoscoliosis. Over to you, Dr. Katikar. Yeah, Harishal, you are on. Oh, hi. Good evening, friends. So, as the uh, history was read out, this is a young girl with uh, dysphagia and uh, she has a kyphoscoliotic deformity and she also has uh, achalasia. The manometry shows a type 1 uh, type of, a, of an achalasia. So, what we, ex what we expect to do here is a short myotomy. So, it's a slightly sigmoid esophagus as you can see, Dil significantly dilated, sigmoid and that's yeah, so the, Arishal, in, the GI junction. In type 1, yeah. I think there is enough evidence that we can we do a, short do a very short, short myotomy. myotomy so yeah. You need not do the complete myotomy, myotomy. and the long length 6-7 centimeters on the esophageal side at all. It's yeah. on actually. It's yeah. Closer and also the thing is, some of this Sigmoidization, as we would say, could yeah. also be because of the kyphoscoliosis. Yes, so yes, that yes, is also yes. the fact that we have to keep it in mind. mind yeah. So that is there. So 
So where the, the G junction is at 35, around 35, around? 36, yeah, around okay. 35, 36. So, so what, what are you I, planning? So you I are, plan to just come back to, to around 7, 8 centimeters back, okay. just to maybe in line with this, this uh, angulation. angulation, just next to it. Okay. And probably from there start your uh, incision and incision tunneling from and that then side. You can do and the tunnel with the myotomy, myotomy beyond, that. beyond that. Yeah. So great. So uh, I think uh, that will be wonderful. And this time, thanks to Anand, we've had this opportunity. Uh, uh, Sahil and Sanjay, I know, you, you know. So I, I know we are running late. So we are going to continue with this case. And actually, we had one, two more cases, but uh, we'll at least show one more case out of that of, uh, you know, Dr. Asma. But obviously, we don't want to overshoot the time too much. So what we will do is we will continue with the cases in the background and uh, we will uh, have the next session coming up. And uh, only thing is I would ask the audience to reserve their questions for the evening when you meet the faculty at dinner and uh, that time you can you know, ask them the questions so that we will not have the audio from the hospital. So that is how it is. But before we sign off from here, I would like to thank... Uh, TTG. Yeah. And uh, I would like to introduce our team over here. You've already seen Harshal and Nachiket and Rajendra. Rajendra, I think, is there in the hall because he's going to be moderating the next session. And uh, you all have all seen Shivangi in action. And our rest of the team, Vilas, our chief technician, and you've seen all our other technicians, Sambhaji, Swapnil, Rahul, and Man Singh, and Rajesh, and Sandesh. They have been instrumental in helping us with everything. And our admin staff is uh, definitely equally important. We have. Uh, our admin, uh, admin team headed by Amruta over here and the rest of the team over here and uh, of course the backbone of all these patients, uh, all this, this kind of workshop is our doctor team over here. So we have Dr. Rohan and Dr. Arun. Arun is already in the hall because he is presenting a video in the evening, in the video session. And we have also Ajay yeah. and Jaseem, our pre uh, earlier fellows who have uh, come to the department, you know, for this thing. And of course, we have our DNB fellows, Yash, Sanjana, Yash, and Chetan, and our medical officer team as well, headed by Dr. Nina. So that is how it is. And our nursing team and our uh, rest of our helpers and the MPWs, all of them have contributed and it's really a great pleasure to have you all over here. Of course, these kind of procedures, you all saw what, what can happen with bleeding and CO2 and all that. And for that, we have our anesthesia team we are today headed by Dr. Kalyani. And yesterday, it was Kalyani and Dr. Swati. And yesterday, it was Dr. Amruta and Dr. Aditi. And they were instrumental in managing all our patients during that, uh, during these difficult, uh, you know, procedures. So that is how it is. And uh, what we are going to be doing is we will sign off from here now. But you will keep seeing the uh, live procedures. In the next room, Dr. Asma is going to start another case uh, of a rectal lesion, where, which is going to be uh, for ESD using the hybrid knife. And... Uh, that will be done on camera but without audio. So you can, if you have any questions for Dr. Asma or for Dr. Harshal or even for Nilay, you can reserve it for the uh, evening when you meet them at dinner. So with that, thank you so much. And I, I think we'll this is a rapid round of applause. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. you everybody. Thank you so much. And a big applause to video, you know, Anand Peter and his team. We, you know, from video line for this fantastic audio-visual transmission which you all have enjoyed for the last two days. Thank you, A sir. A big applause to him. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Anand. Thank you. Yeah. Right. As of now, so without audio, you can start off with the lectures, uh, Vijay. I know, I know. Uh, two alone small on the side. You can start with your first lecture and uh, Dr. Rajesh Puri will present it from here. And Dr. Yeah. Moyen will do it from here. 
we'll call the moderators uh, dr vivekananda yeah Kankar. one second dr nilay just needs to go to the audience oh okay dr so, nilay you're on so what we have decided in this case is we are you going to use full thickness resection device so we are loading it and then uh, we'll suck the lesion into uh, not the suck get the lesion into the ftrd and then uh, we'll do a full thickness resection that is what is the plan that is what i just wanted to share so we are just loading the device and then we'll start the procedure thank so, you nilay so that's a base thing about doing it in a conference you don't have to worry about money <laughs> <laughs> right we'll keep watching you sir anyway thank you you can call the moderators for the next session dr vivekanand kulkarni dr rajendra pujari dr palyani appan and we'll call the first speaker dr praveer rai gas related adverse events prevention and resolution uh, very good evening i would like to thank uh, dr amol and his team uh, for this uh, opportunity and a wonderful conference so i'll be discussing about gas related adverse events prevention and resolution so once we talk of endoscopic luminal surgery what do we have is a number of procedures that we have seen in the last two days poem g poem z poem d poem poeter prem and c poem so in all these procedures what is common is that you are operating in the submucosal plane which is close to the mediastinum and the peritoneal cavity and that's the reason once you are doing procedure in this area there is a chance of insufflation related consequences in all these procedures majority of the insufflation related adverse events do not require any specific intervention therefore these are not adverse events in the true sense so just uh, this slide is very very important and why this is important is this slide tells you there is a continuity is described between neck mediastinum retroperitoneum and pelvis on basis of anatomy and facial defined spaces vascular perforations of fascia and the muscle insertions also constitute potential conduits between compartment and that is the reason why the air can traverse from upper limb neck mediastinum retroperitoneum pe uh, peritoneal space and extra peritoneal pelvis even scrotum and the lower limbs so what are these gas related adverse events it can be subcutaneous emphysema like this this is again ct done in a patient of ours post procedure capnothorax then you can have mediastinal emphysema then you can have capnoperitoneum that is air around the pericardium or co2 around pericardium then capnoperitoneum and you can have retroperitoneal air so this is very important to recognize these events and the incidence of gas related events is variable in different studies depending on the definition used whether gas or co2 was used and the modality used to diagnose that is whether x ray or ct scan so in a study in which they used ct scan post operative the incidence of pneumoperitoneum mediastinum was to the extent of 53 to 85% pneumoperitoneum to again up to 67% subcutaneous lymphoma in 30% however only 6% of these patients required specific intervention so it is evident that most of these events have no clinical consequence and the routine post operative ct is not required so currently only those gas related events requiring an intervention should be categorized as adverse events and in a large multicentric study the frequency was only 1.6% very important so again considering stir in a systematic review the pooled prevalence of gas related events of subcutaneous emphysema and pneumomediastinum was around 15% pneumothorax 6% pneumoperitoneum 6.8% what is important to know is that gas related complications are frequent in the esophageal tumors when you are doing stir as there is absence of serosa in the esophagus So again, what are the risk factors we have? It can be procedure-related. So what are these? Use of air rather than CO2, creating a narrow submucosal tunnel, high-flow CO2 tube, 
continuous heavy burst of current during tunneling or myotomy, and knife without water jet facility. Operator dependent can be long operative curve or during the learning curve, that is initial days. We need to understand that the occurrence of insufflation related adverse events cannot be completely prevented. So in a study by Mohan, uh, the rate of clinically significant capnoperitoneum was 28% with the low flow gas tube, while it was 12% with the extra low flow gas tube, again, both by Olympus. Another interesting study, Family et al., they reported nil using a low flow gas tube and 36.7% with a high flow to medium flow gas tube. So when do you intervene? So in a subcutaneous emphysema, it usually resolves within 24 to 48 hours, does not need any specific intervention. Coming to capnoperitoneum and retroperitoneal CO2, intervention is based on the ventilatory parameters. You have an ETCO2 more than 50 or a high peak airway pressure, or you have a presence of clinically significant abdominal distension. So in both capnoperitoneum and retroperitoneal CO2, the steps to intervene include gastric decompression, temporarily stopping the procedure for around 10 to 15 minutes to allow CO2 absorption, does the job in majority, modifying the ventilatory settings to augment washout of CO2. How do you do, do this? Increasing PEEP, increasing respiratory rate, and giving 100% oxygen. This, again, the anesthetist does and needle drainage of air and CO2. This is usually done using 16 to 18 gauge needle, insert in the right mid-axillary line below the coastal margin. Cannula is attached to the plastic syringe. You saw that in the live demonstration also today. And this just tells you that the CO2 is coming. You see bubbles there. So retroperitoneal CO2 and capnoperitoneum distinction is important because once you have capnoperitoneum, that is the air below diaphragm, needle drainage is required. However, if you just have retroperitoneal air as seen in the second image where you have air around the kidney, the pausing the procedure and modification of ventilatory settings are required, the needle does not do the job. So capnothorax, again, uncommon as compared to capnoperitoneum, identified by reduced chest wall exertions on the affected side and increased airway pressure. Again, anesthetist and the assistant has to keep and watch on this. Temporary pausing the procedure in small thorax and drainage with a large capnothorax, where the puncture site is usually in the intercostal space in the infrascapular region along the posterior axillary line. Capnopericardium, again rare, 0.2 to 2.4%, usually goes undetected. You have a small one, temporary, sees the procedure 15 minutes, the job is done. However, tension capnoperitoneum can be life-threatening and early detection is paramount. There's a report in GI endoscopy 2015 where they have reported two cases where the capnoperitoneum, capnopericardium led to cardiac arrest. So this is an interesting video, the same. As you can see, the myotomy is being done. And here, as the myotomy is being done, you can see an opening here. And this opening, they suggested, is possible in the pericardium. Despite this, they continue with the myotomy. And you can see a clear opening here. However, in this particular patient, after this, they did the x-ray, which showed uh, capnopericardium, how the patient could be resuscitated. So to summarize, gas-related adverse events need prevention, use CO2 for insufflation, low flow gas tube, positive pressure ventilation. You need to identify increased abdominal distension, decreased chest movements, increased ETCO2, airway resistance high, vitals you need to monitor, fluoro or CT scan you need to do to determine, di to diagnose management primarily by stopping the procedure, gastric decompression, adjust ventilatory settings, and relage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rai. You can join on this stage. Uh, we'll call Dr. Jayanta Samantha from PGI. He'll speak on mucosal injuries during tunneling endoscopy. Uh, thank you, chairpersons. 
good evening everyone at the outset i like like to thank uh, dr amol bapaya sir and his whole team at dmh for this wonderful conference and having me here so i've been given the job of uh, mucosal injury during tunneling endoscopy how to prevent how to treat so we uh, so we all know that i mean for the surgeons uh, and uh, uh, gi surgeon any esophageal leak during surgery is a dreaded complication because it, it you know there's a chance of contamination of the esophageal contents into the mediastinum leading to mediastinitis but this does not often happen with a digestive endoscopy tunneling technique because of only one factor that's known as the mucosal barrier if the mucosal barrier is breached or the wall is breached then what happens is all the contents will go out and it will lead to a, a mediastinitis or mediastinal complications this usually occurs in around 4.8% of the cases of poem procedures just to give you an insight that in comparison to where hellers the mucosal injury occurs is just in 0.6% of the cases so if you are not able to identify mucosal injury at the right time it can contaminate the mediastinum and once the oral diet is started and can lead to a lot of complications so one of the important issues that whenever we talk about uh, poem related procedures or sub mucosal tunnel technique related procedures in adverse events so mucosal injuries can happen intra procedural as well as post procedural as a result of delayed mucosal barrier failure so first let us see about the mucosal injuries so whenever we are doing a luminal endoscopy when you enter into the mediastinum that's a perforation for a sub mucosal endoscopy when you see the lumen through the tunnel then that is a perforation so what are the types of mucosal injury that we talk about these are type 1a there's a mucosal scald is there just a superficial scald if it is type 1b then we call when there is a submucosal exposure is there so and then type 2 when there is a through and through full thickness perforation in usually the type 1a and 1b these are easy to repair type 2s are usually larger ones and sometimes can be difficult to kind of uh, tackle so what are the key factors which can lead to mucosal injury so the basic key or the contributing factors or the risk factors for mucosal injury are the mucosa and the submucosal health esophageal anatomy it can be complex technique related aspects and finally operator related factors let us see it, uh, each of them one by one so whenever we talk about mucosal health this was one of the uh, discussions in the morning also that th there's a lot of stasis esophagitis candidiasis so these are mucosas are very friable and when you try to do a poem procedure in these kind of situations these can lead to mucosal uh, injury during the procedure and even delayed mucosal barrier failure so they have been they have defined it into grade 1 and grade 2 edema depending on how bad is the mucosa and on while, while giving an incision how is the edge of the margin so this can be a grade 1 or a grade 2 edema the higher the grades the, uh, the worse is the uh, the higher is the chances of mucosal injury coming to submucosal fibrosis again this is another important concept that if there is a too much amount of fib mucosal submucosal fibrosis during dissection you can inadvertently injure the mucosa again complex anatomy so let's say there is a sigmoid esophagus and then you try try to uh, pass your scope across and you are not getting into line with the uh, with the axis what can happen is you can, the shaft of the scope can force your uh, mucosal incision entry bigger because of the because of the mechanical trauma right so uh, these are the anatomy related factors so what are the fault in the technique primary the fault in the technique will be two one is mechanical where your inadequate entry point is not cleared properly and you are trying to force entry so the mucosal point will start increasing or your axis is not right and you are pushing the shaft too much and as a result leading to uh, elongation of your mucosal entry point and the second will obviously be the thermal that is excess coagulation where you are dissecting very close to the mucosa those are the situations where it will well lead to mucosal injury there is one concept called the anterior versus posterior some people have you know kind of uh, said that anterior uh, poem the chances of mucosal injury is higher because what happens is that the fling or the swing of this of the knife is much bigger when you are trying to do an anterior uh, uh, poem Uh, uh, because of the weight of the scope as compared to a posterior one but again these this is a very minor point for, for the beginners but for someone who is an expert this does not play much uh, factor for causing a mucosal injury what are the additional factors that we have operator experience uh, less than 1 year or less than 20 cases tunnel length more than 13 cm high risk for mucosal injury long standing disease previous treatment with let's say poem or a pneumatic dilation or even a botox therapy or even long procedure time these are the other additional risk factors which can lead to a mucosal injury so how to prevent it so the prevention starts from the basic steps so the basic steps is give optimum and generous mucosal injection and uh, not only at the entry point but at each time whenever you are in doubt give apt optimum injection to separate the mucosa away from the muscle clear the fibers this was one point where dr rajesh puri was mentioning mentioning in the morning clear the fibers at the apex because that is very important to have a wide entry point so that you do not force entry and cause tearing of the mucosal entry point and finally stay close to the muscle 
because we we all know that we are we want to preserve the mucosa so whenever you are clearing the submucosa stay close to the muscle as much as possible judicious use of electrocautery so this is another important aspect that use the electrocautery to uh, to only that much where you need to coagulate avoid prolonged spray bursts because the more spray you give uh, it is going to uh, lead to more uh, higher chances of mucosal injury slow down your bursts or coagulation when you are very close to the g junction or maybe in a submucosal fibrosis because this is the area where the muscle and the mucosa is very close to each other at those points maybe you try to reduce the power or use a different more rather than a spray coag like an endocut and always when you are coagulating pull away from the muscle i uh, sorry pull away from the mucosa during coagulation using a soft coagulation that will pre help prevent more of mucosal injury so you need to know your electrocautery system you need to know how powerful it is because the the, the highest amount of voltage that you are using is is the spray coag so you do not know inadvertently you can cause a lot of uh, coagulation injury to the to the uh, mucosa and as a result as i pointed out whenever you are going very close to the mucosa in those situations you might change the the power settings or might change the mode settings and always slow down slow down when you are at the g junction slow down when there is a submucosal fibrosis so these are the areas where there is a higher prone for mucosal injury another important aspect to prevent is look where you are going so you need to know that your muscle should be at the 6 o'clock position so you know exactly where you are going if you are too oriented towards the right or towards the left you inadvertently can hit between the muscle and the mucosa junction causing mucosal injury in in advanced uh, complex anatomy as i earlier pointed out what you can do is you you might be possible that you are going in a different direction and you need to use a guide wire technique in order to kind of orient your scope accordingly to avoid mucosal injury some uh, also you, uh, for severe submucosal fibrosis this was a this was a case done by dr zahir and here you can see this is known as a water jet technique because of the poor uh, mucosal uh, health what is happening is you know he is not getting a good lift so what he did was initially he tried with on one of the uh, created a tunnel in one place then he found that there was too much amount of severe submucosal fibrosis he stopped the procedure there and he did a, a third injection a second tunnel was created and then the procedure was completed so this is another technique which you can use again watch what you suck the problem with uh, with our initial training is that we tend to uh, use a lot of suction while doing a luminal endoscopy this is something which you should actively uh, prohibit anyone who is learning a poem because with the distal attachment cap the suction effect is intensified this is a very rookie mistake initially because whenever you suck too much inside the tunnel there there is a very high chance of bleeding from the vessels and these vessels are attached to the uh, to the capillary uh, uh, to the mucosa and they tend to bleed and then you try to uh, achieve hemostasis and cause more and more injury so be gentle and judicious with with your suction and avoid mucosa entrapment while you're doing it another important aspect that i talked about is a delayed mucosal barrier failure so you have completed the procedure later on patient develops some complications pain fever etc you go in and you find that your there is a wound dehiscence or the mucosa has given away so uh, this ha can happen in 0.4 to 0.8% of the cases because of excess coagulation use and one of the key important predictors that have been found was mucosal edema so whenever there is a mucosal edema it is always judicious i'll take a couple of minutes more uh, to postpone the procedure if there is a severe edema how to manage the tools we all know so there are clips the through the scope clips ovesco clips if if the if the lesions are larger in size you can uh, use a clip and loop technique and finally you can use sutures these are primarily for healthy tissues for unhealthy tissue probably there is too much amount of unhealthy tissue you can just place a stent and come out tackling the injury uh, uh, these are standard routine procedures so so if this kind of a perforation is there you what you can do is you can place routine clips and try to close the uh, close the rent what happens is many a times what you can choose is once there is a perforation you can carry on with the with the poem procedure complete the myotomy get the come out and then tackle the uh, the mucosal injury or if there is a larger injury then what you can use is is a, is a king's closer or a clip and loop technique and close the rent people have used fibrin sealant and etc and also these are, are other other techniques which have been used for closing the rents delayed mucosal failure like as such as these you see such a large clot uh, i mean the unhealthy mucosa because of the injury has happened or there is a contained perforation in these situations if you are not able to close it adequately just calm down don't worry what you have to do is keep the patient prolonged NP npo give some nutritional support let the esophagus rest it will automatically heal on its own you can give some vacuum therapy as well do you investigate every time whenever there is a problem no this was one of the studies where they uh, empirically did a uh, esophagogram after poem and they found that it is doing being excessive investigate do not do it even for that matter a second look endoscopy for all uh, poem procedures is not needed do it only when there is a high risk or a clinical suspicion of a, a delayed mucosal failure 
The, and obviously the learning curve effect is there. Data has suggested that as you go along and learn more and more procedures, automatically your mucosal injury uh, risks and, and adverse events risks will go down. And uh, what is the data suggest? That for, for competency, 20 cases, for mastery, 60 cases. So finally, I'll conclude by saying that mucosal injury is an important intra- and post-operative complication of submucosal tunneling. The key risk factors will be mucosal health, esophageal anatomy, and the technique of cautery use. Prevent, how will you prevent it? By optimum sub submucosal injection, judicious use of electrocautery, and avoid uh, too much suctioning. Go slow near the critical areas, such as the G junction and, the sub and where there is a submucosal fibrosis. How will you manage? By standard endoscopy closure techniques, majority can be managed. Detect early and manage early to prevent late complications. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samantha. Please join on the stage. We'll be now, uh, Dr. Rajesh Puri will be speaking on bleeding during ESD and tunneling endoscopy, how to prevent and manage. Dr. Puri is joining us from, yeah. Yeah, good evening. You're on. Uh, good evening, I'm audible in the hall. Yes. And visible. Yes. So again, thanks to Amol for giving this opportunity and I'm going to talk bleeding during ESD and tunneling endoscopy, how to prevent and how to manage. So bleeding rate in, with an EST ranges from 0 to 11.9 percent. But one of the most important thing is it is not considered as a complication, it is a part of procedure until patient has a hemodynamic instability. A minor bleed is not a complication, but definitely if patient become hemodynamically unstable, patient require blood transfusion and the hospitalization, then yes, this is a complication. And the prevention and the control of the bleeding is crucial to maintain the good field in the view and to implement for the safe procedure. If you make a good view, if the good view is there, if you have a less bleeding, the chances of completion of procedure with the less complications are very high. So first of all, I'm going to talk how to prevent the bleeding during ESG and tunneling endoscopy. So the most effective way of managing immediate bleeding is not how to stop bleeding, but how to manage vessel before bleeding that is preventing the bleeding, otherwise known as procoagulation. So I think we should have an aim, we should prevent the bleeding should happen rather than once the bleeding happen and we should try to control it. And the two cardinal rules to prevent the bleeding is simultaneous visual observation and careful dissection of the submucosal layer. Everything should be done under visual guidance and step by step you do the procedure. Once you come across with the bleeding vessel, try to coagulate depending upon the size of the vessel. And identification of the vessel prior to cutting through the tissue, I think these two important cardinal rules to prevent the bleeding to happen. And how to prevent? High definition view and the avoidance of the blind dissection. This is very common. We do a blind dissection. Your assistant has taken out the knife much higher and you are doing the blind dissection and the risk of bleeding is very high. Adequate submucosal injection is very important. Preventative coagulation of the visible vessel. Wise choice of the traction tools because at angles or in the difficult position, if you use the traction devices, it gives the good opening of the submucosal plane and the chances of bleeding is less and slow pace of dissection is another important thing. Now, how to prevent bleeding while doing the injection? Many of the time you have seen when you do a submucosal injection, bleeding start. So to prevent that network of the vessel, the needle should be inserted while your assistant is injecting the fluid and insertion should be stopped immediately once there is a formation of the bluish protrusion. Now, while doing the mucosal incision, second point, while doing the mucosal incision, many of the time you have seen that patient started bleeding and you use the scooping technique. And what is the scooping technique? A shallow mucosal incision is mandatory. Look at here on the left side and on the right side. You prevent the blood vessel to be injured and look at this video. So you are doing a very clean, swift incision and you are feeling that the job is done nicely. But once you complete, your depth of the incision was high and you start seeing that patient is oozing. So it should not be that deep into the submucosa that you will find that patient started bleeding. This is the right way. You do a superficial incision of the mucosa 
leaving the submucosa intact and you can see the blood vessels and that's how you can prevent the bleeding during the mucosal incision. Now third is prevention of the bleeding during the submucosal dissection. As in the morning if you see the professor Nori would have said in the upper two third and the lower one third there are larger vessels but they are fewer in number. If you do a superficial dissection the chances of the network of the vessel will be high and the chances of the bleeding will be more. So while doing the submucosal dissection, you should have a two-third upper and the one-third lower to prevent the bleeding as well as ongoing bleed. Now, you have, we are doing the dissection, you come across with, with the vessel. If the vessel is less than two millimeter in diameter, then the knife which you are using, an IT knife or the hook knife or the dual knife, either using the swift coagulation or the forced coagulation with the effect of 5 and the wattage of 100, you can prevent the bleeding. You see a bleeding vessels, catch hold either with your co-grasper or with your knife and apply the forced coagulation, you are able to control the bleeding. But if the bleeding vessel is large, especially the perforators, in those situations, it is better you use the hemostatic forcep or use the co-grasper and use the soft coagulation mode that is effect of 6 with the 100 watt and apply. While doing that, try to pull the accessory towards you to prevent injury to the deeper vessels or to the mucosa and the muscle. So catch the vessel, slightly lift away from the muscle layer, pull towards the scope and coagulate till the blanching of the vessel happens. Now, how to manage? Bleeding makes the scope view extremely limited and lead to a significant complication such as perforation of the specimen injury. Each slight bleeding should therefore be completely stopped as soon as it occurs before proceeding. So the most important key to achieve the good hemostasis is don't panic. Till you are introducing, you are changing your accessory. Suppose you are changing from your knife to the co-grasper. Apply the compression or the mechanical pressure by your cap because it is going to help in preventing the bleeding and your vision is very clear. Use the endoscope equipped with the water jet, that is another important thing. And identification of the exact site of bleeding by flushing with the water, you know underwater from where the bleeding is uh, appearing. Blind uh, in any appropriate re repeated hemostasis will not going to help, is going to help produce the charring and its, its chances of producing a delayed perforation is high. If you have a profuse bleeding, as I said, expose the bleeding point well, not to try to coagulate randomly, that is a habit of the beginners. Use the cap to tamponate the area and once your accessory is out in the form of co-grasper, then try and withdraw your cap and localize the bleeding point, hold it under water. Once you hold it flush with the water and there is no ongoing bleeding, then you can use the current. You can use the RDI mode. Or if you are doing the ESD, you can rotate the patient to the non-dependent area. So this is an example you see. On the left side upper image, ESD on the right side poem. And you see there is a bleeder. You hold with the co-grasper. Put a water. On the right side of the image, you see I have compressed with the cap. Once the accessory is out, withdraw the endoscope slowly. Catch hold the bleeding point, flush with the water to ensure that there is no ongoing bleeding and by using the soft coagulation you can prevent the bleeding. So this is the way and then you can proceed with the dissection. If you have a bleeding, as I said flushing is very important, identify the source of bleeding, catch hold with the co-grasper or with your knife which you are using and apply the coagulation current. With the co-grasper, you use the soft coagulation. With the knife, you are going to use the force coagulation and the bleeding can be stopped. So bleeding is not considered a complication if there is a no compromise of the patient vital sign. It is a part and partial of your procedure. Prevention and the control of the bleeding is crucial to maintain a good field of view and is implement for the safe procedure. Maintain calm, don't panic, use cap as a tamponade if the bleeding is significant. Thank you for the patience hearing and I invite you all for the upcoming Endocon 2024 which is going to be held by New Delhi in Medanta Hospital. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Puri. <coughs> we now invite Moin Kashab to speak to us on delayed perforations. Thank you. 
I guess uh, is Dr. Zayed there, sir? We probably will have to interchange with Dr. Zayed because Dr. Moin uh, uh, is on the way. Okay, fine. So, so Dr. Zayed, Zayed can uh, do his talk. In the meantime, Dr. Moin will reach the venue. Dr. Zayed will speak on FTRD for GI lesions, optimal indications, correct technique. Good evening. So, uh, I'll restrict my talk to only device-assisted full thickness resection, optimal indications and correct technique. So, uh, there are two types of uh, EFTR that can be performed. One is exposed or the conventional means you resect the full lesion using your knife and finally close the defect using any of the available techniques to you. And the second is device-assisted which will be uh, uh, the focus of my talk. A device assisted also called as non-exposed means you initially secure the lesion and finally uh, after securing you snare the lesion either, either using an FTRD device or also it can be performed using a Gerdex device. So two types of uh, the uh, full thickness resection device uh, available one is for colonic use which is 21 millimeter in diameter and one is for endoscopic use which is recently available and also called gastrodudinal FTRD. The length of the cap is similar. It has a pre-mounted snare. It has a clip. And you can also see that you get a balloon also when you are doing a gastrodurnal FTRD, like we saw yesterday, that there is a balloon which can be used to dilute pylorus or uh, the cricopharynx area. So the technical specifications of both the devices, if you see uh, only the diameter is the main thing that differs. The inside diameter of the cap, which is very important and which also determines that how much tissue can be grasped inside, is you can see it's only 12.1. So it does not mean that it's, uh, uh, it's a suitable device for lesions of all the sizes. So there has, uh, the device has some limitations and within those limitations you have to use the device. So what is all which is available uh, in the uh, pack? except for the tissue anchor, everything else is available in the whole packet. Uh, there is a high frequency probe for marking and hemostasis. Uh, there is a balloon. Uh, this balloon is 20 millimeter uh, diameter and 60 millimeter in length. Then there is a clip set. You have a grasper and you have a tissue anchor which is especially useful for pulling the lesions in stomach. So there's, a, there's also something called proof cap. Suppose you, you don't know or you have a doubt that this lesion will come inside the cap and all, whether I can resect this lesion or not. So there is a testing cap, which is called proof cap, which has the same dimensions as the gastrodurnal. So you can just apply, fix this cap to your scope and go inside and see if you can pull the lesion inside the cap. And after that, you can load the device because loading the device and all, it takes some time, it's a tedious effort. So to save that, if the lesion is not going to come uh, within this uh, proof cap, you can avoid or abandon that case. So what are the upper GI indications? These are mainly the upper GI indications, non-lifting adenomas less than 30 millimeters, Duodenal subepithelial lesions, you saw Nilay doing a case. I think that was an ideal case for gastroduodenal FTRD uh, device. Uh, gastric subepithelial lesions, uh, only 15 millimeter or less should be included because the mucosa is very thick. So if you take larger lesions, there is a risk of incomplete resections. And more importantly, what are the contraindications for using this device? If the lesion is close to papilla, if it is within two centimeter of the papilla, you should avoid it. If the patient is having coagulopathy and you shouldn't use this device uh, at stenotic areas. So how to prepare the device? This is just a short video and uh, just to show you that what are the tips and tricks to optimally place. See how the fingers and where to tighten the loop. So once you have placed it to some distance, you just see this thread. This thread should lie in parallel to this channel. So and once you, you have ascertained that, you fix it completely. And finally, see these semilunar walls. They should come close to the scope. And then the next step, you pull. You see the grasper, you pull gently within. And finally, once you have pulled it, you fix this grasper with one hand. And you ask your resistant to maintain the position of the scope. Finally, you rotate it. So the device is fired, see the ring fires forward. 
moves forward, you can see the white ring moves forward and at this point you can ask your assistant to close the snare. So marking around the lesion is a must. Dilate the pylorus if you are dealing with a duodenal lesion and esophageal intubation with balloon and guide wire if the patient is, is not a, a well-built patient, a thin patient, ideally you should use a balloon. So let's see how the case is done. This is one of the cases. Uh, you can see first we see the position of the papilla relative to the lesion. We mark the lesion. We have already, uh, uh, we are dilating this uh, pyloric channel and you see once you have dilated, always cross uh, past the device over a guide wire, never without a guide wire because the risk of perforation is very high. Finally, you reach to the site of the lesion. These marks will help you in identifying uh, the, the lesion proper and then you grasp the lesion, bring it in and use gentle suctioning. If you do excess suctioning, there may be risk of entrapment of nearby organs, so you should avoid it. And finally, you close it and you can pull the lesion. Finally, you inspect the lesion, have you resected or not, and then if there is any bleeding, you can control then and there itself. In stomach, uh, it's very important, don't choose large lesions because stomach gastric mucosa is very thick and there is a high risk of incomplete resection. Rest of the thing is same, only uh, in cases you are not able to grasp the lesion, you can use this anchor to push inside the lesion and open it, so th which is very helpful in pulling the lesions inside. So this is the only difference when you are dealing with a uh, gastric lesion. Finally, what to do post-procedure? Single shot of antibiotic, oral liquids on the evening of intervention. Second look, in case you have resected a duodenal lesion because there is a high risk of delayed bleed and a PPI for two to four weeks. So technical failure is mainly due to poor selection of cases. These are two cases where I failed because I failed to realize that this is a gastric gist and this is more than two centimeters. So uh, this I could not resect. The second is a duodenal gist. Again, I could not, I could have used a proof cap, but then uh, that was the time when it was not available to us. So these were the two uh, patients where uh, I failed technically. So patient selection is the main criteria for. What are the potential complications? One is duodenal stenosis. If you cut too much of the mucosa, apply too much of the section, then sometimes what happens is that uh, you resect too much of the mucosa and there is a chance of luminal stenosis. And the second is delayed bleed. So you should always be cautious if there is any visible vessel, you can pre-coagulate it after you resect the lesion. So if you have to remove the, the uh, over the scope clip, which, which is uh, the case in 50% of the cases, the clip may remain in place even after several months. You can use this DC cutter device to remove the clip, which is very easy. So this is my uh, last slide. Uh, this is another device which is used for management of GERD, but this can also be used to, uh, to get a full thickness resection of these lesions. You just apply it to pledgets. Once you apply it to pledgets, you can use a snare to uh, cut this lesion in full thickness. So this is another interesting area and I think for which uh, work is being done. So whether what uh, procedure to choose depends on the location of the lesion. So one technique does not fit all. So you should remember that there are many techniques available. What technique to use? Each technique has its advantages and disadvantages. But as of now, we are using FTRD device for intraluminal lesions which are up to two centimeter in size. Thank you. Dr. Moen has yet not reached here, so we could have some discussion. Any questions, floor as well as the chairpersons? Sir, one question, sir. Uh, Navi, sir, can we put uh, the e e EFTRD for a lesion within two centimeter of the ampulla while putting a CBD stand and PD stand so that we can secure the drainage of both uh, biliary and pancreatic? No. So, uh, why? Uh, because, uh, uh, look, uh, it's, it's likely because this has a very big and strong jaws. It's, okay. It will entrap your stent in everything. It will, like, uh, I don't feel that uh, this device should be used. This, in fact, this is one of the few strict contraindications for use of uh, uh, full thickness resection device. Nothing close to ampulla.
Uh, Dr. Prabir, uh, this uh, regarding the gas complications, now we have seen few patients, almost uh, many patients develop uh, peritoneum, pneumoperitoneum or capnoperitoneum, but a few patients develop surgical emphysema also. And those patients, they don't develop capnoperitoneum. So are there any predicting factors which patients will develop uh, surgical emphysema? Uh, uh, I don't think, Sandeep, I have a very good answer for that, but uh, what uh, I showed you in one of the slides, the way the gas of the CO2 travels. So if you see that, I think all these potential spaces are connect connected with each other. So which way it will go, it depends upon what site we are operating upon or dissecting, dissecting upon. So what you are saying is absolutely correct. Subcutaneous emphysema develops in other patients, while in other patients you have just pneumoperitoneum. Uh, uh, so, uh, which subset will develop what complication of these? Uh, I, I don't think we have a definite answer for that. Thank you. No, 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 no. I think we But does the uh, subcutaneous emphysema has got a, a uh, more serious complications than? Uh, uh, this is question uh, to Dr. Dr. Jahir. Uh, Hello. Uh, just, just, I think subcutaneous emphysema, as I showed it, almost always resolves in around 24 to 48 hours. Does not need any intervention. Question to Dr. Jahir. Uh, while doing FTRD, whenever you are sucking, there is a lot of uh, trickling of water, obscuring your vision. How to rectify that? Is there any way to fix it, some of that, that problem? Uh, I'll say yes and no both. Uh, your first attempt is your best attempt. If you fail in first attempt, what happens is there is a bit of bleed. There is no exit for, uh, the cap is designed in such a way that there is no exit for water or uh, uh, debris, whatever you suck in. First of all, suction should be minimized because uh, in fact, uh, the company recommends uh, practically no suctioning at all. But what we have observed is without uh, a gentle suction, it's, it becomes sometimes impossible to pull the lesion entirely into the cap. So we use a mix of both gentle suctioning and pulling. We always uh, make sure that we have caught the lesion uh, to a good extent. Suppose if you are not sure that you have caught the lesion in, in, uh, to a good extent, you have not caught a good major chunk of the tissue, it will tear off, there will be some bleed obscuring the entire vision. You already have a uh, very tunnel vision because uh, the cap is so deep, it does not allow you a very wide vision. So first attempt should be the best attempt and uh, you, should, you should try to finish it off in your first go. So that is the only thing. Otherwise, it becomes a semi-blind procedure where you don't see. Uh, right. Becomes uh, most of the times. Uh, I did two cases, but it becomes most of the time it's a blind procedure. It's at a semi-blind. Yes, yes, yes. It cannot be uh, entirely blind because you, when you are uh, marking and you are catching the lesion, so that that is your eye. And once you are sure that you have caught the right uh, thing and you are pulling it in. If you use suction, definitely it's going to be more and more blind because suctioning will obviously suck fluid in uh, a part of blood mixed uh, fluids which will obscure your vision further. And that is the reason that uh, excess suctioning should be avoided to keep your vision very clear. We can have more questions because Dr. Moin is, will be here any moment. Uh, just and now, even the judges are on the way for FTRD the last session. was done for uh, NET in the duodenal cap. It appears that there is a duodenal stenosis because I don't know it, it was because of edema, whether it is going to resolve or because a good amount of uh, uh, <clears throat> mucosa was sucked in. Will it resolve on its own or it, it, it requires uh, the, the case which was done today? Or? Yeah, right, just now. Okay, so I, I think it, it uh, sorts out with time. In fact, we had a couple of cases where uh, we had difficulty even in negotiating scope across the clip into the door. No? But what we have found is it, it uh, as the days pass by, we keep, him, keep the patient on modified diet, it opens up very nicely. In fact, there was near total occlusion in one case. Uh, we did nothing. We just placed in nasogenual tube. That was the only experience uh, I had of to near total lumen occlusion. 
and after a couple of weeks it opened up completely so i think it's just a matter of time it never completely uh, uh, covers up excludes them occludes them because sorry when you take compare sing the nima petroleum is it always on the right upper contrary or that is the second option no definitely uh, there, there are many places it's in fact uh, what i have seen is uh, some people like to do it uh, just below them like us and uh, it's like you you find the maximum tympanic note and you can put your needle there and in fact many people don't prefer it in right upper quadrant they 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 prefer a more central location for decompressing Mr. Anand, can you just find out whether the live case can come on the main screen? Uh, I mean, if you ask us to, I can get uh, Dr. Asma on. Yeah, Dr. Asma. You would like it? Okay, right. Uh, Uh, Vijay, yeah, full screen. One minute. We'll just give Dr. Asma a microphone. Hi, uh, this is a rectal lesion which showed like first biopsy showed like hyperplastic polyp and re repeated one saw some adenomatous tissue and then we decided because you can see here that there is some inflammatory component and um, but the biopsy showed some adenoma then they decided to take it by ESD and block. We have started doing the uh, we start doing the mucosal incision from the retroflexion side because we arranged to do like a tunneling technique. Uh, started here from the cecal side and then started from like the anal side and trying to catch the tunnel together. But you can see here because of the inflammatory component and rectal lesion, there is a lot of blood vessels here we're facing. And see how big is the blood vessels, uh, the hemorrhoids, uh, plexus. Yeah, I think they are very huge vessels. Yeah. It's a lot of fibrotic component. And the submucosal plane is somewhere uh, below the lesion which is fibrosed. And uh, looking at the surrounding inflammation, I feel that and the lesions which we see in retroflexion, probably Nitrate. this is uh, inflammatory uh, polyposis, Nitrate. that is what I presume. Uh, who is there on the chair there in the auditorium? I think we have Dr. Wadwa there. Raju. Dr. Nabi, Dr. Nabi is there in the chair. Yeah, Jahir. Yes, yes. What do you feel? So, I, 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 in my opinion, it doesn't look to be an adenom adenomatous. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Not something which uh, demands uh, endoscopic submucosal dissection. Yeah. Uh, and at actually what we see in retroflexion to me, it appears to be inflammatory cap polyposis. Ah, it looks, it has it a… It looks inflammatory yeah. even to me. Yeah. So, I was of the opinion that we should do an EMR. Yeah, uh, oh, the, the only thing is if those vessels can be avoided… Uh, yeah, 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 I think they can be, they can be because uh, it is going to be a tough job uh, tackling all these vessels. Yeah. Asthma provoked for hybrid uh, ESD to Nile and I think uh, the same can be done to her. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, no, this is uh, something… Uh, <coughs> 
and i don't think r0 resection is is uh, is it should be the re really be the aim here because uh, it's, it's, it's all fibrosis in such benign fibrosis. lesions yes. uh, it's it's only the safety concerns oh okay zahir i'll take your opinion and do the i put the snare also i was resisting pankaj of putting the snare <laughs> and trying to take it all in block yeah so but uh, <coughs> let's inject inject first snare, with snare. The, 25 mm snare well, i'm just thinking to inject again more or okay, inject with the with an with a needle, yeah. Okay, yes. Inject in retroflexion and then remove it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, learning lessons are a lot for the people sitting in the crowd. Yeah. Uh, what to do, when to do, when not to do, most important. And don't be adamant. Be ready. Be flexible to change your decisions. Uh, depending Pankaj, on the situation you come in, yeah. Pankaj, Dr. Moin has arrived. We can carry on with the lecture over please, here. Please, please go yeah, ahead. Yeah, please yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, apologies, uh, Pune traffic. It took a while. So this is, uh, I think you've seen and you've heard about uh, most of the things I want to cover today. It is about closure of uh, gastrointestinal defects. So the way I think about this is uh, we, we have our basic tools as first tier, and these are the clips, the regular, these uh, through the scope clips, over the scope clips, and stents. Second tier, we talk about, talked about suturing. We talked a little bit about vacuum, and you saw the case by Amol, and I'll talk a little bit more. I'm not gonna show you this, but everybody needs to learn how to tap or evacuate pneumoperitoneum. So if you have a perforation, this is what kills patient on the table. So you want to evacuate the pneumoperitoneum right away. And you saw today just using, using an angiocatheter, a needle, or a uh, varus needle, they all work. <clears throat> we talked a little bit about using through the scope clips. There's still a big role, an important role. You saw lectures about closing full thickness colonic defects with through the scope clips. This is a full thickness esophageal perforation from a pneumatic dilation, and you can uh, close with through the scope clips. As long as you can oppose both edges, and as long as the edges are healthy. If the mucosa is not healthy, the clip is not going to stay. So if uh, the edges are not healthy, then you may want to consider larger clips, like the Ovesco clip, to get healthy tissue within the clip, or suturing. This is the over-the-scope clip. You saw some examples. This is a patient that had a perforation, uh, was, I think, an EUS scope. You see, it's a huge perforation. But even with that, you can use the Ovesco clip. It comes with, there is a twin grasper that has independent prongs that you can open right and left, but they're not easy to use and they're not rotatable. So we do a lot of suctioning. So what you should do is get a cap on the scope and do a test suction and use this peritoneal fat when you see it. It's like the patch that surgeons use to clo close perforated ulcers. So use this to your advantage. Even if it's a large perforation, you can use the fat to occlude large perforations using a standard over-the-scope clip. So that allows you to use to close perfor large perfor perforations like this. And you have to be mindful of the lumen. There are several reported cases of closing the entire lumen with the ovescoscope with the Ovesco clip. So be aware of that. Suturing, we talked about the overstitch, <clears throat> uh, which is an over-the-scope suturing device. It's a large instrument. So when the tower is open like this, the width is 25 millimeter. When it's closed, it's 15.5 millimeter. But we can uh, close full thickness, uh, we can provide full thickness closure. Here's some examples of something we see all the time, like these uh, gastrocutaneous fistulas from PEC tubes. 
So this works very well. There are a lot of suturing patterns we can use. You're seeing here that we are just pulling the gastric wall fully and making sure we're grasping muscle. So very important is not to put sutures through the mucosa because once you pull the suture, tying, tying the suture down, you're just going to uh, basically slough off the mucosa. There are a lot of suturing patterns, and we can do multiple layers. So here we did first layer, and then we're doing a second layer on top. As you know, and the, the outcomes of closing fistulas is worse than closing leaks and perforations. So multi-layer suturing, uh, in my opinion, works. This is another suturing technique uh, that I call the internal-external suturing. So first we APC, and then this is a trocar with a needle. We insert a, this is uh, the spy bite. We insert a point O suture. We need a strong suture. Then on the other side, needle, trocar, grasp the suture and come out. So you're providing a full thickness bites on both sides and then you tie it on the outside. You can either do multiple bites or make it smaller and then use an adjunctive technique such as the Ovesco. But if the angle is favorable, you can do multiple bites using the percutaneous suturing technique. We talked about the through the scope suturing or the X tag. As I mentioned, you can uh, dig it into the wall by 3.5 millimeters. And here I'm just gonna show you closure of a fistula. This is post-edge procedure. U.S. directed gastrointestinal, sorry, U.S. directed transgastric ERCP. So root and Y gastric bypass ERCP. And this is through the gastrogastric stent. So after removal of the stent, there still remains a fistula. So we ablate the fistula with APC and then using the same scope, which is the gastroscope, we take bites in a figure of eight fashion here. So you don't have to change scopes. If you're using the overstitch, you have to use a double channel scope. And then we just pull the suture and then cinch it. Cinch it. So it works extremely well for this. EVT, you already saw this yesterday. This is from the Yoga de Mura, uh, from the same center that you saw yesterday. So typical NG tube, you put a gauze, and then is, this is a surgical drape. By the, by the way, the reason for this, the surgical drape, is to ensure that the gauze does not stick to the wall. And also, it makes it easy to insert it transnasally. You have to, of course, puncture the, the, uh, that surgical material, and then test it, make sure there is enough suction, and then insert it through the nose. You can put it inside the cavity, or you can put it just uh, in the esophageal lumen or the gastric lumen, depending on uh, the case itself. This is a nice example of an upper esophageal perforation from a foreign body. We've seen also perforations after Ovesco, after uh, overtubes from z -poem, and very hard to close. So this technique of vacuum treatment works extremely well for this, uh, for this uh, kind of pathology. And you can, you'll see here the white scar healed very well within a few weeks. Another example of Really good use of this vacuum therapy is post-sleeve leaks, gastric sleeve. Very hard to close with suturing and Ovesco because of the angulation. Uh, so you put EVT here inside the lumen and apply suction, remove the EGD scope. And again, these work extremely well. And you see how it healed very well. The last slide, I want to show you this septal occluder device, or the Amplatzer, that is used to close ASDs and VSDs in the heart. We can use it as a plug for refractory fistulas. So these are the fistulas that we've used everything on, 
and nothing works, so you plug them. This is, you can uh, insert this through a sigmoidoscope because the sigmoidoscope is shorter than an EGD scope and a larger channel, it has a 3.2 millimeter channel. So this fits through and gets out and very nicely uh, you can deploy it. See, it looks like an Axios but without a lumen, but this works uh, very well. That's all I have for you today. Thank you for your attention. Any discussion? Any more questions? If there are no questions, then we can uh, thank the speakers and the panelists. Thank you, sirs. And we move to the last session, which is the competitive video forum. So may I please call the judges for the video forum, uh, Dr. Noria, Dr. Yoji, Dr. Moin, you would have to stay. Dr. Prasad Ayer, I believe Asma is still in the case. Dr. Amol has not come, but he will uh, take the adjudication of the judges. Dr. Matthew Philip and Dr. Rajesh Puri. Dr. Matthew Philip and Rajesh Puri are chairpersons. Good evening after the wonderful uh, live demonstrations and talks and uh, uh, we had a wonderful discussion on every aspect of uh, third space, cases as well as its complications as well as all details. So let us have the uh, speakers first. <clears throat> if somebody can give us the list of the cases and the speakers or you can just call upon. So it is shown there. So can we have Dr. Sri Hari Anikshindi from Gangaram Hospital? Time limit is kept? Yeah, okay. So try to finish in uh, correct time. So, a very good evening to the respected judges and this august audience. I bring greetings from Sir Gangaram Hospital and I shall be presenting my case of an early gastric cancer and decompensated cirrhosis, which we removed using ESD and closed it with ESD and lip clip closure. So, our case was a 53-year-old male with child B cirrhosis, CTP of 8, with significant portal hypertension. He had mild to moderate ascites with an INR of 1.7 and a platelet count of 47,000. On a screening endoscopy, which we were doing it for uh, cirrhosis, we saw large esophageal varices, but there was also a polyp which was biopsy proven to be a malignant polyp. It was an early gastric cancer, zero one. And pre-operative staging, we did a triple phase CT abdomen and a CT thorax, which showed no metastatic disease. On the US, it appeared to be a superficial lesion with no involvement of the uh, muscularis propria. So we contemplated the treatment options. Obviously, surgery was out because this was a patient with decompensated cirrhosis. FTRD was contemplated, but putting in a 20 millimeter device in this patient with large esophageal varices was uh, challenging and we thought it would lead to bleeding. EMR was thought of an option, but uh, as we know, the end block resection rates with an EMR might not be very optimal. And this resection chance was the only chance that we had with this patient because a redo, redo surgery would not have been possible. So we decided to go ahead with ESD of this lesion. So uh, we uh, did a pocket uh, method for uh, ESD. The injectate uh, which was used was uh, gelofusine and indigo carmine. Uh, the accessories used were uh, dual knife from Olympus. And for, uh, the, uh, for larger vessels, a coag grasper was used. 
and the mode used was endocut 1 with an effect of 2 uh, with an RB cautery. Here we can see the submucosal lift being created and we uh, could have a good submucosal lift. So uh, one of the reasons why we also chose ESD over an EMR because we thought that uh, the vessels could be visible and we could do a planned controlled dissection in this patient. Considering the coagulopathy and the severe thrombocytopenia, there was definitely a risk of bleed. And though uh, literature mentions the ESD having higher risk of uh, bleeding, but theoretically uh, it could be a more controlled procedure over an EMR, which would be a blinded procedure. The larger vessels were uh, coagulated and with a uh, coag grasper. and the lesion could be completely removed and there was uh, no significant bleeding during the procedure. Even minor bleed bleeds were also very minimal and the entire lesion could be removed in total. Now closure of this defect was very vital because obviously we were dealing with a patient who had severe thrombocytopenia and coagulopathy. And uh, so these were the varices that you can see in this patient. So we went in with a loop and clip closure because the post TSD defect was relatively large. It was around two centimeters. We used the loop and clip closure through our conventional single channel scope. There was one of the questions from the audience uh, whether how we can do it with a single channel scope. This is how we did it. Uh, you use the endo loop and take it across with a clip hook to it and then would apply the endo loop across all the margins of the defect. And finally, when the loop was grasped, we could see that there was a complete closure, uh, that was a very good closure of the entire uh, ESD defect. The patient was discharged after uh, day two. There was an, uh, no uh, intraoperative or postoperative complications. A good R0 resection was achieved. And uh, in the review of literature, there has been a recent uh, published paper where the single centered uh, study where more than 150 patients with cirrhosis have undergone an endoscopic resection, including an ESD. And it has been seen that it is a fairly safe procedure, highly effective, with adverse event rate of around 6.1%, which might not be significantly high as compared to normal. Thank you so much. Now it is open for questions. Uh, Judges kindly. Did you consider like ban the EMR? Like uh, th three minutes? Yeah, it, it was, we did consider a banned EMR in this case, but uh, as I said, sir, uh, we were not very sure if you would have an N block resection because this was a patient with decompensated cirrhosis and this was the only option that we had. So con considering that the R0 resection rates with an ESD are much better with a ESD as compared to an EMR, we thought uh, we should go ahead with an ESD because the patient was scheduled for a transplant. He was undergoing a, a workup for a transplant, and if this lesion would have been there, then uh, obviously he would be left out of candidature for a transplant. No NBA pictures were shown, and what was the NBA picture on that? And the lesion is so small, do you think uh, EMR would have been sufficient? Uh, the lesion is, what is the size of the lesion? So the uh, lesion size was around eight millimeters. I think the, your, uh, the closure method is your uh, point, point of, uh, in, in your presentation. So, uh, so what is the nobility of the uh, closure method? Did it what, what is new in this uh, you want to convey? How is so, it different from uh, any other? So, uh, so this was basically an ESD in a patient with decompensated cirrhosis. One of the points which we considered was whether we could actually do an ESD with a patient with such a decompensated cirrhosis and we could achieve a complete R0 resection without any major adverse events. And the closure obviously could not have been possible with conventional clipping. We went in with a, a loop and clip closure 
uh, a good closure of the mucosal defect, defect was very uh, paramount. And I think this was the best possible method that we had to ensure a pro proper closure of the mucosal defect. Any questions from the audience? We have one more minute. Uh, one question, uh, the patient has an INR of 1.7 and platelet level also low. So have you transfused the patient with platelets and FFP? So we had kept uh, FFP and platelets ready. During the procedure, we infused a single donor platelet infusion. And the FFP was not required. There was no bleeding intraoperative or postoperative. And the patient did pretty well. And uh, uh, what, uh, have you used uh, this tag, Rotem and tag in your patients? No, we, we did not do in this patient. Okay, so just want to ask, uh, uh, can be removed and should be removed are two different things. In a decompensated serotic early gastric cancer, so lifespan in a case with the early gastric cancer and lifespan in a case with decompensated so cirrhosis. So this was a 55-year-old male with child B cirrhosis and because they, he was a good candidate, he had a very good performance status, he was a candidate for transplant and transplant was contemplated. If transplant was not contemplated and he would have been severely decompensated, obviously there was no point in removing this lesion. But because of the planned transplant, obviously this had to be resected and this lesion had to be out. That was why uh, we went ahead with the resection. Thank you, Srihari. I think uh, we'll move to the next case. Uh, can I invite Dr. Madhurya Prasad Suman from Coimbatore? <coughs> On a case of rectal tubular villus adenoma. You have five minutes for a presentation and three minutes for discussion. Uh, my video is actually 5.3 minutes. I submitted it earlier. So just. Uh, I have, this is a case of a fairly straightforward case of a endoscopic ESD of a rectal submucosal uh, dissection. So this is a JNET type 2A to 2B and there's an amorphous area showing that there could be deeper involvement. So we did a radial uh, EUS which showed the muscularis propria all along in the entire plane to be free. That is why we proceeded with an ESD. So it was a 3 by 4 centimeter uh, rectosigmoid junction lesion. and uh, you can, we, we are injecting a mix of carboxymethyl cellulose, indigo carmine, saline, and there's very good uh, lift of the lesion, uh, giving us a relief to start the procedure. So I'm using a TTJ knife. I'm attempting the pocket technique here because I find that the fluid stays inside and gives me a good dissecting plane. And I have not done the proximal dissection. I am only proceeding with the distal because I feel that it holds the fluid inside more. So they are uh, using the coag grasper to coagulate the vessel. And uh, just by injecting, actually the fibers, the submucosal fibers played and moved away and uh, gave me a very good tunnel to get into. And every time I kept checking the proximal extent to see where, where I was, just measuring internally and externally, just to know if I'm done. So it, uh, doing a tunnel like the poem is, makes it a very easy and fast procedure and brought down the duration of the procedure by it made one third. Usually it used to take me three hours, but this we could complete it in just one hour and 20 minutes. And uh, I just felt that it was adequately dissected and uh, checked the extent on this side and uh, the other side, the proximal side. So then proceeded with the lateral dissection using the IT nano knife because I felt I, I, I always feel it protects us, the muscular layer and uh, as Professor Oido pointed out sticking to the deeper submucosal plane to avoid the vessels
and uh, we prefer just to leave the defect open uh, so we um, we find we we check on it at uh, 24 hours and after one week and we find that it's all right and uh, follow up the patient so here again i'm using the ttj knife to complete the dissection Uh, the final part, uh, using the IT nano knife, I encountered a vessel there, so that's a spurt. Trying not to go close to the tumor and keep closer to the muscle plane to give a complete dissection. It's almost done. I just skip. That's the defect. So we're inspecting the defect for vascularity. Then we use an endoscopic collagen spray, which uh, we feel that it activates both the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways and helps healing and also prevents delayed bleeding. We, we prefer to use it in our cases. It's a product from Shiley Endoscopy. And uh, that brings me to then. And then uh, it, it was completely resected. It was a villous adenoma high grade and all, all uh, areas were completely dissected. Thank you. It's a very straightforward case. Thank you. Now it's open for questions. We have time for two minutes for questions. <clears throat> Judges, please. Audience. Maybe a similar question. So currently, what is the indication for ESD versus EMR in your practice? So uh, we felt that some areas were looking a bit amorphous, mm -hmm. and so we thought that it could be bordering on a JNET 3, 2B to 3. Mm -hmm. So after making sure the muscular plane was completely OK, we, we proceeded with an ESD. Uh, we don't have that much experience with uh, doing a EMR, so we usually proceed with ESD. Okay. What would you have done? Usually, yeah, under, underwater EMR. Underwater EMR. Mm. But isn't there increase, just to play the devil's advocate here, isn't there increased risk of cancer in rectal lesions with a big sessile component? Mm -hmm. yes. mm, but I think there's no such kind of evidence so far. So mm. we just. I think we have to wind up. Thank Any you. other Thank questions you, you have? Thank you, Kirsten. Yep, yep. So, so what's the indication? For ESD, for 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 what polyps uh, do you perform ESD, and especially in the rectum? Rectum, rectum. The twist is regarding the size. The twist larger than two cm. That region is not so large, I think. And uh, the morphology, we need to consider the morphology and uh, uh, how how we suspect the invasive cancer. So. Totally, we should uh, judge. At least the size is probably important. So maybe okay. one more one more question is about using the TT knife for ESD. Um, so why why would you why did you choose to use that for ESD? I find that um, I find it more convenient to use. We're so used to it. But when I don't see the you know the proximal part, I prefer when I cannot see the proximal part, I switch to the IT nano knife. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we would always appreciate uh, when you can show us the narrowband imaging pictures also. That will actually tell us. Uh, I started okay. yeah. with that. Yeah, I understand. Always knows better. You. Anyway, thank you so much. I thank think, you, you know, you. Uh, we move on to the third case that is uh, by Jahangir Pasha. <coughs> Jahangir is from Hyderabad? Yeah, I'm from yes. AG Hyderabad. So, uh, good evening. I thank Dr. Amol Bapai sir and the entire team for giving the opportunity and thank you judges and chairpersons. So, uh, we are discussing uh, a case which uh, we did uh, recently. So, he is a patient. So, he is a 62-year-old gentleman with a large subepithelial lesion. 
So the lesion is arising from the muscularis propria on EUS. So we planned endoscopic resection. So uh, in view of expected large defect, we started STIR. So this is the endoscopic view where the lesion is in the fundus. We can see and confirm on both the CT and also on PET. So this lesion you can see it is below the G junction and uh, few centimeters only. So initially we did marking and also uh, we started the initial incision in the lower esophagus few centimeters above the G junction. After the incision, we entered into the tunnel. This is the submucosal dissection we are doing here. After doing a few centimeters submucosal tunnel, we could not find the tumor. So again, we went back. We can see we actually we are going more towards the right side. And so what we did here is we injected a concentrated methylene blue just above the a tumor and again we entered into the tunnel we could see some methylene blue uh, marking here so we continued the dissection towards more lateral side but still we could not find the lesion here again we again cross checked here where we can see the direction is more close towards the tumor but it was not uh, uh, fruitful then what we did is we extend the submucosal incision one centimeter below and again we did uh, some submucosal dissection and extended the tunnel and we actually created one more tunnel in the same plane and we tried to identify the tumor but we could not and finally what happened here is after joining both the tunnels we could not identify the lesion. So we abandoned the procedure, we closed the tunnel in view of not identifying the tunnel. So what we did is we immediately shifted the patient to the surgical theater. We discussed with the surgical colleagues and also to the patient attendants where we adopted a hybrid procedure by doing endo lap approach. These are the laparoscopic ports that have been placed here. And subsequently, we started endoscopic full thickness resection here. And what we did is initially, the scope actually is in the retroflex position. Initially, we uh, after injecting, we are doing uh, incision around the tumor and we can see here a slightly exposed tumor here, a careful submucosal dissection was attempted and we are trying to not breeze the capsule because it's very important because most of the times this is a gist and we are doing the submucosal dissection carefully and we are continuing the dissection all around the tumor margins so that we can expose the tumors carefully. And this is the tumor we are seeing. And you can see majority of the tumor bulk after exposing. What we did is here we have made a further uh, dissection to completely expose. Here we did a deliberate, a purposeful, uh, complete full thickness hole. So that because it's completely attached to the muzzle here. So there is no other option. So uh, anyway, we have a backup of surgery here. So we made a full thickness uh, resection. We detached the tumor. tumor and also what we are doing is the residual tumor, all margins were resected and the tumor is completely exposed and we can see this is the last step where we are trying to completely detach the tumor from the gastric wall. So you can see here the tumor is detaching here. So it is the complete detachment of the tumor. That this is the final uh, step of detachment. Yeah. Now you can see the tumor is completely separated and subsequently our laparoscopic surgeon colleague came into the picture. So he first what he did is he completely closed the defect here because uh, we tried removal endoscopically but it was not possible because of the edema and also the previous clips. Even the surgical accessories were rigid and could not uh, retrieve the specimen. So first a complete closure of the defect was done. To retrieve the specimen, a uh, uh, separate incision was made in a very convenient position where we can see a full uh, complete uh, resection was made in the gastric wall. And you can see the scope and also the gastric lumen here. And subsequently, they brought a specimen collecting bag here and specimen was collected and securely placed in the bag here. This is to avoid the spillage in the peritoneum. So after that, a complete closure of the defect was made here. And we can see the defect was completely closed. And this is the final step where securely we brought out the specimen. This is the final resected specimen here. 
So this is just a overview of hybrid endolaparoscopic procedures. In exposed tumors where we can do a uh, traditional way, what we can do here is the same way what we did. In non-exposed techniques, there are two techniques described. In clean NET, the tumor is actually pushed outside and subsequent laparoscopic resection was done. In another technique, the tumor is actually wall inverted with the backup of a muzzle so that uh, combined EHD also can be performed. Thank you. I think uh, we have time for uh, questions. One minute. Can I ask a question? So uh, what was a pre-treatment uh, pre diagnosis? Histological diagnosis. So the pre-treatment diagnosis, the lesion is arising from the fourth layer, muscularis yes. propria and US. We thought it was a gastrointestinal stomal tumor, gist. gist. But, uh, Even the post-resection also, it turned out uh, gist only. According to our experience, usually tunneling resection, uh, you know, working space is very narrow. So for example, like a gist, uh, it usually damages the capsule. So yes. I think just export through thickness resection or maybe tumor is larger than three centimeters. So I think it's very difficult to retrieve from the mouth. So maybe combination therapy like a clean net or something would be better yes. indication. So I think what you learned here is that, uh, and I think that uh, they spoke about it, in the fundus, you cannot tunnel towards the fundus. Okay. Yes. So you can tunnel maybe in the cardiac lesions, in some of the cardiac lesions like lesser curvature, but in the fundus you just can't tunnel. So you have to go full thickness resection. And for very big lesions that you can't retrieve uh, through the mouth, usually UES or the upper esophagus, you have to make, make sure in elderly people you can actually injure the, the, uh, the esophagus. Uh, so one technique is to leave the tumor in the stomach for 24 hours and you go retrieve it the next day it will be shrunk in size. So that's one thing you can do. Um, question in the back, maybe one question. Could we have sutured it with the uh, Apollo Industries instead of doing a laparoscopic suturing? Uh, pardon, can you repeat the question again? No. Could we have sutured using the Apollo Industries instead of using the laparoscopic suturing? Yeah, that is also another option. The expected defect uh, would be large. We can uh, attempt a suture, but it is very high up in the fundus. Uh, so we thought angulation and closure attempt would make more difficult. We thought of uh, a laparoscopy would be more uh, secured and also the retrieval is also easy. The another problem with the suturing is retrieval of the specimen also uh, because the size is big. So because of these two reasons, we adopted a okay. hybrid approach. Thank you, Jahangir. We have no time for further yeah. questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We can have discussion later. We are running out of time. Uh, thank you so much. Can we call upon next speaker, that's Dr. Ganesh Shipi. Uh, very uh, very good, uh, good evening to the dignitaries present here. I, I bring a warm greetings from Department of Hepatology, PGH, Chandigarh. We will be discussing about uh, management of post splenectomy gastric perforation in this uh, case. Uh, we don't have any disclosures. Uh, post splenectomy gastric perforation is a rare entity which usually occurs in less than 1% of the cases. It usually occurs due to the ligation of the short gastric vessel during the surgery along the greater curvature of the stomach. Uh, most probably the etiology is mostly ischemic really, ischemia related and each, the management usually requires a complex re-exploratory surgery which is always associated with high morbidity. We got a patient who was a 31 year old male patient who underwent uh, emergency splenectomy in view of a sp shattered spleen in a road traffic accident. He presented to us three weeks later with the complaints of high spiking fever and pain in the left upper quadrant. And the CT imaging of the patient showed a subdiaphragmatic collection which was communicating with the gastric fundus. Unfortunately, we were not able to get a, a plural free space to place a percutaneous catheter in this uh, uh, collection. So, what we did is, we went ahead and performed an upper GI endoscopy in this patient where we can see a gastric perforation which was communicating freely with the subdiaphragmatic collection and necrotic materials coming through it. So we advanced the scope into the collection. We advanced the scope into the collection and we initially uh, saw the necrotic materials and pus coming out through the subdiaphragmatic collection and it was communicating with the body of the stomach. So we gave a thorough saline lavage to this. Then we went ahead and placed a ne nasocavitatory drain, nasocavitatory drain into it. 
by placing a naso cavitatory drain into it what we can what we achieved is that we started filling the cavity with the contrast and the uh, saline so we were able to push the cavity bit down and we attained a pleural free space and we placed a pictile catheter also so by doing this we achieved a multi gate drainage we were draining uh, through this pictile also and through this naso cavitatory drain which we placed also thereafter we intermittently started irrigating the naso cavitatory drain initially the necrotic materials was coming and gradually the drain got cleared then we started the patient on the oral fluids two days later patient fever started to resolve then after four days following this we went ahead and tried to close the uh, perforation but when we started to uh, apply the endoscopic clip the margin started to dehesce because as we know the etiology of this perforation is mostly ischemic the hernia we have a granulation tissue but it started dehiscing so the intention to close the perforation to the primary closure was up and done then we went ahead and placed a naso jejunal tube and started the patient in enteral feeding so what we did next the nasocystic drain was removed 5 days later when the percutaneous stain was showing no output uh, the patient was advised to continue on the nj feed the patient was also as asked to consume the colored fluid because whenever the patient consumed the colored fluid it could show out in the percutaneous drain uh, slowly gradually the drain uh, output also got nil a week later patient presented to us and he told that there was no drain uh, coming out through this uh, uh, collection and then uh, we uh, performed a relook UG endoscopy which showed a complete obliteration of the perforation by secondary intention by itself without placing any clips. Then we uh, went ahead and performed a repeat imaging and uh, with oral contrast. Here we can see the complete obliteration of the perforation. There is no extravasation of the dye and the residual collection are also completely obliterated. So concluding remarks of this case is delayed gastric perforation after spinectomy is a rare complication which is always comes late, uh, presents late to us. Endoscopic closure may appear to be uh, complex but adequately uh, draining the collection and uh, taking care of the patient's uh, feeding in a, in a otherwise healthy patient such as non-malignant patient and carefully selected patient, we can always achieve uh, good results. Thank you. It's open for uh, questions and we have three minutes for uh, judges, please. Why are you calling it a perforation? So we, you know, it's important to say, is this a leak? Is it a perforation? Is it a fistula? Right? So this happened three weeks afterwards. Three weeks it's later. not going into a free space. It's into a collection. Yes. Right? So maybe it's not a perforation. It's more of a leak. So did you consider uh, vacuum therapy? By the way, you guys did a great job. This, these are very difficult yes, patients, sir, and that was excellent job. This was uh, initially. So did, did you think of uh, vacuum yes, therapy? Yes, we initially considered for vacuum therapy, but uh, on the table we got this one and we proceeded with this, sir. Patient was presented to us in emergency. Means like from the emergency, we took the procedures. You know, the two two points I learned uh, from this is when you guys filled it, yes, sir. and allowed percutaneous drain. That's yes. one and two, monitoring the output by the patient uh, drinking yes. colored fluids. So these are very smart ideas. Good job. Thank you, sir. Can I can I make a question? See, uh, you have done an external drainage yes, that was not coming out well, but the naso jejunal naso biliary drain drained it better. How is it possible? Is it because of irrigation you've done through sir, the NASA? Uh, we, come, uh, we kept on irrigating the patient every four hourly, sir. So the, both the things helped. There's a multi-gate drainage which helped us most. Means yeah. like uh, the nasocystic drain was also helping us and uh, this percutaneous is dead. Multi-gate drainage helped in more sense. The external drain tube was small probably. I don't yes, sir, it was a 10 French pit type. Good, I think uh, sometimes uh, even doing not major things also will help, you know. Yes. That is the lesson for this. This is uh, in... <coughs> Good. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Now I will call upon the fifth presenter. This is Ashish Gandhi. Is he there? Uh, coming. Audio is on, no? audio. It is a pre-recorded video uh, with audio, voice over.
successful concomitant esophageal poem for hypercontractal esophagus and gastric poem for refractory gastroparesis in single stage manner with significant short term efficacy gi motility disorders encompasses wide and rare spectrum of diseases and advanced third space endoscopy has brought a paradigm shift in its management this case demonstrates successful concomitant endoscopic management for hypercontractal esophagus and refractory gastroparesis our case was a 70 year old male symptomatic since 4 months presenting with recurrent nausea vomiting reflux symptoms intermittent chest discomfort associated with meals persistent symptoms were noted despite being on ppi and prokinetics endoscopy showed dilated tortuous esophagus with significant amount of food stasis despite 14 hours of fasting additionally pylorospasm was noted wherein endoscope was passed across the pyloric ring with moderate resistance esophageal manometry showed high dci more than 17000 normal irp gastric emptying study showed significant retention 24% at 4 hours with t half of 129 minutes a contrast follow study showed cock screwing of esophagus high gci score of 31 was noted other work up including ct evaluation thyroid evaluation diabetes evaluation was unremarkable there was no history of opioid abuse working diagnosis was medically refractory idiopathic gastroparesis with hypercontractile esophagus medical management with ppi and prokinetics had failed and there was worsening of reflux symptoms with sildenafil in view of overlapping nature of symptoms there was a therapeutic challenge treatment of any one of the either diseases may lead to suboptimal clinical benefit which necessitated both addressing both the issues simultaneously a concomitant endoscopic management esophageal plus gastric poem was hence planned initially g poem was planned followed by esophageal poem scope was negotiable across pyloric ring with moderate resistance a vertical incision over the posterior gastric wall 5 to 6 cm proximal to the pyloric ring was taken following 2 cm incision scope was could be facilitated into the submucosal space with submucosal dissection and tunneling technique meticulous dissection was carried out larger vessels were encountered most of them were tackled using him using coag grasper forceps bluish hue discoloration in the duodenal bulb was noted which suggested completion of submucosal dissection intratunnel pyloric ring was identified with vertically extending duodenal mucosa accessory was switched to it2 knife to avoid any injury to the duodenal mucosa a vertical myotomy full thickness approximately 2 cm in length was then performed on luminal side pyloric ring can be seen wide open and there was no evidence of any duodenal mucosotomy mucosal incision was then closed using multiple disposable endoclips once g poem was completed esophageal poem was undertaken all the steps were followed in the conventional manner however only esophageal myotomy was carried out les was spared gastric side was not entered a full thickness esophageal myotomy corroborating with the spastic or hypercontractile segment noted on manometry was carried out capnoperitoneum was drained duration of g poem was 80 minutes and esophageal was 110 minutes patient was resumed on oral diet two days later and discharged three days post procedure overlapping symptoms posed a significant diagnostic and therapeutic challenge co-occurrence of these two rare disorders made this an exceptional case scenario poem has shown favorable results for spastic esophageal disorders in case reports and series whereas g poem 2 has shown durable efficacy with 60 to 80 percent success rates it was necessary to address both disorders simultaneously therefore endoscopic management was thoughtfully and logically one of the best therapeutic alternatives to patients rescue at 3 month follow up patient is near asymptomatic and has reportedly gained 2 kg weight follow up endoscopy at 1 month showed opened up pyloric ring with clips in c2 follow up manometry at 1 month showed absent hypercontractile segment post esophageal myotomy Contrast follow at 4 weeks showed absence of cock screwing of esophagus. Gastric emptying study at 3 month follow up 
showed normalization of gastric retention time. This case video demonstrates successful concomitant esophageal and gastric poem for hypercontractile esophagus with refractory gastroparesis in single state setting with significant short term efficacy. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, one thing is, your topic title was different and the video was different. You have talked about the sequel extract. No, sir, not sequel. Actually, uh, earlier a different presentation was put forth. Okay. This now case the, was pertaining. To okay. The house is open for the question, both from the audience as well as from the judges. Hello. Hi, Ashish. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Hi, ah, it was a great case. Uh, I have just two questions. One is that how did or how reliable is the assessment of delayed gastric emptying in the presence of an esophageal motility disorder, one. And second, did, how did you assess that it was a refractory gastroparesis? You mean that symptoms were refractory gastroparesis when the patient was already having a hypercontractile esophagus and there'll be overlapping symptoms? So actually, uh, it is based, uh, the symptoms earlier which I thought was predominantly due to gastroparesis, GCI score was high and there was no, uh, in Indian setting particularly we have gastric emptying study and the diagnosis more uh, based on the clinical symptomatology. Uh, there was significant food stasis despite 14 hours of fasting uh, which was going towards the gastroparesis thing and why uh, medically refractory because Three months, the patient was started initially on uh, prokinetics and PPI therapy. Uh, prokinetics were given acosiamide for three months, 100 milligram thrice daily dosing, uh, to which there was no significant symptomatic benefit. And that is how uh, I went with the thought of refractory gastroparesis. So, um, so I want to caution you with, with, with that assessment because the uh, gastric emptying is not reliable when with delayed esophageal emptying. So you can't say this was 20%. We never do it during the same session because of that. 70-year-old suddenly developing gastroparesis for no good reason, right? It's kind of weird. And also you see food stasis because there is delayed esophageal emptying. This is food in the esophagus and now it's in the stomach. So it doesn't mean it is stasis in the stomach. Technically that was excellent, but typically we separate them. So the other point is when you, now the esophagus is atonic and you're leaving a, a, a hype or a normal sphincter, there is a risk of a blown out myotomy. And that doesn't happen right away, you see it a year or two later and it has been reported. So that's why although there is a risk of reflux, we like to include the LAS within the myotomy. And uh, surely sir, uh, because uh, of the overlapping nature of symptoms, uh, addressing the issue in a separate manner or maybe first uh, esophageal poem and then if the patient tends to remain symptomatic then deeming it as a failure of esophageal poem versus whether the symptoms were particularly because of gastroparesis. So it was thought of that to address both issues in same setting. Uh, there are other issues too like patient uh, uh, like uh, follow up logistically it is difficult, economically it is difficult. So. Perform, performing it in a same setting where the anesthesia cost also come down for the patient at least in uh, this part of the country definitely uh, was the logical explanation or thought process behind performing both the procedures. Thank you. I think we have to move on. Thanks, uh, Ashish. Uh, Thank there you. are many questions, Thank but uh, <coughs> may I call upon the next speaker? Kunal Das, Dr. Kunal Das. Thank you uh, to the DMH. So I will be presenting a case of post poem delayed bleed, which was managed. Per oral myotomy has been developed a non incision minimally invasive endoscopic treatment. Common complications include delayed GI bleeding, mucosal injury, uh, gas related complications. Uh, so uh, we know that post operative delayed bleeding in poem occurs after 70, 48 to 72 hours. Despite the low incidence, delayed bleeding leads to serious complications, vomiting of fresh blood, uh, progressive serious retrosternal pain, and early manifestations. When delayed bleeding is suspected, emergency endoscopy should be performed immediately for exploration. 
Uh, major intraoperative bleeding requiring blood transfusion is usually rare, 0 to 0.1%. Management of genuine bleeding is not well de uh, defined. Both conservative management has been reported as well as endoscopic management includes re-entry into the submural tunnel. So we had a patient, a 30-year-old male with abnormal pain, uh, upper abdomen, nausea, vomiting, increased difficulty in swallowing with normal GI function uh, examination, hemogram, kidney function and liver function test were normal. Therefore, we went ahead with the upper GI endoscopy. The upper GI endoscopy shows that the esophagus was dilated, LES was hypertensive, and the scope entered the stomach with some difficulty. So we go, went ahead with the high-resolution manometry, which showed type 1 ecclesia. Uh, uh, the swelling matrix was such, IRP of 36.3, and uh, the next slide will show the uh, high-resolution manometry pictures. And then we started the endoscopy. Poem was done in a standard manner. We entered the, did the mucosal incision. And uh, thereafter, we entered the, uh, did the submucosal tunneling. The procedure was absolutely, went off uh, quite uh, well. After uh, the tunneling, we did the myotomy. And we came out and post procedure, we put the clips, there was no bleed, we waited. And the patient uh, was uh, uh, post procedure, had slight pain, but there was no uh, melina. And the patient was discharged on the day three of the poem. The patient also came uh, five days post poem. Uh, and was patient was eating, but on the date uh, 12th of patient presented with melina and had a drop of CBC. And therefore we admitted the patient and did an upper GI endoscopy. And we found that there was a large blood clot in the esophagus. Uh, we sucked out all the blood and we found that the incision side was uh, showing a slight ooze. And the blood transfusion done. Then we did as uh, per protocol a CT angio and a CT thorax. We were contemplating uh, the next step. So before we do, uh, this is the NCCT we showed, uh, which will show the, uh, there was blood in the, both the submucosal tunnel and the, there was interluminal blood. Then we uh, went ahead with the CT angio. The, in the CT angio, uh, we could see that there was a small uh, atriole which was coming from the aorta into the submucosal tunnel, which had a slight uh, blush also. So we were contemplating whether we should uh, go ahead and do the embolization or not. We decided to have a slight weight and weight approach because the patient was hemodynamically stable. And uh, we transfused uh, two units of blood and the hemoglobin increased to 12. And uh, post uh, patient was, we could discharge the patient post uh, after four days and patient uh, was eating uh, normally. And we called the patient uh, at uh, day 60 and we can see that the is esophagus was completely okay and the uh, uh, GI bleeding had stopped. So we, our case was a uh, ecclesia cardia, a young patient developed a post delayed bleeding on the uh, 12th post operative day, had a blood uh, drop of almost 4, but with uh, a weight and watt approach and uh, a masterly inactivity, the patient uh, improved, uh, and, but we were at the same time, we were ready for all things, uh, including opening of the submucosal tunnel, as well as uh, CT angiography and CT embolization. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> now it's open for questions uh, and comments from the judges and from the audience, chairpersons. So Kunal, this is very well presented. I, I just have a basic question. So we really don't have any direct proof that the bleeding happened in the tunnel, yes? Are uh, we presuming yeah. that to be the case? You didn't see a, you didn't see a collection on CT or active bleeding or anything like that? Yeah, so the CT angio showed the arteriole which was coming from the artery and at the end of artery there was some blush. So we can actively interpret it as a bleeding uh, due to the arteriole. So that's what we can say and 
Unfortunately for our patient and for myself that the patient, uh, the bleeding stopped on its own with uh, in, uh, inactive management only. So the, the arteriole was located where? The arteriole was uh, coming at the, uh, below the clips in the submucosal tunnel and yes. it was directly come from the outer and there was a blush. So with this information we can presume Yes, we didn't open up the uh, subosial tunnel and we have not seen the arterial bleeding uh, from our own eyes. That is the thing. Any comments from judges? So I think one essential thing with the endoscopy is to look at the healthy, healthiness of the mucosa. Because if you have a big hematoma and you cause mucosal ischemia, then it becomes an uh, emergency. You have to evacuate the tunnel. So you go in there's no more bleeding and the mucosa is healthy, this is when you should do nothing. So the idea of endoscopy also is to look at how healthy the mucosa is. And it appeared normal here. So it's, this is a spontaneous, a spontaneous arrest of bleeding, you know? The, is it because of the, uh, the hematoma piled up in the uh, tunnel that has produced a terminal effect? Probably, we can think that probably that is a cause. Hello. There is one question, Cook. Yeah. Even in this case, you did the CT angio after the endoscopy and you found a blush. It means there is active oozing at that time also. There is a drop of hemoglobin of 4. So I think it was not a good idea to go conservative in this patient because it, you cannot wait for another bleeding episode to occur. Uh, I think uh, embolization should have been done in this case if you feel that the bleeding is uh, into the tunnel. Yeah. See, we have to see the hemodynamic stability of the patient and also we have to actively manage it. So if the patient was hemodynamically stable and we have to think that how active is the ooze at that time. Patient had a history of melina, had a history of bleed and so that's why we admitted the patient. The patient was under active management. We were doing the resuscitation and also we saw that the BP was okay, the, hemo, uh, the pulse rate was okay. So maybe the bleed was intermittent and due to, as sir had said, that there was a hematoma, the uh, bleeding had stopped immediately. But we were ready for everything because we, uh, we were seeing if the patient was hemodynamically stable. That's why we ended with the CT angio first and even after the CT angio since uh, we transfused the blood and the hemoglobin had uh, increased up to 11.4 and daily hemoglobin we were seeing that the hemoglobin was stable. That means that the, uh, uh, that the bleed had stopped on its own. Okay, thank you Kunal for your comments. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I think you know, we can move to the next case and that's the last one. May I request uh, uh, Dr. Arun Arora. Yes, from, okay. Good evening, everyone. I thank Dr. Amul Bapai, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Today, I am going to present a video of ESD of cecal lateral spreading tumor and primary closure with extract system. Okay. A 79-year-old male patient with complaints of constipation and anorexia, colonoscopy showed a cecal lateral spreading granular tumor about 5 centimeters in size, just lateral to the appendicular opening. NBA image showed uh, genet type 2A. Uh, Submucosal injection was carried out with a mixture of uh, adrenaline, uh, methylene blue and jellofusin. And the lesion was uh, completely lifted up. And the mucosal incision was carried out partially and uh, the submucosal resection also uh, initially done partially. Then a SO clip was applied. SO clip consists of a clip with the spring. And with the SO clip, counter traction was uh, done. The counter traction facilitates, uh, prevents the prolapse of the tumor and uh, facilitates easy uh, dissection of the rest of the tumor. So the uh, submucosal resection was carried out in a traditional manner. Uh, Submucosal dissection was done uh, using a dual knife J and is uh, continued. The submucosal dissection was uh, done using dual J knife with alternate cutting and uh, coagulation technique. After uh, doing submucosal dissection, the incision is extended circumferentially
the sub mechanical dissection is continued after that the traction clip is removed and the sub mechanical dissection was completed here you could see the clear uh, mucosal defect so the right side colonic lesions after asd they needs closure here we uh, did closure by using extact system it contains a mounting platform and a handle drive so it, it, it drills the tack in uh, uh, surround uh, it, it drills the tack this is a helical tack so it is initially uh, attached to a normal tissue 5 to 10 millimeters uh, beside the mucosal defect and it is drilled into the uh, tissue the drilling is done uh, along the mucosal uh, defect peripherally total four tacks are placed and the mucosal defect is approximated. All the four tags are deployed here and the mucosal defect is approximated by pulling the suture line. Here, complete closure of the defect was seen, shown. And uh, end block resection showed 5 centimeter lateral granular swelling tumor. And follow up scope after 3 months showed complete healing of the uh, lesion without any residual tumor or recurrence. Okay. Very good. Uh, this paper is open for discussion. Arun, as people are coming up, um, is this something you would routinely do, close a sequel ESD uh, site? Uh, is there something that prompted you to use XTAC? Sir, actually the uh, defect size is more, sir, 5 centimeter size. And the right side colonic ESDs are more prone to get perforated, sir. So we decided to close the uh, defect uh, mucosal site using the XTAC novel system, sir. It is not available in India, but we got this. So we tried, uh, yeah, but when compared to endo stitch, it is easier to use, sir. Okay, question from there. Do you use a routine colonoscope or what scope? Yeah, yeah, with this extract system, uh, routine colonoscope is enough, sir. But for endo stitch, we, should, we require a double channel scope, sir, for endo suture. And even for ESG, you use the colonoscope in this patient? Yes, yes, yes. Comments and questions from the judges, please. Uh, sir, okay. uh, he, uh, what Dr. Moen had showed us in the lecture yes, yes. was that cinch was used and you have used clips. Yes. So, was the technique any different? No, from sir. What? No, sir. So, so, you could have also done a clip and line yes. or clip and loop technique instead? The clip and line, clip and loop, it requires a lot of clips, sir, when compared to this. And the cost would increase. So, you had used the cinch also here? Yes, yes, yes. The cost the of shop. extract also is high, you know. What is the cost of this? So, question. So, okay. how did you decide the direction of traction? Sorry, sir. Direction of traction, how did you decide? Direction of tax, sir. Yeah, uh, traction, SO clip. Where did you uh, put it? Opposite wall, sir. Opposite wall, uh, the ascending colon, mm. the anterior part. I think maybe direction. The region is down, sir. So, opposite, anteriorly, we place the clip, sir. So better counter traction. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Arun. Uh, I think we are now closed for this, and I believe the scores are being calculated, and we should have results shortly. We thank the judges. We have we have three prices: first, second, and third. 
I'm only a skeptic as a seeker what is the price money or <laughs> prices. <laughs> anyway, I think, you know, thanks the judges, wonderful judges, and uh, we have chairpersons, and on behalf of all of them, I say thanks to all of you. A wonderful presentation, excellent cases, and thanks Amol for this opportunity. And it shows now the interest of the people, the hall is almost full even now. We thank okay. the chairpersons and uh, the judges for chairing this session. And I'll call upon Dr. Amol to take over from here. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with us for the last one and a half days. May I call upon my colleagues, Harshal, Rajendra, Sachin, and uh, Nachiket is here. So if Najik is here, him too. Yeah. So it's always been a, you know, it's always a pleasure to see happy faces at the end of the event and such a full hall, even at the end of a fact day, after a two day, two busy days of live cases, lectures and everything. I think we've kept you very busy. And uh, as, as I said yesterday at the beginning of the event as well, it is, it is your enthusiasm and you know, your uh, dedication to come for these meetings and your enthusiasm which actually drives us to do this meeting year on year. On year. This is the ninth year that we've been do we, are, we are doing this meeting and uh, it has grown in size as well as I think in popularity and thank you so much for this patronization. As with any other event, this kind of an event would never be possible without the support of so many people that are behind the scenes and also around everywhere. So I would just like to take the, uh, this opportunity to thank each one of them, at least as teams. So the first, of course, is our colleagues in the Dinanath where, you know, we are here and uh, of course you saw the entire staff over there and they are really the backbone of whatever you saw in the last two days from the hospital. And thank you so much for that. And uh, particularly Shivangi who is, you know, she, she drives the entire this thing around, so that is very important. The audio visual which you saw over here is all thanks to the fantastic team from Anand Peter and video, video Line. And uh, I think there is very little to be said about their quality and their dedication and their this thing. So a big round of applause for the audiovisual team from Video Line and Anand. So thank you so much. This kind of an event requires tremendous amount of coordination and that is possible only with the help of our event team from Avama events. You all know Vikram Patwardhan, but Vikram was, could not be over here, but Rucha from Avama events has led the team over here, and thank you so much, Rucha and the entire team, for organizing such a complex Thing of activities where faculty have to be transmitted, transported, we, presentations have to be taken, faculty have to be reminded, everything, and you know, everybody's coordination, rooming, logistics, so on and so forth. The other important, uh, this is the venue itself. We would like to thank JW Marriott, and particularly Abhirath and Lena and their entire team who have supported us in these last so many years with this event and they give us unparalleled support, hospitality. We ask them for so many things at the last minute and they just provide us without this thing. So thank you Marriott for their uh, unconditional support for this event and for our, this thing. I take this opportunity to particularly thank all our international faculty they have traveled from far and wide and 
we have really kept you all so busy and you have you know despite the jet lag despite everything you all have endured our you know persistence you 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 know agreed to whatever we asked you to do and you you are over here all the while and thank you so much for that and along with that a big round of applause also for the national faculty the international and all the national faculty who supported this event without you all all the discussions over here would not have been possible thank you so much i would particularly like to thank our supporters and our academic partners particularly olympus along with that sun pharma torrent creo medical herbe overstitch apollo not sorry, overstitch also and ovesco and uh, imi boston scientific intas and so many others so there have been a lot i have already taken the names yesterday as well so thank you so much for the support because without the the support this kind of an event is just not possible yes last but not the least you all have seen this the hall and the entire proceedings being conducted by a person who is a master of the master of ceremonies function and the entire team of the mocs dr sanjay sarunke dr sahil rasne and dr sachin palnetkar you know ably supported by so many others you know who were there on and off and they have led the proceedings and they have conducted the proceedings so seamlessly and without any you know, glitch at all in the entire this thing so a big thank you to them for for the this thing a big round of applause for them as well and before i conclude i would like to just announce that please block your dates for the next year's event we'll be having our 10th anniversary event and the dates that we've selected are that uh, 12th 13th and 14th of july you will hear more from us very soon and keep these days blocked in your calendar and with that i think we will close the session thank you so much and uh, uh, again a housekeeping announcement before we close is uh, that those who have registered for the hands on session we start hands on in the same hall tomorrow at 8:30 sharp and i know everybody has is in a hurry to go home so if we start in time then we can finish hands on in time so that everybody can go home at the appropriate time and very conveniently and do join us for fellowship and cocktails and dinner and thank you so much thanks once more once again thank you sorry 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 the big announcement do you have the i, I need to they they totaling it okay sorry <laughs> so we will just wait for a moment more to announce the winners until then i will announce the prizes the first prize is a cash prize of 25000 rupees the second prize is a cash prize of 15000 and the third prize is a cash prize of 10000 and i think they are just totaling so bear with it with us for a moment more until we announce the winners yeah Huh? They need some time. Okay, so we'll announce it over cocktails. Otherwise, that we, we, maybe you can keep one mic on. Yeah. So in that case, we will conclude with the national anthem. May I ask everybody to rise for the national anthem, and we will conclude and we will announce the thing.
second places, but then the third one gets missed out. <laughs> because <laughs> Right. So, I think I forgot a very important name in the valedictory, and that is ANBIG, the Asian Novel Bioimaging and Intervention Group, which has supported us in such a big way in this event. Professor Noria and Professor Yoji are both ANBIG representatives over here, and I apologize on the, uh, you know, that I missed on that name, unfortunately, but I would like to acknowledge that. And for the prizes, so we have a tie for the second place, so we will have two second prizes and one first prize. So the second prize goes to Dr. Srihari with uh, point, 114 points and Dr. Jahangir also with 114 points. So. Both of you all can come up on stage. I don't have a check ready over here, but uh, we will dispatch it to you very soon. And the first prize with 131 points goes to Dr. Ganesh. So congratulations, all three of you all. And let me tell you, the marking is so close to each other that each one of those videos were probably had an opportunity to get a prize. It's just a few marks here and there. So each one of them was a prize-winning video. So congratulations to all the participants. Congratulations. Okay. And we will finally close now. Congratulations. <laughs>